Hello and welcome to the World's Preview Show. Jad and I are hanging out here next to the iconic Taipei 101 Tower in the crazy busy streets of Taiwan, getting ready to kick off the 2014 World Championship. Yeah, and just 10 minutes down the road is Taiwan's NTU Sports Center, which the first two groups of worlds are going to be playing there on Thursday to fight towards the Summer's Cup. That's right, so with all that action coming your way, don't touch that browser. The World's Preview Show starts right now. Everything on the line now. Pressure to go to Worlds. You're headed to the World Championship! Hello and welcome to the World Preview Show. I am Trevor Quickshaw Henry, joined by David Freak Turley, along with a veritable all-star assembly of experts, starting with Mitch Krepo Forsbulls, Yeliang Double of Peng, and Christopher Monte Cristo Michaels. So it's great to be this, guys. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at the first group stage of the 2014 World Championship. Kicks off Thursday in Taipei as teams from groups A and B will compete for a shot in the quarterfinals. Yeah, and just a heads up, be sure to stay tuned through the entire world's preview show today because we are very excited to debut a brand new song from Imagine Dragons that was created specifically for Worlds. And you're not going to want to miss the premiere of Riot's incredible new world championship video, Warriors. Now, I imagine you don't want to be anywhere else. Yeah, well, let's not drag on this introduction because there are four weeks of action heading your way as part of the 2014 World Championship. So let's actually take a look at the schedule. Of course, we'll be starting things off in Taipei with groups A and B, and those matches will kick off on September 18th at 5 p.m. local time, which is 11 a.m. Central European summer time and 2 a.m. Pacific, or roughly 12 hours from now. So check your watches, guys. And after that first week of games, the World Championship will head to Singapore for the second part of the group stage, where teams from Group C and D will be hitting the rift beginning September 25th. Now after that, it's off to Busan, Korea for the quarterfinals, as the eight teams who survived the group stage will compete in best of fives beginning October 3rd. Yeah, then the final four teams will make the trip to Seoul, Korea for the semifinals. There, the two best of five matchups will be held on October 11th and 12th at the Olympic Gymnastics Arena. And that all leads up to the 2014 League of Legends World Championship Finals, as the two best teams take the stage in the Songnam Stadium for a shot of the Summoner's Cup and the title of best team in the world. The 2014 World Championship will be played on the 4.14 patch with NA enabled. But since it's been almost a month since us non-pros have played on that patch, we've brought in Black Enola to help us take a look back at some of the major details with special Worlds version of the TLDR patch notes. Patch Notes, TLDR, League of Legends Patch 4.14, up in this world's preview show. Nar the Missing Link is now available for play. He'll tag you at range and lock you and your team up in three years of crowd control when he transforms. Will they rename the World Finals the Chronicles of Narnia? Only time and maybe Freak will tell. Assassins have seen a rise back to the LCS. Our favorite floating purple riftwalking mage assassin needed to be toned back a bit. It'll take longer for the damage and mana cost of riftwalk to reset. Oh, Kog'Maw. You're you're quite possibly the deadliest marksman. I guess it doesn't really matter what your target builds when you can melt it like a hot knife through butter. Name probably knows this best. Riot's lowered his base move speed and lowered the damage on his ultimate. Maokai is the new top lane terror. I'm all about diversity, but the mighty oak does too much damage and offers too much utility. The base power on Twisted Advance is going down, and his ult has a max up time of 10 seconds per activation. While everyone's trying to get at least a goal to get victorious Morgana, regular old Morgana's power in the bot lane can't be ignored, and so the base shield on Black Shield and the damage on Soul Shackles are going down. I honestly can't believe some people were saying it was Zyra. Come on! Oriana got her base AD lowered by 6 points. I can only imagine one of the balance team members going, yeah, that'll show that ball-loving robot. You take that nerf. Just how will Guang or ex Peke ever cope? Anyways, this shouldn't take away much from the most balanced mage in the game. Rengar has a higher cooldown on his alt early level, and the warning indicator range is larger, but it won't stop players like Dandy from clawing your carry's face off. Finally, Zed, because Z is at the end of the alphabet. Now when he uses Deathmark, 
it'll place Zed behind the target rather than in front, all while getting the ability to move through units, just like True Ninja should. I'm sure this makes Bjergsen, Westdoor, Dade, and Hive very happy. Everything else in these notes doesn't matter. This is TLDR Patch Notes Worlds 4.14. I'll see you next patch. The chase for the cup begins. Oh, baby. Yes! Now that we got the dates locked in and the patch notes covered, it is time to take a look at the teams in Group A. But first, just because Group A simply isn't exciting enough a name for the preview show, it's time to reveal our favorite nicknames that you guys, the fans, have sent to us. Yeah, you guys have sent a lot in, and while most of them were iterations of two, beings being, two teams being good and two teams being less good, with varying degrees of profanity, cruelty, and even intelligence, there were several that actually made us laugh. And I'm looking at you, Thanksgiving group. Ooh, the one that felt the safest to air for both legal and moral reasons was actually the Davids and Goliaths. And we like that one as well, and we want to thank E or something for being the first one to send that in to us. And you know, Trevor, I actually did beat Goliath in that matchup, so of course anything can happen in this group. Monty, actually, you were also quite vocal on Twitter about the name for this group. You called it Resident Sleeper. Want to chime in on why? Yeah, I named all of the uh, groups after Twitch emoticons, and this group, we have two obvious favorites here. It's probably going to be the most boring group, and hey man, he's asleep. What? Doesn't need to watch. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's take a look at those teams over in Group A, starting with the number one seed from China's LPL. It is Edward Gaming. Next up is the number two seed from Korea's The Champions, Samsung White. The next team in this group is the number two team from the GPL, AHQ Esports Club. And the final team is going to be one of the international wildcard teams, Dirt, uh, Turkey's Dark Passage. Well, let's actually take a closer look at those teams, starting with Turkey's Dark Passage. Passage. Dark Passage has been the most dominant team in Turkey for the last two straight years. They won the winter, spring and summer seasons as well as the Turkish Grand Finals in 2013 and 2014. They competed in the International Wildcard Tournament last year but lost out in the semifinals. But this year they've returned and have dominated their opponents bringing their first ever World Championship trip for a Turkish team. So let's take a look now at their starting lineup. In the mid lane is Naru, in the jungle is Crystal, supporting is Touch, AD Carry is Holy Phoenix, and the top laner is Fab Fabulous. Yeah, and I've actually had the pleasure of shoutcasting Dark Passage both last year and this year, and there's been a noticeable improvement. The first person who stands up for me is their mid laner, Naru. He has definitely grown from last year to this. He's got a phenomenal KDA of 7.3 in both the Turkish Grand Finals and including the 2014 World Championship, uh, International wildcard rather, where he really impressed me with his champion pool. You know, playing at Gamescom under the lights on the stage, he played seven different champions in eight games and he really, really excelled in his role. Secondary to that, Holy Phoenix has joined the team in the AD carry. He was too young last year as he was not 17. Now that he has come of age, he joined in the squad and he destroyed at Gamescom. Crepo, I want to ask you what's your take on Holy Phoenix and Dark Passage as a whole? Yeah, I think Holy Phoenix is definitely one of the better, if not the best AD carry in his region. But unfortunately for him, this tournament is going to be so stacked AD-wise that it's going to be so hard for him to even come close to the level of, of his opposition. All the other AD carries in his group are just really good at what they do. So while he's very strong, I'm just really worried to uh, how well he can perform. However, he had a good season, had good KDAs, had a good performance, and even had a pentakill on Tristana. Maybe he's dreaming for another one, but... I don't think it's going to happen. Well, we'll have to see. Maybe you can repeat that success. All right, guys, let's turn our focus onto GPL's AHQ Esports Club. AHQ have been one of the top two teams in the GPL over the last two years. And last season, they were actually the favorites to make it to the World Championship, but they were upset by the Gamania Bears. It's kind of been the sort of the story for AHQ is they're always almost there, but the losses have, keep, have kind of continually fired AHQ up in GPL's regional finals this year. They swept the Saigon Fantastic 5-3-0 and finally grabbed that number two seed and went to the World Championship. Now we're going to take a look at their starting roster. Their AD carry is Garnet Devil and the top lane is Prize. In the mid lane, their star player is West Door. In the jungle is Nas and supporting is Green T. Now again, the player that stands out to me is that mid laner West Door. He is definitely the best mid laner in the region. And this is, again, a region that has bred players like toys. This is a player that a lot of us still remember from the Season 2 World Championship. This guy is a phenomenal assassin player. His Fizz, his Zed, his Yasuo are great. And if they're going to win, it's going to be on his back. 
And I just want to chime in because Westor and Nas are just the playmakers of that team. If there's a fight that breaks out top lane 1v1 or bottom lane 2v2, they're always the first ones to respond. They're always looking to make plays, get picks, and carry the team. They're just the most active members of HQ. I'm glad you mentioned the bottom lane. What's your take on Garnet Devil? I mean, ADC, ADC, what do you think? Yeah, so when I watch him, I would compare him to the likes of Cop. He's very consistent. His positioning is good. He's not a playmaking like uh, AD carry per se, but he's very focused on just positioning, hyper carry, get to late game, and just do his job. Um, he's not standout in any way, but he definitely is the top AD carry in his region, in my opinion. Well, 12 and 0 on Jinx. He definitely makes it to the late game, that's for sure. All right, next up, it is going to be Samsung White. That's coming from Korea. This team is making it back to Worlds after failing to make it out of the groups last year, where they played as Samsung Ozone. Samsung White have admitted to being overconfident last year, and they tasted the bitterness of defeat. It is weighing heavily on their minds, as we heard in the Road to Worlds documentary. Sure, but they're of course not going to let that defeat hold them back. They've earned enough circa points to force a tiebreaker against SK Telecom T1K for the second spot from Korea. That's where they defeated the defending world champions 3-0, so a very good road for them so far. And we're gonna take a look now at their starting players. In the jungle is Dandy, one of the best junglers in the world. AD carry is Imp, supporting is Mata. In the mid laner is Pawn, and the top laner is Looper. Now, the only difference for this squad from the last year's sort of failed squad at Worlds is a swap in the mid lane. Pawn is now playing in place of Dade, and I think it's for the better. Yeah, I think so. Dade struggled last year. I'm looking forward to seeing Pawn play. But mm -hmm. truthfully, we have to ask the conductor for his opinion on Samsung White. Talk to me about some of the players, Monty. <sighs> well, you know, for Samsung White, I, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan <laughs> of the Samsung organization, and either team is going to probably win this world championship, but if I had to bet on one, I'd bet on White. And the reason is, even though, you know, they haven't kind of had that seminal performance where they actually beat Blue in a best of five, I think the time is now. And Dandy's going to be right up there with it. Dandy, I think, is the best jungler in the world right now. And he is head and shoulders above pretty much any other jungler in this tournament. It's his jungle pathing, his control of vision with Mata, uh, his ability to play Rengar even after the nerfs makes him very, very dangerous on certain uh, assassin champions. And he's a playmaker. You know, he can go in there, he can lead his team in, and this guy is just extraordinary. We call him the Prince of Thieves, he always steals objectives, really well-rounded player. I want to know your thoughts on Imp. I'm personally excited to see him play, what's your take? Uh, Imp's a very good player. Uh, a lot of the time, what Samsung White will do is play pick compositions. Imp will typically play a champion like Twitch in that situation. He's one of the first in, usually. He's not like uh, Name, another AD carry in this group who's more positional. He's there in the front line. The best thing about Imto that he has the privilege to play with Mata and that makes his their bot lane just even better. That's arguably the best support, if not one of the best supports in the world. I'm just looking forward to seeing them play. And finally, let's check out China's Edward Gaming. Just half a year ago, this team has gone from not existing at all to being one of the best squads in the world. They were assembled by combining the top players from teams like World Elite and Positive Energy and molding them into this unstoppable powerhouse. And a powerhouse they are. They stormed through the spring and summer playoffs both, taking first place the entire year. They also only lost a single game the entire route through the summer playoffs. And so with two first place finishes and then winning the Chinese regionals, they are the number one Chinese seed for Worlds. Let's take a look now at their starting lineup. Their AD carry, their star player is Name, formerly known as Devil if you think about him from a while back. Their top laner is Koro1. Their jungler is Clearlove. Their mid laner is Unstoppable. In this tournament, he'll be known as just the letter U. And the support player is FZZF. Well, now, double lift. I know that you keep in touch with the Chinese scene and Chinese Chinese AD carries in particular. So what's your opinion on Name? I mean, this guy's just amazing. He's definitely my pick for just someone to watch in Group A. I mean, he's three-time champion. Uh, he's just incredible. He's so consistent. I've never seen him lose lane. When I watch EDG play, this guy never, ever, ever loses lane. The only time that he actually dies in the first 10 minutes is when the enemy team, like, 4v2 dives bottom lane. So it's just something completely out of his control. Um, he's super consistent. His positioning is incredible. But he, the thing to note about him, he's really unique. He doesn't make plays. He is just very, very consistent. He's just, he doesn't dive in 1v5. His, his positioning is pretty much always perfect. Yeah, I agree there. He's just a very smart player. One game, for example, he made an adaptation where as Twitch, he would just gank level 1 mid and just basically win that mid lane for you, go down to the bottom lane because they were playing in a lane swap anyways. He recognized that he had that 30 second window where he actually did not need to be bottom lane immediately and he took advantage of that and basically won mid lane for his mid laner. One thing that is going to be a little concerning though is the fact that I think 
a lot of this tournament is going to be on his shoulders. And if he's not willing to take risks and abuse the fact that he'll be winning the bot lane consistently, it's going to be a little of a hard road for EDG with teams of incredible players in every lane. Yeah, very briefly, let's talk about you, Unstoppable in the mid. I feel like he's overshadowed by some of the other Chinese mid laners. Double of Ketis, share your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Yu's not the strongest mid in China by any means. Um, but what he is known for is his diversity. He can play pretty much everything. Um, the thing that kind of strikes me as negative about him is people will sometimes play niche stuff against him, such as Jace mid, and he'll just go on crazy feeding sprees. He'll just die constantly in lane. So he might not be the best laner, but he's exactly what the team needs. He's super versatile, and he'll pick for the team comp. Well, now that we've looked at the four teams in Group A, let's go look through our telescope over to the Telestrator, as Monte Cristo is actually going to take us into the laning phase. Thank you, quick shot. If we take a look at this group on Summoner's Rift under a sweeping lens, one lane stands out above the others. And that's where I expect the make or break performances that will see a team advance or falter here in the group stages. For Group A, I think those battles will take, in the bot, take place in the bot lane and specifically with the AD carries. So we're going to do a quick rundown of the four ADCs competing in Group A and exactly what makes them tick. Starting off, Samsung White. There's Imp. Also known as one of the best ADCs in the world, he has insane mechanics and believed to have one of the strongest laning phases of any ADC. Following up, Edward Gaming, it's Name. He is known as one of the best positional ADCs in the world, extremely intelligent, and picks heavy scaling champs for the late game carry. AHQ Esports Club, Garnet Devil. One of the best in the region, and he had amazing performances with huge KDAs in the recent GPL season and the regional finals. And finally, Dark Passage, it's Holy Phoenix. He's undoubtedly the best ADC in all of Turkey. He carried his team during the international wildcard tournament with a pentakill. Now, if we start to rank the ADCs in this group, I think it'd probably stack up a little bit like this. Number four, Holy Phoenix. Unfortunately for him, he's going up against the three ADCs that are among the best in their respective regions. These regions are much bigger, and moreover, our top two are probably top three in the world. Following up, number three, Garnet Devil. Like Holy Phoenix, he is one of the best in his region, but he will be facing Name and Imp, and these are regions with a lot heavier competition. Number two, may surprise some of you, I'm actually going to say Imp here. Uh, Imp does bring great mechanics to matches. He has a very strong laning phase, and he's paired with Mata, which you really can't underestimate, but he can get cocky and make some mistakes in the late game because he's more of that playmaking style. You want to look for consistency. It's my number one. It's Name here. It's really close between Imp and Name. They have very different play styles. But I believe that Name just edges Imp out due to his stronger late game and his consistently good decision making and his emphasis on team fights. Regardless, it'll definitely be interesting to see these two duke it out with their very different styles. So there you have it for the laning phase for Group A. Quick shot, back to you. Thank you very much, Monty. Jet actually took some time uh, out of his schedule to catch up with one of those OP AD carries over in Taipei. So let's send it over to him and see what Edward Gaming's Name has to say. Hey everybody, I am here with Name from EDG to talk a little bit about the World Championship. And you have actually won three straight splits in the LPL. How have you been able to do that? Uh, 我就觉得我能赢他们吧，差不多也相当于是自信和就是我觉得只要我不倒着我打得很差，不会崩盘，我就打着我会赢得这场比赛，自己就有信心很足练。It's interesting. Where does that confidence come from? Because you've been so dominant as an AD carry for so long, but where do you draw all of your confidence? 嗯，这种东西有在日常交手中，就是。与交手过很多次，也不是就是不是属于那种陌生的对手。打起来的话，就是不会不知道对方体系，所以说就知道该怎么玩人赢。And now you guys actually move on to the world stage, where you get to play AD carries from all regions. How do you think you'll stack up against those players since you haven't played them before? 啊，我也有事先看过一些国内外的比赛，就是事先了解他们。比较想交手的,我感觉每个地区的种族队都是我非常想交手的队员。And after watching all the other AD carries, how do you think you stack up against them? 这种事情要上了舞台之后才能决定吧,就是当你打起来和你在台下观看完全就是不一样了,你交起手来你才知道一个人的真正实力有多少。
And of all the 80 carries you've watched, who are you most looking forward to playing against, or who do you want to face the most? Why him? You want to play against Imp. Are there any teams in particular you want to play against? And last question for you. OMG and Royal Club both had a lot of success last year at Worlds. OMG in the group stages and Royal Club making it all the way to the finals. Yet, your team, Edward Gaming, has beaten them consistently in the LPL. How do you think that helps you as a team going towards the World Championship this year? Uh, well, thank you for that, Jet, and thank you even more to Name for taking the time out to chat to us. Yeah, and I just wanted to expand on something earlier, because I'm really excited about Name. It can't be understated. This is a guy who's coming into Worlds with three consecutive championships in his region on two different teams. For me, this is the best player in the world that we have never seen at an international competition, and I am so excited. Well, after that introduction, Monty, it's time for the table. Well, you end the table to tell me who your number Number one and number two teams are. They're gonna make it out of groups into quarterfinals, and I know you're gonna put Edward Gaming first. So come on, <laughs> you know one me and so two. well. No, no, no. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be Samsung White. This is a team that as good as Name is, Imp is still right up there at the top of the elite carries in the world, and they're just better players at all the other positions. Effectively, now my one concern with EDG being number two, Samsung White has had a tendency to lose to a team that has a very similar style to EDG, their sister team, Samsung Blue, that's reliant on a very positional AD carry, an AOE, big time AOE mid, and a lot of team fighting. Of course, HQ probably third, Dark Passage probably fourth. This is the David and Goliath group. I don't think they stand much of a chance. We'll see, we'll see if it works out. Had some uh, faith in Westor earlier. What's your opinion and predictions for this group double lift? Well, I have to agree with Mani, even though I don't really want to, because <laughs> the Korean team is definitely gonna make it out, Samsung White. Absolutely the best team in this group. And EDG, just a little bit under them. Honestly, I think Name edges out Imp a little bit, but in all other roles, in all four other roles, Samsung White just has slightly better players, if not like drastically better players. Westor and Garnet Devil, not even a glimpse, maybe? I don't see a glimpse of hope for them. I see a glimpse of hope for HQ to potentially take one game off of these guys. Well, we'll see. Next prediction, Crepo, one and two. Are you going with the trend? Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely putting White first, EDG second, and I do agree with Double if their AHQ might be able to take a game uh, of EDG just because their vision control isn't really good, their pre-planning isn't really good. They, um, these, these 5v5 brawl fests that's so typical for the Chinese scene actually happen because they don't plan ahead very well. They don't push out their side lanes very well or they don't have the best vision control. Compare that to, uh, to White, they have Mata just controlling the game on his own in terms of vision. So, and I agree as well, roll for roll. The Koreans are just better in this matchup. Freak, I've got to roll this one on to you. Yep. EDG, the one Chinese team at Worlds that I feel doesn't play that stereotypical team fight way. I think they can if they want to. Right. One or two, or is a surprise like AHQ going to make a one and two? So I can't give any more facts than what you guys have already said. I agree. The number one is Samsung White. Number two is Edward Gaming. Number three is AHQ, and I think they are a dark horse that can make a run here. Um, Specifically because I think they are very strong and Westor can just hard carry here. And with Edward, there's the chance that Name just doesn't perform internationally. There's the chance that it doesn't quite click for EDG and there's the upside AHQ goes through instead. It's unlikely, but I think that is on the table. And don't forget... Samsung uh, White or Samsung Ozen Lost you. choked in groups. Sure. Now, this is normally where we would turn to you out there and ask for your favorites. And of course, you still can share those with us. But today we'd like to do something just a little bit different. It is time for the 2014 World Championship preview show, Mad Libs. For those of you unfamiliar with Mad Libs, it works like this. We ask you for different types of words, like a noun, a verb, or an adjective. I had to look them up too. And we'll plug them into a predetermined <laughs> sentence, often with hilarious results. For instance, I'll ask the guys here on the desk for some words, starting with Crepo. Give me the name of a player from Group A. Imp. 
empty is. Double lift. Can you give me an adjective, if you would? Uh, kawaii. Okay, so <laughs> imp kawaii. Monte Cristo, give me a past tense verb. Well, it's imp, it's twitch, it's ambushed. All right, so imp, imp kawaii ambushed. Let's see. We'll take those, we're going to plug them into our league Mad Libs. In this case, we'll end up with something that looks like this. Wow, that play from imp was kawaii. He totally ambushed the other team. I'm not really sure what that means. All right, earlier this week, we tweeted out on LOL Esports and asked you for a team name from Group A and two verbs. And here's the sentence that you were unwittingly constructing. Team name better verb this group or they'll verb all the way home. And we're actually gonna fill in our favorite responses to the sentence and it reads something like this. From at Sam Chamison, he wrote, Samsung, uh, Samsung White better Shrek this group or they'll sob uncontrollably all the way home. Shrek is love. Shrek is life. I think if they Shrek, they could rename themselves to Samsung Green. <laughs> At Bowling Giant wrote, Samsung White better kill this group or they'll feed all the way home. That's pretty much how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, keep sending those to us and be sure to use that hashtag world's preview so you can all play along. And of course, keep it clean or at least relatively, we are still PG-13 up in this preview show. All right, now for a little bit of a local flavor, and I mean that quite literally, former pro player and season two world champion Mistake takes us on a tour through Taipei's culinary scene. Today我来到台北宁夏夜市 它裡面是有豬大腸,這很多外國朋友可能不大敢嘗試,可是台灣人非常的愛。那它吃起來的口感非常的棒,然後很多人會把它當早餐。然後搭配著台灣的泡菜 搭配一些欠水,然後堅持雙面金黃酥脆,然後很多外國朋友都一定會來嘗試看看。我剛剛買的豬血糕鹽酥雞也是台灣非常有名的美食然後呢它是使用很多新鮮的蔬菜然後去油炸配上九層塔然後可能再配上一些辣椒以及蒜頭其實它跟美國的炸雞很像然後只是會炸了各種不同的材料
欢光临。我一杯波霸奶茶。好，波霸奶茶。嗯。大杯的吗？大杯。好，冰块甜度要不要调整？呃，半糖少冰。今天品尝完了这么多台湾到地的美食，这次来台湾的朋友们，除了世界赛以外，别忘了来体验到地的台湾小吃哦。See you guys， 拜拜。Well, now I'm both hungry and jealous. Everybody enjoying themselves out in Taipei. Right, let's move along. 2014 World Championship is heading to Korea for the quarterfinals and beyond. I think it only seems fitting to embrace some of the Korean culture and learn some of the language. It is now time for the 2014 World Preview Show, World Championship, League of Legends, Korean Phrase of the Day, with today's special guest star, Counter Logic Gaming's top laner and Korean enthusiast, Seraph. Today's phrase is, can I get a gank in the bot lane? Name is more fed than a poro in ARAM. Seraph, take it away. Hey, Kisha, it's easy. Ah, Name got ARAM and poro more than a poro in the baton gang. So, please do it. Yeah, that, that wasn't easy. Thank you, Seraph. I'm going to have to work on my pronunciation a lot because I suck at Korean. Now that we are slightly more culturally educated, let's take a look at the teams in Group B or what was formerly known as Group B because we're turning to your nicknames from Twitter once again. And of course, thank you guys for sending so many. The majority of you have noticed the same thing that TSM did, which was finally the absence of a Korean team in this group. And that prompted a few of you to suggest that this was a very lucky group, despite the fact that he's not on Royal Club anymore. Although, one of my personal favorites was Group B should be Lord's group, because they'll never beat Royal. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> dipping back into Monty's Twitter feed, I see you gave a shout out to Twitch chat once more by calling this group Failfish. Any particular reason? Yeah, that's uh, that's the old facepalm. You know, this this group is uh, probably not the most competitive group in terms of as we run deeper into the tournament. There's a lot of parity in this group early on. It's difficult to tell who's going to get out. In fact, pretty much any one of these four teams can theoretically get out of this group. But any team is going to lose in the quarters here. So... Ooh, We're going to see a lot of face words. palming. We're going to see a lot of face palming from the analysts in this group. Strong words indeed. For me, the most appropriate nickname for this group actually came from our very own chat during the reveal show, which is the veterans, because all four of these teams have actually been to Worlds before. And plenty of you actually did suggest that name yourself, although the first of you to agree with Jat was at Brett VZ, and I'm sure Jat would love to thank you for that himself. I will thank you too. Now that we've had some fun, it is time to actually check out these veteran teams in Group B, starting with the number one North American LCS seed, it's Team Solo Mid. And the number one team from the GPL region is the Taipei Assassins. We're also adding the number two team from China's LPL, Starhorn Royal Club, and the number three team from the European LCS, SK Gaming. All right, let's actually zoom in for a closer look at Group B, and we're going to be starting things off with SK Gaming. SK overhauled their roster coming into the 2014 season after placing second in spring and third in summer. SK has gone from not making worlds last year to being a potential dark horse in their group, depending on how well they perform. Unfortunately, that potential took a serious hit on Wednesday when Svenskeren was suspended. The suspension on Svenskeren will be for SK's first three World Championship games, and he has also been fined $2,500 for being racially insensitive on the Taiwanese server. This is not the first time that Svenskeren has been warned about abusive interactions with players and fans, and his last formal warning was back in July. SK Gaming's substitute for the first three games is going to be Gilius. And the last time we saw him was when he was playing for the Unicorns of Love, the challenger team that recently defeated Millennium in the Spring Promotion Tournament. And it's somebody that you've commented on and spectated for many months this year. Yeah, so Gilius is a pretty good player, certainly. The difficulty, though, is that his style is very different from Sven Skarens. Uh, of course, playing with a new player in general is always going to be very difficult, especially someone who's quite good like Sven Skarin. The different style is likely to be a hindrance, but sometimes new players just click and there's that weird chance that, that works out well for SK suddenly. This means SK Gaming's lineup is going to look like this for the first three games. In the jungle is going to be Gilius. In the mid lane is Jesses, supporting his N-rated, AD carry Candy Panda, and top laner Freddy122. All right, Monty, coming into today's show, you actually had SK Gaming as one of your favorites to make it out to, into the quarterfinals. How much has Fenceron's actions affected his team's chances, in your opinion? Uh, quite a lot. 
in fact. I mean, this is they're not coming in with a lot of scrim time or any at all, potentially, with Gilius. And it's unfortunate because if we look at this team and the European playoffs, I think this was a very strong team. They really gave Alliance a run for their money in a way that nobody else did during, during those playoffs. And for me, they were really the second best team coming out of Europe, even though they couldn't take the second seed due to being paired with Alliance in the semifinals. So I, I think they're quite good. I was excited to watch them now. I think they are probably going to take last. In the yeah, I felt the same. Uh, Krepo, can I just get you to comment on SK losing Sven Skerr? And these are players that you've known for a long period of time. How much does it mess with your, your, your gel to lose that man? I mean, we have had to have switch players throughout this season. And it's definitely really hard to just get that vibe, get the same people on the same page uh, immediately. And then in such a big event for, for Gilius, who started in challenger scene, Made it into LCS, hasn't played it, and immediately has to go to Worlds. That's going to be a tough blow. However, whenever I tune into the Challenger scene, I always like what he was doing. He was an uh, active player, had a good sense of understand, understanding of the game, and he had good mechanics. So I hope he performs. Well, we'll see if it does. Definitely for SK's chances. All right, up next, it is the GPL's Taipei Assassins. The Taipei Assassins won the Season 2 World Championship, surprising everyone with a phenomenal performance. This surprise was actually equaled by TPA's inability to qualify for Worlds last year. Over the last two years, TPA has struggled to find a consistently strong roster, but they do seem to have found a recipe for success in their current six-man squad. They blasted through the winter, spring, and summer splits of the GPL, earning the number one seed from their region. And we actually saw this team play at the Paris All-Star Invitational back in May. But when they played there, Wins had just joined the roster as their junglers so a couple of weeks ago. So these teams, or this team specifically, has gotten a lot better since then. And it's something we're going to actually watch how well Wins actually synergizes with that roster. Let's check out the starting lineup. In the top lane is Achi. In the mid lane is Morning, or maybe Chawi if they sub him out. Supporting is Jay. AD Carry is BB. And Jungle is Wins. Yeah, and just to expand on that mid lane point, both Chawi and Morning have played in their regular season so it is a strategy this team may implore i want to ask more about wins and i want to ask monty your opinion because i know you know him quite well yeah i he's a veteran so he's got a lot of experience on the world stage from last year well not a lot a little bit he did only play one best of three but <laughs> he looked good and uh he's only developed since then and he always occupies a space kind of in the middle of the challenger ladder in Korea. He's known for his Lee Sin play. And moreover, he's now getting coached. Another thing that we really need to talk about is that one of the former coaches from the Najin organization in Korea has moved over to the Taipei Assassins. And we've seen them improve dramatically under his tutelage. And man, they look good in the GPL finals. Clean sweep. Yeah, they definitely are looking good. I keep talking about AD carries and every time I do, it's double lift I throw them to. BB. AD Carry, go. Well, uh, we did, CLG did a boot camp in Korea, and I had the pleasure of uh, practicing against BB and Jay. And I can tell you first an experience that I would be very surprised if he had a good time in lane in this group. Honestly, he's not a very strong player in lane. He's more of a hyper carry. He loves to farm. He loves to do the double lift and split push solo on AD carries until he's strong enough for team fight. But really, his laning phase to me seemed incredibly weak. So that's just something to look out for. I sincerely hope he's learned from the double lift and not going to make the same mistakes. Oh. Right, let's move on. The next team in Group B is China's Starhorn Royal Club. Many of you will remember Royal Club as a team who made it to the final match in Worlds last year before being beaten by SK Telecom T1K. This, however, is almost an entirely different team. It really is. The new players are going to include two Korean former stars, including jungler Insec. Uh, and this is a new lineup that has actually looked pretty good. They took second place in the LPL Regional Final to qualify for that return trip to Worlds. Let's take a look at the total starting lineup here. In the jungle is Insec. The AD carry is UZI, that's what we're calling him here. The support is going to be Zero. The mid lane is Korn, and the top laner is Cola. Yeah, it's very a strong lineup. Many players remember Uzi from last year. He has stated quite clearly it's Uzi I and AD Carry. It's double lift. I'm going to ask Chinese AD Carry. Uzi I, what do you think? So he blew everyone's minds last year at Worlds. I mean, he made these ridiculous plays. His mechanics were spot on, but uh, his biggest weakness in the LPL has been his inconsistency. This guy is not afraid to jump in 1v5, and he sometimes it works out, and he escapes with 10% HP in situations where other AD carries would have just died. But he is a big risk taker, and that's a good and a bad thing for his team. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I look at I look at UZI and I see that playmaking possibility and. In a way, his style perfectly works with Insect, their jungler, because these are both guys that are action first, think later, <laughs> right? And that's why Insect, uh, you know, he fell off in Korea. His mechanics are still great. He's very aggressive, but he overextends. He gets ahead of his team. But when he's with another player who does that as well, it almost works because they can force so many skirmishes around the map that they often catch teams off guard. And this is a team I actually have my eye on a lot as well because they could just be so darn good. The problem is getting everyone onto the same page. They have to play in English together, which is none of the players' main language, right? Like, if this team could learn to play as a unit of five, they would be ludicrously incredible. Yeah, there's one thing that's interesting, though. If you contrast them to OMG, they are both very aggressive, both in your face. We need to see which one can learn the most between their regional qualifiers and now the world stage. Now, with that, it brings us to the final team in the group, North America's Team Solo Mid. TSM had a dramatic finish to the summer playoffs, beating their rivals Cloud9 for the first time ever to take the number one North American seed back and they are certainly no strangers to the world stage. This marks their fourth appearance at the World Championship, and this time, more than ever, TSM actually has the ability to do well. Yeah, I think this is the best roster TSM have actually ever put together now. The individual skill level is really high on this group of five, so they kind of brought in new players at the beginning of the year. They've expanded that support staff as well with Coach Loco Doko, and for the first time in a year and a half, they're, as you said, back to being the number one team in North North America. So this is a roster that could go far here. Let's check out the starting roster though. On the jungle is amazing. In the top lane is Dyrus. In the mid lane is Bjergsen. At AD carry is Wild Turtle. And supporting is Lustboy. Yeah, now both Krepo, you and Doublelift have played against this team all season long. Krepo, I want to ask your opinion in the support role on Lustboy. He seems to have transformed that duo lane with Wild Turtle. I just think Lustboy is a really solid player. I think his laning is not his strong point, but he's solid enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lot of other people. But I just like what he brings in terms of vision control. He's very calm. He rarely gets caught out and just is a very methodical player. When you watch uh, TSM play and when they rotate around the map, Lustboy will often be leading a charge. I don't know if he's calling them, but he definitely knows first where to go and he just does that immediately. No hesitation and just a super solid player. Yeah, it definitely seems to be performing well. Double lift, anything to add on the rest of the squad? Maybe looking at Bjergsen as really their all-star player at the moment. Yeah, I think when a point of contention when you're watching a game is something to talk about is when somebody goes even against Bjergsen, that's something that's interesting about the game. That is a big problem because Bjergsen is just a monster. He's unrivaled in North America. This guy almost always solo kills his lane, if not just consistently pressures them. And the thing to note about Bjergsen is he will break the opponent mid laner. There will be times early in the series, or maybe the first game he's up against someone, he goes even. Then as it goes further and further and further uh, across the tournament, he just essentially destroys them, picks them apart. I definitely agree that Bjergsen is a very strong individual player. I still have to call into question TSM's shot calling a little bit, just because I know it's not a role Bjergsen really loves, but it's the one he's kind of been forced to embrace a little bit. Um, so his 1v1s are still very strong, but TSM, I think, are going to have a really hard time keeping up strategically with some of the teams in this tournament. Well, we'll have to see. They learned a lot at the North American playoffs. We are actually going to turn things over to the mind of Monte Cristo once again, as he highlights four players in the laning phase. Thanks again, quick shot. When you look at the lineup of talent on these four teams, it should really come as no surprise that the matches in this group, just like in Group A, will rely on the AD carries. So let's take a quick look at the four ADCs in Group B. For SK Gaming, we'll start off with Candy Panda. He is one of the most experienced ADCs in Europe, and he also brings experience with him from his World Championship appearance in Season 1. Team Solo Mid's Wild Turtle is next. He's one of the most unpredictable ADCs in North America. His performance at Worlds last year proved one that he is one of the strongest players for TSM. For Starhorn Royal Club, Zuziai, he's back again. He's one of the best ADCs in China. He's one of the top in the world, and he rivals Name, but more is a playmaking ADC. You'll probably remember him from his performance last year at Worlds, where he nearly carried the team all the way to a title. And finally, the Taipei Assassins have Bibi, who is the only returning member from the team that won the World Championship in Season 2. He posted huge numbers for TPA this year, winning the GPL and bringing them to Worlds. Let's talk a little bit about ranking. If you rank the ADCs coming into this group, here's how I think they measure up. Coming in at number four, it's going to be Wild Turtle. 
At the World Championship last year, he was one of, if not TSM's biggest asset. But his most recent playoff run has been inconsistent. His laning face has been poor, his team fighting uh, has been hit or miss. And while the rest of his teammates have really risen to the occasion, he's stayed a little bit behind. Coming into number three, I've got Candy Panda. Candy Panda is a veteran player uh, who's looking to improve his performance from Worlds in season one where he fell out of groups. He's pretty strong in Europe, but he is a bit behind the other two ADCs in this group who are both former world finalists and one world champion. World champions coming in at number two, it's BB. This is his return to the world stage for the first time since he won in season two. TPA right now is focused on getting him ahead. Like Doublelift says, he may not have the stronger laning phase, but he does play hyper carries and they do rely on him significantly in the late game. Now, number one, it's gotta be UZI. UZI has a long list of accomplishments, including his crazy vein mechanics from last year's appearance at Worlds. With any luck, we'll see his aggressive outplays this year. And if we're not seeing those outplays, we're probably going to see him fast pushing on Caitlyn. So that's the laning phase for Group B, and that means we'll be watching the bottom lane a lot in Taipei. Quick shot, back to you. Thank you very much, Monty. Make sure you catch that Korean hype train on the way back. Now, it is time to hear from a player who's made it all four World Championships, as we've caught up with TSM's Dyrus regarding their chances in Group B. What's up, League fans? Rivington here with Dyrus atop the Shangri-La Far East Plaza. Absolutely gorgeous here in Taipei, Taiwan. Got the chance here to sit down with Dyrus and talk a little bit about Worlds. And I want to start first with the victory at PAX. What did it mean to you to take down Cloud9 and get the LCS title? In your personal accomplishments? Normally it wouldn't be as high, but every game was so close fought that it was well earned. Um, it was a really hard fought battle through every single match, and it was very close every single game, and we finally made it. Finally made it, and you for a fourth time now. What's different about this year that compares to the rest? What can you kind of take out of this and, and bring to this world? Well, this year a different roster every single time. Um, except me, I've been here. Personally, it just gets better every year because it isn't really about the prize pool. It isn't really about like, you know, well, it is about winning or losing, but every single year, more and more fan interaction comes to the scene and it becomes more and more exciting to, you know, perform for the fans. Right on. So a lot of people feel that you guys kind of got a favorable group draw. How do you feel about it? In my opinion, we've gotten maybe the first or second best group we could get possible. Of course, that doesn't mean it's a free ticket to Worlds. In best of ones, out of like two matches per each team, anyone can win. And if we just slip up that one game, if we go under pressure, like even if we are favored to get out of our groups, it's really, really easy to not get out of groups. You guys kind of got a little recognition and praises sung by uh, Samsung Blue Acorn on, on social media that says, you know, you guys were the hardest team to face. Are there any teams that you are actually looking forward to facing in Worlds? Personally, I'm looking forward to playing against every single one, whether they're good or not as good as the other teams. They're really, really fun to play against. Mm -hmm. I feel very, very confident in what we've been doing. And, you know, as long as we play to our best and did our best and we still lose, then, you know, that's how far we got. And if we win, then <laughs> we all know what's going to happen. So follow up on that, is there any player you would like to specifically face in this world matchup? Out of all the top players I really respect so far is Go Going. And last year he just, by playing against him and Impact, they just showed me like a top lane level of mechanics of where, you know, I just wasn't there yet. And this year I want to see how far I've gotten to compare up to them. And I want to step back real quick, back to PAX before a final question. What was the Dyrus we saw at PAX? It was, it was definitely a different Dyrus, a very emotional and powerful Dyrus. Will we see that here at Worlds? In my opinion, the emotions kind of get in the way because when I did that at PAX, um, it ruins my team's concentration and what we need to do next. Um, it's going to be more serious and more strict on myself, but I'm going to be looking to play as strongly as I did as PAX. All right, and Dyrus, what would it mean to you to win Worlds? It would mean that the last four, three times I didn't make it, that as long as I put my mind to it and as long as my teammates um, you know, kept doing what they were doing and I just stepped up to my teammates' level, then it would mean everything. It would mean 
I'm giving the win to myself, to my fans, to North America, and just everyone in general. Thank you very much for that, Riv and Dyrus, and I'm sure picking up those wins will mean a lot to the TSM fans as well, but you need to pick those wins up. Winning gets you out of groups. We've dissected Group B. I want to ask the panel which two teams will be advancing from Group B to take place in the quarterfinals in Busan, Korea. I'm gonna start with Crepo, formerly of the European Union. You turned to apple pie. You turned to freedom. Are you a believer in TSM or not? Last year, I put all my hopes for a Royal Lucian. Didn't happen, so I'm going TSM all the way this year. I think actually they have a chance of play, placing first in their group, uh, with a close second being Royal Club. Uh, it might be the other way around. I'm sure Monty disagrees with me here. But uh, yeah, something tells me, you know, I have this gut feeling that TSM is going to show up and uh, place first. Well, it's going to be interesting. Double if you've played against them even longer than Crepo has. Give me your opinion, your top two, who's getting out of groups? Definitely Starhorn Royal Club as the first. They're just the strongest team in the group to me. Uh, they come from China, a very aggressive region. Their team fighting is immaculate. They have UZI, like, this guy is a monster. He's going to crush everyone bottom lane. And then number two, Taipei Assassins. Um, even though this group doesn't have a Korean team, to me, they're like the honorary Koreans because they scrim constantly against Korean teams. They play in the fastest region with the, with the lowest game time. That means these guys are super objective focused and it'll catch everyone off guard. Just don't underestimate TPA. In my opinion, they're going to make it out of the groups. So no faith at all in TSM. You don't think that they're going to show up and, you know, take them out? It's, a, it's close between TPA and TSM, but I have to say, TPA's playstyle to me inherently counters TSM's. A CLG member suddenly not believing in TSM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more. Monte Cristo, who is your top two teams? Does TSM feature? I know you liked SK before the incident. Yeah, I mean, the reality is is that SK doesn't have that same uh, scrim practice that they've had in Korea with their normal jungler, Svenskeren, so any substitute situation is really going to knock them down the standings. I got them at number four. Number one, I'm taking Starhorn Royal Club. This is a team that has, uh, with UZI, has a lot of international experience. He stepped up his game last year. And for me, the difference between uh, Starhorn and TSM is that they kind of target the weak point in Wild Turtles laning phase. I see Uzi kind of getting huge out of the lane here. And as much as TSM has stepped it up with their other members, I think they're just not going to be used to the heavy, aggressive, skirmishing style of Royal. There aren't that many teams that play like they do, and I think they'll have an edge. Yeah, between the rest of the table, TSM, TPA, Royal Club, is yep. there any differences on your side? Which two are getting out? Uh, no, for me, number one, definitely Starhorn Royal Club. UZI is basically just going to have a farm lane, both of minions and champions down there. It's going to be, honestly, I feel pretty free for him. And he can carry his team to victory almost single-handedly here. The number two team for me, though, is Team Solomid. I think they're actually quite strong individually across the board, which is good for them. Um, Taipei Assassins, to me, could finish somewhere between first and third. Like, maybe they could upset the entire group. The problem is their region is so shallow. You, It's like they have HQ and then a bunch of, like, CLGs. Like, most of the teams <laughs> that they face are not really big tests. And so you say, like, they have these really fast game times, but, like, that doesn't necessarily mean anything for, for uh, TPA here. So I don't know how strong they necessarily are. But maybe they're actually incredible and maybe they finish number one. But to me, it's SHRC number one, TSM number two, TPA number three. All right, well, first off, I'm going to get you back for that at some point. <laughs> and second of all, I'm going to counter your argument by saying TPA has been screaming Korean teams for a whole year. Uh, North American teams can only dream of going to Korea and kind of boot camping for a couple weeks, but these guys practice against Koreans all year. Yeah, but we saw how well Korean screams turn out, right? Yeah, definitely. definitely worked out. <laughs> well, like, we need to. We can't expect right, anything from the other uh, <laughs> Korean boot camps, I'm can we, right bags. before Worlds? <laughs> Let's move this one along. And even though we have the president of Puntown with us, we're going to turn to you for a bit of wacky wordplay. It's time once more for the 2014 World Championship preview show, Mad Lips. By now you know the drill. This is where we take your submissions on Twitter, drop them into a sentence that none of you guys have seen, and hopefully we end up with something funny. That's how I do puns. Remember that earlier we revealed the sentence to you guys? This team name better verb this group or they will verb all the way home. And these were our favorite responses for group B. At Fictitious Panda tweeted, TSM better hop this group or they'll flop all the way home. Yeah, a few of our analysts said they could do that. Our second one also comes from a TSM fan and says from at Coco5 says, TSM better eat this group or they'll sleep all the way home. That is how you get fed. It's true, although the weird thing is if you eat, you tend to get sleepy afterwards. So 
I don't know, we're gonna have to see. But I'm of course starting to see a trend here because our next tweet is also about TSM. At DJ Grizzy wrote, TSM better one this group or they'll be capping all the way home. Definitely not words. Now, just because your answer didn't make air this time, don't worry, we will be playing again next week with a brand new sentence. It's gonna be great. So be sure to follow at LOL Esports on Twitter and keep your eye out for the next round of World Championship Mad Libs. Yeah, and with the very first stage of World kicking off soon, let's take a look at the schedule. There are 24 games heading your way as groups A and B compete in Taiwan, beginning with a showdown between Edward Gaming and Samsung White. And we'll end the first day with Starhorn Royal Club taking on Team Solo Mid. It's going to be some great games, but Friday's matches will also come the day after with TPA versus SK Gaming at the beginning, and they're going to end with Edward Gaming going up against AHQ Esports Club. Yeah, day three will see TPA taking on TSM, and our analysts predicted that one of those two teams will join Royal Club in the quarterfinals. This might be the match that determines it. It'll be great, and of course that same match that began the Taipei group stage will end it as Samsung White faces Edward Gaming once again. And remember, those matches all start at 5 p.m. local time, which is 11 a.m. Central European summertime and 2 a.m. Pacific. So we have seen the schedule, we have talked about the teams. I very quickly want to go down the line and find out which head-to-head -head matchup are you most excited for in this stage and why. Taipei Assassins versus Team Solo Mid. I think the winner is going to the quarterfinals and that's pretty darn important. Yeah, big game. Um, Team Solo Mid against Royal Club. I'm either gonna look really smart or really stupid. And I hope it's the former. <laughs> uh, for me, it's EDG versus Samsung White. It's the best team in China versus potentially the best team in Korea. And it's just the battle of the two Goliaths. Yeah, I got to agree with, with Peter here. I got to take EDG versus White as well. I think if any team has a legitimate shot at dethroning the Koreans in this tournament, it's EDG and it begins now. All right, well, we're nearly ready to close things out, but we can't leave without hearing from Riv and Jet once more. Thanks, Trevor. And this is the venue, the National Taiwan University Sports Center, where eight of the best teams from around the world will be competing to get out of the group stages on Thursday. And as you can see, there's still plenty going on here. Riv and I actually have to head inside for rehearsal because the World Championship starts in about 12 hours. That's right, lots to do. So take care, guys. We'll see you on Thursday. Let's go. Thank you guys very much. We will see you for day one of the 2014 World Championship, which kicks off in roughly 12 hours. So unless people are watching the special encore presentation of this show, in which case we're about five minutes away from the first game. So one of the two. Yeah, well, whether you are watching our initial airing or the second presentation, that about does it for the group stage one world preview show. But before we go, we are very excited to debut the brand new 2014 World Championship anthem. It's a collaboration between Riot's music team and Imagine Dragons. Our preview show's last hit will now be your first hit of Worlds, and here it is, the premiere of Warriors. As a child, you would wait and watch for far away. But you always knew that you'd be the one to work while they all play And you, you'd lay awake at night and scheme Of all the things that you would change But it was just a dream
Hello everyone and welcome to the 2014 League of Legends World Championship. For the last 10 months, teams from around the globe have been fighting simply to make it this far. You are currently looking live at the National Taiwan University Sports Center. The greatest League of Legends players in the world have come to prove themselves. It's AHQ Esports Club entering the venue. Starhorn Royal Club in their ready room, getting themselves sorted for the day. And of course, the hometown favorites, the Taipei Assassins, heading in with all of their gear. There are 16 teams that have risen through the ranks, and today, eight of them will continue their quest for the Summoner's Cup and the title of World Champions. I am Trevor Quickshard Henry, and joining me here on the Analyst Desk are some of the top minds from League of Legends. Starting with Evil Geniuses, Mitch, Crepo, Force Pulse, Team Dignitas, Alberto, Crumbs, Renjifo, welcome to the desk. Next up is, of course, on Game Net Caster, Christopher Monte Cristo Michaels, and the President Punster of North American LCS, David Freak. Turley, it's great to have you guys here. Thank you for joining us. Now, our tournament begins today in Taipei, where the first eight teams in both groups A and B will compete through September 21st for a chance to survive and advance towards a shot at the Summoner's Cup. Then we'll head to Singapore, where the second set of teams from Group C and D will play their matches at the Singapore Expo on September 25th through to the 28th. The top two teams from each group will advance to the quarterfinals in Busan, Korea. And those eight teams will go head-to-head -head in the Bexco Auditorium October 3rd through October 6th. The action will then shift to Seoul, Korea with four teams in the semifinals at the Olympic Gymnastics Arena on October 11th and 12th. And all of that leads up to the 2014 World Championship match, which will take place in the Sangam World Cup Stadium on October 19th as the last two teams standing will battle for this year's Summoner's Cup. Now, we are both proud and honored that this 2014 World Championship will be broadcast around the globe in 16 different languages with over 24 different broadcast partners. So the term Worlds is ridiculously appropriate. Over the next four weeks, we'll be seeing former world champion TPA player Mistake, along with Remember, casting for the Garena Premier League. That's going to be covering uh, Southeast Asia and Taiwan, along with the casters from China's Tencent League of Legends Pro League, and of course, coverage from Korea's on Game Net. We, of course, have our own team on the ground in Taipei to bring you all of the action. So let's actually send it over to the caster desk for a preview of today's matches. Hello everyone, I am Riving the III and making up our caster Trinity Force is Lee D. Man Smith and Joshua Jat Leesman. Yeah, and this is just so crazy. We've been waiting the entire year for the World Championships to start and it's finally here. Plus, it's the middle of the day, so it's a little bright. It'll get darker as we get later <laughs> yep. in the day, but we got six games now to play. Yeah, we have got a jam-packed day to kick off our World Championships. Of course, it is starting out with China's number one seed, Edward Gaming, versus Korea's Samsung White. And that's going to be followed by North America's summer champions, Team Solomid, taking on Europe's SK Gaming. That's right, D-Man. After that, two teams make their world's debut with Dark Passage from Turkey versus the GPL's AHQ Esports Club. Then, one of the home teams Teams will head to the stage as the Taipei Assassins face China's Starhorn Royal Club. And in our final two matches, AHQ will take on Samsung White and Starhorn Royal Club will face off against Team Solo Mid. Yeah, it's going to be amazing stuff. For now, though, we're going to send it over to Shox at the Interview Lounge for some initial thoughts on today's games. Thank you very much, D-Man, and hello everyone, I'm Efe Shogs of Porter, joined here at the Interview Lounge by Sam Kobe hartman Kenzel and Martin DeFischio Lunga. Now guys, anticipation is running high, and I have to ask, what are you guys most looking forward to today, Kobe? Well, it's got to be the very first game coming up here. Edward Gaming, the number one seed coming out of China, versus Samsung White, quite possibly the strongest team coming into the entire tournament. And with the way that Ozone performed last year in group stages, I expect them to come out of the gate swinging here right from the beginning should be one of the most exciting matches of the entire group. Totally yeah. agree, Martin. I mean, have to agree, of course. Game 1 is going to be insane. Game 2, SK Gaming, new. Jungler now, Gilius, what can you do on the big stage? I mean, the guys coming from Challenger scene, two worlds instantly, and SK Gaming, they have to perform. Playing TSM here, Europe against NA, it's going to start already. And then I'm also looking at TPA against Starhorn Royal Club. I mean, TPA, they're playing here, the home crowd. 
And if they can actually manage to survive the early game, I believe they do have a chance to win, and uh, it would be pretty awesome if they did. Very interesting. Well, we will be catching up with the pros throughout the day to get the inside story on every explosive match. But for now, let's send things back over to the guys at the analyst desk. Thank you very much, Sharks and crew. The 2014 World Championship is bringing together teams and players from around the world. I wouldn't mind asking you guys to give me some insight into some of the regional strengths and the differences between the teams taking part. Crumbs, you're the new kid on the block, so tell me your thoughts. Well, we have Europe coming in as more of a dark horse. The last time they played, we saw them play at Gamescom mid-August, so it's been a while. And really, the only time we've seen these players play is in the North Korea, in the Korean solo queue ladder, along with the North American teams. Now, they've been doing excellently in these. They've achieved master level, challenger level, which makes me think perhaps the mechanical difference between the North American and European teams with the Koreans just aren't, isn't there. They're, they're both able to play at the same level. Yeah, I think that we have seen a lot of uh, teams and players mechanically catching up to uh, to the Koreans. And, you know, that's not the big difference between the teams a lot of the time. We do have exceptional uh, mechanical players in the West as well as in Asia. But it's that team play element, right? It's that depth of strategic knowledge, the vision control. That's what really differenti differentiates the, uh, the Korean teams from everybody else. Yeah, and I'm just looking forward to how these Western teams have been adapting to scrims in Korea. Uh, I've been there in 2012 when we were there. Initially, we lost all our scrims. But after a week, you really start learning, you start adapting to their play style. And yeah, as you said, mechanically, maybe they're not exactly on the same level, but they're close enough for where it matters. But they can just learn a lot about the macro level strategy of these uh, Korean teams. And then one point in particular that I want to see is how fast are those Korean top laners going to be teleporting down? Because when I play bot lane and I'm in a skirmish, it takes me about 10 seconds once we start fighting. Once they get low, like, hey, we can get our top laner in here. When I watch Korean League, they're in there, like, in an instant. And I just, I'm just, i so surprised how quick they react. There's very few TP cancels as well. So I'm really looking forward to those top laners interacting with their bottom lane through the teleports or even just mid lane. And I'm actually more interested myself in seeing how the various regions do interact. I actually want to see more regional differences because I, I agree, especially with Monte Cristo, the Koreans are generally a step ahead, especially strategically. So I want to see teams kind of forget that element of the game, rely on the fact that they're going to be mechanically about equal, and play a different type of game. Play a more early game, aggressive game, try to win your lane. We've got amazing Western players like Bjergsen and Froggen who can just crush people who are so darn good individually. Use that snowball elite, play a 20-minute and then fall off team comp to get some of these upset wins. I think that's the way you beat the heavy favorites in the Korean teams. Well, definitely a risky strategy. We will see sure. if that pays out for them. If you guys at home do want to get on any last minute studying, make sure you head over to lolesports.com. That's where you can find interviews, stats, VODs of their previous matches, and much more. You can also find a complete schedule for this week and vote for the teams that you think will win. So log on and put your predictive powers to the test because we will be testing our analysts later in the day. We would also like you to tap uh, your collective brain power on Twitter. Today we'd like you to tell us how do you worlds. So for this, we like some visuals from you as well. The World Championship is bringing fans together around the world. And we want to see how you're enjoying those games. Here you can see how the casters are doing it at their desk in the venue in Taiwan during rehearsal. Here's how we will worlds from the analyst desk, where you can see Prolly and Doublelift, who will be joining us as guest analysts later in the week. And we want you to share with us and your friends and see how you're enjoying the games. Tweet your pictures to us at LOL Esports. Use that hashtag worlds. Now, let's check in on the opening ceremonies at the National Taiwan University Stadium as we begin the 2014 World Championship. As we head over to the venue, you will be hearing professional esports broadcaster Lee Chen, aka Peppers. She is from Taiwan. She'll be uh, talking us through these shots from across Taipei. We'll be getting the rest of the analysts to join in on the conversation a little later. It's one of my favorite things about esports is how global it is. A really, really beautiful footage from around Taipei and Taiwan. Of course, this is going to be AHQ taking to the stage. Yeah, I've been in Taiwan before and the crowd goes absolutely bonkers. This guy right here, Westdoor, that's who I want to see. He used to play on the NA ladder, widely popular here. That's what I want to see him perform. Don't forget, you've got the home crowd advantage from them as well, so I think SCA team's going to show up. Yeah, definitely. This is, of course, Dark Passage from International Wildcard, qualifying from Turkey. Holy Phoenix is their star. They want to see if they can get him to play. And I just like Fat Fabulous because he's called Fat Fabulous. Great name. 
I think this is one of the teams as well where they've got to rely on trying to make individual plays. Maybe they can make some uh, some games happen. I I that's it. definitely the case. We are taking a look, of course, at Samsung White from On Game Net Champions from Korea. Probably the favorites for the tournament, really. You know, people very a lot of faith in the team. I know Krepa is looking forward to seeing Mata play. I want to get schooled. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we are going to be looking at the number one seed from the LPL from China, Edward Gaming. Name, Name definitely the star on that squad. Oh, sure. And they are built around him. It's a lot of raise the AD carry making crash. And we'll see. I think Name is worth all the hype, though. He can bring the team far. First time international stage. You never know. You never know. Yeah, and th there is a real chance that he doesn't show up today, but well, we I don't think it's going <laughs> Well, we transition to Group B. This is, of course, SK Gaming. That's actually the sports psychologist just giving in right to the hype. Bit. One of the only teams that's really gone that sort of professional route. Freddy, widely regarded as one of, if not the best top laner from Europe. He's a chalk caller too. He's actually really important in this roster. Oh, that's for sure. Always keeps his cool. All right, next up from the LPL. Season 3 finalist, as far as the franchise is concerned, it is Starhorn Royal Club. But only Uzi, not UZI. Much confusion has been had regarding his name. <laughs> it's not an Uzi name to say, after all. <laughs> oh no, too early in the day for puns, freak. Wow. Two in the morning, I start quick. <laughs> of course, you got uh, number one seed from the North American LCS. TSM. TSM, as Crepo likes to say. Believing in Apple Pie. TSM calling him to make it out the groups for Crepo. better not let me down. Else I'm going to look really dumb. If I recall, prediction game at Worlds last year didn't go well for you. Also did. <laughs> also I did. I'm in, did. I'm in an upwards position. Right now. And of course, representing Garena Premier League, Season 2 World Champions, missed last year, and have returned. It is the Taipei Assassins. I imagine this crowd is going to lose it when they take time. I can't wait to hear the crowd, man. We played a show match with them one day in Taiwan, and it was absolutely insane. Really cool crowd. Uh, we will see. We watched those GPL finals. The team looked fantastic. Just a few crowd shots, of course, just before we head back into the radio. Players are taking the stage. There are very, very few words that can truly encapsulate the feeling of being on that stage, being in that auditorium, and the pressure that is on these guys' shoulders. World Championships, it starts right now. Before we get to the games, I do want to go down the line, ask you guys some opinions that myself and the viewers can actually start to learn from this first stage of games in group stage uh, one in Taipei. Let's talk about what we're going to learn, talk about what we can understand for the rest of the World Championship. Once again, Krams, you're on my hit list. Start us off. Now, the match to watch is going to be EDG versus Samsung White. We got the number one seed from China playing against the number two seed from Korea, which is arguably the better team and possibly the best team in the world right now. These two teams will give us a really good understanding as to how China stacks up against Korea and from that since both of these teams are highly highly favored to win the whole thing this could be a final match to watch right in the first game it's true, and I do think that the Korean teams are absolutely incredible, especially teams like Samsung White, but I'm actually really interested in seeing what the two Taiwanese teams are going to bring out here, because I think uh, the GPL is sort of underrepresented. Again, in Season 2, TPA won the whole thing. No one thought they would. They were a huge underdog there. And then last year, we had Mineski and Game Bear show up, who were gigantic underdogs that didn't win a single game, and it <clears throat> kind of undersold the region. But AHQ and TPA are much better than I think people are giving them credit for, and they're going to turn some heads. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, just from seeing TPA scrim over the last couple of months, you have to remember they brought in a Korean coach from Najin, and they've just been getting better and better and better. They had a very clean sweep in the GPL finals, and I'm excited to see them, especially with the home crowd behind them. That could really be the key to win in a very close group. 
Something I'm going to pay close attention to is just vision control in general. It is no longer like last year that you can just buy an oracle and just start sweeping the map. Vision control is a lot more methodical, especially with supports. Are they going to do Moby Boots early? Are they going to play like the Koreans? Are we going to see deep wards? Are people going to play with fewer or more wards? How are they going to play around those wards? That's something I'm going to pay a lot of attention to in the games. And I just want to see how far Korean is ahead in terms of macro level strategy and vision control. Yeah, it's actually really interesting. This is the first world championship with trinkets. I know we're all used to it playing in the game, but... It was less than a year ago those things got added to the game, so it is a very different game from last year. Yep. Well, we'll definitely see how that pans out. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, we are gearing up for that first match of the day, and of course it will be Edward Gaming from China taking on Samsung White. You can actually see Edward Gaming studying up, doing some last-minute VOD review. Samsung White making sure their mechanical ability is up to scratch. So see, we will see if they deliver. These two teams will go head to head when we come back. So guys, stay with us. It's going to be a short ad break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the 2014 League of Legends World Championship. We're kicking off our group stage with a hotly anticipated matchup where China's Edward Gaming faces Korea's Samsung White. These are far and away the two favorite teams in the group, and Edward Gaming is LPL's number one seed after they took the spring and summer split and won the regional final. They are considered to be a super team with an origin story that's not unlike the European LCS Team Alliance. I would also say they play like a non-stereotypical Chinese team. I think they're very intelligent about the way they play. And I'd like to ask Monte Cristo your thoughts and opinion on Edward Gaming. Uh, yeah, they, they really play a lot more like the Korean teams. I know a lot of the Chinese analysts like to call them Baby Blue in reference to Samsung Blue's kind of positional focused AD carry where they have deft. The emphasis on kind of a slow build up and then ending the game with impressive team fighting skills. So. They're a lot different than the more skirmish-oriented playmaking style of a team like Starhorn Royal Club. So there's a lot of diversity now in strategy in the Chinese scene that we're seeing. And honestly, I still think, though, that Samsung White has a bit of an edge here because I think they match everywhere so darn well. Now, the one thing Edward does have, though, is Name, an incredibly strong AD carry, and him and FCZF are going to do whatever they can in the duo lane. But I really, really want to see how that matches up against Imp and Mata because those guys are incredible as well. If Edward wins, Name goes off. Whether Name plays an aggressive early game laner to bully or he gets hyper fed on someone like Kogma, we have to see. Yeah, we will find it. I'm happy you bring up Samsung White. They, of course, the number two seed from Korea. We keep saying this, we will continue saying it. Many view them as the strongest team in their region. This is the second trip to Worlds. Last year they played as uh, Samsung Ozone, but they have made a notable change. It is a new mid laner, and they appear to be significantly stronger than last year. Yeah, Pawn is a very solid mid lane player, and I think that this roster swap, uh, one of the coaches said in an interview a while back that switching Pawn and Dade, the intention was to get both teams to Worlds. Uh, he was a little bit of a more rookie player at the time, and so he kind of fell in line behind the shot calling from Dandy and Mata, the more playmaking players, whereas Dade fit very nicely into Blue as a playmaking mid laner, and that kind of gave Blue the spark they needed to be successful. Yeah, and of course, we're going to talk about the jungle Dandy. Uh, probably the strongest jungler here at the tournament. Crumbs, as a jungler yourself, talk to me about what your thoughts on the player. Now, Dandy has been in the scene for quite a while, and he's been consistent all throughout. He's been playing Lee Sin, Evelyn, and Lee's all the meta champions for a while, and Korea is one of the few regions that's able to bring out Rengar as well. So he's got in his, that in his champion pool, and he's the only player in the entire world that's still playing Evelyn after she got nerfed, which adds quite a bit of a surprise factor. I just want to see how you or Unstoppable uh, holds up against Pawn because I don't think I think that matchup is going to be very slanted. And uh, as Crumb said, Dandy, if it's not already slanted, then Dandy will slant it for them. And then in the bot lane, yeah, sure, Nami is a really good AD carry, but Mata is just uh, complete ranks above SCZF, so it's going to be really tough for EDG to just outmatch uh, their enemies because in roll for roll or, or lane for lane at least, they're at least tied if not better. I, I do think we are underselling clear level a little bit, though. He has incredibly high kill participation. He actually ganks incredibly well. And I know Dandy's a player who likes to get in his opponent's head and try to understand what his opponent is going to do. Maybe that happens here, but I don't want to count out clear level. I think he can also get his lanes going and get that early game that I think Edward needs to get here. Well, I like the fact we've got a little bit of differing opinions on the players. Let's see if it actually shows true in the predictions. Wouldn't be an analyst desk without that prediction game, so I'm going to be putting these guys on the spot, and I want to know legitimately who you think will be winning this matchup. Let's run this one down the line. Crepo, 
Who's going away with the W? Yeah, pretty much what I said already. Like White's gonna win this. I think lane for lane, as I said before, they just they're gonna outclass their opponents. And then even in terms of just macro level strategy, their vision control will be better. Um, Edward Kamen's had decent vision control, but I mean White is just yeah, it's White. You know they're gonna win this. Crumbs. I think White is gonna win it as well. You know when it comes to the methodical Korean playstyle compared to a little bit more chaotic, even though EDG is not that chaotic to the chaotic Chinese style. I pick the brain over the brong. <laughs> Yeah. Or the <laughs> <laughs> yes. Monte Cristo. How do I follow that up? No, I I got to go with uh, Samsung White as well. I do think EDG is a very strong team. And because if both teams make it out, they'll be placed on opposite sides of the bracket. We're looking at a possible preview of the World Finals here as well, it, potentially. Well, we'll find out. Freaked, final thoughts. So I definitely think Samsung, Samsung White is going to win this game. Uh, I agree with kind of all the comments here where they seem to be a little bit better everywhere. But sometimes the X Factor comes in and, you know, Edward could make that play. But yes, down the line, I think Samsung White is better strategically and a little bit better in every single Role. Well, you guys at home have heard what our analysts are picking. Let's see who you chose to come away with a victory in this first game. Over on lolesports.com, 80% of you say that Samsung White will take the first win. It's heavy favorites for sure. Now, despite the fact Edward Gaming is heading into Worlds as the number one team from China, they are their own biggest critics as they prepare for the competition. <laughs> Dollar 然后打赢了 训练的话，因为韩服之前的版本就过不快嘛，现在过不也跟上了嘛，然后就会先去研究一些视频和必须的顺序和选择，然后再根据队伍队员的打法和性格，对我的风格，然后筛选一些英雄和一些打法的元素
you know, control on the world stage and, you know, not give it your all. I think maybe once you're at that incredible high level of skill, you're able to do it. But honestly, when you, when these guys are up there, they're not really thinking. They're just playing instinctively, right? They already know exactly what to do. So holding back on something that's pretty much hardwired into how you work is pretty difficult. But I mean, there, there's there's a good consensus of what the metagame is right now. They can just play just play standard metagame and just duke it out against each other and see where their flaws are. That doesn't mean they don't have to reveal any new strategies, any new picks, because there's plenty yeah. of champions that are just overly played everywhere. And I think that's what we're going to see the first game. Well, we are about to find out. Thank you very much, guys. We're going to hand things over to the casters to take us into the game between the top team from China versus the perceived top team from Korea. Guys, take it away. Thank you very much, Trevor. And let's check out the starting lineups as we get right into this match. I think we're all ready here. We've been waiting an entire season to get to this. On the blue side, it's LPL's Edward Gaming. In the top lane, it is Koro. Jungling is going to be Clear Love. In mid, it's you for Unstoppable. AD Carry is Name, and supporting him is FZZF. And over on the red side, representing Korea as the champions, it is, of course, Samsung White. In the top lane, making a return is Looper. Dandy is in the jungle. Pawn in the mid lane. Imp is the AD carry. And Mata on support. And the biggest thing that I noticed when prepping for these two teams is how they don't actually share very similar champion pools. They're actually much different than many teams here. The jungle in particular, Jarvan the four for Clear Love is actually by far and away his most picked. Obviously the Rengar is a shared pick because it was banned heavily against EDG and it's the main pick for Danny. But outside of that, the other roles don't have many overlapping champions as well as far as their main roles. Yeah, and speaking of bans, of course, you gotta look towards EDG. Banned Yasuo 31 yeah. times throughout the summer and the playoffs. Of course, that is against yeah. a lot of Chinese mid laners. Yasuo is a big threat there. Pawn, not so much. Exactly. It's kind of the wrong Samsung if you're looking for a Yasuo player. Pawn and you are actually two players that are completely versatile in the champions they pick, but they will still trend towards more passive mid laners. Pawn, because he generally just waits for Dandy to set things up and you because he's just a passive player and that's EDG's strategy. <laughs> but of course, yet again. Obviously, the Yasuo getting taken out. EDG liking to play that slow game, so they don't want any Yasuos jumping in on their own engages. And something we should talk about, obviously, is a big thing. The Twitch ban in there. AD carries, you know, we talked about Name versus Imp. Of course, we heard Monte Cristo talking about it in the preview show. This is a big, big battle. We've got yeah. to see which one they're going to go with here. Where's the Alistair in the Maokai ban? Is what I'm wondering, because we were thinking that White was probably going to ban those away to keep them away from Coral. Coral doesn't actually play those champions very frequently, at least the Alistair, but that's because it's banned all the time. Right. They actually ban it themselves. So good scouting by White there, seeing that Coral and FCZF aren't going to be playing the Alistair, but still, that was a little dicey. If we do see the Maokai come through, and I think it may well be first pick, it could be an AD carry first pick, but he has got Jana five ben. wins on it. Jana, of wow. course, FCZF did play that throughout the uh, playoffs, and there is the Instalock Maokai. Five games, five wins of for course. Koro. Yeah. We'll see how it works out for him. Absolutely undefeated. But they're trading picks in that sense. I guess there's so much Whoa. up right now. Remember, there's a Twitch ban. Kog'Maw is still available. I'd expect EDG to take it on this rotation. Zillion is a super, super, super high tier pick for certain teams. And I guess White was able to lock that down. Looking at that pickup, Clear Love loving Kha'Zix. Dandy takes that right away. Gonna be a great pickup for him. Versatile pick as well because we don't know whether yep. that's a support or mid lane Zillion. We could see it on Pawn. It has been rising to the prominence, but Name going for it in the bottom lane. It is gonna be that Lucian. We thought that may be one of the primary picks for the AD carries and of course, Looks like he's going to be responding with a Tristan. Yeah, this has blown me away a little bit. Obviously, these are still high tier picks, but I was expecting a Kog'Maw from EDG. Lucian is very much Whoa. more about winning the lanes here. And so, all right. All right, Let's that do changes it. everything. This changes many things. It's not something Looper has, been, has played, but it's something he has been training. It's something that yes. has been coming up huge, especially in Korean solo queue. You see a ton of Rumble playing around as far as the lane matchup goes, he can't touch a Maokai. He casts so many spells just to keep his overheat going. The Maokai is <laughs> going to be healing like crazy. But as far as team fight damage goes, it is absolutely off the charts. And that's exactly what Samsung White loves to do. Get into those team fights. And they're going to have to try and get past the Oriano. We're going to see a lot of that throughout World. It's going to be picked up by Unstoppable this time in the mid lane. And that Jarvan pickup still coming through for EDG. Yeah, absolutely. You talked about it yeah. at the start. It is something 
that he's very comfortable on Clear Love, of course. This is the return to the World Championship for Clear Love is here in Season 2. But it does look like it is going to be, well, Nami. We expected wow. to see it a lot earlier in the picks and bands. It's yep. got snuck through all the way to the end for Mata. Yeah, well, one interesting thing is the team with Nami doesn't play Nami very frequently. <laughs> they usually let the other team get it every time. It would not surprise oh, me if we were able to see the Nami on the other side right here. It fits in well with counter gauge, which is what you want against a team like EDG. Even though EDG is a slower, more methodical Chinese team, they still turn it on. When they have Maokai and Jarvan, they are very much about an all-in engage. And if they're running that into a tidal wave, plus an equalizer from Rumble, it is a whole bunch of pain. Great counter coming out from that Samsung White, as you say, within those fights. An EDG number one team coming out of China, only brought up in February, have pretty much combined a super team, if you will, and have gotten themselves here now to face what people think is the number one team in the world right now. This is going to be an amazing matchup. Yeah, I mean, of course, if viewers that are watching that are not sure of about the Chinese scene, but just basically think of EDG as the alliance that came together back yeah. in the start of the spring and suddenly won everything. Of course, Alliance didn't quite do that in the spring. <laughs> but nevertheless, they have been dominant. They've dominated the Chinese scene. It is, a, This is an official proper challenge to Samsung White. Samsung White is the team that everybody, honestly, in this tournament perceives as the best team entering, yeah. despite the fact they are the number two seed for Korea. Yeah, but it's for good reason. Mm. Everyone fears them because they play against them in scrims, and they're really the team that doesn't have a major weakness. You can see that with their pick and ban, they can adapt to almost any situation, and here they're going for a lot of counter engage. Well, let's see if EDG can find a weakness on them in the late game as the players load into this one. Let's let us let, let's think how, or see how you are voting on this first match of the World Championship. Tweet EDG win or SS win to at LOL Esports. We will be checking in to see where the fan vote stands shortly. Mouthful of words. <laughs> yeah, of course you can see. This is one thing I wanted to notice, actually, going back to the picks, is yeah. Dandy. Dandy on Kha'Zix. It's a champion. Yeah. He only played once throughout the uh, summer of, of the champions. It's definitely a takeaway. But it used to be Rango. Rango was on the table. Yeah, we do have to remember, obviously, that it's been a long time since we've seen these guys play. Yeah. Rengar is not the same power he was, and Kazakh is much more popular. All right, gentlemen, we are on to the Rift. This is what everybody has been waiting for. And from Group A, we get the top two teams to start off the World Championship group stage. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. EDG starting out, of course, as the blue team. This is a round robin group phase. Group A, Group B, Group C, and Group D, of course, will be played over in Singapore. It's all about A and B right now. They will play each other twice, but that will be in three days' time. EDG will face the final match, actually, here in Taipei. Well, they'll face Samsung White. This is really a big tell. We talked about it, obviously, Monte Cristo and the crew on the analyst there talked about This is a potential final. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. These teams are both incredibly strong. EDG as well. Whether or not they're telling the truth, they said that they're not really preparing for Samsung White in the group stage because they are confident in their ability to make it out regardless and are getting a head start on preparing for their semi-final or quarter-final opponents. That's how confident they are in getting out of group. But uh, yeah, this opening right now is fairly passive from both sides. Nobody wants to give up that first leg. No advantage to either team here as we start. Looking at a little bit of the inventories, normal there as well. So it looks like no tricks up the sleeves here, D-Man. So I want to get into the Rumble. The Rumble in the top lane. He's obviously up against the Maokai. Maokai's been incredibly strong. We did see SK Telecom pull out Rumble once throughout the uh, qualifiers. Of course, it was the one game they won, was very successful, and of course, used to be a champion heavily played in Korea back in Season 3. Absolutely. But it's been a long time since we saw this. I mean, if we even think game. back to the All-Star game in 2013, we saw PDD's Rumble absolutely oh. wrecking that tournament. Yeah. It's not like anyone is shy for Rumble, it's just that he's been gone for quite a long time from the competitive scene, and a player like Looper commanding Rumble actually makes me think he's more of just trying to withstand the lane, obviously make teleport plays, but he's there to counter EDG's playstyle as much as possible and make it difficult to be dived upon in team fights. And those teleport plays are what brought Looper into the scene last year at Worlds. And if you think about the long range of Equalizer, even if he's late on these teleports, he's still going to be able to participate. It's going to be such an amazing world. This is such a great first game because remember, the Samsung White team has four out of five returning members from Samsung Ozone. And those guys didn't make it out of group stage. So this is a big moment for them and they are not going to underestimate or underperform in this group stage by their own admission. Speaking of big moments, the bottom lane. 
That is really what the focus is, especially for Edward Gaming. Name has to get going. He is the man that will keep the team rolling and up against Impa Mata. This is really a big test. It is a absolutely massive test because that is the lane that if it doesn't go well, every other lane is supposed to lose for EDG based on the scouting report. It's because Dandy is famed for his jungle routes and his gank paths. However, he actually got spotted out by a ward here, so he is vulnerable to a clear love collapse or counter gank here. That's what they're trying to set up. Yeah, clear love definitely ready for that one. As we look back to the bottom lane here, we we're talking a little bit about Samsung when they were Ozone, mentioning that very overconfident last year, and Imp is quoted mm -hmm. being saying, that's not going to happen again. Well, as far as bottom lanes go, Imp and Mata are the most aggressive 2v2 bottom lane pretty much in Korea. And Name isn't actually an incredibly aggressive AD carry. If you compared him with an Uzi from Starhorn Royal Club, he is nowhere near the same level of aggression, but above and beyond in consistency. Well, going along with well, how all the way around generally play you've got to wonder you know with the Lucian in there how it's going to handle in the late game of course we know Tristan is going to be strong he's going to get out of this one fairly straightforward just quickly defensive ball meanwhile oh. down the bottom the hooking straight in Imp could be going down a nope actually they're going to turn away Nami took a lot of early damage there actually and Imp was totally safe it was a completely one trade by White right there still a full mana pool on Nami and able to sustain up that harass on Nami is going to stick and we actually saw Dandy there, a jungler to prep his ganks quite a bit, and he even wanted a return on that lane, went all the way around. Yeah, I was actually a little bit surprised there that he put so much investment into that gank and then to not even get a positive result. EDG has actually done a very good job so far to withstand Dandy's presence so far, uh, especially you in the mid lane, out farming despite about a minute of time being spent by Dandy, both on one side of the mid lane and the other. Speaking of pressure, we do see Koro going back. He's gone for a second Thorns Ring, so not going to be getting in towards that Rod of Ages as quick as I feel it'd like. It is going to delay his build for a while, but a lot of Pink Ward's starting to pop in here. Potentially, we could be seeing EDG making, maybe making a play for Dragon in a few minutes. They are a slow team, but they're not afraid to make moves. Definitely able to go for these early game objectives. Yeah, one of the biggest questions that I had coming into this one was whether EDG could enter into a team fight phase without being terribly far behind. Something that Samsung White does in their victories, especially in Korea, is they absolutely demolish people. Actually, in victories, they average 15 more kills than their opponent, which is the highest mark of every team in champions, including playoffs. They demolish people when they're getting ahead, and that always starts in the laning phase. So EDG, with a slightly slower style, is doing well to be even in gold here at six minutes. We'll see what they can do to build around Name. Usually EDG's focus throughout these games. He'll be able to stay on the backside here as they now get a bit of aggression towards their side of the lane. Clear Love not going to get anything out of this just yet. Junglers staying on par with each other as the pink wards come out early. And we're going to see that haunting guy still for Rumble. Honestly, I am very impressed so far with EDG's vision control here. They're actually the team that's had more pertinent wards up on the map, and it may be restricting Samsung White's ability here. Obviously, Dandy was caught by that ward early on. There were multiple pink wards and sweepers bought early for EDG, and they're setting themselves up for some nice plays here. Yeah, nice hook. Death sentence onto him. Didn't really come too much of it, though, and they're just pressuring them onto the tower right now. Of course, we also saw in that mid lane, you was pressuring Pawn. Pawn going back to buy, making his first trip back, comes out with that tier of the goddess. Necrotron Cloak as well. He's going to make his first back as well. Expect to see probably the buildings of an Athens and Holy Grail on there. There you go. Chalice comes popping in. And we'll see how it builds from there. Big advantage in terms of CS already, though. And this is huge for Dandy. Level 6 to a level 4 clear love right now. He can already start tearing people's faces off, as we heard in the Black Anola patches. This game actually Ooh. sets up for a very dangerous dragon fight if Samsung White wants to force it. Rumble, Zilli, and Kha'Zix all at level 6 have much more powerful power spikes than you will get from EDG's side. However, they're still not really forcing those things. Just check out the ward coverage from Samsung White. Nothing in that dragon area. And if I know one thing about watching Korean teams, they almost always ward before they look to set up a play. So as they move wards into dragon is when we can expect them to start respecting it as an actual objective to take right now. That pink ward could be the beginning. Yeah, that blue buff, it looks like it's going to be taken and given to you. We saw Danny making a slight move there. He's also heading up towards the top. Looper under a little bit of pressure here. Koro 
feeling confident, trying to delay him as long as he can here. Danny gonna make his move, this is but bad. this is very, very low. Koro's gonna flash away from this one. Lupus gonna keep on chasing. Looks like he should be able to get away if they can lock him up. Pod comes steaming in. They're Thank gonna lock on towards him. This could be the first blood of the world championships. Danny pounces in, and there it is. Wow. The jungler takes it. Even though they get the first blood, that is a massive investment, D-Man, right there. EG, because there's no ward covered as well from Samsung White, you can tell they did not care about that as an objective. And it is basically a trade. First blood be damned. Dandy gets himself some good gold on that kill, but EDG is picking up a lot. And now to deny blue as well. Not going to hurt Pond too much, but they are going to go ahead and do the same. Both teams having the inkling to keep themselves in this one. Ooh, Dandy actually, very important thing right there. Ooh. Accidentally took the red buff, the blue buff with his red. Oh, FC's the oh, that's very terrible. caught out here. Nami trying to do what he can and put up a shield for his teammate with damage. And Nami's able to force them off as he grabs the culling just in time. Wow, great teleport cancel there at the last second by Looper. If he actually went in on that one, he would have been in the hole he blowed to trouble because EDG was collapsing very well. Another thing about these teams that they do spectacularly well is make every skirmish into a team fight because they're almost immediately collapsing anytime somebody is in danger. Koro sneaking through unseen in that top half of the jungle. Will get himself a ward down on the red ball. Back down the bottom. Explosive wow. damage back and forth. Nami taking a big blow. Oh! Death Set just lands on towards him. The wave comes riding through along with the Aqua Prison on Nami. Taken very low. Has to back away from this one. Mana bounces it. Mana gets it. Fantastic flash there. And great play from the bottom lane. If Imp and Mana win that 2v2, it is disaster for EDG. Nami took so much poke from Imp, using his ultimate preemptively, and then Getting hooked was just a bait for EDG to fly in there. Name falling in lane is not expected. Very, very big. He talks a lot about confidence, and it comes from knowing that he can beat his opponents. Now, that might put a little crutch on that. He did say in his interview that Imp, of all the players at the World Championship, was the player he wanted to play against the most. Well, he just died. <laughs> he certainly did. I was about to say this game is, you know, starting off slow as you would expect in a tournament right. play because this is the very first game of the World Championships. Absolutely nobody wants to lose that game. Mm -mm. Of course, we're going to have SKTSN. That's going to be a tense affair coming up after this one. But right now, this is, you know, this is the big, big game. Who could get that number one seed? Who will they face should they reach the playoffs? Because if you were to look at this group, these are by far the strongest teams in it. Yep. Yeah. And that number one seed is very important. But Things are definitely heating up right now. You can see still very even in gold, despite the first dragon going to EDG. I can also tell that EDG has definitely tried to change their play style against White here. Danny jumping in for Koro. Uh-oh, there's the equalizer going down. Koro's got a red carpet, but he's going to stay for the party on this one. And it's a level 8 to an 8 and a 9, and it's not going to be enough. Koro goes down. Dandy's patience paying off once again. He waited in that brush for so long, and they're going to start making a camp out of Koro. They are really trying to get Looper fed. If that rumble gets going, there will be no slowing him down. Good prediction getting that ward down in the bush. Finds himself Javan the fourth, ready and waiting in the form of Clearlove. Invade from Dandy once yeah. again. They know that Clearlove's down the bottom. Go straight in, take the jungle. And here's the big thing that's actually been keeping EDG close in overall gold, uh, but is not normal to EDG's play style. Clearlove right now has 33 CS to Dandy's 52. And he actually hasn't even ganked that much. Clearlove has spent so much time walking around the map, trying to scout, placing down wards, and really just trying to keep up with Dandy. He's never made his own plays. And he also hasn't farmed that much. Clearlove typically farms a whole bunch before setting up ganks. He will be really weak in these upcoming team fights based on how much scouting he's tried to do. Well, we saw EDG switch to sweepers so fast. We see that Samsung White now has all of theirs, but he has just been going around trying to clear things out and not getting anything after because Samsung White, as Mata has proven before, just is a god of vision towards the mid game. Currently, you can see just looking across the map, talking about vision. Yep. It is very much covered both angles. Both teams all got their coverage. Of course, EDG with a lot of pinks down the bottom. They did have them down there for that dragon earlier on. One was just swept out by Mana in there. Koro taking a lot of damage. This may be a straight up one on one right now. Looper fancies this one. His ultimate is available if he wants to pop that equalizer down. Koro already used it. Blocks him off perfectly. Koro in trouble. Looper overheated. Oh. He doesn't have enough to finish it. And Koro gets away.
by the hair on his chinny chin chin. That was ridiculous by Looper right there with the cutoff. Maybe if he placed that equalizer a little bit farther back, it would have uh -oh. been fine. Whoa, that's aggressive. Whoa, the, oh, he's going to be walking past the dark oh, path. Whoa, and that's oh. a hit from him. Big damage coming out here if he can actually get that blessing. Oh, the bubble goes down from Mata. They get him in, and it's going to be more trouble. FCZF is taking shots, and M's even going to get the reset on the tank to get out. Clear looks only here to watch. This game may be getting out of hand right here. Imp jumping over the wall right there with Trist. Obviously, Nami hadn't hit his Infinity Edge yet, but you can tell they have just sensed an opening in top lane, in bottom lane, and they're really trying to take some advantage now. Definitely getting the kills, that's for sure. That gives them that 2,000 gold advantage in the first tower of the game. will go down to Samsung White. Imp leaps back away and goes to spend a chunk of that gold. One of the only problems, I would say, is Mata's the one that's getting the kills. Hey, let's see this again. Yeah, they thought Imp had gone back to base or just had not returned to base yet, which is one of the reasons FCZF was not in position for that lantern. If he would have been farther back, they could have uh -oh. oh, oh, got a mid-team fight. The ball goes down. Shockwave's still up as they try to put it in. Oh, it's going to get a miss on that one as Dandy gets himself out quickly with the flash. But the dark passage brings it back in range, and everybody's going to get a piece of that one. The double kill coming in for Unstoppable. And they're Whoa. looking for Looper. That is a big turnaround for EDG right there. Not sure exactly how that happened, but getting their first two kills on the board nearly 14 minutes into the game. It took them a while, but now they can even this game right up. One more time on that. Yeah, I mean, this was just Dandy and Pawn getting a little over a zealous right there. Pawn CC locked so he couldn't use his chrono ship. At that point, Samsung White just has to bail. Great presence of mind there by FCZF to finish that one off with a flash. First tower of the game going down for EDG, started to turn some of their own pressure back onto Samsung White. You can tell these teams, despite what EGG said, have very much prepared for one another. EDG now in the form of three, four members all heading north. Looper's hanging around with the equalizer. That is a this bait. is a problem, because now they and FCZF come around the side. Koro takes a lot of tower hits, but he does not matter as EDG collapse on the top lane. They will take the tower as well. It's another one of these dragon trades, though, right there. Samsung White was planning for the dragon. That's where their wards moved. They moved them down to the bottom lane, meaning they fell in the top lane. It exposed Looper. He was overconfident in lane. He's typically a passive laner trying to push his advantage, and he gets baited. That is what has been amazing me. A not trade focused Looper going absolutely crazy in these fights. Samsung also with that last two deaths they took. Trying to walk into a very dark jungle, not like them. I think they're getting a little ahead of themselves. And even though Samsung White is winning this game, that was what most people expected, everything else in this game has been unexpected. <laughs> EDG has had very good vision control, sometimes sneaking through the wards of Samsung White. Imp and Mata are destroying Name and FCZF, despite Name being known and touted by many as the best AD carry in the world. They've been getting outplayed 2v2. That's not just Imp, it's because Mata is also the best support in the world by a lot of people's ratings. And it's also crazy here that Pawn is struggling a little bit on Zillion. Oriana has had her way with Zill, and you may become unstoppable this game. Oh, Dandy spotted out FCZF there. Push in there, the hook does not quite land. Are they going to time that blue buff spawn? Remember, they did take it away from them last time around. I expect it to be coming up. They've come down to the dragon. They realize it is not there. And it is, of course, that blue buff was taken away by Pawn. So EDG a little bit off in their time in there. They're trying to push out and make a play. It has left them exposed in the mid lane. We do see Name taking that turret, but look at Samsung White. They have grouped heavily to push them in. It's incredibly difficult for EDG to get in position to stop this one. They're getting trapped and cut off. This turret's going down. It has to be going down. They have so much Ooh. disengage. Even if EDG tries to get into this one, Samsung opens up the map a little bit more. Might start to push that advantage. They have good items coming out in those spikes we were talking about on both sides as the AD carries as well get those items finished. EDG grouping in the mid lane right now, trying to react a little bit slow, maybe going to try and force down the inner, but you can see the imp is off in the top lane, and this actually may be EDG's advantage. Instead, they're going to collapse around, look at them, they're trying to collapse across him, but the moment he's off in the top lane, trying to push that tower down, he's realized the danger now, he's backing off, and I think he should be safe. This is a period in the game where so much is up in the air, with so many turrets down, the vision control is incredible, Dragon's not up right now, so really, the freedom that these teams have is unmatched in any portion of the game. One thing that Clear Love is focusing on right now, I think a little bit too much actually, is vision, vision control. He was already a little under farmed on Jarvan. He went an offensive first item, and he's followed that up with a sight stone. 
he's going to be a piece of paper in these team fights. Zillion bombs, Rumble ultimates, and a Trist are going to melt Clear Love and make him ineffective come late game. And now they leave Imp in the top lane, already quite ahead of pretty much anybody as an AD carry right now, easily to farm up against Koro. Not going to be a problem there. And Dandy, he's, he can, like, Clear Love cannot catch him without boots. He's got Mobies now, and he just bought the Hex Drinker. Crazy build from him, evolving the wings, and he's ready to get into even more fights with the team. Mata beginning his vision control around the map. We'll see what EDG can do to stop this. 2K gold lead. Imp still laying in waiting. The rest of Samson White also moving off there, jumping straight into it. But you can see the lantern ready and waiting. But five members of Samson White are all making their way up on towards his top lane, and EDG are a little slow to react to this. Name still down the bottom. I think this tower is yeah. going to go. This is Samsung White's play, just a better rotation. They even out the turrets and they extend their lead. With Samsung White being so far ahead, EG, EDG is not going to get there. Play safe in lane, wait for a Baron, win game. It's not going to be that easy. Against a fully magic penned up looper on Rumble right now, and a soon to be full item pawn with the Athenes and Holy Grail and his tier, that zillion has reached a peak in power. Uh, if he could just pick up some more cooldown reduction, that's all he would need. It's a very dangerous point of the game for EDG right here. You're talking about Samsung a little bit in their vision. It looks like they've placed those pink wards a little deeper on both sides. Maybe getting ready to push their advantage a bit more. They do have two minutes on Dragon. Clear Love still trying to clear out as many wards. They have so many in such a close position, and it's not really providing them anything just yet. You know, it seems to me right now, EDG, they want to fight. They're looking for that fight, mm -hmm. but Samsung White is just avoiding them. Happily to push those objectives, you can see EDG all grouping up the mid, trying to make something out of the jungle of Samsung White. I'm not sure this is the territory they want to be pushing, though. Yeah, even though EDG is a slower team, when it's go time, they're very willing to go. Samsung White is actually pretty similar in that regard. They're ready to brawl, but mainly they want to either catch EDG without members, or they want to catch EDG over diving, which is something they're definitely prone to doing since they have no answer to Imp's split push. The instant they see Imp split pushing, I'd expect EDG to try and find a fight, but because of the immense vision control from White, that is really hard to do. Dragon's up in one minute, and the vision battle has already begun. Yeah, there's a hell of a lot of wards falling left and right. Pawn taking a lot of damage in the mid lane. Name and the rest of ADG collapsing in towards that middle turret. And that inner will go down. You can see just off of the side, though, Samsung White ready to come in from the side. Are they going to be able to react? Are they going to go for it? Because EDG, they could keep pushing. Right now, EDG has the ward control in the places that matter, but White is just doing their best to counter that with the split push, trying to take them away from their points of power. Fast Static Shiv onto Amp allows him to get here. He should be able to take that down with the well, next wave to come, but he is going to have a party here soon. Three is definitely going to be a crowd on this one, and it looks like he will get a bit of help from Looper and the rest of the team to cut off. That oh, advantage that's... catch! That Aqua Prism was crucial, but the Lantern followed through. EDG get out of dodge, and that was quick reactions. Dragon though is about to spawn in 10 yeah. seconds, and that will give Samsung White the advantage. Equalizer down, but also half of Yu's health bar White is still respecting that play a fair bit, though. They don't actually know that everyone on EDG is recalled. They need to get that Dragon down quickly. Otherwise, a bunch of full health EDG members will come back without the ultimates of Samsung White. It's smarter than to go now. Trying to make that full team play down onto Imp, and it cost him the Dragon. Samsung White able to see what was happening with all the vision they still had up in the jungle. Somehow, after EDG clearing everything out to the max. Two to three of Dragons in the game, so EDG has been able to get back somewhat. But I don't know if it's going to be enough right now. That middle turret definitely helps quite a bit, though. So the battle for wards is clearly about to begin. Obviously, there's a lot cleared out in that last moment. Baron is a potential, but not just yet. It's more a case of getting some vision down. So let's start taking a little bit of stock over the items that maybe they're picking out. You can see a whole bunch of pink wards being picked up by EDG. And they're starting to start just slightly popping towards them second items. One is the big power spike because I can see Imp has completed that static shift and infinite edge. He's going to start becoming a beastly Tristana. So EDG, they need to start quicking on the pace up here. Imp has hit his power spike. The first mid laner to hit death cap could potentially equalize that power spike. They're both working towards it. Right now, despite the 3,000 gold difference, the game is actually in a fairly close place. Uh, it, it is definitely in White's favor fairly substantially, though, because of the Trist. 
Uh, because Clear Love is unable to get gold to create tank items, and because Corbin oh. doesn't have armor yet, EDG wouldn't need a catch. But they just kind of got caught. Yeah, throwing in everything here. Whoa, Pawn's right in the middle of it. Tries to slow him down to keep it. The fight begins, and EDG is trying to get out of this one. Coral gets jumped down, but the slow is wearing off. And he's going to try to flash over the wall with the rest of his team, but they will continue with the calling. Coral in all sorts of trouble. The shot by pulls into Lupa. Lupa take a low, but so is EDG. They're backing out. Now they're going to run back on towards him. MCG is going to get picked off. It's a double for him. Could it be a triple? Yes, it will. And that is a big, big turnaround. Samsung White, the contender. Just an absolutely pristine team fight there from Samsung White. They called out the bait from EDG, they poked them in the Baron pit, they slowed them down as they are trying to retreat, and they forced them into a bad play. Now they're trying Baron, but it's only two defenders from EDG. Imp goes in! Whoa! Oh, that's gonna be big. They get the shot back from the Buster. Imp wants to go down on oh. this one, and he does! They pick up the double kill, one for each, and Imp's gonna jump in to see if he can clean up this mid wave and get that mid turret down as well. They are moving as a perfect team right now. Everything's happening in their favor, and people are getting away with slivers of health. The game just completely broke wide open. Samsung White is now dominating. They had the Infinity Edge. There was no Death Caps answered on the other side. The fear of Clear Love and Coro being too far behind was absolutely valid right there. Imp shredded through them. The zillion power spike here, level 13 with a lot of spells. Just everything going Samsung White's way. Obviously, the Tidal Wave catching three was absolutely crucial right there. And they just couldn't run through Looper. He was going to hit him with the Flame Spitter, so they had to split up. Here, EDG in classic fashion tries for a turn, but you can see they're lacking tank stats, basically, when they jump in. Coral was already low, no armor. Clear Love really doesn't do anything. He locked a Kha'Zix in for half a second, and that's the imp that they've been trying to keep down this whole game. When you lose the bottom lane and you have Nami on your team, EDG doesn't have really too many ways of winning the game back in that sense. There's a big, big advantage now for Samsung White. Proving that number one seed that they currently hold in everybody's perspective, other than the fact that they didn't qualify as it. <laughs> they are the number two from Korea, which is a little scary in the rest of the uh, Western world's eyes, I think, and maybe even China's, because this is their number one seed falling down to Samsung White. But there's a potential for coming back, and Pawn Woo. completely caught out of position. I don't think the rest of his team are going to collapse, but let's see what advantage they take from this. They know that the rest of EDG are all down there, and immediately it goes top. There is no answer for him whatsoever. Look at his items right now. He doesn't even need a Last Whisper because there's no armor being built up by EDG. They do not have the gold to do so. Far and ahead of the game right now, Samsung White looking to take this one home. We mentioned a little bit that EDG may not have looked at them so much during practice, but still, this is a dominating performance we're seeing from White. Solid, solid play. Clearly chasing the wolf. <laughs> not quite able to uh, pick that one up like he'd wish to. So. Everything's now, giving them trouble. Where are they going to go from here? I mean, they basically had to sit back and hope that Samsung White now made the state because it really did crack the game wide open. They've got an 8,000 gold advantage, as you mentioned. Imp, he's a, an absolute monster right now. You can see he's got a clear 2,500 gold advantage over Name, which in itself, for Tristana versus Lucian, is a gigantic problem. Yeah, and the fact that he's level 15, in small thanks to Zillion's passive, but mainly because he's been split pushing so much, uh, just makes the range discrepancy even greater between Trist and Lucian. Uh, this has been a very well-played game by Samsung White. EDG definitely threw a few curveballs at them, putting a lot more emphasis in early game vision control, having a nice bait in the top lane for Coral that one time, but outside of that, it's really been a Samsung White-controlled game. EDG not forgetting to keep the wards up. Pinks across the inventories with the double sight stone as they continue to try and stop the snowball that Samsung Whoops. White has here. Man, Shockwave pulls in Mata. He's just going to heal that one off, but all down for, could have been a kill. And not quite farmed enough. He would have needed to right. zero Mata out with that one to make a big impact. Now they're just down Shockwave and just hemorrhaging objectives left and right. So Dandy wow. stealing away the blue buff, the Prince of Thieves as he's nicknamed by Monty and Doa. And as you see, the vote, of course, very much in favor of Samsung White right now. It's actually less, though, because it was an 80% swing to begin with. Now it's only 67%. EDG putting up a good impression at the yeah. start, and obviously they do face yeah. each other again. There's a lot to take from this one. Koro caught out. Teleport oh. is not going to get interrupted. Wow. Does manage to get back to base. I mean, 
Oh, that's another oh. one upon, actually. Oh, man, he's going to go down, but the team has time to get over there. Looper may throw down the ultimate for the walkout. It's actually down already past that. And it looks like Pawn oh, gets himself enough speed up, dodges the destiny, oh. but the clockwork does wind up nicely and he goes down. Looper could be in trouble, but the rest of the team is collapsing in mid lane. Flash on towards him. You can see, as you mentioned, the team collapses in towards him. He tries to turn it back on towards you. Oh. He gets the kill, turns around in a 3v1. A simple turnaround kill. It's great for him. F goes aggressive, actually leaps across to the side. Not sure where he's planning to avoid dodging out of the death sentence there. Dandy comes around the side and still, Samson White, despite losing two members, keep the pressure on EDG. That right there is one of the reasons they picked Rumble. He has so much latent damage, even in a 1v3, he could turn that kill right around onto you. Still a pretty good move there by EDG. They cannot contest this dragon, uh, but they're trying their best to survive right now. Very great play and an interesting orb situation coming out in Samsung White's inventory here with the two scrying orbs. They Absolutely. want to be seeing everything. Yeah, they just want to make sure nothing gets surprised on them. They know yeah. that EDG likes to group up as five, so if they catch one, they usually end up catching a whole heap of players True. behind them. To just kind of go back to the start of the game, though, mm -hmm. and all the hype around Samsung White, the player that stood out the most here was the duo lane of Mata and Imp. I would say Dandy was, even though he's a spectacular player, not particularly spectacular this game. That bottom lane performance against the cream of the crop from EDG and China, uh, being able to get all those kills, it's been Imp and Mata this game taken over. It's hard to not let that happen. You give Mata Nami, you have sustain for Imp in that lane, and they want to go hard the whole time. We saw Nami and FCZF go hard a little bit in the beginning, but after that, they've kind of just fallen behind. Yeah, there's been domination, and if one team knows basically how to control a lead, it is Samsung White. They've been in this situation many, many times. They're not going too aggressive, they're not going crazy. They had the Baron buff, but they didn't overly commit on anything there. It has happened to them in the past, and this time they are playing it safe. Looper, is he going to get caught out? Death Sentence will land, and the rest of EDG claps. That's a lot of damage they're missing from wow. the fight. He threw the Equalizer out as well, but you see how far EDG is behind. They go to clear more out. They don't go to take anything off of this. Hey, quite honestly, that was just a sloppy play by Looper. They did not have ward coverage, and it was a nice catch by FCZF. Obviously, though, Samsung White has never put all their whatever's in one basket. <laughs> you can always have a backup plan here, and it's that backup plan. And I've got to be honest, if Koro comes down here, I don't think he could do anything with him. And he's just realized that he was making a direct he needs help. And then he thought, nope, I can't handle this Tristana on my own. Nami and Klilov all have to back off, but he's ripping the hell out of that tower and on his own single-handedly blows Koro backwards and says, thank you very much, your tower's gone. Imp is playing with that lead about the best he could right there, completely knowing his limits, doesn't take a, a lick of damage there, finishes off an inhibitor turret, and now, because they pulled so many defenses down bottom, it gives them time to create vision around the Baron Pit. All three sweepers just used, pink wards placed as well. You know, this is a man that's clearly looking for tears. He tasted them earlier on, of course, <laughs> against Piglet, who sadly is no longer on SK Telecom. Maybe he's looking if he can see if he gets them from <laughs> Name. I don't know. This guy is maybe a little bit sadistic. Who knows? But it is Samsung White setting up, EDG looking for that fight, and they may well find it. Well, so far, been working out for Imp, known to be not as mechanically and strategically sound in fights, but everything's been one for one v one for him today, and it's coming out rainbows. Samsung White has two different ways of winning this game that could easily work out. They're choosing to do the split push strategy here with Imp, while trying to keep Baron control with the rest of the team, knowing there's no one who can deal with Imp. They also would win a five v five team fight pretty easily. So, I'm surprised they actually haven't just grouped up around Baron and tried to recreate the fight that blew the game open in the first place because they weren't nearly as far ahead then as they are now. Lots of new things coming into the inventories being drank up. Pawn puts out an elixir there, which means they want that extra bit of power for what else is about to happen next and solidify that win. With the inhibitor open in the bottom, Koro's forced to stay down there right now, but the teleport is available. But Samsung White wants this. Prepping the fights, we're gonna get ready for the Baron. It maybe shows just a little bit of respect that Samsung White have for EDG, despite the fact they are 10,000 gold ahead. They're not pushing a gigantic advantage. They know that obviously with an Orianna there, it's pretty easy to clear. You've got the Cullen, you can wipe out them waves. Instead, they are drawing them into the Baron, which 
Honestly, they could take with ease. Yeah, and to EDG's credit, they have delayed Samsung White's execution on multiple occasions. Oh. The oh. level of catches they've had is pretty great. This looks bad, though. Flag and drag out, but he's slowed on this one. He does get the shield, oh. so they know the rest of the team is close. Dandy wow. looking to go in, but he backs off. That's Jungler down, but they flash into the F1! They pull oh, to get away dear. from the Shockwave just about. That does mean it is a big ultimate down, and Samsung White, they know they can go for it. Clear Love is not in the picture. He is very low. If he comes sliding in, you can see he's charging EDG, for the EDG, if they care for their lives, they don't go in here. There goes the ultimate. Nami's wave is out, and they're forced to back up. Imp jumps into the fight. Koro's trying to do what he can with Maelstrom up, dodging all that damage, but it's going to be too much. The team leaves him for dead. They're just trying to do as much damage as possible so Samsung White can hopefully not finish this Baron, but Imp is just unstoppable. He hasn't taken a single hair of damage, and he'll go wherever he wants. He's going straight for it. Glitter forced away once again. Nami's calling is up in a moment, but they did delay the Baron. Job done for EDG. They just need to sit back and wait a little bit longer. Imp sees a gigantic wave in the bottom. What a gutsy team right there to just go in again and again. Every time someone get knocked out in the fight, they uh -oh. hold off with four. The fact they only suffered one casualty is remarkable. And now White has to leave for wave management, again delaying the game for EDG. How long can they do this? Imp is gigantic. Solo pushing lanes by himself. I'm going to guess not much longer, <laughs> because things are getting a little bit crazy here. Uh, Looper's incredibly strong. If they can make a super, super late game, you'd think the Zillion would fall off a little bit. But it's paired with a Trist, and the front line, despite having a Maokai, will still fall to an incredibly fed Trist. It's EDG is Ooh. delaying here. They're hoping to catch a more ridiculous fight. And speaking of catching someone out, we know this has happened in the past, and while he did say it, I'm talking about Imp here, oh, yep. says cockiness will not creep back into his game. It has done. He's a 5-0-4, massively fed Tristana. If he was to single he get caught out, he's been playing it risky so far, that could be a big yeah. turning point for EDG. He That's would have to play a massive damage dealer. Remarkably risky, though, because yeah. they have the Zillion as the safety net right yeah. here. Uh, they're doing this on top of Ward, but they're doing it so quickly that I don't know if EDG can make it in. They're going to go for it, though. Nami's got a pretty good item build to start shredding in here. The calling goes out to start Koro again in the front, but they were not uh -oh. able to stall it this time, and the fight continues just below Baron. They got him down! They got him down! That is a big turnaround, but can they have the damage back on this one? Pawn is still alive! They need to get that mid laner down! Uses the ultimate on itself! He's Jumps away, Pawn is still oh alive! That is EDG picking up three kills! Two members incredibly low! EDG, despite losing Baron, turned that fight around, and that is exactly what we said. If they can catch Imp out, they can turn the fight. What a spectacular team fight right there by EDG. Down 10,000 gold and a Baron buff, and they can get this. One more time. How did this happen? Oh first gosh. off, you never see White do Baron on top of a ward. That's the first unexpected thing. Then, Rumble Alt gets almost nothing. Imp loses his oh. mind, gets crushed oh. in the CC, and dropped before the Zillion all can land. Exactly the scenario we thought could never happen. They then catch Looper in Zhonya's. The fact that he was able to escape with a sliver of health is a bit of a miracle. That was nearly a clear ace. Baron is gone from three people. It's only on Dandy and Looper, and EDG shows they will not ever go down without many fights. Like we got a lot of people still holding their breath because EDG just made a huge play. Only, I believe, Looper and one other comes out of Baron with that dandy here comes out of Baron with that one where can they use it there's still yes a huge push to come out from imp that mistake probably won't be made I once can't more. believe that happened the one thing that could spell a turnaround for white and he Crazy. rocket jumps in with no backup when zillion is not in range that is the definition of what he said he wasn't going to do. <laughs> that was complete uh -oh. overconfidence right there by him and a great capitalization by EDG. Well, White don't look like they want to hang around this time. They're making the play. They're going to push down towards that exposed inhibitor. And mm. EDG are not in position to deal with this one if they were to go fast for it. They see the rumble. They see Looper making that move. So they are going to react. They are going to be in position. Name, he's got big off that last he's fight. Huge. He's got yeah. the items. And this actually will be much closer now for Samsung White. Imp also has a lot of items, and Samsung White needs to be very careful not to give in to the chaos. EDG is one team, they're, they're used to playing against a lot of teams that will make judgment calls with limited vision control. Right now, White is trying to set up a retreat, they're trying to control the initiation, they're going to ward up and try and play as a cohesive unit. If they don't do that, they will get drawn into the chaos where EDG thrives. Well, currently, they have to delay. Imp's flash not available. 
Pawns is, of course, if that shockwave were to catch on him. If he didn't jump at the exact moment, it would be curtains. They are going to back away. And Samsung White, again, playing very respectfully on EDG. There's a big way of pushing on the top. We can see Looper's going to go deal with that one. And this is just buying a little bit more time for EDG in there. Happy to wait with this one out. Of course, the Orianna's just going to get stronger and stronger. And this team fight, whenever it happens, will be a massive deal because these teams are stacking up. We're in the 60K mark. So suddenly the gap, despite being, what, 10,000, is becoming a less and less of a problem for both teams. EDG, they have worked their way back into this game off that single mistake. And it could make Samsung White pay. They got just enough catches to delay right there. And they honestly forced Samsung White into a very impatient decision. Like I said, obviously, they were able to secure the Baron. But doing it on top of a sight ward when they have such pink ward control and so many sweepers is really out of character. So you can definitely see a little bit of fear or second guessing coming in from Samsung White here. However, that is six full items on Imp. Yeah. And when Pawn did resurrect himself in that fight, you saw he came back with full health. Yeah. So Zillion has enough AP that is basically two imps if they play these fights properly. Very, very big here for Samsung White to make this next one. Even bigger for EDG to come out on the play. Looking at Nami mostly as saying that his items right now aren't looking at much armor on the side of Samsung White. The most is on Looper. So if he can stay alive, if he can position and be the carry that EDG needs for these fights, it could definitely be a different story. Uh-oh, Koro is in trouble. He's going to get claps on. The rest of his team are coming to help, but they are going to be too, too late. The question is, can he hang on long enough? Samsung White coming around the side. EDG coming down the pole, and the left is there. An EDG rescue crew manages to survive <laughs> and get him away. But for how long? What did that cost? No real cooldowns were used for Samsung White. Koro was a little bit out of the fight. He has to recall, and they also have a bad path back to their inhibitor. This is Samsung White using half of a catch to try and get an inhibitor. Putting on a bit of a stranglehold here. Should be able to take this one down. Ward's all over the place as well. Clear Love is thinking about a flank from behind. There's not sufficient ward control for White right now. Here comes Jarvan. Oh, Matla's going to get caught there. Clear Love goes in. The wave will pull them, but the top wave is strong. They're going to catch on towards everybody low. Koro, big in between the team. They all back away. Looper having to use that Zonia is very, very low. And they're going to continue piling in. Every summoner blown by this point. It's going to be a big shutdown there as Imp gets a kill. He goes down after in the retribution kill coming from unstoppable and the fight has not ended yet a bubble coming in and they're gonna oh. keep going on to Koro finally taking down the tree they give it a few more cuts and the inhibitor is in their eyes you the only man standing can he keep them away Bay here not too sure he can Pawn pushes in towards him doesn't quite catch on the death sentence does though and he's gonna get caught out once again his ultimate backup just in time you taken solo Pawn comes back to life the inhibitor finally goes down Samson White they're still pushing the control the chaos. They're trying to go through and they have no AD carry, but they do have a 4 to 2 advantage. 40 minute game right now, 16 to 11 on the Nexus turret. You up. You does not have his ultimate for a few more seconds, but Samsung White sees that window. They're out. A little too chaotic. What a way Ooh. to open the World Championships. That fight was Samsung White entering into the chaos. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. They get flanked at the start of it. Imp goes absolutely crazy, but luckily he took Name out with him when he fell down. If that didn't happen, if he wasn't able to land that counter damage, wow. White would have been aced here. It's crazy to think because they won that fight so well. So obviously Shockwave was a little bit lackluster there. They tried the flank initiation, and because Clear Love was still under farm, he wasn't able to pull much up. But here with Imp, look at how on the same page everyone from EDG is in this team fight. However, Samsung White had the same idea. As right. soon as you see the AD carry, you're gonna go for it. Because they did that nice collapse, they were able to secure this one, and then it was just about keeping the team fight going so Zilling could get an ultimate back up again, and that's ultimately how they took out the inhibitor. And D-Man, like you said, definitely waiting for Imp's flash. You can see it was blown in that fight, keeping him safe and in the right positions. Now six, two, and seven, the full build is out for him. There are two scrying orbs on Samsung White Ooh. right now. And there's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Peekaboo! Oh, Pawn actually pushing in, gets the bomb down. Thank you very much. Back away from this one. So, Super Minions shoving down the bottom lane. EDG, you have a decision oh, to make. Do you fight the Baron, one. or do you let the Super Minions take your nemesis? They have to go immediately. Otherwise, they're done for. They send Maokai back. He's not very fast at clearing those. They may yet lose an inhibitor turret right. because he can't clear these minions away. Samsung White holds all the cards right now. 
doing what he can, slamming the ground. Tree's trying to make noise. Nobody's there to hear it. The turret does get <laughs> oh, saved. He, held it. he does hold it, and the Baron begins. But this is where EDG has come up big. Can they stop it again? Samsung already reconsidering. Yeah, teleport was available, don't forget, for Koro. So mm -hmm. he does hold on, and this is still very risky yeah. play by EDG. Every time that minion wave hits the turret, it has to be cleared again by Koro. He bought about 30 to 40 seconds when he cleared that last wave, and it's surprisingly, uh, White didn't really take much off of it. They are being a little cautious after what happened last time, and Koro has done a good enough job pushing that wave out that the teleport threat is very real, and White is not willing to do another Baron with 5v5. One of the things we talked about as we watched White is the incredible objective control early. And they're still controlling that, but not as much, it seems, as they oh, want to. No. Back and forth. No, no, back no, no, and no. forth. They do have... not do this, EDG. They're thinking about going to Baron, but White is oh. way ahead of the game right now. That's... There's no defense. This could be Inhibitor 2. That's Inhibitor 2 gone. There's no way they can react to this one quick enough. That's a simple tower being just destroyed by him. They will again try a flank, though. Watch their left. He's trying to come down Jarvan. He seems very far ahead of the team right now. Trying to get that cross queen out, does not hit it. Looper throws down the red carpet for the team. Koro's in again. The dive buddies go in oh. and they actually change spots this time. Clear loves in all by himself and Imp has free shots as they take down Koro. He jumps in, it's gonna be a double kill. It doesn't look like there'll be any more, but it's eyes on the Nexus and the triple kill dodge. The Quadra possibly on the fountain. He won't go as far and they're gonna go for the Nexus. That's, That's all they ball. need. Right there, it was such a great catch. They finished off you before he could shockwave and finally, White takes him down. Beautiful game by Sam Song White. Showing a bit of weakness in the mid game as they got, I wouldn't say weakness, but over cocky in their strength, which hurt them a little bit. Name on the screen, trying to be a carry for his team, but could not come out here in the first game of groups. He played fantastic, however, throughout the game. But what a fantastic opener we've had oh already. He's showing the strengths of both teams, and honestly, it was just hinged on just a couple of team fights that could have swung either way. As you mentioned, if Name had not gone down in that bottom fight, absolutely that would have gone EDG's way, and who knows where that game could have gone. Questionable decisions, maybe from Samsung White, a little bit of nerves creeping into game one, of course. Now that one's out of the way. That's the big, strong game they had to deal with. Can they sweep the group? It seems like they're poised to sweep this group. This is their toughest challenge. However, some small weaknesses are rising in Samsung White, and I think a little bit of it was right. seen in that game. They do have a slight issue closing games. That's one of the big reasons they can never seem to defeat their sister team, Samsung Blue. Because even if they can get an early lead, sometimes they have trouble making decisions late in the game. That's the main reason that game stretched for so long. EDG was pushing them into uncomfortable situations. And yeah, like you said, a couple of team fights switched the wrong way. And we have ourselves a massive comeback and a completely different story right now wavering back and forth on that Baron, but the man right there, these two, I should say, the early game duo lane from Imp and Mata coming out extravagant. Well, I think Mata will have some words with Imp, honestly, because, you know, <laughs> it was all about that one jump, that one Maybe a few. crazy, crazy leap, and, yeah. you know, he was at 505, I believe, at the time when leaping in, a little bit overconfident, and this is something yeah. they've talked about coming into this World Championships. They may need to get him in check for the next match. A little bit overconfident is a pretty big <laughs> understatement right there. That was absolute insanity. But it's because he overperformed expectations so heavily yeah. at the start right. of the game. And it, ultimately, it did not decide the game against them. Name was able to get back in the game because of that mistake. But the way they were able to shut him down and make the game really all about you and maybe clear love trying to find the right fights is exactly what White wanted to do. It's... EDG didn't get much out of the early game, but a lot of wards swept. And we saw how far behind Clearlove was throughout the game and then trying to initiate. And it was very off with him and Koro. They, one would try to get back out and Koro would be the guy diving in. And it just didn't seem to work out in the fights the way they wanted. And something that none of us really expected coming into this match was the simple fact that Rumble was played in the top lane by Looper. That caught all of us off guard with our stats. Yeah, right off the bat, they've been preparing too, obviously. <laughs> Samsung White wants to win this group. Absolutely. So right now, we're actually going to throw it over to the guys at the analyst desk for a breakdown on Samsung White's win. Thank you very much, guys. And right at the end of the conversation, they're bringing up the picks and bands. Looper playing Rumble, seeing the Zillion, seeing the Nami coming out. Samsung White surprising us a little bit in picks and bands, but 
they made it work at the end of the game. Monty, what's your take? Well, Rumble was a pick that we saw late in the regionals in Korea from SK Telecom, and it was uh, a game that they beat uh, Naj and White Shield with in the finals. And coming into these picks and bans, we really are looking at two very quintessential team compositions for both of these teams. We've got that hyper tank up in the top lane for EDG, that emphasis on AoE and team fighting with the Jarvan in the jungle, and then on the other side of the coin, we have actually an extremely difficult composition to play from Samsung White, because we're dealing with a comp that requires a massive early game lead. Rumble's the champion that you have a lot of early dragon control over, and EDG played well against it. In fact, they uh, kind of baited them into the pit and then rushed mid lane, taking towers, avoiding the Rumble ult whenever possible in the early game. Fortunately, there was a bad fight in the jungle right there. But going to the late game, if you have this composition that we see Samsung White running, you need that large lead. You need that big buffer. And not only that, but you need pretty much perfect team fighting because you're very squishy. You're super reliant on the Zillion pick uh, to get the ult off in order to get the resets rolling with Tristana and Kha'Zix. So it requires good Zonia's use from the Rumble as well. And of course, you know, if we look at the pick and ban phase, early Zillion pick, it's a flex pick, although typically White plays it in mid, and then they have that counter pick on support with the Nami. Especially given how the pick and ban phase was going, it was pretty telegraphed that that Zillion was going to end up going mid lane because they have the Rumble that they definitely want to match against Maokai, but then Zillion Tristana would absolutely just lose against Lucian Dresh, so they needed Nami as a counter pick support, and it worked for them. But didn't you feel that Tristana Nami should also lose to Lucian Thresh? What was your take on the head-to-head -head matchup and how that played out? Yeah, that's something I really want to point out. Um, how EDG started basically at their bot lane side with their jungler, which set their bot lane even farther behind. So they had to leash, and then they played against Imp and Mata, who didn't leash with Tristana Nami. What ended up happening was the early levels are so crucial in this matchup. They allowed Tristana to just push early and sustain up and just whittle them down, as well as Thresh started with a ward in two potions. So Every single point of that matchup where Thresh and Lucian could just abuse Nami Tristana was just not, not allowed to by EDG. And at the same time, those weird jungle starts influenced the jungle as well. And you speak about the bot lane matchup. The matchup of Kha'Zix versus Jarvan with the Zillion passive makes it even more volatile. And we saw Jarvan struggle to get early ganks and he fell behind in farm while Kha'Zix was able to pick up some of the scraps from the mid lane. He built up a CS lead and then eventually managed to camp top lane. In another volatile matchup, when you have Rumble, a champion that if he gets really far ahead of whatever opponent he's against, he's going to be able to do just massive amounts of damage. And these champions are so reliant in their team comp that when you get them really far ahead and shut down the main tank for EDG, then the team fights has become that much easier. I want to get back to that bottom lane point, though, Carpo was talking about a little bit, because even though they did start out with the war, they started out with the leash, by the third or fourth wave, we were equal CS. And I know you're talking about the fact that Lucian should be ahead in CS, and it should be a winning matchup, not an equal one. But the point is, we got to a point where the matchup was at least equal, which is reasonable. But it's too late. It's not too late. A, it's sure, but... Purely what, opportunity cost. You should fine. already be so far ahead in that matchup. I know what you're talking about being ahead. What I'm going to talk about, though, is the fact that they had an equal lane, and I talked about it in the preview show. What if Name chokes internationally? Name died in 2v2s in a winning lane matchup multiple times, and that is very Let's, unforgivable I mean, for EDG. I don't Let's, think these lanes are equal, though. You get zillion passes. Like, that, it makes a huge... You're always going to not get level 2 first. Level 3 I like first. That point. Actually, Let's, let's move on. One second, one second. I like the point. Also, Mata was a massive reason for that when he picked sure. up the first kill. Let's move on out of the laning phase. Strategically, Samsung White just seemed to have a step ahead of EDG, despite yes. some misplays in team fights. Freak, uh, explain one of the strategic plays that you particularly liked. Okay, so let's pull up the replay, and we're going to start out with it pause for a little bit. This is basically one of the big reasons Samsung White is a better team than Edward Gaming. So what you see right here is the fact that Name has a free road to split push the bottom lane. Now, we had seen Imp do this with Impunity later on and get down to an inhibitor turret. There's enough wards to see Dandy if you watch that minimap. Not make his split push here completely safely. Instead, he's going to give this up. Samsung White dictates and goes mid lane, and Edward Gaming the entire time is playing second fiddle and trying to like play follow up here. So roll the clip out. We're going to run it fairly flat, uh, fast overall just to watch the map movements. But Samsung White is actually first here. The mid laner Oriana is actually killing Wraith instead of showing up to this turret, and so this goes down for free. And this is, again, kind of silly. So finally, the Lucian makes his way in, but Imp's already hitting top lane. Imp is already ready to split push the top lane, push a wave in. EDG just now sees it, just now clears the wards, and so Imp says, oh, now they're coming top lane. I can leave very easily. He's actually able to create the pressure on these turrets, and at the very end of that clip, actually what happens is you've got the Maokai trying to hold the top lane against this Tristana push. 
and Rumble's already getting the wave bottom. Trissan had already cleared the wave top. They've already killed the turret mid. So we actually had SSW take all three lanes, something useful in all three lanes. And Edward was like, oh, shoot, go mid. Oh, shoot, go top. And they're just behind the entire time. Reactionary. And a big part of that, too, is the itemization that we saw in Tristana. If we noticed, it went BF Sword into Static Shiv so they, they could get as much lane pressure early. This is a team with Rumble and uh, with this specific composition, with the Disengage from Nami, that is very concerned about taking early objectives, and they don't need Infinity Edge crits. They're not looking for those early team fights. They're there to push the waves, to have the split push, and if they, if necessary, group around the Rumble, Rumble ult a turret, and just knock the turret down as fast as possible to get that global gold lead. Let me just quickly interject and, and change the topic a little bit later. We've seen a big team fight following this where Samsung White uh, delay aced Edward Gaming, got themselves a Baron. Then they sort of uh, fiddled about for a while. A few misplays from Imp getting caught out, stalled the game out maybe a little longer than it needed to. Do we feel that Edward Gaming, if they had made slightly better decisions in the early game, maybe a different AD carrier, Cogmore, something that could scale more, could they have done better against Samsung White? Because there were some chinks in the Samsung White armor. Freak, I see you excited. So I'm really excited about this because I looked at the post-game screen. Name had the highest damage to champions in the game. He was a 4-4-3 four, four, and three Lucian. We had a 9-2-7 and seven Tristana. We had a big rumble. Name still found a way to deal more damage than every other player in the game. So... He lost, like, there's so many things going against him, yet he still managed to do more damage. So this is a very big factor that if EDG can get out of the early game, something they've even struggled with in China itself, let alone internationally, then they're going to look better. But it's been a repeated road of the early game going week. Some up. final I thoughts from Crumbs. I think we the on. biggest factor was the jungle matchup. Like, Jarvan fell so far behind, and he ended up with a, just a welfare build while you have Kha'Zix. <laughs> He's going full damage. Rumble gets, got so far ahead, and Jarvan just not able to do anything. Jarvan is all in. Either you win or you lose really hard. Just the last point, yet again, about the early game. If, I agree with Freak. If you play around your AD carry, don't let him leash in a winning matchup. And then the other yep. uh, other opposite yep. side doesn't leash, and then all your advantage you literally throw away already, and you play from behind level one. Especially when you have a tank top, just leave that tank alone. Even late game, he can just flash in and twist it advance, and that's enough. That's what yep. Malka needs to do. If your AD carry is so good at dealing damage in T fights, then that should be enough. But why would you leash and then just screw it over in bot lane? Big questions that Edward Gaming will need to answer. You can tell that we're particularly excited. <laughs> Anyways, you guys at home, you've been sharing photos with us about how you and your friends do worlds. So let's actually take a look at some of those very quickly. First up from at Good Vibes AU from Australia down under. Hype down under. This is how we worlds. Definitely looking pretty cool. Like your forehead, bro. Next, <laughs> should there will be some familiar faces from LCS fans. That's Fnatic's coach Aranea dropping in on Alliance, stealing them strats and he says since I saw so many world selfies this is the Fen Alliance selfie hashtag keep smiling maybe hashtag keep smiling finally we have a tweet from Chasm who says this is how I worlds in medical school uh, let's just hope the future doctor is paying attention <laughs> I <laughs> <especially> <laughs> hope so yeah. <laughs> for your patience sake uh, thank you guys for sending those in remember to tweet your pictures to us on how you world at lol esports uh, lol esports use the hashtag worlds and if you see big plays world's big place. We're only just getting warmed up after a quick break. We'll head back onto the rift for an LCS matchup between North America's Team Solo Mid and Europe's SK Gaming. Guys, don't go anywhere. As it turns out, we're going to take a quick look at TSM preparing for their match. You can see uh, we'll transition over to SK Gaming in a moment or two. They've got a tough challenge ahead of them playing with that substitute. All right, guys, we will be back in just a moment, so don't go anywhere. That ad break is coming up before our coverage of the Eventually. 2014 World Championship continues right after this. <laughs> On that one as Dandy gets himself out quickly with the flash. But the dark passage brings it back in range. They're backing out. Now they're going to run back on towards him. And he's going to get picked off. It's a double beam. Could it be a triple? Yes, it will. That is a big turnaround. But can they have the damage back on this one? They need to get that mid laner down. Uses the ultimate on himself. He's going to pop back up in a second. One is still alive. That is EDG picking up three kills. And they're going to continue piloting. Every summoner blown by this point. It's going to be a big shutdown. 
there as Imp gets a kill. He goes down after in the retribution kill. Clear loves in all by himself, and Imp has free shots as they take down Toro. He jumps in. It's going to be a double kill. Welcome back, everybody, to the League of Legends World Championship here live from Taipei, as I am joined here by someone who is no stranger to the <laughs> international stage. It is, of course, TSM's owner, Reginald. Well, this time you're not playing, at least you're on the stage. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's been an amazing experience coming here and just seeing everyone, seeing all the fans just welcome us really warmly. So just, like, thanks to the fan for coming out and cheering us on. Yeah, they definitely have your back. Uh, Talk me through what is going on leading up to this World Championship. You guys obviously went to Korea to scrim. How did that pan out? What kind of weaknesses of your team or maybe strengths did you discover over there? So initially when we went to Korea, um, we thought that we were going to be way, way, way far behind. And when we played the Korean teams, they, they were really, really good. But um, individually, right, they don't really destroy lanes as what we expected. But their team play is just absolutely crazy. And that's what we're having trouble most with. And throughout the last two weeks, We've been playing a lot of games against the Korean teams and we've only gotten better and better. And so the gap is closing. And so it's just been a really good experience going to Korea, boot camping there, looking at their infrastructure and just seeing how they do things so we can mimic it and copy it in our own way. And when we go back to the US, we can train with that regiment and just make us better overall as a, you know, an NA, NA scene. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, obviously you guys came out of the NA playoffs with a fantastic win over Cloud9. Does that momentum still carry on or through that experience in Korea where we may be grounded a bit? So, I mean, just going to PAX, like every single match was like a game of inches. We barely beat LMQ, we barely beat C9, and after the finals, we knew that we needed work and we wanted to do well at Worlds. And so the momentum kind of died down when we went to Korea, but we knew that we could get better. And as we played the Korean teams, we, we, we just stayed positive. We kept practicing every single day. And, you know, we're, we're going into groups right now. I'm very confident. Well, uh, you say you're going into the groups very confident. I might almost say that this might be the best setup TSM has had yet to do good in groups. So what is your general impressions of your opponents? So, I mean, overall, like you said, every single world thus far for TSM, I feel like this world is our best chance of going far and even maybe like going to the finals and winning it. And so the, these groups, I feel like um, we have a really good shot at coming out and taking first. Um, we have hard opponents, CPA, SK, and Royal. I think that world's going to give us a run for our money. All right. Well, you got to start by winning off the first game here versus SK. Um, tell me your general view on the game and, and where they maybe could beat you guys out. So with SK, um, I feel like our team has the advantage uh, player for player. In every single role, I'm confident that my players are better than them for every single role. But SK has really good team synergy. They come very prepared. And you know, even at the EU LCS playoffs, Alliance has a better roster. Other players are really mechanically strong. But SK showed up. Their, their strategy was really good. They have good level ones. They come in with a solid plan. And they were able to carry that out. And you know, they, they, they barely lost Alliance. So when we're playing these matches, we're coming in fully prepared as well. We're going to just do everything we can to just win the match. All right, fantastic. Well, good luck, Reggie, and thank you. Thank you, too. All right, it's time to head back over to the guys at the Analyst Desk to get things started. Thank you very much, Shox, and uh, great hearing from Reggie. We are about to kick off our next game, a good old-fashioned fight between North America and European LCS regions. It's Team Solo Mid taking on SK Gaming. TSM have the honor of being the only team to play in all four World Championships, but this year they also have the distinction to be the first team to break Cloud9's hold on the North American League, defeating them at the playoffs to take the Summer Championship and that number one seed. It took a full year of roster swaps, adding support staff, and also really scraping through those playoffs. But it worked, and TSM have the highest seed. Crumbs, your opinion? Going into the playoffs for NA, TSM, the one that we saw there, it was completely different from the one we saw in the entire summer split. Like, they added Lust Boy at last resort. Everybody thought it was a really risky move, and it worked out for them. They've shown that they can adapt really quickly and just become better when they really have to. They've been doing this for a while now. And they showed up at the playoffs in the LCS studio, and they did it again at PAX. And every game that they've played, they've shown to that they're becoming a better team. Now, when they're going to Korea in boot camp and they say that they've become a better team every time screaming versus Koreans, their infrastructure becomes better, their whole team synergy becomes better. I believe it fully. So going into this, I'm really curious to see and just try to kind of compare 
what they're doing here to what we saw perhaps from Samson White last game. Yeah, Lust Boy has really taken a good, good fit into this team as well. I mean, I casted him for a long, long time in Korea, and his vision control has brought a lot. But as they've kind of changed out the players, like Crumbs is talking about here, we have to also mention the infrastructure developments that they've had. I mean, if we're realistic, the picks and bans at the beginning of the season for TSM were often a disaster. But since the addition of Loco Doco, they've really, really improved strategically, and a lot of it is due to his, his game knowledge and the knowledge he brings in uh, from a Korean team here understand some of these uh, coaching methods that were taught to him when he was a pro player in Korea. And I think he brings a lot and uh, adds a lot of value. Yeah, just in addition to that, just day-to-day -day life, having local talk being bilingual definitely will help. I mean, we play with a Korean in our house as well. And there is langu language barriers and culture barriers. For example, like we had to explain Helios what sarcasm was because he didn't even know. <laughs> so, but I'm, okay. I'm pretty sure local talk was well versed in the art of sarcasm already. So <laughs> he could definitely help them. Uh, they made sure local uh, Lost Boy was always speaking English and only Korean where needed. And I think that's really good for TSM and that indicates how uh, well and how quickly they grow to, as a team. So I, I'm definitely looking forward uh, to how much they learn from the. A lot of positivity, there. but I know Freak is a little yeah. concerned about some things in TSM. So TSM, it's still a very big test for them. Um, this is a tough group. There's a lot of individually very strong players up against them. I think that they do outmatch SK role for role. Again, what Reggie said, I think that is pretty much true here that the roster swaps have helped that significantly. But the difficulty is that I think. Except for maybe against Royal Club, they're outmatched strategically in this group. I think every other team has better shot calling, especially with the fact that Bjergsen is actually a reluctant shot caller here. It's, he wants to just kind of do what Xiao Xiao does, which is be silent and just go 1v1 people and let someone else take over. Amazing talks during the early game, but Bjergsen takes over late, and it breaks his concentration a little bit here, and it's just a bit of uncomfortability for that team. And keeping up against SK Gaming, who's one of the best strategic teams in Europe, which is already a strategically pretty sound region, is a test for TSM. And it's going to be a big test for SK Gaming because they've been made uncomfortable because of the fact they have that roster swap in the jungle, thanks to Sven Skeren's suspension, unfortunately. Before the suspension happened, Monte Cristo, you had touted them to potentially be a top two team in this group. They need to adjust. They need to adapt on the fly. How are they going to handle TSM without one of the biggest uh, components of their early game in Svenskeren? I think that's a really tough question because Svenskeren is so key to SK's strategy because the way that SK likes to play the League of Legends is they like to push all three lanes at the same time and then have Svenskeren go and try and 1v1 the enemy jungle or counter jungle very heavily. Now, I don't know if Gilius is going to be really up to that task. Um, it's a very different kind of jungle style, but maybe SK can hold it together. Maybe they can maintain that kind of oddball style that's, that's kept them kind of on the forefront and really gave Alliance a run for their money in the European playoffs. A couple of things I want to go into is, is both champion pools for Jezus and Enrated. I know Jezus isn't really that typical assassin player. He plays a good Ari, but I'm, I'm sure TSM has done their research and Bjergsen alone knows how to handle these Ari. So I, I'm wondering if he's going to be on the same level when Bjergsen start playing Zed, when Bjergsen start playing Talon. At the other side of the map, on the support side, Enrated, he plays a lot of these niche picks. And if you look at his solo queue stats, he had a lot of Alistar. Then it switched to Vel'Koz. I mean, I'm, I barely saw a Thresh game in there. Obviously, I don't know what he's screaming with. But yeah. I do hope he, he has the, the basics prepared before he switches to niche picks because otherwise that would indicate that he's just not at the same level as Lost Boy. Well, we are about to find out. Guys, it is time to put you in the hot seat. Brush off your crystal balls. Which team is going to come out on top? We're going to run this one down the line once again. Crepo, prediction, winner. TSM or SK? Yeah, well, I have TSM for my uh, plausible <laughs> first. I hope I don't regret that decision. So, uh, TSM. Crumbs? Well, you know, before the suspension, I would have perhaps thought that SK could give them a run for their money, but now I'm going to have to go with TSM for sure. I, I think this was always going to be a very close matchup, um, and I still have to think uh, TSM is going to come out here with the suspension. SK, this group has kind of been broken up into three teams and unlikely SK. So TSM, I think, is the obvious choice. I think TSM has a really good shot as well. That's my pick. But the question does stand that many of these players haven't actually played at Worlds yet. So maybe that actually shakes these guys up. You never know. We're, SK is green as well, to be completely fair on this one. But um, sometimes just teams don't show up properly at Worlds. And that could always sh just change things around. But I think TSM is the favorite.
Yeah, I do agree. I think that's an important note to remember. Let's compare the fan protections. According to lolesports.com, 84% of you guys what a surprise. think that TSM <laughs> will take the win. Yeah, I don't think too many people. That's a great amount of support. Guys, before we head to this match, TSM tells us what it means to carry the hopes of the North American LCS onto the global stage of the World Championship. It's pretty special to be here at Worlds. Like, you play the whole season just for this moment, and it means everything to you. I was there watching all through the groups to the final last year, just spectating, and I just really wanted to be on that stage, and this is my chance. For our group stage and judging from the other LCS teams, yeah, we're probably carrying the hopes of the LCS. I would say we're the hope of the Western region right now. Me and Bjergsen obviously from the EU TNA, so we unite basically NA and EU and try to show that we're capable of beating Koreans and basically beating other regions. If we don't do well, then fans are going to feel like other teams that didn't manage to get here could have done better than us. So there is pressure on us, but it's also up to us to relieve that pressure and just play like we would usually. It's the biggest stage I've ever been on, and it's basically the last chance in this season to prove our worth. Well, we're about to see what TSM can and be put to the test as they come up in their next match, or their first match, I should say. Let's get right to it with a quick look at the starting lineups. On the blue side, it's going to be Team Solo mid. In the top lane, it's Dyrus. In the, in the jungle, it's amazing. Bjergsen in the mid lane, Wild Turtle at 80 carry, and Lost Boy, always on support. And of course, on the red side, it is SK Gaming. That means in the top lane, it is Freddy122. Coming in a substitute is Gilius in the jungle. Jez is in the mid lane, Candy Panda as the AD carry, and alongside him is Enrated as support. And something about SK is even whenever they made it in the LCS, they're just constantly underestimated. Mm. SK, they barely made it in. How could they possibly have a good split? They take second place in spring. Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. They get this huge slump in the middle of the year. And they come back again. Now they have suspension. They're playing with a sub. Everyone completely counts them out. Never count SK out. They're actually an incredibly heady bunch. And they do know how to play together. Yeah, one of the things SK has had throughout the entire season is they will generally lose the lane phase. But they always manage to pull together as a team and somehow manage to hang on work the way back into it, and pick up the wins. And it's just one of those things throughout the entire season. We've been vexed by exactly how it works. <laughs> That's the tricky thing, though, because over on the other side of the pond, TSM, when they win the laning phase, they almost never lose. That's one of the big reasons yeah. they pick strong laning champions and just the way they play. It's a very conservative style, actually. When they lose, they actually barely lose because they slowly get bled out and are afraid to make moves. That's why when they do have the lane victories, mm -hmm. they slowly win in the same fashion. So as far as a matchup goes, this is very heavily in TSM's favor because of the lanes. Well, Bjergsen calling the shots with Amazing on the side of Team Solo Mid. That's Freddy's job. Team Captain over on the side of SK Gaming. And something we'll have to note for Team Solo Mid throughout the entire tournament is a Nidalee ban that's yeah. going to have to go down. Well. They banned Nidalee in 14 of their 14 NALCS playoff games, and they're not going to be picking it up for Worlds. I oh. think that's pretty clear. That is just a ban used every single game, a definite weakness in TSM's overall strategy they're going to have to overcome. Oh. Yeah, and it's an absolutely needed one because Freddy would quite happily pick that up. Kale also banned out, and that, you may be thinking it's towards Jezus or Freddy, but no, it could well be N-rated. He's played his support three times throughout the season. Zed, of course, yeah. focus towards Bjergs, and the big one for me, though, is is Syndra going to be banned? SK have let this one through before, despite the fact in Europe they know the champions in that mid lane, big players like Frog and like Peke can play it well, just like Bjergsen can, but they're happy to go up against it. Aatrox for targeted towards Freddy. That's going to put Freddy uncomfortable, and there is the Syndra ban. Definite target banning. However, I think the big reason they banned Cinder there is they would have loved to ban Alistair or Maokai, but if you're not going to be able to control them, you just have to be able to trade them back and forth. Thyra's picking Alistair, I expect Maokai to come back on the other side. Woohoo, awesome pickups to start. The cow does get through in game two. As we go through the group stages, Freddy and Gilius now to pick up. Eyes on Gilius as well. Consider him to be an impact here to come in for the team if he can continuously play as Senskaren did. Like they said, a little bit of counter jungling, but will he fall into that style? It's a fair bit of pressure. He was just in a pretty pressure-packed situation, actually, on Unicorns of Love. He qualified yeah. for the LCS. He ends up picking Kha'Zix, 
which is something Sven Skarin actually was 6-1 on the playoffs with, so he's really just trying to fill his shoes, not change anything strategically for SK. They didn't rely on jungle shot calling to begin with. Most of their shot calling comes from Freddy 1-2-2 in the top lane, so maybe they can just pull off their normal strategies here. It does, of course, mean that Lee Sin has snuck through. 17 bans against him, amazing in that mid lane. Of course, back in the Copenhagen Wolves in Europe Spring, he was one of those top champions as well. So he's managed to rock this champion throughout yeah. the entire season, be it in Europe or North America. And against the European team, it should work well for him. Alongside him, of course, Nami picked up a Lust Boy, someone that's come in for TSM and absolutely done incredible things. Yeah, no surprises on TSM side, just picking the big time champions. A surprise on the SK Whoa, side, yeah. though. Yeah. Locking down the zone, a very nice coming in for N Rated. They said he's got to make his, make his champion pool bigger. All right, so we've seen a little bit of Sona play. It's been patchy throughout. Uh, some Chinese teams are actually playing it. LGD Gaming. Obviously, N Rated is also a type of person who used to rely on Sona occasionally. It is the new Sona updated. If they're able to group up and if TSM doesn't have a lot of AoE, it's a little better. However, they're playing it against Alistair, Nami, and then whatever else TSM decides to throw at them. It is a vulnerable pick in the laning phase, a squishy champion. But if Sona does get ahead, I very much respect her power. I'm surprised. I'm not that surprised to see her at Worlds. I am surprised to see Mundo picked up instead of Maokai in that. So that's something yeah. that has switched across for Freddy. Going to see how that works out. Of course, Ari's still on the table, but we're going to wait to see whether these Yasuo does get locked in for Bjergsen. And of course, Wild Turtle on Tristan, no surprises. That team synergizes amazingly if they lock it in. Everybody can prep Bjergsen for the knockup of Last Breath, and it is locked in. A lot of top tier picks coming from Team Solo Mid. One thing the TSM likes to do Ooh. frequently, instead of counter picking matchups, is to pick entire team comps. And this is very similar to the Yasuo compositions they ran throughout the regular season when they would go for Yasuo. The only difference is they would run Lulu in the top lane, but they have a monster in there with the cow as well. So every single person on that team can contribute to Yasuo's ultimate, giving Bjergsen every single option he wants as far as which target to go for, and really trying to set him up to carry. Going back to that Mondo, these only been once Freddy has played that the entire summer. So it's definitely a turnaround, and we wondered that with the bands coming in, the nearly the Aatrox targeted towards him. Has that put Freddy in an uncomfortable position? Dyer is up against him. We'll see how it works out for him. It's true. One of the big stories that we need to follow here is whether or not Dyrus can neutralize Freddy and kind of take him off of his game. As a shot calling top laner, if you're struggling in your own lane, you're not going to be able to make very many good initiation plays. Also, Mundo himself isn't a very good initiator, it will be kind of difficult for SK to find the right type of plays throughout the map. Well, with the match about to get underway, we'd like to turn our attention to Twitter. Tell us who you think will score first blood. Use the hashtags TSM win or hashtag SK win. And of course, we'll send your tweets to LOA Sports. We'll check them out as we get the game underway. Here are the teams, here are the champions. What do we think here? Well, a little bit of sustain in the bot lane yeah. is the one thing that I think. Not necessarily a huge lead here for Tristanami. If they can land a few big time bubbles, it will be very interesting to see whether Enrieta can stay alive. I think that bottom lane is potentially the weak point. Potentially the weak point of TSM. Wild Turtle has struggled massively in laning phase near the end of the North American season, and he needs to pick it up for Worlds. And here we are, game two. Coming out of group B for this one. TSM versus SK Gaming. As we said, Gilius stepping in for Svensk Garen throughout this. And we are going to see the game underway. Well, one thing I never thought I'd hear in Taipei there you go. is the TSM champ. Clearly the home favorites <laughs> here. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> yeah. so, and who knows? Coming way out right away. So one thing that's, that's always intrigued me about SK is they're the team that is all right with taking breaks but they'll come back a little weaker than they usually do, and even did so coming into Worlds, but it's kind of a yeah. stop the burnout factor for them. It's one of those teams, we talk about their sports psychologists frequently, but during right, right. the summer split, when they were slumping, when they came out of the slump, Candy Panda was very upfront about it. He said, we slumped because we were slacking off. We weren't practicing as much because we didn't want to burn out before the end of the season. They started grinding near the end of the season. They made it back in the playoffs. They gave Alliance a great run in the semifinals. Many people think SK was actually the second best team in Europe after playoffs. Of course, all of that changes with the Gilius substitution in the jungle right now. 
but it definitely has to be noted. Maybe they're going to be more fresh than other teams. Yeah, and the Gilead substitution is obviously a, a big, big point in this one. But you would say, despite the fact he's you know a fresh-faced kid he coming into this one, thrown into the World Championships, completely wouldn't have expected that. It was a challenger <laughs> team not too long ago. He has performed brilliantly on Unicorns of Love. You cannot deny it. However, it is a very different team. That's all about supporting Power of Evil in the mid lane. Can he do yeah. the same with Jezus? Jezus is a completely different player to Power of Evil. Power of Evil will carry games and Gilius will support him. And I gotta wonder, with Freddy being the shot caller, whether he's just gonna pull him towards that top lane or maybe down the bottom. Well, you usually get the regular lane of Jezus kind of farming, being by himself. You didn't get a lot of attention from that Seth Garen either. Yeah, hopefully for SK, they have enough confidence to let him make his own decisions. Because as soon as you start bossing a jungler around, you completely neutralize them as a player. So down the bottom, immediate aggression. Will we see some level two plays from either of these teams? TSM playing it cautiously. Back towards the tower, Candy Panda shoving the wave in alongside n -rated. It's been a long time since we saw Sona down in this bottom lane. I'm ready for it. <laughs> I was watching a whole bunch of LGD games and their support would often pair it with Graves and they had a lot of success Whoa. in the laning phase. The damage output, when they get both people in that new Q snuggle zone, they can get a whole <laughs> bunch of damage when they decide to go for a trade. Giving out all the hugs to start off the game. Looks like pretty on par for both junglers here as they start. We even may get treatment for the bottom lane from both if they decide to go straight there. A lot of pressure in this game. We talk about pressure for Dyrus and being able to perform here. Did quite well in the playoffs for Team Solo Mid. Also talk about Jezz, who's talked about his confidence kind of being shaken. Mm -hmm. He's quoted himself as that. I have to really wonder what's going to happen in this mid lane. Bjergsen is just so good in the mid lane. And yeah. obviously, Jezz is not the most hyped mid laner. He just kind of has to get by. He's usually pretty consistent as well. Uh -oh. This is a tough one, though. Yeah, looks like Bjergsen's trying to set him up here, trying to force him off to the left-hand side. Amazing, ready and waiting to go, but doesn't look like he's taking the bait right now. Jez is going pretty deep on get this the one. Up. He's in trouble. Can they get him down? Manages to dodge the Sonic Wave. Ignite was also used. Heal flash by Jez as some of the spells burnt on both sides, but Jez is safe for now. Got to yeah. say, oh, my boy's very impressed when an early level 3 Yasuo can get off that attack. You, you already have the wall or the Q up. They know it's yes. coming. Jez has had to blow the flash. Really nice move there by Bjergsen. Obviously fairly aggressive. If Gillies would have been there for a counter gank, it would have been rather dangerous. Amazing also burned his flash. So at the end of the day, it is a two for two summoner trade. Not actually that great of a thing for TSM. Bottom lane still quite back and forth. More pressure yeah. in the mid lane. Jez is going to get a bit of attention from Gilius. So it's going to be different for them, but he is still going to play it safe and not show that Gilius is there. Good control by them. This is tricky, I feel. Bjergsen well aware of the fact that if Jezus is being that aggressive, that far up the lane. He knows there is Gilius waiting in the wings just off the side there. He calls in the reinforcements. Amazing waiting there. Doesn't look like we're going to see some play, but Jezus may well get caught out again here. Pulse defensive ball will get knocked up. Here they go. Sonic Wave does catch this time around. First blood is coming. It's amazing that gets it for TSM. That mid lane jungle synergy brought all the way over from Europe. Definitely starting to work out even more for TSM every single game they seem to get better. Bjergsen now level five and should punish Jesses with no summoners. And it's great. History repeats uh -oh. itself for TSM. Ooh, top lane Dyrus getting a little roughed up there by Freddy. I talked to a lot of people about Alistair in the top lane, and I was actually one person that was of the opinion that you can manage him, especially with Amundo. If you can somehow sustain through him. Doran shields Freddy with a lot of health regen as well. You remove his ability to out-harass you with headbutt, and then you start turning around with more damage in teamfights. It definitely feels like Freddy is ready for this one. That's why they didn't pick Maokai, because they wanted that matchup. And one thing that always catches you out as a player is, of course, the fact that Alistair, without the ultimate, is squishy in all yep. things. You think you're his big, giant tank. Without items, you can be handled. Freddy returns, teleport used by both top laners to come back in there, and they immediately go straight back at it, <laughs> going straight in with that headbutt. Freddy almost certainly has health regen roots in that top lane. Currently with the Giant Spell, he's at 49 health regen per five seconds. He's really going to be able to withstand that Dyrus headbutt, and it's basically a neutralized farm lane. There is no bully potential from Dyrus in that lane anymore. Amazing, looks like he wants to get Freddy a little bit of aggression here in the top lane. Jezus 
trying to keep himself safe there, and it looks like Freddy's gonna have a little uh -oh. bit of trouble. Amazing, slowly waiting yeah. on the outside. Gilius nowhere near They're this trying one. to go before Freddy has his ultimate, but he's still pretty tanky. Is he going to be tanky enough? Flashes out, Sonic Wave catches on, but he can just walk away from this one, as you mentioned, with that giant belt on him. Yeah. It's no problem for him. One thing that has happened, though, Jez is forced back to lane early on there. Had to go and respect it. Goes for the cloth armor. Fantastic pickup there by Freddy. Almost nullifies the fact that you can dive that Mundo before six and get him down. I like it a lot. Down back down to the bottom lane. Candy Panda is really using a lot of that mana to get himself in range as Wild Turtle and Muskway continue the harass from this lane that has come so far this season for Team Solo Mid. Both are very close to level six right now. You can see the sizing each other up, seeing who can land it. Will it be the wave? Will it be the crescendo that starts things off? Of course, Dragon could easily follow. This is the right time. The junglers are up in the top half of the jungle, so it's both be really a straight up duel between these two. And Radio taking some damage. It's TSM that are, you would feel are in the stronger position right now, but that crescendo in the right point can be critical. Yeah. They still have Wild Turtle on Trist. If they can get him out of the laning phase unscathed, yeah. it's a huge boon for TSM. Even Ooh. when he was getting beaten in laning phase, he was still having good team fights with Trist, and they're going even actually down bottom. Gilius back to the mid lane, just for a cross, making sure Amazing isn't trying to make a return pass, but it looks like TSM is happy with that first kill they got here. It's gonna definitely give them a spike if they go for that first fight, but they're going to have to be careful. It is a great fight team comp from SK. More pressure to the bottom lane here. No shots on either turret yet, but you can just see how dominant Wild Total is on that Tristana. Tricky, tricky stuff in this bottom lane. Level six, imminent between the two junglers are down in the lower half of the jungle, and Dyrus, he is on a this warpath. Is the, this is the Alistair dive. He can't do anything to Freddy, so why not go mid for Jessus? Right into the wall, we'll stop him up for a little bit longer. The synergy comes in from the Mad Pow. Jess is ignited, Jess is down. The only way Jess lives through that is if he flashes while Dyrus is trying to headbutt him. He does not, he gets displaced. Bjergsen alts on top, it is a systematic well executed gank by TSM. And the blue also being stolen away by Amazing. He took his own, now he's gonna take theirs. And that's a big problem for Jessens. He needed to get hold of that. He needs to try to keep up with BX. And you can see the CS difference is starting to become huge between them. And he knew that coming into this game that Bjergsen versus Jezus was going to be a critical point. And now we're gonna get a 3v2 dive on yeah. bottom. It's in a ward though. Gilius will try and counter gank this one, but Amazing goes in. Oh, not quite gonna land it. Candy Panda, Gilius tries to react, comes across, catches the Crescendo oh, and Amazing, and man. that is the first kill for SK. That was right on the point, the edge of the Crescendo, but N-Rated landed it. What a spectacular shot right there by N-Rated. Doesn't even have to burn flash, definitely well practiced on Sona, that's exactly what SK needed to just stay survived in this game. Gilius has been completely outmatched by Amazing up until that point where the ward of the bottom lane and the crescendo of the bottom lane is able to help him out against the enemy jungler. Another Giant's belt coming in for Freddy here. Looks like he's got to keep his pants up a little bit more. This lane, <laughs> definitely going to be a long fight lane if it goes down to it. We see the Triforce already coming out here for Dyrus. Things are getting crazy up there. Yeah, and I wonder if that amazing play would have pulled off. That would have been a dragon for TSM, I feel, but it's definitely put stops on that one. It's delayed it for a while. We talked about SK's weak laning phase. It is very much showing right here. Mm -hmm. The mid lane, of course, big, strong, dominant force. Wild Turtle on Tristana. If he can get going on that ahead of Illusion, it is a win in lane phase regardless. The top lane, big difference in farm, but Dyrus yeah. has already roamed. He's already got himself assist. Everything TSM has used has been towards Bjergsen, and that's really their power point right now. He's got a two-level advantage onto Jess's. I suppose SK is trying to come back by just building multiples of the same items. Double giant spell, <laughs> triple longsword. <laughs> At this point, they're still in a little bit of trouble, though, because Bjergsen is very powerful. Could be difficult. However, if Amazing continues to make aggressive plays, it will give them small windows to come back. Will he check the brush? Possibly not, but another ward goes down. At, they're, they're re warding these to make sure they have consistent vision throughout the jungle. Gilius spotted out by that ward of TSM. There's the culling being used while Turtle healed straight up by Lost Boy. Mm. No problems there. Double buff still on Candy Panda, remember, from that earlier gank by Amazing. That's about to wear off. Gilius, a little bit of counter jungling here, but Amazing, he's creeping around the back of Jezus, but he's spotted. 
Jess is, if this turns into a 2v2 of any kind, TSM would come out on top, which is why Jess has to run away. However, oh. Gilius gets a little bit caught. Wards everywhere, and they're going to be able to give some protection to Gilius. He's forced to flash over the wall. Tough game for him. He is getting warded out everywhere. It's going to be a tough series. He just got thrown into the World Championship, mm -hmm. obviously, and he is struggling a little bit here. Even the wards they're placing on the top side that aren't seeing Gilius are, is alerting TSM of where he is on the map. If he hasn't crossed the top side, then he's in the bottom. Let's make a gank here. They're using everything to their advantage, and every lane seems to have a good one of that. Bjergsen is completely honed in right now as well. And because Amazing is just setting up camp right there, there's nothing SK can really do to come back here unless... Unless Bjergsen makes a mistake, he's completely... Landing all the skill shots, keeping the pressure up, and the ward coverage is immaculate around where he is right now. Yeah, completely manhandled. There is a ward spotting this one. They know that this dragon is going down. I don't think they're going to do anything about it other than get a timer. You see SK sneaking in, but immediately the call's been given back away. You're never going to get close to this one. Gilius was not there. So, first dragon, big objective for TSM. Gives them a fairly substantial goal yeah. lead. Just 12 minutes into this game. They're playing very well. Very controlled. And it's kind of the way TSM always wants to play. They focus around Bjergsen so he can be a playmaker late game. And Ooh. the biggest thing here is their bottom lane is actually winning. A lot of praises sung towards Team Solo Mid as they were boot camping a bit. Plus Boy having great play throughout all that, that practice. And TSM has definitely changed a few things about their gameplay. Getting that aggressive early start, and it's really paying off. 13 minutes on to this one. Not much pressure from Gilius in this bottom lane, and Candy Panda and N-Rated have been at that turret the majority of the time. Chez has absolutely struggled in this mid lane. Still yet to get his hands yeah. on the blue buff. Nearly 30 CS behind on Bjergsen. Absolutely has been the focus, and why not? It's it's well known that he is the weak point of SK Gaming in that mid lane. Completely leaving the top lane alone. Dyrus and Freddy have been on yeah. the island, untouched, and you know, it's a gigantic tank versus a gigantic tank, so no surprises. And we can see the overall gold lead here being about 2.5 thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, 1,200 of that is in the mid lane. So it is just wow. them absolutely picking on Jesses right now. And I think they're just going to continue this. There's nothing drastic that TSM needs to do. They need to continue to set up some ganks, obviously on Jess's. If they push him back far enough, then Bjergsen can begin roaming. But they're really just trying to work from the mid lane outwards towards the rest of the map. And Jess is, is so piecing together his build. His spike will be so far away, trying to get a few items in there. And then Bjergsen coming out so strong already has to put in that Seeker's Arm Guard. TSM once again towards the blue. Gilius able to figure it out. Looks like they get away nice and clean. This could well be the first claps we see. And the first big team fight, honestly. This blue buff, mm -hmm. is it worth fighting over? TSM, little unsure on this one. They're buying time instead for the mid lane. They are going to give this one up. That means, oh, are they? Amazing tries <laughs> to land it sneakily at the end there. Trying to force a smite, I think, from Gilead's there. He did use it. Jezus gets the blue, though. Yeah, that was pretty much it. There's still a lot of pressure lost there by SK just to secure their blue buff. One thing I will say is, even though SK is not buying a whole bunch of wards, they got pretty good value in the wards they are actually buying. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh, indeed. Everybody swarming the top lane here. Freddy They're using his ultimate early on this one, so it's going to be wearing off. Flashes it. They're getting what they want. <laughs> Blocking the business there as he gets out. Buys nice time in the mid lane, though. We'll see whether they can push out or whether they're going to get punished for it. That's the question. Crescendo on the wild turtle. He's going to get locked up, and is it enough? Great disengage from Lost Boy. The wave, the aqua prison, everything lands, and TSM just walk away. Pretty sweet move there by N Rated using Crescendo from the Fog of War, though. Definitely catching Wild Turtle a little bit out of position, but they're able to get out thanks to the fantastic play from Lost Boy. As we said, getting those praises sung, and he's showing it here on the stage as well, keeping consistent play up. That gold lead isn't getting much farther away, so SK has been able to stave off the advantage TSM has now, but Amazing is getting everything. Bjergsen's not needing blue buffs. He is getting big. Level 10 to Gilius is 9, still getting warded out in his jungle. TSM on a good path right now. One thing that has actually worked well for Jez is the fact that he's built into this. You just saw there, while he did get it, a little bit of damage on him from mm -hmm. Bjergsen, it didn't do as much this time. He's got them Seeker's Arms Guard. It has delayed his build. You can see he hasn't got that Athenes yet, but he's built correctly. Hasn't managed to stick to his path, built against what he needs. And it is going to be a simple game of delaying for SK Gaming, honestly. They need to get 
a lot of items on Jezus, but the fact is Bjergsen is going to have those two critical items before he gets there. And I feel like Freddy is just hoping he has enough armor to withstand a late game Wild Turtle. As far as TSM goes, especially with the Trinity Force Alistair, they are a full attack damage team. So armor stacking actually will work very well against them if they can get to reasonable levels of gold difference. At the moment, TSM is still outpacing them a little too quickly, but if this was an even gold game late and SK itemized appropriately with a lot of armor, they would actually have an item edge in that sense because their defensive items would be much more efficient. Such a spike Ooh. right now coming in for Team Solo. Uh -oh. And Gilius gets hit up. That's just the shiv and the wow. Q. A little bit of pain being delivered there. That can also come from Wild Turtle. These guys far and ahead on items, a minute on Dragon, and they're going to look to pressure that quite nicely. Forced to back off. Gilius heads back to the jungle. Looks like he's cleaning up what he can. Still warded out on the top side. They are not making it easy for the newcomer. I can't tell whether that was good to reaction from Gilius to not flash there mm. or simple shock. <laughs> he's just like, I've just lost half my hit points, guys. I don't, I don't know what happened. He had Oriana right behind him, so yeah, obviously Bjergsen was just being a little bit safe. It was still real scary, though. Sightstone on, on Lee Sin very early as well. Uh, Lizard Elder, for a second I thought it was a Sightstone Kha'Zix. But no, that's just a normal build for me. Gilius can't get next to a brush without getting uh -oh. hit. Jazz is Bjergsen getting his own ultimate in. Oh, the Sonic Wave doesn't quite hit, but the safeguard comes in. Whoa. He cleans it up with the last Q. What a slick move there by TSM. I thought they were leaving him a little bit extra alive, knowing he'd still have a Shockwave to suck him back in. Amazing, making it out just in the nick of time, barely taking any damage. Oh, Crescendo does not land this time around, and that's the Aqua Prism followed by the bubble. Brilliant play, oh. but then Rainy gets away. Wild Turtle not going to get turned around. Candy Panda wants the pursuit, but Amazing's coming in around the side. Candy oh, gets no. back towards him, comes around the backside, and Rainy, Sonic Wave doesn't land. No reactions. Bjergs and oh. go. Dyrus teleports in. They are so dead. Five man. Pylon in the bottom, SK Gaming in all sorts of trouble. Freddy comes down to join the party, but he's simply just another death for TSM. That's a double for Wild Turtle. Three for zero. Fantastic play by TSM. Sometimes when you're under a turret, you just have to give up. <laughs> At that point, the teleport yeah. was completely wasted. TSM had a monstrous uh -oh. advantage. There was no escape, and SK just makes matters worse. Wow! Gilius going down. Jess is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the cow comes in to give him the what for. Picking and up the dragon. dragon. This train is rolling down the tracks way too quick for SK. Something about TSM games. They play slow, they say they play slow, and then they explode. Seemingly kills all around the map. Obviously, this one was a crazy, crazy fight. The shield surprising Wild Turn at the last second, getting him low, but the collapse from TSM was just fantastic. Amazing gets in behind them. Almost the fact that he was missing these spells just made matters worse because it delayed the inevitable. Warding to allow Dyrus with the turret dive. Freddy, really bad teleport right there. Did not even have his ultimate, just teleported into dive. A five man dive with the damage reduction from an Alistair is easy pickings there for TSM. And honestly, I, I completely question why on earth they decided to engage Bjergsen back in that mid lane when Gilius came back in. They already saw the damage he was doing. There's simply not enough ability power for Jezus to put that shield on and return the damage back to Bjergsen. Simple, easy double kill for him. And now, when a Yasuo is at 402, oh. you have big problems. And Bjergsen as well, giving the shot caller uh -oh, a lead in the game. Top lane indeed, trying to lock down once more onto Freddy. He should be all right on this one, backing off. Like you said, Jat, sometimes you got to leave that turret. This turned into a stop. <laughs> very quickly. 9,000 gold at 20 minutes. They took advantage of Gilius. That's that not a, they, they did. That's not a goalie to come back. They took advantage of everyone. This is true. On SK, it really feels like. The bottom lane stood true. Freddy, uh, he was trying to pull a stalemate lane, mm. but he could not control Dyrus' roam. And every member of TSM has contributed no more, no one more than Bjergsen though. Good lord. Freddy in trouble. He's going down. Flash is out, but that's not going to be enough. You cannot survive the damage that Bjergsen has. And that's with a Randian Zoman giant spell and a chain vest. He still gets shredded. Dyrus turning on towards Candy Panda. 2v1. Has he got the damage? I think Candy Panda must have gone deep on towards the tower to have this much damage. He's got that Triforce move speed. He's still going. There's so much that, that the other team can do with this. Dyrus is holding Candy Panda and Edrated hostage right now as TSM runs a muck on the map. Oh, Gilius going down. What turtle finds himself a target. Dyrus bullies out to both Candy Panda and 
red in. Middle lane is wide open. It's only Jezels that's holding ground, and Bjergsen fancies it. Maybe he's going to sniff for it. No! Early Baron! Why not? Why not? Everything going on for them. 10,000 gold lead. They built a Bloodthirster on Yasuo, which you've seen from a few players, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'll let the analyst desk cover that one, because I want them to talk about Bloodthirster on Yasuo. More lifesteal, a little bit of a shield, less solo potential, but this is just TSM turning scrim results into absolute domination. That's a really good way to put it. They're at the playoffs, Reginald said, play it like a scrim. Let's just see this one more time. Yeah, Gilius, what the hell was he thinking? You made a big mistake right there. <laughs> uh, Wild Turtle is really strong. Did he even evolve? That's just... Forcing yourself to make plays. Play. I mean, that's mm, a Kha'Zix right. that has evolved his spikes and his leap. Trying to solo and isolate a target. Maybe if he maxed an evolved Q. Maybe then he could take down Wild Turtle. If not, he has no chance. And it's going to get harder and harder. Three static shifts across the board. Every lane is going to be pushing at max speed right now. And TSM is not going to be stopping. SK finally putting everything back into the middle. Freddy still loves to go for the 1-4, so he's going to try and stay, try and keep Dyrus at bay. But it's only going to be too long. It's not going to be too long before TSM's right in the base. Could we legitimately be seeing the first time TSM make it out of a group stage at Worlds? They are. <laughs> Looking strong here, Let's honestly. Not getting too far ahead. No doubt about it. Well, technically, you could argue they were in the quarterfinals in season two, but that's because right. they got a direct seed there. TSM, though, legitimately have come to this World Championships with the best chance they've ever had, and we're hearing yeah. absolutely great things about them from Scrims. They have two games today as well. There's three different that's teams right. in their group. TPA, they will not play today. Starhorn Royal Club, they will. And they're yeah. going to have a lot of momentum after this one because they have put on a spectacular performance here. Just looking for more. They got three static shivs. They got a 13,000 gold lead. Make that 13,500. And, and there's no reason for them to stop here. It's going up. They're definitely going to need the Swiss bank soon on this one. Inhibitor turret's going to be going down. 24 minutes. We're coming up. Finding the game. It could be SK going for broke here. They uh, do deter what? Team Solo mid just a little bit. And Freddy calls himself in. Here we, we go. Control. The fight turtle gets hit up. Will he be able to keep it going? Everybody's jumping in and going for broke this time. Gilius gets hit, hit up. Thrown down in the box. And they go for Freddy towards the fountain. He's going to go down. They're aced in their base at 23 and a half minutes. Oh. And the surrender for game two at World Group stages comes in from SK. Team Solo Men takes the game 15 to 1. What a way to start their journey towards the World Championship. Obviously, they're playing against a wounded SK Gaming that was yes. not together in this one. But they definitely knew how to finish that time. That is the fastest, most decisive game I have probably seen from TSM since they formed this roster for sure. And to do it on the world stage in their first game is spectacular. You gotta think. Bjergsen, we talked about him, is the pressure on him, the shot caller, the man of the moment for TSM, and by God did he perform on Yasuo this early on. From the very get-go, he looked like a man on a mission. I don't even know how to finish this one, because the game got out of hand so quickly. We were like 14, 15 minutes in. They were, SK was doing all right, you know? They were just hanging around, thinking maybe Mundo can get to a point, and then it was over. I gotta focus on the point that TSM adapted to that misplay so quickly. Amazing went in, and they didn't do it ever again. They didn't make a wrong call after that. They were in the game, and they were ready to just take the win. Knowing they had the advantage, TSM played as they usually do. Loco Doco coming around, the team says, the sixth player of the team, and he's been paying off for him. Yeah, absolutely fantastic stuff. TSM coming in strong in the first game of Group B. The, the game was so fast. That was yeah. a 24-minute game. You don't see games that fast really anymore happen. And sure, SK surrendered, but that's because their Nexus was probably going to die. They'd just been completely aced inside of their base. I would say they've, they've done it to Alliance as well. They've had that against them. 24 yeah. minutes, boom, done. Thank Jeez. you very much. We've had to uh, give up the Ghost. They've done it themselves. They've had some fast games, but... Hmm? We talked about the lane phase. We talked about how SK will start slow and TSM coming into this one clearly well aware of that fact and putting the pressure points where it was needed. You know, you got to talk about the bottom lane. A lot of questions were on Wild Turtle coming into this game, but with Lustboy alongside him, the safety net is there. And clearly, 
you know, the harness is strong with that one because the there's a lot lane, of big disengages coming yeah. out from Lost Boy. The bottom play, lane played good knock rate. Mm. The reason the Wild Turtle is able to come out 5.03 is because Bjergsen played great. Yes. Uh, and you've got to think, you know, coming against Starhorn later on today against Uzi, it's a big, big question mark. I can't wait. That's going to be the last game of the day, game six. And if we continue having 23-minute games, it could be a quick day. Pretty soon. <laughs> so <laughs> here's the thing. Obviously, Team Solomon not caught in a trap game. They did what they yeah. wanted, but that was a great point. They just went in and made a composition. Can they do that against Royal Club? Or are they going to be forced to back and forth with those picks and bans? I don't think so. That composition was a little bit too perfect yeah. for TSM. Everyone having knock-up synergy with Bjergsen, being able to set up mid lane ganks that could not be countered by SK. They got absolutely everything. Lost Boy got to play Nami, right? Yeah. Please, someone. <laughs> you know, like, it, they're not even using early picks on it. It was like, like got it late. history repeats itself in the beginning of the game. Just another generation of Reginald and having Odd One in his back pocket to start off a game. Well, so should we talk about Dyrus in that top lane? Because, you know, it was a fairly solid game. Didn't really get too much involvement, yeah. but his teleport was the one that counted when they piled down the bottom lane. He played like Darius when Darius plays well. You don't really notice him until he's winning the game for you, right? Like, <laughs> he was withstanding Amundo well in lane, and then he made a great play mid, he made a great play bottom, and that really catapulted the game. That's right. All right, so we're going to send it over to Shox right now, who's on stage for a word with TSM's Bjergsen. Thank you very much, Riv. Uh, first off, congratulations, Bjergsen. There is not much uh, more that you can hope for uh, getting a first game like that here at the World Championship. Talk me through the strategy, very much focusing on your mid lane in the beginning. Um, it was just pretty much how the game were, or the picks worked out. We weren't expecting them to give us all these power picks like Nami on Lost Boy. We have Alistar, we got Lee Sin on Amazing. We just got all these really good comfort champions and all these champions that these players are basically known for. And it just led into a really good comp overall. Yeah, absolutely. And Reggie was saying how you guys would have strong laners. You got all of those. And then the team synergy for SK was praised by Reginald, but you guys didn't even have to deal with that. Tell me how the game snowballed out of control. Um, it was just pretty much the way the lane was set up mid. We, can, we managed to get a gank off. And I think as soon as you get a kill on a stage like this, everyone just feels like you're in control and you know exactly what to do and you're just on point. And I feel like as soon as you get just a couple kills, everyone knows what to do. Everyone's on the same page and everyone feels like this is where we need to go and that we're the better team. Well, it is a fantastic start for you guys in this group. Talk me through your thoughts on the group overall. Great first game. Do you think SK won't be a bottle for you guys anymore, and who will be? Um, I think for this group specifically, it's definitely going to be uh, Stormheart and Royal. Um, they're kind of like a weird team. We haven't been able to get that much other than what they've just been playing in the in their own scene. But I think they're just a really strong team, and they have a lot of specific picks that they play really well, and we need to be ready for that. And it's not something we've been able to practice against. Well, then let's look forward to that game because it is, of course, the last game uh, of the day here versus Starhorn Royal Club. And going up against a Chinese mid laner, a wholly different style. How are you feeling going into that? Um, I've been playing against Wei Zhao in NA for a while, and he's, he's just a great player. So I'm ready for a lot of different things. And I've heard that Chinese players are, they can play a lot of different mids. They can be very versatile. And I can't wait to play against their aggression. Yeah, I can't wait to see what you pull out. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thanks. All right. And now we're going to head back over to the guys at the desk. Thank you very much, and what a dominant performance from Bjergsen with the aid of Amazing camping out that middle lane throughout the early stages of the game. Truthfully, TSM had SK's number through the entirety of that match, all the way back to picks and bans. Uh, and the early game, what was your thoughts on the Sona pickup for Inrated, uh, knowing Brown was open, and how SK handled the laning phase? Yeah, looking at at what point, at the end of the draft basically, SK had one pick left, and they knew they were going to play Lucian because that was their early pick into Tristana Nami, and they went for Sona. And I don't I really disagree with that. I feel Sona is just an inferior version of Nami, especially when like when it comes to poking, you'll get out sustained eventually. Thresh would have been better, uh Braum would have been better, just anything with some aggressive play because you need to shut that Tristana lane down. There is this stereotype that Tristana is do so well at playoffs and worlds for some reason. Mm -hmm. But she can be beaten. She can be beaten by Lucian in lane, but you need to play the lane correctly. And maybe SK was just, you know, has the jitters coming first time, first world game, play passive, but then if you want to play passive don't pick Lucian. Uh, I do want to kind of push against you a little bit on the Sona point. I think Sona is great. Actually, if the lane were normal and not misplayed, I think Sona Lucian would have won that fight. And I think Sona does just fine against Nami. I realize you're the better support player than me, but from what, <laughs> I've, from what I've seen of League of Legends, I think Sona deserves more respect than you're giving her. But uh, that is it may. I, I do think, though, the game kind of played out as you expect. TSM have better individual players. Amazing. Obviously a better jungler than Gilius. Gilius also not a very aggressive jungler in the first place. I mean, this was a guy who was getting out jungled in his promotion relegation match against Millennium, you know? And that's... Uh, 
a tough mark to beat them when you're up against guys like Insect in your group. Yeah. I think a key point in this game happened to be that there is just no synergy between the midland and jungle. Obviously, you're putting in a substitute, and they fail to recognize that the entire team comp of TSM revolves around Yasu and getting Yasu far ahead. So Kha'Zix was basically just lounging around mid lane instead of making his own thing happen, try to create pressure elsewhere and force TSM to react. Instead, he we saw him just walk behind... Uh, Jess is the entire time just be like, okay, I'm waiting for Lee Sin to come around. Where's Lee Sin? Lee Sin never shows up because he's not going to show up in the 1v2 scenario. And he had multiple opportunities to get better objective control when they committed to making dives on Mundo. Mm -hmm. And it just never happened. Not only that, but to really jungle here at the world level, you have to have a lot of synergy with your team. Because the problem really was that it, amazing... He had those misplays. He kind of gave up the double buffs when he was trying to make the plays. But what he did really well was that he was playing always on the side of the map with the pressure, right? And Gilius looked a bit lost. He was constantly in the wrong side of the jungle, getting counter jungled, and it, it was just kind of a disaster. He had zero, zero, zero presence in that game. What do you mean playing on the side of the map with pressure? Just, just for the clarification. Uh, yeah, well, when the lanes are pushing up, so let's say you're pushed up into the top and middle side, or you've got a preferable matchup where, for example, the Dyrus Rome coming down after they had press, uh, pressed up into top, and when they had that Yasuo who was getting fed in the mid lane, go into the enemy's red buff in that circumstance if you're on the blue side, and try and control the top side of the map in that circumstance. They got the deep boards down, and then they just you can punish so hard off of that. See, uh, TSM was capitalizing on mistakes. SK wasn't doing so. At yep. one point, uh, the desk here pointed out, I actually didn't even see it myself until you guys called it out, that Julius could have went for a red buff. Instead, they went for the tower push. Same for bottom. Going back to that laning phase, I went back and watched the first like four or five minutes of that laning phase. And SK just, they gave TSM the push. They got outpoked. All their poke led up to just not be out sustaining it anyways. And they just, they didn't play aggressive enough. And if you don't play aggressive enough, you can't capitalize on the mistakes. And then you'll just die just a slow death and eventually Bjergsen will become too big. Well, very one-sided game. We will have to take a step back and talk about TSM's power later in the day. But coming up next, two teams will be making their first appearance at Worlds as Darker Passage from Turkey faces AHQ Esports Club. We'll be taking a quick look at some of the teams and players here. Are the Turkish champions? We are watching their matches from that practice room. We need to see how they step up against stronger opposition. AHQ, they are doing the same. It's uh, quite focused, calm looks on their faces. Guys, we will be moving to a short break very, very shortly. When we are back, we'll return with that match. In all sorts of trouble. Freddy comes down to join the party, but he's simply just another death for TSM. And SK just makes matters worse. Wow! Gilius going down. Jess is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Turtle gets hit up. Will they be able to keep it going? Everybody's jumping in and going for broke this time. Gilius gets hit, hit up, thrown down in the box, and they go for Freddy towards the fountain. Hello everyone, we're back with our continuing coverage of the 2014 League of Legends World Championship. And right now, I would like to welcome a local favorite, the Taipei Assassins, AD Carry, Vivi. Um, fantastic to talk to you here in Taipei. First up, what does it mean for you to be back here on the world stage after a year of not being there and of course winning it all the way in Season 2? It's very, he's very happy that he's back at the world stage. It's a dream for all the players. And uh, he hopes to uh, succeed in this season. Well, talking about succeeding in the season, you guys did fantastic over in the GPL. And uh, you guys actually said after all stars that you felt kind of behind on the foreign team. So how far do you think you've caught up coming into this tournament? So after all stars, they hired a Korean coach, and he's been giving them different uh, strategy and guides, and hopefully that has improved the team strategy by a lot. 
All right, so uh, of course you guys are coming in here, and later today you have the game versus Starhorn Royal Club and their superstar Uzi versus you in the bottom lane. How do you think that matchup is going to go, BB? So after that, you're going to have to go with Huang Zhu. Uzi is a very famous ADC. What do you have any thoughts? I know Uzi is a very famous player, so I'll go to the next game and I'll go to the next game. He knows that Uzi is a really good AD carry and he'll do his best to defeat him. All right, well, that'll be a great matchup. Uh, finally, you're here in Taipei uh, in front of your home crowd to play those games. Is there anything you want to say to the fans coming out here? The last question is, you're in Taipei, and now you're in the house. Do you have any words to tell all your fans? Thank you very much for TPA and my fans. And we will be able to win the win. Thank you. Thank you. Is, he's thanking uh, all the fans in Taiwan for their support, and uh, they'll try everything in their power to win the games. Well, it's fantastic to have you guys here, and good luck in your upcoming matches. Okay. All right, I know everyone is excited for this next match, so, so without further ado, let's send it over to the guys at the desk. Thank you very much, Sharks. It is great hearing from the players. Now, we're on to our third match, which is going to be Turkey's Dark Passage versus GPL's AHQ Esports Club. Look, both of these teams are considered to be massive underdogs in this group, but the winner of this game is the one that we think could potentially uh, be the dark horse. They could potentially go on to upset the two superstar teams. I think they've both got similar play styles. They both rely on strong mid lane play and their strong AD carries generally getting towards that mid to late game. So let's talk about, about uh, let's talk a little bit about their players. Uh, Krepo, what's your thoughts? I just want to say, yeah, do potentially, of course, they can be the Dark Horse, but after watching that first game in the group, I do think they're going to be uh, outclassed by a significant margin. Yeah, if Krep, uh, Freak, rather. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about Dark Passage. They are far and away the strongest team in their region, gone sure. undefeated for basically two straight years. Uh, they showed up big at International Wildcard, weren't really pressured. What's your take on their team and their squad? So they are, again, the best in their region, but it is a fairly small region. If you wanted to rank this team internationally, you would probably call them uh, a top EU challenger or low EU LCS caliber team. So somewhat below SK at full power. Again, I think this puts them at a, at a pretty weak spot. That said, um, they are still pretty decent and they look better than they did last year where they failed the IWC qualifier. Their star AD carry, uh, Holy Phoenix, is a very good player. He's going to be what... You know, he's going to be everything he can be, but again, it's still a tough climb for these guys. And that's kind of just the story here is Dark Passage are huge underdogs. Crumbs, you know a little bit about Westall. He's star for AHQ. Uh, what do you think he's going to do against this fairly unknown international mid laner? Uh, I actually think the matchup between these two teams is going to really come down to Westall just getting a lead. Now, Dark Passage's mid laner is not known for being an exceptional mid laner, but Westdoor is. This guy has been rank one in North American server, Korean server, and Taiwan server. He's been around for quite a while, and he's built up quite a bit of a fan base for himself. And I think we're going to see him perform. Well, we will have to find yeah. out if he does. Guys, before we throw it up to the caster desk to get us into the game, I do want to poll all of you to see who you are going to be picking. We'll do this one in a slightly mixed up order. Freak prediction, who's going to come out on top? Uh, I think definitely AHQ, and I do want to see just how strong AHQ looks. I still think they could be that team to upset, Ed to upset Edward Gaming and take second in the group. It's a long shot, but it starts here. Well, we'll see how they perform. Crumbs, you're next on my hit list. I got to go for AHQ, West Door, hoping for that Mordekaiser pick. Sound like a bit of a fan <laughs> thing, Crumbs. <laughs> Cripper, are we going to go AHQ or are you going to believe in Dark Passage? No, nah, I'll stick to AHQ. AHQ I, I well. too actually want a Mordekaiser pick now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> of course. I, I used to scream a little bit with it with Froggen. We let him have it for a couple of times and you can have fun with Mordekaiser. So yeah, why not? Well, it worked for Overpower <laughs> a couple of times. Yeah. Monte Cristo, final thoughts. HQ, I don't think there's a lot to say here. They play in a vastly more competitive region, and despite Dark Passage dominance, it's it's probably going to be an HQ win. Well, we will see if it does work out that way. Guys, you've heard from the analyst desk. Let's see who you've picked at home to take the win over on lolesports.com. Dark Passage is leading AHQ with 53%. So I think uh, most of the viewers are a little on the fence on this one. Before we get this match underway, let's hear the players from Dark Passage tell us how they have prepared for Worlds while making a name for themselves in the fast-growing Turkish League of Legends scene.
Ee, Dark Passage bir LoL takımı arıyordu. Ee, biz de bir takım olarak bu takıma geçtik. Ee, uzun bir süre beraber kaldık. Oyuncu değişiklikleri oldu. Ee, ama her zaman kazanmayı bildik ve devam edeceğiz. In Turkey, for two years we won the all tournament. Like we just played well and we won them. Hem arkadaşlık olarak hem de e, takım sinerjisi olarak e, diğer Türk takımlarına kar, e, oranla daha iyiyiz. First year I couldn't go to wild card because I was 16 years old. It was really sad for me. This year I could go to wild card. We practiced a lot for the wild card tournament and winning the all Turkish tournaments. It was really hard and exhausting, but we are here. I think the scene in Turkey is still growing up. Two years ago it was small. After Riot came to Turkey, we traveled in all of the cities in Turkey and host some tournaments. We gave our players a chance that they can compete with each other and we found that actually Turkish players have very uh, competitive spirit. Ee, tabii ki diğer sporlarda da böyle Türkiye'de büyük takımlar arasında büyük çekişme var. Ee, League of Legends'ta da bu kültür devam ediyor. You know, right after Dark Passage qualified for Worlds, our other teams want to compete for that spot in the future. Like in the finals, 10,000 people in the stadium watched us playing. I expect there will be much more competition in Turkish esports scene. Türkiye'de keşfedilmemiş çok fazla oyuncu var. Fakat iş e, takım oyununa gelince e, tecrübesiz kalıyorlar. Fakat e, Türkiye'de League of Legends çok hızlı bir şekilde gelişmeye başladı. E, bu sorunun kısa bir sürede kalkacağını düşünüyorum. We work really hard to go to the worlds and we made it. Dünya şampiyonunda olduğumuz için mutluyum. Umarım en iyi şekilde temsil edeceğiz Türkiye'yi. I think as a team we want all Turkish fans to support us because if they support us, we know we will do much better than our best. The expectations for us is reasonable. They know how we play. Aslında benim için çok takım fark etmiyor ama e, en iyiler gelirse kendimi test edebilirim. When you think about Fnatic or TSM or other regions, there are so many teams that have history. And I think winning a one game or two game is is really good and enough for Turkish community. I'm from Norway. I don't speak any Turkish, but I'm starting to learn a few words. I think the Turkish community was a little bit skeptical about me in the beginning, but after games come, they wrote to me well played, so I think I'm accepted in the Turkish community now. I think uh, every team should take uh, other teams seriously. We are not Team Mineski or we are not Game Gear, we are going worlds to win. I'm expecting a really good support from Turkish players and the uh, fans, and whatever happens, if you lose or win, they, they will support us, I'm sure of that. Such a passionate video as they come out of Turkey. These guys, their passion just shows right through with everything. And you can see why last year's upset was so big for them, for the Gamma Bears to come out strong. Now, they get their chance. So let's get right into things with the action and the roster rundown. On the blue side, representing Turkey's Dark Passage. In the top lane, it's Fab Fabulous. In the jungle is Crystal. Mid lane is Naru. The AD carry is Holy Phoenix, and he's supported by Touch. And spawning on the red side are AHQ Esports Club. They are going to be a home favorite, that's for sure. From the Garena Premier League, of course. That is Prides in the top lane, Naz in the jungle, Westor in the mid lane, finally made it into the World Championships. Garnet Devils, the AD carry, and a green T his support. And I really just can't wait to see these two teams playing on the world stage. Obviously, everyone has been saying they're completely outclassed in their group, mm -hmm. but that's why we have to play the games. I want to see if one of these teams kind of blows us away with something a little bit interesting. They're both incredibly aggressive teams, yeah. and they both do have a bit of confidence coming in. I mean, the fact is, they are in the group with Samsung White and EDG. Yes. It is a gigantic uphill struggle for both of these teams, which actually is what makes this match more important. It really does. If they drop a game to either of these teams, if they want any chance of going out of the group, 
Dark Passage either has to 2-0 AHQ or AHQ has yeah, to 2-0 yeah. Dark Passage for even the beginning of a chance. They, they called it the David and the Goliath, and right now we got the two Davids. They're going to go <laughs> at it, see which one could beat a Goliath pretty Throw much. stones at each other. Get that momentum, exactly. So coming into this, like you guys said, strong individual play from both sides, and I think it's just going to be a massacre of a game because we obviously have Dark Passage coming out very strong, and AHQ on the other side tends to go a little bit longer because they focus team fights and not the objectives. But both teams are not afraid to brawl. That is very much for sure. And, you know, we talk about the 80 carries. This is actually where the pick of bands, I think, may well focus. They're both very strong. Garnet Devil has got a 12 and 0 on Jinx. Yeah. yeah. But someone who's not afraid to play Jinx is Holy Phoenix, the main man. And then you look towards the mid lane, a lot of bands towards Fizz, maybe for Westor. Everybody remembers his Twisted Fate as well, of course. He was famed <laughs> for that back in season one. But Naru on the other side is a man that can play. Any champion, it seems. Let's see how this works out, ladies and gentlemen. Pick and bands underway for the third match of World Championships. Twitch taken away, along with Alistair. There are some strange and unique <laughs> champion pools at work in this game. <laughs> nice. Uh, one yeah. thing about Westor is 79% of opponent bands in the GPL were actually targeted at him. That's crazy. Most of them on Fizz, actually, who oh, isn't crazy. banned this game. Uh, we might get to see some West Door Fizz here. One thing I did like is the fact that the crowd immediately oohed. The moment Twisted Fate was banned, they were like, oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> we want to get to see West Door play it. It's not going to happen. The so. plays, the plays. <laughs> Fab Fabulous. Nidalee is available. Nidalee. It's, it's a champion he can go with. Maokai also in there. It really depends on what Dark Passage want to throw at them. Slowly waiting to lock this one in, really taking their time. They know this is not going to be one of their hardest matches, but also not one of the ones they want to drop because this is the one they can grab for Whoa. sure. Both teams thinking that, and it actually is the Lee Sin lock-in that is the main for Crystal. It's a lot of confidence locking yes, in that Lee Sin with so much power up on the board. Uh, these teams have no interest in the Maokai pick, though, it seems. Wow. Really, really, really interested in these early pick and bans. You know, I, 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 I seem to recall they did a lease in first pick against Legacy as well, and we were questioning yeah. it then. I mean, to first pick the jungler is a big, big deal, especially when there's so much on the table still. Came out 3-0 there. And it's like Kha'Zix is still up. Kha'Zix is a great jungler. It's, it's not yeah. like Lee Sin is the exclusive jungle now that's head and shoulders above others yeah. in power. It's just a confidence pick there for Crystal saying, yeah, we don't care. We can play anything. We can counter anything. And they want Lee Sin. So quite a bit left up with the Lucian Thresh lane being grabbed. Garnet Devil and Green Tea definitely liking that to their own, the White Steel lane. Holy Phoenix and Touch, pretty interesting composition. Touch just being the solo queue player for Holy Phoenix, and it worked out. How are they going to round out the rest of this composition? The tree may get some playtime here, D-Man. Yeah, it looks like Maokai being hovered over. I'm just looking towards Prides, actually. There is no Nidalees in his champion pool from the summer. So that's a possibility that uh, yeah. Dark Passage are thinking we didn't need to lock that top laner in. We know he can't go with it. I think maybe they're actually trying to force out Maokai. I'm interested to see whether this actually gets locked in, or whether they do go with this one, or they're just thinking, okay, they've shown us their hand in the bottom lane. We're not too interested in that. It's the mid lane they want to focus on. The GPO is actually the first region I saw picking up Maokai after the rework, but it was as a jungler, surprisingly. Saigon, Fantastic Five picked him as jungle and often had a band against him. That was before he became a top laner at all. Uh, so, not that I expect a Maokai jungle in this game. Uh, they just don't really seem to care about him that much in the top lane. A lot of focus as well with no mid laner being picked that they want to see if they can get any more out of Westor before they give Naru something to pick. He'll be picking his mid lane and one of the last from Holy Phoenix or Touch. But AHQ now to answer that Maokai picked up with the Nami. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Italy had to be somewhere. That's what we were saying. And they are going to hover it's, it on the side of AHQ. It's Boom. such a powerful pick, potential-wise. You pick it against Maokai, too, and you can definitely try and take advantage of some weakness early on in the game. Nidalee's one of the only top laners that can take over a game if Pride is able to get going on it. Well, Tristana is locked in, and it seems Syndra could be alongside him. Tristana, of course, Holy Phoenix got the pentakill in that final to get here from the international wildcard. Fantastic Tristana player. Very, very aggressive, I gotta add. <laughs> Those rocket jumps are used to go in, not out. A pretty squishy team being put together by AHQ as well. If they pick Cinder, I mean, Westor's obviously set himself up for a counter pick in the mid lane. A lot of teams did this. Fizz? It's gotta be, 100%. Ooh. 
Yeah. That's not the smell. You don't, you don't have that many bands no. against you <laughs> without being good at it. The fact that the crowd instantly reacted, they knew what was coming. It's going to be a big, big question. And it is a problem for a Syndra player. You are fairly mobile, but you can land those long range stuns. It's really down to Westall whether he can dodge them. Oh. We saw the Zed versus Fizz play and canceling out the Death Mark. You're going to be canceling out that Syndra ultimate too, so Westor gets a nice pickup with that Fizz. I'm really wondering if the Twitch ban is worth it here. Nah. Because it's not like Garnet Devil plays all that much Twitch. He's still comfortable on Lucian, and now they have to deal with Westor's Fizz. I can't wait to see it. It's going to be an amazing matchup. We're getting ready to jump into this one quite soon. You can see the teams panned out now on your screen. Not much of a tank coming in for AHQ, and that could cause problems. But they love to fight, so maybe they'll get there in early before Maokai even can be a tank. Absolutely. We'll see how this one works out. Of course, the champions are locked in. Head over to Twitter and tell us which jungler you think will have the biggest impact in this game. Tweet your hashtags DPWin or hashtag AHQWin to at LOLE Sports. And we'll check those out as the game gets underway. How is this going to work out? That is the question. We are champions yes. in our own right there, apparently. But <laughs> It's about the mid lane in yeah. a big way here, yeah. as it always is in AHQ games. A lot of the time, you almost want to call AHQ Esports Club like West Door Esports Club, because that's <laughs> pretty much every time you bring up AHQ, it's like, oh, yeah, it's West Door's team. You hardly ever remember uh, Pride, Nas, Garnet Temple, or Green Team. It's just West Door. Hey, you got to go through the door if you're going to get somewhere. See how they go <laughs> coming into this matchup. DP versus AHQ, and we are on to the rift for game three, ladies and gentlemen. This has been an amazing start to Worlds already, and there is so much more to go. We'll see how this one works out. Of course, AHQ, home favorites. They are on home turf. Not had to travel very far for this one, that's for sure. <laughs> Just across town. And yep. We'll see whether that gives them some bonus coming into this one. This is a game they absolutely will be looking for a victory in. And with the Home crowd advantage, we'll see if it works out for them. Dark Passage themselves won everything in Turkey for the last two years. Dominant over there. Didn't have that man, that Tristan that's twitching out in the uh, bottom lane. It looks like we're going to have a bit of a late invade here from AHQ. They're setting up. It is going to get spotted by that sapling. We'll see whether it times out before they come through, though. Yeah, it's going to be tricky. They're going... Nope, oh. it spots him a little bit early Surprise. right there. They all tried to run away. Not going to happen. So they have been found out, but looks like they're going to stick to it. They don't mind. Man, Fab well. being fabulous. <laughs> Throws another soccer ball into the brush. It looks like he keeps it in the rough, so they're going to be safe from that invade. But oh, the bushwhack possibly to be set up here in the top lane. Wow. AHQ pulling out all the stops early on in the game. Prides could teleport down. They're really just trying to pull an early advantage in this lane. <laughs> They're in the wrong spot. They're in just <laughs> totally the wrong spot. Yeah, they have to abandon. We'll see where the Oh, they're trying to sneak around the sapling. Oh, oh, oh. No pings. Oh, they got spotted. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they got spotted. The question is, do they react? How do they perform? They're going to go straight for red. They want to get the red steel, so it's going to be a red and blue steel. The question is, when they come back, how do they cross? Yeah, both teams were spotted, so they'd have the choice of if they want to try and catch a fight right here. What an interesting set of maneuvers right here. I think Holy Phoenix and Touch should just back away. And yeah, the craziness of swapping buffs right there, and I don't think really anything's going to come of it. That Australian meta, as Pastry would say, Switching up the lanes, and everything's on the bottom side now. So top laners are going to be facing off against each other. A little bit of aggression towards the mid lane. Safety coming in from Nas. So Westor is not going to find too much pressure there, but he is not level two by any means right now. Whoa. And he is taking quite a bit of damage. Wow. Woo. Early aggression from Naru. They're using that ignite. Didn't see Westor panic too much, though. Held on to every summoners. Didn't react too quickly to that one. He started with the Crystalline Flask and a bunch of health potions. It's expected that Fizz will fall a little bit early to Cinder. It's the CS that we need to watch and if there's actually a kill because the harass is actually not that devastating for West Door. And there's still kill potential on West Door, or for West Door, I should say now. His Ignite is up, Naru's is down. So let's go through what's happened in the jungle because mm. it's a double blue. 
for Naz and the double red for Crystal. Who's going to have the advantage here? You've got to feel that Naz on the Kha'Zix, he wanted that double blue. Yeah, it gives him more sustain options. He does still have a slow with his W. Lee Sin. Yeah, double red works well for him as it's well. It's alright, like it, it's yeah. actually okay for both of them. Great hook. Didn't think that was going to land, but it does get Tarsh right on the edge of his tail there. Nas getting seen out by a ward. Looks like he's just going back and forth, though, to make sure Crystal wasn't in the area. But guess what? He is. Could be very big as he's coming up around the backside. There's some bushwhacks in that trap. Oh, or in that bush. Oh, 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 don't do it. No, oh, whoop. Oh, oh, dear. <laughs> well, he got rid of them all. Hey, I told him not to yeah. do it. <laughs> At least he managed to clear him out. Fab Tavis doesn't have to worry about that any longer. All right. Smart play there by Pride. He's getting the forward, not even a ward but just the brush control for himself. Nas now to go back down, knowing that Crystal maybe have backed off from that count or from the gank, so he's going to get his try in. He's happy to stick around. He knows he's there. Fat Fabio is playing this one safe still. Risking it. Risking it. Now he's got Crystal coming back in. Let's see if he can bait this mm -hmm. one out. He has just hit level four. Crystal comes around. I think they're going to go instead towards Pride. They lock on towards him. Sapling will nice get the job. slowdown on him. Have they got enough damage? That is the question. Pride flashes away to the tower. He does get away free. Now, can they turn this back around? No. They are both very safe. Lack of damage on both sides. Yeah, it really felt like Pride's was going to get away from that one clean, but Dark Passage had a lot of sticking power in that one, and Nas just could not retaliate very much damage there. Obviously, just the level three Kazix not having the red buff to help him out either definitely hurt them there. Yeah, definitely a huge one with the red onto Crystal, forcing that flash. They may be a return to lane there for Crystal sometime soon. Great play coming out all around, but again, in the mid lane, we said it's a big focus. 39 to 28. Naru's been having his way so far as West Orc, but we haven't seen wow. the fights yet. A good hook coming in. Holy Phoenix towards the turret. Forced to jump out, but he doesn't gain much ground. Green T was already on his heels. Garnet's not going to be able to make it. Oh, he oh. forward to bring it closer. The play is almost coming oh. out. Trying to go a little too deep, but it's so back and forth, and he finally gets out. Yeah, they're willing to go in, but they just burned two flashes yeah. offensively. Obviously, every summoner spell in that lane was burned, save for the heal on Garnet Devil. Aside from West Star and HQ. The other playmaker is definitely Green T, and we're seeing why right there. He's landing those hooks right seemingly through the minions. Poor old Naz returning to that bottom lane. That's Ward still yet to time out, so again, does get spotted. Prides, though, turn back around on Fabulous. Well, sticking around in this lane for a very long time. Naru back in the mid lane. He's got the CS advantage building up over Westall. Went aggressive early, has got that Ignite now back off cooldown. And we'll see, of course, Westall just biding his time. Needs to get to that level six. It is about to strike, but Naru hits it first. We'll see if he decides to go aggressive and maybe try and burn that ultimate before he hits it. Yeah, Westall happy to stay. He goes for rings. He knows he can keep the lane going for a little bit longer. Yeah, Naru has handled him pretty mm -hmm. well so far. It's what's supposed to happen in a Cinder vs. Fizz. Cinder is supposed yeah. to dominate. Uh, it's still somewhat close in CS, but this is kind of how you would expect the matchup to play out. And considering the hype that is behind Westor, I'd say very great job by Naru thus far. Interesting to see the two AD carries both having to go early, get the double pickaxes, or single pickaxe, pickaxe a piece, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, Pride's getting caught out. But Fabulous is taking so, so low from this one, but has Crystal got the damage? No, Sonic Wave misses. Good dodge for Pride's. Prides might start taking over this lane now, too. You can see how quickly he was able to turn that around on Maokai, even though he had previously burned his flash. And that's going to be trouble there. A bit of a play here. Nah, it's just far off. He didn't want to get the leap in to get there. And it is going to take a little too long. Holy Phoenix actually dodges nice into everything. Oh, some trouble dodging the skill shots. First blood for AHQ. And the teleport was burned and canceled there, which will delay the Maokai in the bottom lane. That is a two-lane win for AHQ. Everyone but Westor actually stepping up. Yeah, I think a little overconfidence. They were trying to bait out a little too much there. And instead, we're not expecting the damage turnaround to come out so heavily from AHQ. Westor now, can he start putting pressure on Nauru? Will Nauru have an answer for him if he does? Big, big difference. Holy Phoenix is the man that needs to carry for Dark Passage. I always feel that you've got to look towards basically all of their matches back throughout the year. He, he is the main man, and if he can't get going, if he gets slowed down in any way, which clearly AHQ have already figured out, that's the man they need to focus on. 
it's going to cause some problems. Green T is just locked in on his patterns as well. He has not been able to avoid those death sentences. Green T's percentage on those is through the roof right now. And it's just going to keep coming and coming until Holy Phoenix learns how to dodge them. And we see how aggressive AHQ is. The flashes are back up and they do it again. We were just mentioning that they had him down and they might play passive. No way, Jose. Now coming in from the top side, Crystal looks to make a play as even more happens in mid. The chum, the waters just misses, but back down to Prides. He's going to try to get away from Crystal and Fat Fabulous. He's a long way from home right now. <laughs> Yeah, he's not going away from this one, I don't think. Unless he makes a miraculous run, it will be a kill this time for Fab Fabulous. You can definitely see the focus right now. Dark Passage on the bottom lane, trying to get Fab Fabulous into a point where he can neutralize Nidalee and then probably come in in team fights. And obviously, AHQ is focusing on the top lane. Yep. Try and get that Garnet Devil going. A nice bait as well. Fab Fabulous, we saw him just go down almost to Prides. And now Crystal is there every single time working that bait very nicely. So one-to-one -one on each side as both teams are making some great plays so far. And we even got a little bit of roam towards, or not roam really, but Nas trying to get help out from West Door and Green Tea coming into that mid lane gank that we saw missed out. So Pink Ward being cleared by Nas. What? They were he messed that up real bad. Yeah, he did. Nas had the sweeper <laughs> down, but failed to clear the normal ward. Instead, wasted his attacks on Pink. All right, never mind. He, that was actually smart. I'm a fool. Uh, he saw the timer on the green ward, knew it was going to die anyway, and saved time by killing the pink ward. Presence of mind, actually, <laughs> by Nas to do that. Clever little girl. Knew exactly what he was doing. Naru, in this mid lane. 20 CS advantage lead. building up pretty big against Westor. Westor, as you saw, throwing out the ultimate chum the waters early on. Did not find its mark. That fabulous. We'll see how he continues to deal with this one. Yet to complete that Rod of Ages. Meanwhile, Pride, you can see, clearly feeling very confident on this Nidalee now. Just shoving in that way. But Fab Fabulous is landing most of the farm here. Not causing too many problems for him. Has to burn that ultimate, but it's a very, very yeah. quick timer. Almost on his Rod of Ages as well to start charging that up. And we're seeing Triforces almost coming out here. Starting on the Sheens. And Prides and Westor are going to be putting out some big damage when they spike to those Triforces. Almost up on 11 minutes right now. The gold is completely even as AHQ looks to teeter top of that in their favor. Yeah, but no vision control. Zero. They definitely need some more wards down there. That's one of the things that happens when you're 11 minutes into the game and you still haven't swapped your lanes back. Uh, it really is all on the jungle and mid laner there to continue ward control. And Naru wasn't really keeping up his end of the bargain. Created the nice vision black hole there. And AHQ was able to take the drag. Oh, oh my god! Once again, Tunch in trouble, the wave not doing enough! The knockback from Holy Phoenix just about saving his support that. But again, Green T landing the hooks. It's Absolutely one, ridiculous. It is one thing against the Nami lane. We've seen this matchup before today, though. The Trist Nami can sustain a bunch, and because they didn't die there, it's actually AHQ that has to double recall despite landing what seemed like a great hook. A store cleaning up mid lane. This is the first time he's really been able to farm without pressure on him so far. 116 to 88 there. A lot coming out of Naru. He picks up the Fiendish Codex as well to get a bit more power under his belt with that cooldown. Blue buff already on him. Doesn't look like he wants to attack or try to defend that ward too much. Not much vision coming out from DP right now, and it could start to affect him quite a bit. Yeah, they seem happy to stick around with this Tristana in the top lane. Holy Phoenix. That's true. He's been up there a very long time. Westor has got to that point where he can just play full Trickster onto the minions and wipe the wave out instantly. Mm -hmm. He's sitting on a lot of gold. You can see you guys, Turkish fans, up early. A lot teams. of Turkish fans voting. Of course, we are right on here. the English stream, so no surprises that the Turkish fans have a higher percentage than the Taipei fans here because they're all in this building. <laughs> they are watching live. Maybe they need to get that tweet on. Who knows? Pride. The cheers for clears. Cheers for clears. Yeah, Pride's still sitting on a lot of gold as well. He's farming up, trying to, as you mentioned, get that Trinity Force. It may well be now that he goes back to get it. And that's going to start causing problems. You can already see he's putting a lot of pressure on Fab Fabulous, unable to stop him in that split push. Somebody is going to have to deal with him. And I got a feeling it's going to be Holy Phoenix that's going to be separated. 
Split pushing yeah. against them. He's gonna have to try and go up against him. Uh oh, a super safe time. That's a great shark. Uh oh, Naru very much so looking like he could go down here. What a great sky to the week. Oh, the flash off of his play. Flynn to the trickster. Westdoor making it look easy with the rest of the team. Actually, he just got it himself. Yeah, hardly takes damage right there. And a nice move by Westdoor catching Naru. Coming back from a ward, I believe, and that is just real trouble for Syndra. Ooh. Oh, finally a miss. <laughs> oh, plays there though to follow on. You can see Naz comes through. They get the slowdown. We can throw out the lantern. Westall doesn't take it. Now he does. Slides on in there. The kick from Crystal. Is it enough to save touch? No, it is not. Oh, maybe oh. it is, but Crystal's in trouble now. He will go down. That's picked up by Westall. Touch goes as well. And suddenly, AHQ starts to pick up multiple kills. And those kills woke the crowd up as well right here. It just seems like HQ was in position and Dark Passage was not. Nothing incredibly spectacular except for Westor's juke of the tidal wave and then grab the lantern. That part was awesome. Actually, if he would have grabbed the lantern while the tidal wave was going, it would not have taken him to his final destination. The tidal wave would have interrupted his lantern thing. So it was such nice movement there by Westor to juke around the tidal wave and have the patience to go in. We get to see it again. Yeah, obviously mistook, but then Touch had nowhere to run. He gets kicked caught by the play. And this is the big moment, moment right here. If he grabs it now, he doesn't make it. He dodges just around it, seemingly going through the model, but that is because he's played so much Fizz and knows exactly where he is. And then they're able to secure both these kills. Crystal with a failed flash. He would not have been able to escape anyway. And this will be tough for DP to recover from. Green T is creating an immense amount of opportunities for AHQ, and they are taking hold of every one so far. But, like we said, not much objective focus, so the, all the turrets still stay up. It's four to one, just the kills right now. Yeah, you mentioned before all those fights started to happen, before the three kills all came back to back, massive lack of vision, and we're still seeing it right yeah, now. Dark. Unawares, of course it is just <laughs> Green T sit laying in the bush, causing them problems. He's gone off the map, they don't know where he is. Teleport coming in though, they're gonna go for it. Fab oh, man. coming in. They I mean, there's one it. way forward here, but they're outnumbered. That's the grab again on the touch. A lot of the disengage is grabbed there, but they're going to be able to finally get green tea. Give him a little bit of his own mana. Oh, Two runs comes in. Very low on mana on this one. Back to Cougar form. He might be able to hit his mark. What an arcade smash coming in from Bad Fabulous. And Chum the Waters is going to chomp down on touch. Sushi for dinner. 3 0 1 right now for Westdoor. He's getting a little bit scary. Of course, that was a traded kill. But the fact that Fizz was getting farm is a bad omen. And you gotta think, you look at nerves maybe for touch there. That wave was way too early on the teleport. Completely mistimed it. If it would have been at the right time, disengage could have happened. Westall would have gone in on his own as it was. Oh, right, we didn't see that. I mean, it's okay. Sun was in his eyes. Yep. Dark Passage has played on very big stages before. We saw 10,000 showed up for their regional finals. But they yeah. definitely seem to be showing a little bit of jitters right here. Touch is struggling. He didn't play in that game. That's the big thing. Touch You're only right. came in for the international wildcard because obviously the support that used to be there right. is on military service so was unable to leave the country. So Touch is coming into this one. Really, you know, obviously Gamescom was pretty big. There was a pretty big yeah. crowd there. Mm -hmm. But now he's at the World Championships. That's yeah. what they were fighting to get there. They were running up against Legacy. Now they're up against big teams around the world. And they're up against AHQ in the home club, really, effectively. Oh, Whoa. green tea. Well, that's two. That's two, man. Starting to kill that <laughs> percentage. <laughs> yeah, that number's getting pretty big right now. He's going to have to pick his game up, clearly. Two and a half thousand gold lead mm -hmm. here, trying to vision control around the dragon. Look at the pink wards. Dark Pass is going to have to pull off something pretty spectacular. They do theoretically still have a great team fight. Pride's on Nidalee, doesn't have a split push presence right now. If Fab Fabulous could find a fight with the rest of his team, they may be able to turn this game back. Better warding coming out for sure. The double sight stone finally out for these guys. Dark Passage able to get quite a bit. However, there is a big item difference between the 80 carries right now. Yeah, absolutely. You can see Infinity Edge was completed by Garner Devil, of course, getting that kill of and two assists. Meanwhile, Holy Phoenix yet to get that one. AHQ starting off and almost killing this one. DP, are they going to go deep? They might go for it. Crystal gets hooked in, though. Tries to come through. You're not getting out of that one. Another fantastic hop by Green T. Not the play Dark Passage needed to make right there. Failed steal, could not retreat, and now AHQ continues to pressure. Slow moves as AHQ starts to drown out the vision. 
for DP here. They're going to set up even more and take everything they can. Bottom turret's about to go down as they control the map. You know, AHQ have quick games in their region. Yes. And I think we're starting to see why. Now that they have the advantage, they are really starting to put some serious pressure. Number three miss, right there. It was a blind hook. We've got to give him that one. He's but actually on a terrible missing spree. I haven't seen him land one in He landed one time. in the pit. All right. Yeah. This guy's right in front of us, like two feet away. <laughs> So, Whoa. AHQ right now, as we were just saying, you know, they know how to close games out. And Dark Passage, they got to be careful that this doesn't quickly get out of control because it is already slipping away. 4,000, close to 5,000 gold differential at 18 and a half minutes. It's a big problem. We put a lot of focus on Holy Phoenix. 5K right now has 1,000, but he's still about 1,600 behind. The team considers him to be one of the heavy carries. If he's not going, the confidence really doesn't come through there. Still have Naru on Syndra, so that could easily be a playmaker, but Westor has just been far and beyond making more plays with less items. Yeah, it is a big problem. You can see it was the two tech Not carries. More. That is where the goal difference is. <laughs> yeah. It is the mid and the AD carry, and if they're ahead, it causes a massive problem. There's a massive mm -hmm. chunk of damage. You can yep. see AHQ grouping, pushing for this top turret. Fab Fabulous has to be leaving this turret right now. Or he's in trouble. Uh -oh. Slicing Maelstrom only stops so much. He's able to get away from the hook, but they are just going back and forth. Who wants it? Who wants it? Prides. Lack of vision control, lack of foresight is what's happening for Dark Passage right now. They were not even prepared enough to launch a valid counterattack against that incredibly slow-moving four-man dive from AHQ. It kind of blows my mind to have a lack of vision control with the two sight stones that they have. It's kind of like when a steamroller is coming towards you and they can go... <laughs> they just didn't get out of the way. He didn't see it coming. and He's a big tree. He couldn't dodge it that quick. So, Dark Passage, now they react. Nauru coming in. Trying to put the damage oh, down. And oh, oh, oh. Dark, Dark Passage trying to make the play, but AHQ, they react well. And while this is all happening, Westall's just down the bottom, free farming. He is getting pretty farmed here. One thing we need to mention actually is Garnet Devil right here. He is having a spectacular game and is greatly underappreciated by the overall community. I've actually been watching a lot of those LCS pros in Korean solo queue streams, and they'll always feature what players are in the game. On a couple occasions, I've seen Garnet Devil in the really high elo games, but he's not listed. Like, he is high up in Korean yeah. solo queue right now, and is a very good AD carry, having a great game. A lot of times you don't hear about him because they kind of shadowed by TPA in the region, but AHQ definitely able to put up some play here. Whether DP would be playing strong or not, they are making the moves and they are making things happen. Littering the map right now. Looks like a light bright on the top side. Not pushing the lanes too much though. Looking for fights a little too much, but they're keeping the lead. Currently, mid lane goes down. It's three to zero in turrets. Currently unanswered by Dark Pass. It's the blue buff being stolen away from them. That's going to be cleared up. Naz smites that one away. And AHQ are taking just about anything they want right now from Dark Passage. Yeah. They are seemingly unable to answer anything. They're going to try and group. They're right. going to push the mid lane. Dark Passage knows that they have nothing to deal with mid lane. Even though they have a goal disadvantage, their only option is to try and get a nice five-man fight. However, it puts oh. them at huge risk, and that's the worst guy to get fished. Oh, I thought he was going to bring it into Naru, but they're still going for the fight. Westor is a little too far. There's the kill coming out onto Touch. He goes down while blowing summoners, and AHQ starts picking up a few more. Two for one so far. Focus right now from the culling. Pride jumps in onto Naru, and they're going to keep the kills coming. Yeah, as soon as Pride's joined the fight, this is all over. Fab Fabulous is going to get locked up. Good play comes out. There's another Garnet Devil cleaning up right now. 5-0 for the focus is on Westall. Forget yeah. it. It's Garnet Devil and Green Tea. They are a mean partnership in that duo lane. So nicely done. Like you said, they focus Westor, but everybody else is still having a good game. 504 Green or Green or Garnet Devil as they push in. Yeah, and they only ended up focusing Westor right there because he was so far ahead of the rest of the team. Mm. Everyone else is able to follow up right there. Great mechanics there by AHQ to finish off these fights, and they are looking for a quick and decisive victory. One more time on that. Yeah, I mean, great shark, obviously. Holy Phoenix jumps away to kind of close the distance, but he flashes in and eats an exhaust right away. So he is clearly in a pretty rough situation. They burn everything on him, which doesn't leave anything left for the flank that comes in. Obviously, Prize and the Kazakhs are behind them here. Nice juke up top there by Garnet Devil to avoid the Syndra stun, and it was just a collapsed 
messy skirmish because of the great lead by AHQ, they're able to easily come out on top. Already looking for that Baron, creating their pick focus comp here. They're really working out for him as Westor just needed those few items to spike. He may have had a hard time in lane, but he knows the power of Fizz and he knows when to use it accordingly. So AHQ clearly in the lead in this one. Oh dear. So, no. Oh. Jumbo Water's not quite landing. Holy Phoenix get out of that one. Back to my train of thought. What are you going to be looking at towards this one? AHQ, they are looking like a very solid team. Granted, they are against our passage right now. True. But Edward this. Gaming and Samson White got to be looking towards this. And maybe having a little bit of a worry. I mean, that's going to be the deciders in these groups. This has been such a powerful performance by AHQ. They're going to look to try and make their statement. Obviously, this is the game that they had to win. They're going to try and build on their confidence that they have a rather formidable opponent later today, right? This is kind of their momentum game before they have to play Samsung White. And another query i just like to throw out there. This is AHQ. They're looking solid right now. Taipei Assassins dominate them. They're in True. TSM's group. They're going to be played later. That is going to be an awesome game. Absolutely right about that. Green Chi, though, trying to make another play. Oh, he gets the play first oh. to add the slow, making sure his hit percentage goes up a bit, forcing the flash from Crystal. He's got nobody to safeguard to, and the team's in recuperate mode. Unfortunately, no one grabbed the lantern before he flashed to break it, <laughs> so when he made that spectacular hook play, the follow-up was late. However, Prides is being a bit of a menace down in that bottom lane, and they're just using that pink board vision control around Baron. They started early, though. That's, that's risky. Well, when you got Green T running defensive, I don't think it's too risky. He's been landing those plays, the hooks. They have peeled off, though. They didn't fancy it. They didn't feel they had quite enough there. Or are they just juking them out? Touch comes in, clears the pink wards. And as you mentioned, down the bottom lane, Prides, he's just called his own all sorts of problems. And you know what? We talked about it. They had the advantage. They had the choice. They could have taken Nidalee in this bottom lane. Fab Fabulous does play this champion very well. Yep. And you've got to wonder why they went with Maokai. Really wanting that safe lane, knowing there's a lot of fight coming for both teams. There's solid play in every player here, but obviously AHQ stepping up to the plate way before DP and able to just get their items out early. We saw the aggression from Naru in the mid lane, but nothing really came of it. They did not try to continue to pressure that, and Westor just got going. Carry for the team, and they are going to be right behind him. Like we said, you got to go through the door to get anywhere. AHQ slowing down a little bit. Not an incredibly right. decisive finish to this one. They have to be careful that Holy Phoenix can't split push too much to become strong. However, they are not too worried about it, knowing that they have the assassination Fizz here. And also the fact that Garnet Devil with the five kills can probably take Triss down for the next 10 or 15 minutes uh, in 1v1s. And they're just trading an inner turret or an outer turret, which with a 10,000 gold lead isn't ideal, but it's still a good trade. Well, Holy Phoenix is not backed off yet. He's continuing to push to so see how much damage he can get down on that top lane turret. Westall steaming in there. You can see Home Guard boots on him now immediately reacting to get out of it. The question is, can he get away from Scott Free? It looks like he will. AHQ peeling back. So, first turret of the game for Dark Passage there. 5 to 1. Now, still gigantic advantage for AHQ. Gigantic indeed. Bot lane's kill participation has been Ooh. almost with everything. Nine out of the 11 for both Garnet and Green Tea as they make their way around the map. Very omnipresent, mostly Green Tea. Somehow Garnet Devil finds his way there as well. Two items to the going to be possibly uh, Phantom Dancer coming in from Holy Phoenix. There it is, actually finished up. Very good for him. Hopefully can start getting a split push on that can kind of go against Prides, but I do not think so. Not at this point. Pride literally yeah. is giving no cares to what Fab <laughs> Fabulous does, that is for sure. He is so, so confident right now in his play that he is basically manhandling a guy that got himself a penskiller last year's international wildcard. He's, yeah. he's not a bad player, he's just being outplayed in this matchup. Right. And I think Pride is just trying to be as obnoxious as possible right now, <laughs> uh, mainly because if Dark Passage does kill him, it gives his team bear. They'd have to send so many people for him in order to actually Look get the a focus. Kill, yeah. Which is they're actually trying to do right now. Uh oh. That's the thing. It could even be a 2v1 yeah. if he dodges enough. Where there's a support, there's usually an AD carry. So they're putting way too much into this one. Well, they're going for it. They're going to catch away. Pride's in trouble. Is he going to get a flash away? No, the pounce is there. Holy Phoenix follows through. But look at this. He's going to catch on towards him. But coming down is Westor. 
Tunch is going to go head to head with him. Realizes the danger. Chopper Waters catches. That is a very dead fishy. But oh, oh. Phoenix coming back in. They're going to try and turn it around while it's happening. Garnet Devil takes down the top turret. So a death for a turret. HQ yeah. still come out on top. Honestly, HQ didn't group for Baron while they were getting collapsed on with Prides. Good move there by Dark Passage. They burn exhaust and ultimates, but at the end of the day, they get a kill and only cost them a turret. It looks like they're going to start setting up for something special here towards the blue slash Baron side of Dark Passage. You can see Fab Fabulous doesn't really want to go up there. Wary about the situation. AHQ is not going to waste too much time on that. They like their kills, but they also need to keep making moves. Got to be careful they don't get flanked in his mid lane. Naz is coming around the side. We know what Green T is capable of, and they reacted well. Still, massive lack of vision for Dark Passage. They didn't get out too far. I mean, if they do get a pink ward down, it's instantly cleared out by AHQ. So, trying to get themselves a little bit of coverage in their own jungle and maybe, just maybe, start to push. Remember, Holy Phoenix. He's on Tristana, mm. he can get going if he gets the items, but Garnet Devil is still somewhere ahead. And there's a few things about this AHQ team that we have to know. They have very weak tank line, so actually diving turrets or sieging turrets is not that beneficial. They need to be able to find fights in the open. Also, because of the Nidalee, their team doesn't transition fantastically to 5v5 team fights. Pride needs to create split push opportunities, which then create weird collapses and AHQ needs to find picks within those collapses. So they actually can't really force a very quick and decisive win. They need to wait for the opportunity. When Prize gets picked off 2v1, that just delays it even farther. And Dark Pash is, is reading this. You can see Fab Fabulous, as we saw before, using his saplings to pretty much get everywhere because that pick comp is so dangerous from AHQ. Westor, if he's not the one to be carrying, Garnet Devil's the second carry on the team. And right now at 504, with a little help of how awesome Westor's been doing and the green tea hooks in the beginning, both of them are on par with their usual play. 30 minutes in the game, that 10,000 gold lead is still there. And Prides, nobody's giving him any trouble right now. Well, he's, you say that, but Fabulous is now starting to actually juke towards him. He's going to get that Rannians completed soon. And Prides' his power against him in a split push is going to start to fade. If Maokai can neutralize him, it's actually all right for Dark Passage. Without Maokai, the initiation is low from Dark Passage, but if Cinder gets a stun on a squishy target, they could still actually delay even farther. This is not the worst situation for Dark Passage. They're actually doing a great job of uh -oh. avoiding AHQ because AHQ is living in their jungle. However, as I say that, Crystal Ooh. safeguards himself quickly to safety. 50k to 41 right now. 11 to 4 on that board. The kills aren't coming in for AHQ, so they're going to have to force the objective. And AHQ has to be willing to pull the trigger. They have sufficient vision control right now, and they need to trust in their vision control to try and make a play happen. Oh, Green Team once again. The hot lands. How the hell did that get through? Crystal does manage to get away. An ultimate was burned for a flash. But meanwhile, Naru caught out. He's going to get caught. Still is going to be enough. Nas gets in. He gets the kill. This is it. Dark Passage in all of the trouble. Westall slipping and sliding through the entire Dark Passage front line. And that is exactly what they were looking for. Slipping and sliding indeed. He outplayed everyone right there. Especially with the playful trickster. The instant Naru tried to get the stun on him. Three kills. Easy bear. I love the fact that they actually got the fight so far outside of Baron before they did the objective. So AHQ, they keep history repeating itself with blood before the objectives. 14 to 4, they pick up Baron, and it shouldn't be too long before they get to the fountain if they don't get too crazy with the kills again. Dragon's gonna be up. A little bit of picked up gold here that will definitely help DP. Oh. Late game Dragon. Nice. Uh -oh. oh, maybe not. Never mind. Uh, no, That's gonna be Prides. He's gonna mark his territory. He needed to run away from that one. Pride's coming round, and you got to give a huge chunk of credit to Green Team for the entire game, really. He's yeah. been the man that's been the initiator. He's been creating the plays once again. The hook on Crystal, everybody collapses to defend your teammate, which, you know, it's just natural instinct, but it caused yeah. some problems. They should have just said, you know what? You got caught, you got hooked, you're gone. We're going to check this out one more time. Obviously, uh, this play was actually created by Westor, landing the shark right before Nara could flash away. Ooh. Such a great Zonyas right after, after his playful trickster, and that gave the reset to Nas as well. He could flash over the wall at just the right point, too. Like, Westor is so good at Fizz. Gets the double kill, gets more farm, finishes his Void Staff, and secures the Baron. That extended Zonyas with the playful trickster 
Given enough time for the team to get on his back, carry it through. Great scores around for AHQ right now as they continue their push into the base of Dark Passage. Very good game for the first time on an international stage here at Worlds. Well, one thing is for sure, when anyone plays AHQ later on, Fizz is going to be bad. <laughs> It, the, you know, there's a reason he had 16 yeah. bands against him. Yeah, there's that a reason that 79% of the bands against AHQ are against Westor is because there's so much threat. You don't want Twisted Fate or Zed to get through either. So in yeah, some you do? situations, you're forced into using all of your bands on Westor. Extremely good at Assassins. Great champion pool to be utilized. And here he gets his one of the top, if not the top. And he is just wreaking havoc on everybody. Chum the Waters is up again, so they're going to be right on the front door. DP, Culling comes out. Puts touch away, and that's not going to be good for the team. That's the disengage they've been using with the tidal wave as AHQ now starts to approach the turret, just waiting for Prides to get a little closer in the bottom lane. They still don't have good dive potential. There's one right. right here. As far as actually tanking the turret, Prides is a little bit tanky, but you don't want to lead the charge with the Nidalee. <laughs> Once again, they will try and split up a little bit. When they get the hook, maybe oh. that will trigger things. Ooh, Westor, because of that. his Lich Bane, takes that down pretty quick. Yeah, and you can see while that's happening, of course, Prides Pulls the pressure back down in the mid. They collapse on towards the middle turret. Get a chunk of damage down the hook. This time only finding a little cast of minion. Not the one they were after. And they continue the split push. Back down the bottom. Prides goes. Keeps that wave going. And Naru, he's the man that's been sent down now to try and deal with him. Yeah, and we can really see the goal lead getting out of hand here. 15,000 overall. In particular, though, the uh -oh. mid lane has a huge disadvantage. And that's one way that it manifests. Cutting down the tree quite quick. AHQ gets what they want as they start to pepper the inhibitor. What? How is he hitting these hooks? Amazing stuff coming out of Green Tea. Once again, they back off with not enough control, but that's because Westor wreaking havoc in the mid lane with Brides. They are trying to run DP thin here across the front side of their base. Kind of strange that they didn't actually take the top turret down, which is the, the strange part about that whole thing. They I'm with you cracked on that. wide open. Finally, this time they will do. Westor's on that one. Just needs one more little hit. There's the middle one going in. And it seems that everything will tumble all at once here. AHQ making their way in wow. towards Dark Passage Base. And honestly, they're putting a very solid performance here in their first outing. Whoa! Oh. Bright's going deep on that one. Ultimate comes out and Naru turns it back around. The tower hit should be enough. No will way! The go oh down my God. He gets away with it and they push on through to the base. I think he just took every spell the DP had to throw at him. Westor tries to get in, but he gets scattered like the weak. Garnet Devil's going to be hit up by Holy Whoa. Phoenix here. The last shot crits and it hits. Green Tea's now the focus. DP is getting what they want inside the base. If this can go to Holy Phoenix and get him some good items that he needs, but it's going to be a tough one. I see AHQ coming right back. Yeah, they got a little bit overzealous right there. Uh, not really sure what they were thinking <laughs> in, in a few of those moves. Nerves in front of a home crowd, obviously, and probably just straight up yeah. adrenaline. As soon as Pride escaped this <laughs> so one, deep. as soon as Pride escaped this one without dying, HQ thought, we win. This game is over. They just burned Cinderella. Let's go. Uh, Westor, though, gets kicked back. Westor got outplayed in this fight, specifically that move right there. He would have killed Holy Phoenix if Naru had not hit him with the scatter of the week at that exact moment, and that completely turned the tides of the fight because it reset Holy Phoenix, it allowed him to get the damage, and it kept Dark Passage in the game. Well, it's a triple kill for Holy Phoenix. We'll see if that's enough. Can they hold on? They did only lose the middle inhibitor, but the top one is cracked wide open, and the bottom turret on next to nothing with a gigantic gold differential of 14,000 gold here. AHQ, big, strong position. Prides, will he go too deep on this one? It's the first misplay he's actually made all game, honestly. Yeah. But he can't knock their confidence, that's for sure. I mean, you know, 30 plus minutes in, 17, 18 kills. They're gonna be a little cocky. Absolutely, and now, I mean, yes, they gave a triple kill to Holy Phoenix. <laughs> But because Holy Phoenix is so paranoid of getting every last ounce of damage out, he has no magic resistance. If Westor gets in range of him, I think he gets one shot. I'm pretty right. sure that's what happens with the 600 AP Fizz against a Triss with no MR. It's not going to look pretty, that's for sure. She's going to fall down and go boom. 68,000 to 53,000 right now. 17 to 8 as the kills continue to flow in for AHQ. And now they've been starting to grab the objectives once again to the front door of Dark Passage's base. This should be a downed inhibitor, but it's going to be Pride's taking a little bit longer to get to the bottom lane, so they should be able to defend it. 
for now. Yeah, we just saw AHQ pinging on Holy Phoenix. I think it was simply put, target acquired. Let's see who can get him first, <laughs> because I don't think they're going to hold the trigger too long on this one. It's one thing to build all your damage items, but if you have to give so much respect that you can't even get in range to do damage, the damage items themselves aren't worth it. He needed to build some magic resist before finishing his fourth offensive item. Almost to that level 18 max. Have his range, but like you said, getting in too close. West door, that's the range he wants. Slowly moving around, keeping it split. West door and now Nas instead of Pride in the mid lane. And they're going to work to 2 3 between mid and bottom. Yeah, that's split. turret's going down quick. That's split perfectly right now. West door up on towards the Nexus turret, just off towards the top half of the screen. And it's splitting Dark Passage completely in half. Touch. So, so careful right now. Holy Phoenix as well. They did get Naz very low on hit points. That was a good split from Holy Phoenix. You can see that shield on him built up because of the damage he did. And that has delayed them mm -hmm. ever so slightly. But AHQ is just going to back off, take Dragon, while Dark Passage, are they going to risk it? Are they going to go for a ballsy Baron play? They may have to, but I don't know if it's going to work out. It was a nice delay here, and it's going to delay the game for quite some time. HQ ends up taking the dragon. That's uh, getting in range. They're going for Westall. Up Whoa! And goodbye. He was exhausted during that. Still takes down. This Holy can't touch him. Cannot touch him. Indeed. Fox goes down, but it's only for himself to be put in it. Green T gets another play for himself. The flash box to start it off. 19 to 8 here, coming up on 40 minutes. It's going to be Pride looking for another one. Garnet's already in the base. These guys are coming out of the woodwork right now. Having to throw out the Tsunami. And that's going to be the safety for Touch. Yeah, I think you answered the question there. You know, if if uh, Westall with 600 AP can get onto Holy Phoenix, he could one shot <laughs> him. Sure as hell he can. AHQ going to shove on through. That's the top. Nexus turret going down. One final one remaining. Nothing they can do to stop it once Westall comes on through. And AHQ in front of their home crowd pick up their first victory over Dark Passage. That's got to feel pretty good, but the battle was won. They still need to win the war. They are in an incredibly tough group. They handled Dark Passage quite well, but it took them 14 minutes and 16 seconds. Definitely a strong first performance. They got a lot of work to do. Great play all around from the team. They can follow Westor's strength. Green Tea coming up huge. Such a playmaker, eight and one on his recent games of Thresh, so it should have been expected that he was going to do that over and over again. Solid overall performance. Back of a chair. That's exactly what they, uh, Dark Passage, were thinking there, spinning round. Of course, AHQ coming across, congratulating them. And honestly, all the talk, West Door played fantastic. Yes, sure, he delivered, but wow. for me, it was Green Tea. Green Tea was the man. He got Garnet Devil going, he shut down Holy Phoenix, he shut down just about anyone that came towards that duo lane. Crazy. Yeah. It was a pretty cool thing to watch there. Green Tea, definitely the playmaker, it seems like, for AHQ, being able to set up all those plays. I guess that is what a playmaker is. Yeah, we look at, <laughs> we look at AHQ, though, move forward in our thoughts here. Does their hesitation in the late game get taken over by TSM, by Samsung. Yeah, you know? uh, they're gonna have some issues, I think, against EDG and Samsung White. We're gonna get to see them against Samsung White later today. Definitely a good momentum White. building game for them, but it's gonna be a tough one, that's for sure. So crazy, another awesome match to start off Worlds. We have more for the day, and it's just going to only get better. Home team crowd pumping, or home, yeah, home team pumping up the yep. crowd. Now they're ready for the next matches as well. Yeah, some great games. Obviously, that's the three of us done. There's another three games to go, though, so don't go anywhere. But what a fantastic opener we've had to Worlds already. Absolutely. Game one, absolutely spectacular. Samsung White taking that one over EDG. Very, very close. And then TSM coming through and absolutely steamrolling through SK Gaming. Yeah, good preview for some of the top teams in every group. We still yet to see some big teams, though. Star and Royal Club, TPA, teams that are oh, in these yes. two groups are going to be Really impressive games. A lot of momentum to be grabbed in these first few games and a lot to be had for the game. The teams that play again today. Doesn't seem like too many were caught in trap games. Obviously, Team Solomid yep. came out very strong in their own. So everybody seems to have done their homework now coming into Worlds. It's been impressive. So obviously, with Samsung White winning the first game, EDG is now the focus target for AHQ. The question is, yes. can Green T and Garnet Devil do the same against Nami and FZZF. I'm not so sure about <laughs> that. That's a big question. 
and more importantly, the mid lane. I actually think Westor maybe has the edge in that mid. Westor did a good job withstanding the Cinder. Not mm. very many Fizzes can do that so well early in the lane. And specifically, Green Tea was completely locked into Holy Phoenix's movement patterns uh, with that Thresh. I don't oh, yeah. know if he can do the same against Name. Although, maybe Name is a little bit damaged after that game against mm. Imp and Mata. He didn't look we'll like he see. was having too much fun at the end. Quite vocal on the screen, as we saw. But for now, we're going to throw it over to Shox, who is standing by on stage with Westor from AHQ. Thank you very much. Um, well, first off, congratulations. What a first great victory here for AHQ. Um, talk me through the picks and bands and getting your hands on that fizz for you. One of your favorite champions and a great job you did. Now, So, um, so their bands were like Ali Star and uh, Zillian and uh, Riot. So they, they want to make sure their assassins were okay when, when they bend those characters. All right, so you did get your hands on that phase. A great game from you guys overall. And a lot of times people say, well, it's Westor that's going to carry AHQ, but the whole team stepped up. So does that relieve your pressure a little bit? The truth is, my team carries me. They give, they give me the environment to shine. Well, fantastic. We did see that here in that first game, but a lot left to come. A very uh, tough group for you guys, some very strong competitors. A game upcoming versus Samsung White, which is, of course, a whole other beast. How do you think that one's going to go? You <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, so are we, uh, Westor. Finally, here in front of a home crowd, is there anything you want to say to the fans out there who came out to support you guys? We will come out the group of death. We will come out the group of death. Well, fantastic job here. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, now let's throw it back over to the guys at the desk. Very much shocks. These two teams, uh, they are close, but truthfully, the gap between them, Samsung White and Edward Gaming, does feel particularly high. West or their big words will make it out of the group. He has a chance to prove that later against Samsung White. Let's talk about this game. I feel that both of these squads made uh, a fair amount of mechanical misplays in terms of exactly how they interacted with their champions, but AHQ clearly better and clearly strategically ahead of Dark Passage. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things going wrong. If you, if you can compliment them for something, AHQ called the lane swap initially. They knew that the enemy bot lane was going to swap away from them. They followed them, and then they followed up with a lot of jungle pressure. And hey, look, Lucian Thresh beat yeah. Nami uh, Tristana. The, the, the god tier 80 carry can be beaten, and it happened. Not in the most convincing way, still some, um, some screw-ups mechanically, but th that kind of snowballed the game. Well, just in the pick and ban phase, yeah. too. I mean, it was just incredibly one-sided. They got everything that they wanted, AHQ, that is. And, you, I mean, you play against Westor, you, you have to respect that Fizz. This is a champion that he is famous for playing. And if we transition into the late game as well, I mean, when you have that large of a lead, the ability of AHQ to close out was very, very suspect. I mean, they were very impatient, weren't waiting for the Nidalee split push. They were sitting at Baron with full ward coverage. Nidalee wasn't splitting in the bottom lane. Then they decide to start Baron, then they get chunked out, then they have to go back, they lose all their wards. It was it was a mess. It was just a mess. Yeah, I'd like to touch upon the, the ability for them to close out. That's honestly my biggest concern for them moving forward and making it out of this group, just because... You're gonna have to clutch. You have to close the game if you want to win games here, especially. But as you, the ward, the ward, as you mentioned, they lost numerous pink wards just because they weren't patient enough. And we saw White make some mistakes in closing the game out. So that's a glimmer of hope for <laughs> AHQ moving forward. Well, you, need to get ahead. you need to get ahead and try and close the game out. I mean, <laughs> to summarize it, I think the best way is that AHQ strategically were on the right page, executionally. So 
were not great at making it work. The Baron Bates could have been better and, you know, the misplays. Anyways, we do actually have one of those big team fights that we want to break down over on the Telestrator with Freak. So let's throw it over to him as he breaks down a 4-for-1 in the mid. Thank you very much, Quick Shot. <clears throat> so this is a mid-game team fight that AHT wins pretty convincingly, and I want to basically focus on the plays made by Garnet Devil. Just talk about some of the mechanics of the Lucian play as well as break down uh, how AHQ's team fight works. So Gonna get us over the clip, and this starts out with basically Westor pulling all the attention, and even though he overextends through an exhaust, he still does his job properly. HQ is full of a bunch of assassins, they have a Nidalee flank, they have a Kha'Zix diving in to follow this Fizz as well, which sets up the fight how he wants it. So we start the fight out and watch Westor, because he's gonna do uh, pretty much the right thing, he's gonna land the shark, and he's gonna dive in. But what's really cool here is a great exhaust by touch, catches Fizz right as he goes in. And Westor doesn't realize this at the time. So if we pause right here, we've got in the bot side of this fight, you basically have a guaranteed kill now on the half health Tristan. A cause is coming down. You see Nas already pop his invisibility. Again, we have the Nidalee flank coming in. So that's going to work out. And then the persistent damage is gone. And all the cooldowns have been spent on Fizz. So you've got Westor starting out the fight exactly how he wants it. He's going to trade one for one of the AD carry, which is exactly fine. So now let's talk about Garden Devil, because he's now kind of the way they're going to clean up the fight. And you're going to see why they need assassins to make him work, because Lucian is very cooldown dependent. He's actually in the middle of his combo right now. He's used the W, he's used the Q just now. He's almost out of cooldowns. And let's play the clip out and watch Garden Devil. Gets his last auto attacks out, there's the dash, and there's the kill and a touch. But now he's out of cooldowns, so all he can do is kite back against the Maokai until his spells come back up. Thankfully for him, his spells come up at the right time, lands the auto attacks, his Q is the only spell that comes back up. What's cool here though, is he starts finding this isolation onto Naru, he's gonna pop the ulti, but Naru's gonna outplay it and flash. Now let's pause right here, because Garnet Devil dodges away from that knockback so beautifully. He saw actually that she had uh, summoned the sphere down here, and, he, and Lucian was standing right about here himself. So he was in the line of fire, he knows that the only stun's gonna come from right here. He gets the dash out in time, and lets him pretty much be safe for the battle. So, roll the rest of the clip out. Granite Devil again, gonna get his the rest of the ability combo out, and it's gonna be fine. And at this point, the fight is basically just clean up AHQ, kills everyone off with their crowd control, and it doesn't much matter anymore. But basically, removing the enemy AD carry right away by spending so many resources on that, it actually allows a lower damage AD carry like Lucian to be basically untouched, to save his escapes for when they try to come back on him, and it ends up being a pretty clean battle. Now, that's it for this fight. We're gonna send it back to you guys at the desk. Thank you very much, Freak. I look forward to breaking down some more of those team fights a little later in the day. As you guys know, fans from all around the world are enjoying the action in very different ways. Here are a few more of those photos showing us how you are enjoying Worlds. First is from at John Belly over in Athens, Greece, who is watching while studying. And he says, this is how I Worlds. Yes, that is math. I think you need a bigger phone, dude. Next up is from at Spot Pilgrim, who apparently Worlds with his Dyrus loving Poro. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Finally, it looks like some of the students from Slytherin are joining in the action. This comes from at King Gregorovich, who says school won't stop us watching the group stage. It should. Is that a, is that a cuppa face? I mean, it's a pretty good good uh, effort. Guys, share your watching worlds, how you're doing it by tweeting us pictures with that hashtag worlds to at LOL Esports, and we'll have some fun looking at it later in the day. We have more action from a world coming your way with the hometown favorites, Taipei Assassins taking on Starhorn Royal Club. We'll be right back after a short break with that match.
Welcome back, everyone. We are halfway through our first day of the group stages, and we'll see the next two teams for the first time today as the hometown favorites, Taipei Assassins, face the Star Horn Royal Club. Now, the Assassins are far and away the top team from the GPL uh, by a massive margin. They are facing the number two team from China, Star Horn Royal Club, who made it all the way to the final match last year. However, the team has had a massive roster swap. They are still looking strong, but you can't deny the fact that they are facing that extra man in the local crowd from Taipei here in Taiwan. Krepo, uh, how important is that for the Taipei Assassins to have that you know, backing behind you, all those voices cheering in your side. It is just really fun to play in an environment where you know the crowd's going to be ahead of you. I've had the opportunity to do that once or twice already. Um, especially looking back, Gamescom, we had a match against Fnatic and the crowd was like 80-20 in our favor. And it is just so much fun to do that. On top of that, the Taiwanese crowd is just really nice to be. Like, we played against TPA in a show match in G2. Uh, a couple of years ago in 2012 where they actually ended up playing their regionals as well and there was just a massive amount of people there there's an uh, indoor mall that was just way too crowded but really nice people uh we <laughs> stood there took a lot of pictures had a lot of fan signings and it was just really fun to do crumbs who's the star of tpa in your mind well that's an obvious one baby right here he has been to the obviously he's a season two world champion and he as you saw was playing top lane when the team kind of revamped themselves and now he came back to AD carry and now the team is kind of built around him. So they're a very AD centered team and they win because he just carries. He plays Vayne, he plays hyper carries that are able to just split push and 1v1 and other, other duelists like Zed and Assassins that are coming out of the meta, which is really beneficial for right now. I also like that he's the shot caller for the team there, that being the best player, being the kill leader in the region by like 50 kills and being such a standout, he gets to make the team play around him by making these calls, by being so experienced that you'll see a very cohesive TPA and that's going to be very strong for them. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about Wins, Monte Cristo. I know you quite like him as a jungler from the Southeast Asia region. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think he's quite clearly the best jungler in Southeast Asia right now, and particularly his Lee Sin should be feared. I mean, when I watch this guy play, he's so good at setting up Lee Sin flanks and coming around, kicking your carry right into the rest of the team. So that's a coordination that Taipei Assassins have developed over time, and they're really quite good at initiating team fights in like a pincer movement with their jungler from the rear. I want to talk a little bit about the jungler from Starhorn Royal Club before we move along. Uh, keep him mind that Taipei Assassins, they've got Chawi as that sort of substitute mid laner. They have used him in 7 out of their 20 games from their region, so they can swap that out. Uh, I want to talk about Insec from Starhorn Royal Club, of course. Uh, from the Chinese squad, they brought in two Korean players. Kick this over to Monty on your take on Insec and his transition to the Chinese region. Yeah, both Insec and Zero are coming from the KT Rollster organization, and Insec, at the time that he moved to China, he was kind of at the bottom of the list in terms of junglers. He was ranked 14th out of 14 junglers in KDA in the season of Masters after or right before he left, and he found a new home. Now, he's a very mechanically good jungler. Of course, he has a move named after him, the insect, that ward hop kick that everybody around the world sees these days. But he's never been the most cautious. He acts before he thinks a lot of the time, and he can get himself caught out by going too deep and frequently does. Yeah, and, that, and bringing them on board could be one of the downfalls there because just bringing two uh, players with a different language than you and not really having a good communal language either, both uh, all the players on that team don't have the best English, I imagine, so they're having very limited in their communication. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, there's rumors going on that they communicate mostly in smart things, and the, the Koreans speak Korean with each other, and the, the Chinese people speak Chinese with each other. Just very, very dysfunctional, but somehow they managed to make it work, and they're still a, such a good team. So, I, I just I wish I could speak either language so I could find out what's going on in comms there. I'm looking forward to seeing this game. I know Monty was uh, giving some praise to TPA earlier in the day. So with that in mind, it's time for you guys to make your predictions. Lock in who you think is going to come out on top between Taipei Assassins or the Starhorn Royal Club. I'm actually going to start this one with Monte Cristo. Uh, who's going to take a win and why? I mean, I think it's going to be Starhorn Royal Club. As good as TPA is, uh, Royal really has a very unique style in their skirmishing and their playmaking ability. And you can never underestimate uh, Uzi. And when we're talking about two very AD-centric teams, I think Uzi's the better AD carry. I think he'll get ahead and he'll, he's just going to carry harder. Uh, Crumbs, do you share the same sentiment? Uh, no, actually. I think TPA is going to be the one to take it. And even though both teams are very AD-centric, I think that the junglers are going to be the ones that play the biggest part in getting their jung their AD carries ahead because they're both Lee Sin players. Now, obviously, you have the best Lee Sin in the region and the guy that has a move named after him. And 
when I want to see is just Lee Sin versus Rengar. Pretty much plays left, right, and center and see who can get their ADK ahead more, pretty much. Yeah, I don't think so. I think, <laughs> I think Royal Cup is just going to knock the wins out of TPA. Oh, oh. <laughs> come on. Uh. This is what happens when you spend time with Freak. Too much time. Well, let's <laughs> move along. You You've lost the ability to talk. Freak, what's your <laughs> prediction? Uh, well, they were my number one to get out of groups. I think they're going to win every single game here unless I'm proven wrong. Starhorn Royal Club is my number one for this one. I think they're going to win. And it's a battle, I think, largely of raw skill versus coordination. Um, basically, SHRC can just sort of win by being so darn good. And the player that no one's talking about, but we should, is their mid laner, Korn. He's way better than... Like, we're just not talking about him, but he's so darn good. I think he's going to have a great time against Morning there in the mid lane. And that's going to be kind of it. Is It's going to look a little bit like TSM or SK. And that's my prediction. Ooh, wow. Ma strong maybe not as quick, wow. like that. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That's You've locked down. Bold. You've right. locked it in. You, you can't go. retract that. We will wow. see if you're proven right. Over on LOLESports.com, this one is also very close to call. I share this sentiment. 50% for both squads. And we'll see whether or not uh, this game can help people figure out future matches. Now, let's hear from the Season 2 World Champions as they tell us about the changes the team has made as they return to play in front of a global audience. 呃，当年的资格赛我们很不幸的被局子熊淘汰了。记得那时候是因为有一批新血刚进去，然后大概都在磨合，然后需要一些练习增加彼此的默契，所以那个时候我想没有拿冠军的，应该就是水准还不够。
quite as scary maybe today as they go head to head. Guys, we're going to get straight into the match though by checking out the starting lineups. On the blue side from the Greener Premier League, it's the Taipei Assassins with Archie in the top lane, Wins in the jungle, Morning in the mid lane, Baby the AD carry, and Jay on support. And on the red side, it's the Starhorn Royal Club from China's League of Legends Pro League. We have Cola up in the top lane, Insect in the jungle, Korn as the mid laner, Uzi as the AD carry, and of course Zero on support. And because there has been discussion on how to pronounce Uzi, yes, we did get confirmation from player management that that's what he likes to call himself. And because so many people didn't really accept that, I went 20 minutes ago to his face, <laughs> I asked him straight up, he smiled, he laughed about it, and he said, yes, it is Uzi. So You're the real we're MVP. Go, we're we're going to call it that. For sure. Real MVP. That's, just, that's the most recent info we have. He may change his mind later. <laughs> Thanks for the confirmation, though, Kobe. That helps everyone out there in the world. <laughs> well, guys, we're going to be getting into Champion Select here in just a few moments. So where are the important things to look in this one? Well, so first of all, for me, it's going to be a lot about the junglers here as well, as Crumps was pointing out. Lee Sin is the big jungler for both of these. And then also you have Rengar for Insect here. I wouldn't be surprised to see TPA ban away Rengar and try and get an early pick on Lee Sin. Yeah, that's the thing. The Starhorn Club, they are very easily focused in bans. Fizz and Yasuo are targeted at Korn more so than any other player in the entire LPL. Also, uh, Insect is the second most banned on their team yeah. with both Rengar and Lee Sin. So we'll see what the second ban is. It's probably going to either go to Korn or to Insect here. And the thing about Insect is once you ban Lee Sin and Rengar, or at least you remove them from him, mm -hmm. he falls back to like Java and maybe a Kha'Zix here, but he's not as good as he is on like Lee Sin and Rengar, where he can really set up the fights because he's an, again, he's a action first, think later jungler, as Monte Cristo pointed out here. He wants to be the guy who starts the fights here and the team better follow. I think that one reason this Rengar is such a good ban against is Insect is because when you pop Rengar's ult and you get that infrared vision, it actually gives him more information on when not to go in, and he actually gets a warning system there. But so does it stop him? Does it actually <laughs> stop him? Not every single time. So we see the Rengar banned away, but no Lee Sin ban there. And actually, Insect deciding this time okay. around that he's going to go for Kha'Zix. They also took out Rise there, uh, did Royal Club. On the other side, it was a first pick Lucian actually coming out for BB. So this is pretty funny because Rise is normally not, not a very uh, used pick by Royal Club here. We have seen it a few times in mid lane. Cola didn't actually play it in top lane before right now, if it's going to go for him in the top lane. So really mixing up the things here, also Kha'Zix for Insect instead of the Lee Sin. Yeah, I think that is going to be another mid lane rise here for Korn. He has done that a lot recently, but really I want to go back to the first round pick from Taipei Assassins. They steal away Uzi's favorite champion, the Lucian. They said that they were very scared of him. They're probably going to target him. They already did it right in the first round of picks. And it's really been like his most played champion because Lucian is such a good pick in China where there's a lot of early mid-game action and of course Lucian shines in the laning phase, a strong laning phase, great mid-game as well and you can be really really aggressive here so smart choice but taking it away from Uzi. I still want a little bit about this Lee Sin. I really want to see what Insect can do on Kha'Zix. Well, Lee Sin for wins, but want to touch on that Janna pick because we've been he hearing a lot that Janna is going to be a big, big pick in the World Championships this year. So, Janna, she gives the move speed from her passive still, but it is restricted to 1,000 range. So that really is helpful when you're going around warding with somebody like Lee Sin. That very important jungle and support synergy will be there. So the big deal for me with Jenna is you want to have disengage when you play against a team like Royal Club because they want to fight, they want to be aggressive, they want to force you into bad situations where you have to react instantly. When you have Jenna, you can ulti, you can reset the whole fight here and then you can back away and you can choose when you actually want to go in if you want to team fight here. So I really like disengage against Royal Club. Plus, we can also look to see if they take a page out of Shield's book and go with the early Bloodthirster for Lucian to do the uh, Shield stacking with that Janna-Lucian combo. Very interesting pickup. On the other side, we actually saw Orianna locked in here for Korn. That's by far and away his most played champion this year. 16 games played and it has a 12-4 and record. And while we're on Royal Club side there, Nami also locked in. Big, strong picks coming out for Royal Club. Yeah, and Zero has really been a great support for Royal Club. I mean, obviously, he 
Well, he's from Korea, transferred over with Insec as well, and he's just been performing so well with Uzi down this bottom lane. And Nami is he's one of the few supports also in China who actually likes to play Nami, who likes to play the disengage style. So I really like to pick. Also, if Royal Club gets a 2v2 lane here, because you have Nami into Jenna, it's going to be great for Royal Club. So they're going to look for standard lanes. You also want to have your Rise against Dr. Moon up in the top lane here. So I expect Royal Club to go in level 1, try and get some, uh, some wards down spot, where TPA is going and make sure to get standard lanes. They have great lanes all around and actually a very, very team fight focused comp here. Not as early aggressive stylish so as we sometimes see from Royal Club, but de definitely around the mid lane, also the jungle pick where Insect won't be able to start the fights himself, but now he can get the ball on at least from Oriana and then he can go in. And speaking of Oriana, we can also talk about Syndra there locked in as well for Taipei Assassins. What do we think to that one? Yeah, it is going to be an interesting pick there for Morning because it is a little bit out of character, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, he'll have a lot more kill potential than we're used to seeing from him. Well, guys, as these two teams prepare to go head to head, we'd like you to turn to Twitter and let us know who you think will win this match. Tweet us using the hashtag TPAWIN or SHRWIN to at LOL Esports and we'll figure out exactly how you think that one's going to go down. 50 50 was the LOL Esports.com vote. Do we agree with a 50 50 here? I would put Royal as their favorite, but I really feel like TPA is a strong team and they, I mean, we're playing here in Taipei. If they want to beat Royal Club, or if they can beat Royal Club, they can take number one in the group because Royal Club TSM, I'm not sure who's the strongest. We're going to see later on. If they can beat one of them, why not both? Well, we are about to get into the game then. Both Royal Club and the Taipei Assassins are going to show us exactly what they've got coming into their first match of the 2014 World Championships. TPA, of course, starting out here on the blue side. And we heard it earlier, a possible sixth member of the team being on home soil. So again here, looking at the combo over on TPA's side, you do have Illusion Jenna, that's great for Siege and Towers here, great for at least killing them once you get close enough, where Orianna can be a bit annoying for Lucian with the range nerfs down to 500 now, so it's a bit harder for him to siege up towers. But you do have the Syndra, extra range, you have the backup stun as well, you have the disengage potential for her. So TPA can look to try and fast push from towers here, but there's a lot of wave clan on the side of Royal Club, so they should be able to keep them away. So we talked a little bit about the bottom lane matchup, but one thing we didn't talk about at all is the fact that Uzi decided to go with Caitlyn this time around. A champion that he actually this year has a 100% win record on. Only three games played though, what do we think to Caitlyn? Yeah, so the last time that they used Caitlyn, it was in combination with the Janna for the early pushing yep. of the turrets, which worked really well against OMG. Uh, but this time around, with the Nami and being matched up against Lucian, uh, we'll see how he can take advantage of the extra range for Caitlyn in this laning matchup. If they do stay down there in the 2v2s, uh, then Uzi can actually use that to get a big upper hand onto Lucian. With Lucian being changed down to a 500 range AD carry, we'll see about that. This deep ward, though, looks yeah. like TPA won't fall into that trap. Instantly, you just see... Mundu move down to this bottom lane here because TPA, they want to make sure they get the lane swap. So nice little ward down in the lane to see if anyone from World Cup was standing and waiting. Of course, Uzi was down in the bottom lane, decided to get a few hits on Jay as well to really show TPA. Yes, I am here. You can swap your Mundo down. You can get your 1v2. So we are going to see the lane swap. Does mean TPA will give up the dragon control, but it's all about just dodging around this bottom lane here. And they're going to get free reign on that one. We can see that Archie actually sticking with wins from the start of this one. Obviously, would have a tough time if he was to go down to that 2v1. Cola doing pretty much exactly the same here as he follows Insect on that red buff start. This mid lane going to be a big one to watch. As we said, Morning, not the type of player that usually goes for these very aggressive mid laners. He prefers generally those more utility, supporty type mid laners. Well, that mid lane will be isolated more so than usual. They just really have to watch out for the roaming uh, double ganks there and maybe even three-man ganks when the supports come. But really, I want to point out the difference in style in the lane swap here. Uh, Starhorn Royal Club, they're quickly shoving down bottom. They waste no time. Whereas TPA are trying to freeze up top. And this is really the two mentalities of these two AD carries. BB likes to farm up for the late game. Yep. Uzi always likes to get the action going very early. So we'll see if Starhorn Royal Club knocking down an early turret, if they can take advantage of the extra map movements they'll be able to make. And what should happen here is actually TPA should make sure that Archie down his bottom lane or send him down to this bottom lane so he can start picking up some farm. Because when you fast push in a lane swap, you will never build up a big wave 
it means it's harder to dive, and at the same time, you can zone away and deny CS from a top lane because you will constantly push it in. So I really feel like TBA should have sent both Archie and Wins down towards what? his bottom lane. Barn zone is so oh, in -made. This could oh, be really, risky. really bad for him, actually. Getting caught out here has to flash back towards his touch. He's going to go in. He can go down as well. And his first one for the Titan Day Assassin. So the first rule of lane swapping is that you do not go to the side of the map where your opponents have the duo lane. Honestly, I think Korn was like expecting Archie to be down towards this bottom lane. I didn't expect him to be in the top side. So he just walked straight in. Didn't even place the ward beforehand. He also picked up the sweep before him, but he walked straight into two people. And funny enough, I've actually seen him do this before, where he will place his ward, at least walk to the wrong side in a lane swap, and be caught by surprise, end up dying. There's a TP actually coming down into right, his bottom lane. So Archie will come down, get himself some farm. We'll also have the backup of Jay. Funnily enough, we also see Wins moving in, but Royal Club are actually moving down there as well. They're going to come around the backside, and if you look at the minimap, not actually spotted by any wards at this point. Wins just there doing his golems, but it looks like Royal Club are actually just going to loop around. That's a de decent little bubble over the top of the wall from Zero, but we'll see what Archie can get here in terms of farm. Is ahead of Rise at this point. As Wins starts to move himself in, we'll finally get vision of him. So we do actually see TBA sending down Archie to this bottom lane. Make sure we can pick up some farm. It's much smaller. It will be bad for TBA because four members from Royal Club moving out to spawn. They want to kill the tower first and then go for the kills. Well, they're going to have to back away here, TPA. Four men from Royal Club will make sure that the first turret of this game, maybe on the next wave at this point, will be going down. Archie and Jay have decided to actually stick around from this one, try and soak up that little bit of extra XP as it comes on through, but that turret is going to be going down and Royal Club will pick up the first one of the game here just over five minutes in. Importantly, TPA do have a ward in the back of this Dragon Pit, so they'll see this start off, but Lee Sin is way too far away. They cannot contest this. Maybe if they had people in position and Wins was they're there, running. they could run him off, but they're doing it really quickly here. They have to get there now. Morning is level five. He doesn't have ulti yet, but just by showing himself placing the pink ward, Royal Club knows they're taking too much damage from the Dragon here. They just have to back away. So it pays off for Wins. He went into the Wolf Camp a little bit greedy, not staying around this bottom side of the map in case the Dragon was started. But TPA got it under control here. They have the first blood, lost the bottom tower though, and not looking to push the top one because BB, he's already gone. He want to go back down to this bottom lane and pick up some farm. Yeah, it was good early warding by TPA. That ward in the back of the Dragon pick definitely paid off for them, and they were able to stop the dragon from going down, but really, it is going to be about that bottom turret being down. How can uh, Starhorn increase their control on this red side jungle? So normally, when we see Insect playing like Lee Sin and Rengar, he loves to focus the bottom lane and get it see ahead. And now, when you, when you have a lane where the tower is already gone, it would open up if you go like 10 minutes into the game now for Uzi, oh sorry, for Insect to come down to this bottom lane, try and catch them in the middle of the lane and get a few kills. He won't really be able to do the same on the class X and might look like to sit and farm a bit more now so he can become very strong in these team fights. Because right up from the start, because we had the lane swap, not been able to have the same early game pressure as we sometimes see in the LPL. And if Royal Club do not move Uzi to another one of these outer turret lanes, they then will. they're going to have to spend a lot of money warding up down here because it would be very dangerous for them to return. Right now, headed up top though, to try and punish the early Mundo. Not much that Mundo can do. He has very little wave clear. Archie's still level four in there as well. Caller just hitting level five, as does Uzi with that minion going down. So Archie's going to be forced to retreat back onto his tower. Nami's actually headed up towards that top side as well, which might mean that Archie has to completely back away or risk being dove here. But this is exactly what Royal Club did last time they played Caitlyn. It was against OMG. They killed the bottom tower, they fast push it in the lane swap, and instantly Uzi just swaps to top lane. Zero joins in, they take the next tower. And then it's all about the mid lane, because they want to get all these outer turrets down so they can start putting in some deep wards and spotting out where TPA is moving, and then they can start looking for some picks. TPA trying to answer back though, BB makes the call to shove in bottom lane so that they can then try and gain control of this Dragon Pit. So many resources spent top for Royal Club, 
three people up there. TPA does a good job of recognizing this, takes advantage of the other side of the map, trades Global Gold, they're staying calm, and they've got the lead now. Yeah, so they got the Dragon here, smart move, but Royal Job actually doesn't care. They just want the towers down as fast as possible. It's the reason they picked this Caitlyn here for the early pressure on towers. They're already pushing down now here. Archie's left alone, 2v1. They might be able to get a bit of damage on the tower because Wins is running from base now. Moving back into that one, we do have a few wards down, but funnily enough, Royal Club are actually deeper than the line of wards that have been put down there by the Taipei Assassins, and we can see with that blue buff spawn, it's already been started here by Uzi and Zero. We do have Morning and Archie coming around the side, Stun won't quite connect onto the oh, champion. Get it. Nope. Blue buff is very low, and it does go over yep. to Morning, so successful defense of that buff. They did defend the buff, but now it's going to be a move from Royal Club to the mid lane, the last outer turret standing. They will continue with this sort of full court press style that they're known for. They continually keep up the pressure, and that's why we don't see a lot of rise from them. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of time to ramp up before they start forcing these fights. We'll see if they actually have Cola join the team. Pretty much they're going to try and maneuver him on the side lanes now while it's a four-man early shove. And then just try and have Ryze soak up side lane experience, making use of that teleport to go uh, from bottom to top, wherever the big minion waves are. And we often see with Royal Club, Cola, he's the guy who's split push. Like, he loves to play Jax, he loves to play Aurelia, where he can actually split push and take down towers by himself. Ryze, he's going to be fairly strong in one-on-one, -on -one, but he's not exactly the guy who walks up and kills the towers here. So it's going to be all about him getting a lot of farm in the side lanes and then he joins in for these team fights here. We might see him TP behind and try and flank around. Yeah, it's a good adaptation to, to incorporate Ryze into this comp because he's not going to be able to split push. Ryze doesn't take turrets down well, but he does soak up side lane farm very well. And he well. loves it, man. Yeah, yeah. Ryze to late game, man. He <laughs> will be an absolute monster. Insect down this bottom lane. He's not spotted by any wards. And this is what I talked about just before. Insect, he loves to come down to this bottom lane, especially when the tower is gone and just look for kills here. Possibly a counter gank, Wins is already gone. It's going to be about the bubble here though, and if we look at the AD carry items, there's a BF sword difference, despite the fact that BB is ahead in CS, and we can see them now actually recalling from that one, realizing that you can't really match up to the power there of Uzi, especially if a bubble were to land, and Zero must be close to hitting that level 6 point as well, where his tidal wave would come into effect. Mid lane. Stayed a little bit quiet these last few moments, but it's Morning that's got a big advantage. He's head headed up towards his top lane now. Ryze already starting to back away. This is the danger if you're trying to soak up on the, all these side lanes with a squishy early game Ryze. He's very, very diveable. They make the call to back off, though, because there's a lot of pressure headed mid here. Starnhold oh. Royal Club looking to group oh. up. Mr. Bingo here, they are pinging eggs, so they want to kill, but they also need to get into this mid lane. Notice how Uzi and Zero know they can't go mid lane as long as Morning is there to wave clear. To see a small fight, oh. never mind. But as long as Morning is in the mid lane, he can sit there and wave clear, which means Uzi couldn't really fast push the tower after he took down the top one. But as soon as Morning moved from this mid lane, Uzi ran in there, he'd already shoved the bottom lane, and he wanted to see if he could get some damage on the tower. Pretty much identical builds between the AD carries and the mid laners at this point. Look at Both TP going lane. up towards the Athenes. Are they going to be able to get into this one? And in the end, Cole are actually deciding against it. Yeah, he, that's really going to cost them since they were Ooh. trying to have him uh, sort of play the defense here. Looks like that move down there from Korn to soak up and stop the push from BB is going to buy them some time. But they have stalled it out a little bit here. It was a bit of an aggressive move though. Cool actually wanted to teleport down, try and gank BB to kill him because a lot of TBA's playstyle is built around BB. Like he's the shot caller, he's the captain, and he's often the guy they look to, uh, like the guy they want to have to carry the late game. Lucian won't be a, a hyper carry like we normally see, like Tristan is a big pick for BB here. Still a great late game carry, and uh, we'll continue to look for him to do well. Get him to team fights where he can start carrying, and also why we saw Royal Club thinking about shutting him down or trying to shut him down. TPA just trying to set up a bit of a trap there. They know that both Uzi and Zero were hanging around this middle lane, but actually Zero had already caught, uh, recalled and was on his way back out of the base, so nothing really open to them. We do have a dragon coming up in one and a half minutes' time. Up until now, it's TPA that have got the wards down around that area of the map. We'll see if that continues, though, as two men go down bottom there for Royal Club. 
Oh, it looks like we're going to be seeing that 2v2 once again in action. His intake here going to get the slow. Actually, Flash is in there for the extra damage, and Archie is not going to be able to get away from this one. It's intake that picks up a kill. Nice little setup here. There was a ping ward from Royal Club in the bush, so he could move at least close enough before he got spotted by the ward, and it was too late for Archie up in his top lane to react. End up dying. He will respawn before the dragon. He does have teleport ready as well. Down his bottom lane. Who's taking a lot of damage from BP? Bibi not scared there to get his hands dirty and that may just free up a lot of damage on towards this tower. There is the culling coming out. That'll get rid of pretty much half a minion wave. But it looks like Royal Club have done enough to keep them back at least for now. And notice the level difference here between BB and Uzi. It's simply because Uzi has been pushing these towers with multiple members from his team where BB, he was just in the top lane alone freezing it, getting a lot of experience here. So he's ahead, he's doing a lot of damage now. It's gonna be very important for this potential dragon fight. Well, tower's going down. I'm not sure the Royal Club should have stuck around for this one. Who's in the focus? Exhaust goes down. He flashes over the wall. BB is gonna dash it oh, out. Okay. One more after attack will do it. When Insight comes around, Monsoon is running. Bubble comes down. Is Insight gonna be able to get away? There's the knock -up. A oh, oh, from the oh, oh, no. down as well. Corn now at less than half. Zero, Cola, both the Huge swing for DPA. That turret going down and BB following up. The level advantage pays out big. They're able to get the kill. Snowball into several pickups. That's not only going to be the turret, it's going to be the dragon. Big, big boost here for TPA. Giant mid game power spike. Beautiful play there. And just notice how every single member from TPA rushed to this bottom lane. Let's just see it again. Your tower goes down. Shield already from Jay onto BB, doing a lot of damage to him. Notice that. Level 10 to level 8. Uchi flashes. It's not enough. BB can chase, finish him. Now, the important part the first ulti from Jay actually missed Intake, so he won't get to knock him away. But he's just healing BB and trying to make sure he can stay alive. Corn flashed for that. Oh. So, Apparel ult app, by the way. Well, as that was well. Intake. So Insect, they're able to get a kill here while watching the replay, but man, the missed shockwave from Korn there really hurt them. Morning came in and he barely missed that Cinder Stun, but that didn't hurt them nearly as much as the missed shockwave. I have to say too, that was some fairly greedy play by Uzi, sticking around the turret that was only a couple hits left from going down. And we were talking before the World Championship started, the great thing about watching these Chinese teams that from what sometimes seems like a 2v2, all of a sudden becomes a 5 versus 5 as they get into the action so quickly. But TPA really matching them here on that one, coming out big and now lead this game close to a 3,000 gold lead, 5-4 up in kills. Behind slightly here in turrets, they've got a 4-0 on wins here on Lee Sin, showing against the opposite number, Insek, who famed, of course, for that Lee Sin play, but he can certainly bring this one out. Big morning getting himself another blue buff there as well. And really what we are seeing is the whole plan from TPA coming to fruition finally here. One of the reasons why people stopped fast pushing the turrets down was because of the option to freeze the other side lane. And TPA did that. They sat on all of the extra experience and gold that they were going to feed into BB and then finally brought it down to the bottom lane for the second dragon. And the fact TPA has Syndra sitting in the mid lane to wave clear is simply meant that the whole idea from Royal Club with like taking down all the outer turrets as fast as possible, it failed because they couldn't push the mid lane. Morning was sitting there, he could just constantly wave clear it. He played it very safe in the laning phase. If he had died just once, instantly Uzi would have been in mid lane, killed the tower here. He played it really wisely. Kept wave playing, top lane, going down. Yeah, quick reactions here from TPA. Seeing there was no one top, seeing the gathering maybe you could say of Royal Club in that middle lane, pushing straight up there, leveling out the turret score. And as I said before, 4,000 gold is not too far away here for the Taipei Assassins and looking very, very good. And we heard the crowd after that last oh, fight, yes. really getting pumped up here. And that's something that you can never really count out. TPA looking very good in their first game. And I really wonder here what Royal Club is actually thinking about because normally, once they actually do fall behind, they will keep being very aggressive and like try and fight you and it will often backfire because they are so far behind. So they're not a really a good team at coming back into games here. And they don't have insect on a playmaking jungler. They don't really have Uzi at least for now for the next 
15 minutes on Caitlyn where he really needs to stack up items before he gets to a late game and he becomes a hyper carry, he won't be able to go in and solo kill people either. So the two playmakers, Insek and Uzi, are not able to go in alone and start something. Which means TPA, as long as they play safe, stick together as a unit, they will be able to win. Well, I think one of the biggest problems for Starhorn Roller Club here is gonna be Achi towards this late game. He's facing the double solo lane AP from Roller Club, already got his Spirit Visage done. He is going to be very, very hard for them to take down. Talking about uh, Insec and Uzi, it's gonna be up to them. Oh, stun onto Korn. This tower gonna be focused here by TPA, and I don't think the Royals Club can actually hang on to this one. That'll be turret number three. The outer ring is now gone, and you can see instantly with that TPA saying, right, your outer turrets are gone. We're gonna oh, take Rise. the jungle as well. Rise also again. Oh, he got into the brush there, I think, just before they caught sight of him. The wards go down though, and this is where we'll really see how well TPA can turn this lead yeah. into a possible victory. We know them as a team that sometimes take their time to win games because they do it by the book, and getting the wards down is now the next step for them. And doing it by the book against a team like Royal Club is just a perfect strategy because, again, they want to fight. They want to get in your face as much as possible. If you slowly take objectives, then you go to the bottom lane, four members start pushing in that one to take a tower, and you pressure every single lane, because notice Cola here, he will always go to the side lane to try and pick up some farm, which means he's not there to defend right now. He has to teleport in, so it's all about Uzi or Korn to do the wave there, or to wave play these lanes, which opens up for TBA to fast rotate between lanes. They have full war control in this top side, or in this bottom side of Royal Club jungle. All of that vision does come uh, a large part due to their support, Jay, who is also going to make their tower sieges really, really easy as well. Having that Janna ultimate in your back pocket, uh, just in case there's a bad shockwave, is going to make them be able to get up to the turrets very quickly. You can get a shielded double shot off under the turret and slowly take it down very easily. Plus, they have the support of a Syndra long range stun. One of the best AP champions to have at those tower sieges because she can hit that CC from out of tower turret range very, very safely. I would actually like to see TPA just do what they've been doing for the last like one minute, split up in these lanes here, you have Mundo keeping a rise and check up in the top lane, Syndra sitting in the mid lane with Oriana, and down this bottom lane you do have to dual lanes, and this opens up for wins because the ward control, the vision control is in favor of TPA to then move between the lanes. He can go into mid lane and kick back or pick, kick back Korn and set up a very easy kill for morning, and suddenly, once you get one kill in either of these lanes, because you split it out Royal Club so much, you will be able to take the tower and break further into Royal Club space. So, Dragon has spawned in, TPA, superior vision on that side of the enemy jungle and in the river. That is going to be a complete freebie for them. Obviously, you can call a freebie, I also say, earned from the fact that they had that lead taking down the turrets. That's three out of three Dragons now for the Taipei Assassins, and it brings their lead to just over 5,000 gold, 21 minutes into this one. Doing really, really well at this point. The question is, can they turn a lead into a victory against Royal Club? Well, they have sort of turned their sights towards mid, but the ping back onto blue, that would be pretty big for them. They need to get that for Syndra. Adds a whole lot more pressure in a tower siege. You talked about TPA playing some of their leads out slowly, and they have that luxury right now. They do, but you don't really want to give Caitlyn too much time to just sit and farm, especially because Caitlyn is fairly weak in the mid game and you already had the early advantage. You could keep pushing it there and force Uzi into some team fights, which he didn't want to be in before he got some more items. I mean, you normally say Caitlyn needs like two items before she really starts scaling up to late game. And Uzi's currently sitting on the seal, just upgrade to stack shape. So that's the two items now. You can start scaling to late game. And for now, TPA looking towards the top lane. All the water that in the bottom side of the jungle has ran out. And moving on to... Uh, Yep. They've played it by the book. They moved up their ward line, all of their wards almost in Starhorn Roller Club territory right now. They've clamped both sides of the jungle, swinging up top here. This undefended secondary turret top, they get a lot of damage down here before any response shows up. Ace in the hole coming through and Royal Club may be looking for the fight here. They're certainly going to force TPA to back away from that turret here for now, but TPA have all got themselves together. They're still not quite landing there. They were looking to pin point Uzi, but looks like Royal Club have done enough now to force TPA to back away from it. But how far are they going to go? They still wait here by that tribush. BB just going to go out there, get rid of the ward. But at least for now, 
no fight going to come in there. And they can continue to play it safe like this. Kite back into the areas where they control the vision. Because look at Starhorn Royal Club's composition here. So hard for them to actually get an initiation. Very dangerous. Against a Mundo tank and a Janna who can reset the fight, you really need a great shockwave to pull this one off. Definitely agree it's going to be hard for or love to actually stop or go kill TPA, but they can keep wavelength. We've just seen for the last five minutes, Rodolf has been able to sit in the lanes, wave there has barely been any damage from TPA onto the towers here. Rodolf at least buying some time, and it's still funny to see them play like this, where now they're forced to be defensive and sit and just wave there their lanes. When they normally are this team who just go for it and, and dive you and force you into these bad team fights, it's almost like watching European LCS sometimes. <laughs> that's that's definitely something to be said for Rogue Club. They haven't forced an issue in something where they've been behind, you know, since sort of this mid game here. They haven't overextended. They didn't chase TPA there, which would have been disastrous for them if they tried to chase chase that yeah, team and, into and they couldn't do it enemy with the comp. vision. Like again, this is not a standard Rogue Club comp. This is not one way you force all the fights because you're jungler. Once again, you kind of want to sit and farm. You want to get some items, and of course, Caitlyn. You don't go one on one with Caitlyn in the side lane against anyone there. That's why you need to pick a Lucian or Vayne. TPA are looking, you know, towards that late game here. Jenna picks up her Medjai's, hoping to accumulate a lot of stacks there. Another bonus for having Mundo on your team is it does open up some duo Barons. Mundo's very good at tanking up the Baron in late game. Maybe if they get a lot of vision control on that red side and they can control that entire pathway, then they could sneak something. Ooh, a lot of damage there onto Insect. In fact, the Ignite oh. taking away. One more would have done it. Insect walks away live, just intact. And there is BB actually going in, forcing Cola out of lane. He's now got Jay joining in. Next minion wave is coming up. TPA are going to get some damage onto this turret as Winds will join them as well. The rest of the Royal Club, though, are starting to move around here. Can they hold on to his tower? There is a tidal wave coming through, but it's not able to do what they wanted. It was the Banshees actually on winds that stopped him from being knocked up. But man, Royal Club is not really reacting fast enough here. They'll let BB get a lot of damage on the tower. Onto mid lane now. Notice Uzi, he ran from base to bottom lane, but he was too late. And then he realized, oh, I'm in bottom lane now. They're already gone. They're pushing my mid tower, and he's trying to run into wave clear. So Royal Club here reacting way too slow to these pushes from TPA. And once again, we see another chase here, but there's nothing really they can do to pull the trigger. They don't have a reliable hard engage that they can split the switch here. It would have to be a very dangerous move, like an, an insect jumping in there with invisibility to try and get in position for that shockwave on, onto BB. And that's even that is pretty easy to spot. I mean, unless he's flanking around you and you have absolutely no wards. But because TPA is pushing up all the lanes, they will have wards in the jungle. So insect, he can flank around. He has to run straight in their face and then jump with the ball. That is pretty easy to spot. And they're going for a two-man team up once again towards this bottom lane. Again, Royal Club trying to react, but those deeper wards that the Assassins have got down, spot Insect coming in. And there is a Howling Gale going over. He knocks Insect up, but there was no follow-through. TPA here not interested really in overcommitting for the fight. They want the towers, and this one is going to be going down. That's tower number four for the... No, not quite. Doesn't get taken. And Insect Whoa. here off to the side will get the slow. Can he actually get in there Mudan, to start the fight off? There is the ultimate ultimate use and they do have teleport but just ran away. away from them Archie in that mid lane he should be able to take down this tower on his way through four men from TPA will push bottom back up here and Royal Club unable to get in here and make anything happen we've been over it so many times yes. yeah they just don't have the trigger to pull they they kind of have to hope for TPA to slip up here and go too deep under a turret but that's not gonna happen I mean Insect tried to actually like flank around him even though he knew they had full vision of him and then he tried to just land it slow and see if he can catch someone. Not gonna happen here. Even the Janna passive to help speed you up and there's gonna be another dragon. So TPA been using a few different tactics now to try and get a tower down. We saw them just before he had you with the dual lane in the bottom lane. Wind's running between the two lanes which was what we talked about earlier and then morning hit in the mid lane push it up and they did get a lot of damage because Royal Club are not reacting fast enough to these pushes. They're not expecting, okay, where is TPA going to send their dual lane? Where should Uzi be to wave clear fast enough? And therefore, there's always a lot of tower damage being taken. And with Archie pushing that mid lane, the thing that you expect, and especially out of Royal Club, is for them to say, okay, five men versus four in that bottom lane, kill them off and stop that split push happening. But because of those wards in there, they see them coming every single time, just back off and then push it all the way back in there. 
TPA now, though, finally actually starting to move a little bit further back on the map. There's a blue buff being picked up for Morning, who now has his Zonya's Hourglass in another needlessly large rod as well. Mundo already super tanky with that Spirit Visage, with now the Randuin's Omen in there as well. This is going to be hard for Royal Club to come back if TPA don't make a mistake. They have defended all of their secondary turrets thus far, though. They have at least been able to hold on to some of their territory. Really what they have to worry about is how are we going to keep TPA from getting complete vision control of our red side jungle and then forcing some sort of action around Baron. TPA can easily take control and then do some baiting. So Usi was actually doing red buff here and going back to base, but TPA, because they had no idea where he actually was on the map, didn't really feel like they could just push up, even though this mid tower is very, very low. I mean, it's a few hits from BB, two hits from him, and it's going to go down here. Same goes for the bottom lane tower. So TPA for now seems to be looking towards this Baron here, but might just want to set up a few wards. So there's the risk on these Royal. They want Royal to believe there's a chance they can take the Baron and then force them away from their towers, away from the safe lanes, out in the open, and then you can team fight. Right. If you can get that vision line far enough up, then Syndra is one of the best AP champions from Fog of War, easily pulling off picks with her long range stun. So, that vision war continues around Baron. We see a ward in the back of the pit from Royal Club. And there is the turret finally in that bottom lane going down. It's once again Archie off on his own, just making sure that he gets those waves pushed up. Getting the fourth turret of the game for the Taipei Assassins. Does their focus now turn over towards this Baron? They've got three men in there. The Sweeper's been very, very effective for them. Archie down on the bottom side, getting a bit of clearage of his own. And if you look at the minimap, especially on the top side, he's all blue wards at this point. Yeah, so the defensive pink wards here from TPA, they could actually take them and just move them a bit further up here if they really want to start setting up for a potential Baron. Deny even more vision in the jungle from Royal Club because the two wards you see just around the mid lane, one of them actually just got moved, thank you very much. Second one there at the mid lane, just push it further up. Royal Club is not looking to push on TPA for the next 10 minutes. They just want to sit back and farm and avoid TPA picking up a Baron or avoid losing their base. So take these pink wards, move them a bit further up here, deny even more vision from Royal Club and force them to react, force them away from their lanes into the jungle and then you can land a Sintra stun and then you can kill people. Hmm, they are doing a the greatest job of defending their ward coverage in the red side jungle though. That every opportunity to force a fight here on the red side jungle, TPA. Uh, but Sarna World Club did get in there. They cleared out a little bit and they got a little bit of safety here. One ward down into Baron at least. Oh, Jay that taking a bit of damage. Wind's gonna get bold, but no immediate danger he had. BB on the top side there. And once again, the Taipei Assassin saying, you come in and put your wards down, we'll take them straight back out. And to be frank, Zero going to be running out of wards at this point, the amount that he's thrown down the back. There is BB actually up on the top side. Zero coming across. They're going to try and lock him down here. Tidal wave going to be dodged away from the bubble misses. Yeah, was... And BB says, thank you very much. Use your ultimate and get nothing for it. That was and a very desperate play. They also have complete vision control. Here's that uh, two-man Baron we talked about uh, with the Mundo and Lee Sin. It doesn't go down fast when you do it that way, though. Goes down very slow. That might be the chance that Royal Club need. Jay just basically trying to body block Zero, stop him coming around from it using those Howling Gales. We do have Insect moving across the side though. BB is down to less than half a oh, down. The Baron here and that's is going to be spotted. <laughs> TPA just disengage. And might I even reset like the entire Baron dance we've just seen here. All the pink walls being placed. If TPA backs away from the Baron pit now, it opens up for Royal Club to go in there, clear all the pink walls, buy some more time. For now, they're looking to this mid lane. Syndra is standing there to wave clear. But yeah, how, you know, what can Royal Club really get out of this? They've got five people on three defending the turret. They can get a tower. They back it out. Janna's shield goes down very quickly. That turret does fall. That's turret number three for Royal Club. So they themselves now achieve the outer ring. And what will they do from that one, though, as TPA start to get back in? Insect is going to go up towards the Baron, trying to get rid of a few of these pink wards. There are three of them around the immediate area of that Baron itself. Cole is up on the top side as well. We do have Uzi there in position as well. So Royal Club here, at least for now, going to clear out some of the vision that TPA had worked so hard for. But with a couple of recalls, they're starting to move in. Shockwave will pull BB in, but there's no follow-up. No, but actually also, like if you look down at the items now, smart play by TPA, they know 
or they knew by backing away from the Baron they will lose all the pink wards instantly. Three members to support new pink wards ready to set up for another Baron dance if they want to move in and do it again. I'm not sure why Bieber actually did go for Last Whisper as he's the third item here. He could have gone for Bloodthirster. There's not a lot of armor on the side of, of Royal Club. Give him a lot more damage. Tower pushing potential here. So Last Whisper wasn't really worth it for him as the third item here. But it delayed it for four. Well, right now Royal Club are actually moving down towards the Dragon. That already spawning into the map. Archie down on the bottom side. Maybe part of the flank around, but no, we see that three-man recall. They're giving this one away. Well, this is that uh, reward for chunking BB in the mid lane there. He got, Ooh. he went back to base, and Royal Club, they get another objective here. They're slowly clawing their way back into this game. And this is TPA. This safe sort of style is not paying off for them right now. Every step that you give Starhorn Royal Club back into this game makes it scarier and scarier. They thrive on these Baron fights in the late game. The team fight, you don't want to let them have one of these late game team fights. Uzi now, he's becoming very scary. He's got those Kaelin items you're looking for. One more damage item on Uzi and he will be able to shred. He's holding right now over 2,000 gold. Well, AC in the hole comes through. You see it takes almost half of BB's health away. BB pushing out that wave, but it's only going to fall into the hands of Uzi as that one pushes through. We're also seeing more wards going down from TPA using that scrying orb just to check if anyone was waiting as they once again get those deeper wards down. Insect going to be waiting off to the side. He's actually stood on top of that ward as it went down. And that means that TPA once again get control. They've actually got a minion wave. This is the tower going down. Stunned They've it. done well to actually defend this one. Insect not going to be followed through there. I thought Morning might pull the trigger. Decides against it. Yeah, you can see how risk averse TPA they are. Even though they get one of those long range stuns on a squishy target, don't overcommit. They just take the turret. I feel like though TPA needs to decide. Uh -huh. Do we want to go 100% for Baron here? Do we want to take all our pink wards and fully focus on denying all the vision from Royal Club in this top side of the jungle, start up a Baron or force a team fight around it? Or should we just come back to what worked before where we push up every single lane because Morning is so strong in the mid lane and because BB was so strong in the bottom lane, they could keep pressure on both the bottom lane and the mid lane at the same time. And it paid off in the start. They got the towers really low. They could have kept doing it, killed those two towers, instead of dancing around the Baron here for the last five minutes where they've basically not been doing anything. And we do get to the point where you have to start thinking about super, super late game. Exactly. Royal Club have way more damage they can bring to the table. That's the whole point. I mean, you're basically buying time, buying time for Royal Club to keep farming up here. They got the last dragon as well. And TPA is not pushing the advantage. And funny enough, when we actually watched the finals between TPA and AHQ, the GPL finals, there were some very, very long games. Even when TPA were far ahead, they would just keep like playing extremely safe, keep picking up objectives here, dancing around the pound a little bit. And AHQ almost came back in the game. We were like 60 minutes in, and there were a lot of gold behind. Royal Club can't look to do the same because their late game comp is scary. It is so fantastically strong in team fights. They have Mundo with teleport. They have complete vision control of Baron. They can shove up this lane. They need to create some sort of pressure here. But right now, they've just been wave clearing and wave clearing, picking up uh, the neutral dragons, which, yes, is giving them a nice pot of gold. But slowly but surely, Royal Club come back. Yeah, and even that last dragon going to Royal Club, their first of the game. Let's see if they can continue that trend here. We go back to what we've been seeing for the last 15, 20 minutes almost, which is just the exchange of wards around this barren area. We have the Thorn Mail now done, by the way, for Archie, so it makes it a little bit more difficult for Uzi to crack that shell, but TPA again, showing that they're not scared to kind of step forward in the jungle. They're just not using that positional no. advantage for They anything. need to be more aggressive. I mean, they need to take Jay, Winds, and Morning, and you just go straight into Royal Club's top side of the jungle, then BB up in his top lane. Nobody can one-on-one -on -one him from the side of Royal Club. He can push in the lane. You saw him just perform this top lane here. He will kill the minions and then he would back away. He wouldn't risk anything because the rest of TPA were just staying just around the barrier. So they weren't Whoa. deep enough to spot if Royal Club were going for a gank here. They need to be more aggressive with the lead they had. They keep starting the Baron. Royal Club can just walk in, ward it. TPA backs away here and they're not getting 
deep enough with the wards. They're not playing aggressive enough. Oh, Jay gonna be caught out. Insect on top of him. Uses the monsoon as the exhaust was used as well. Tidal wave will go through without connecting. It's gonna be about a bubble if they can get that one in. Actually, we saw the Ignite use that as a good point. Oh! Oh, no, oh, it's it's down. The shield comes in. Uzi down low as well. Low health on both sides, there's no this, kills though. There, there are wards behind Royal Club right now and there's no teleport coming in from Achi. They don't follow that aggression up. They had two people out of the fight here. No teleport up, he decides to stay bottom. He should get some damage on this turret, but there are reinforcements coming. Well, that's what you'd expect for him to push through, do the damage to the tower, but he did push through, but he didn't do the tower. He should have teleported. He did come into the fire. He should have teleported, yes. He should have teleported 100%. We just saw how strong PP is. Against two people, he just chunked them down to no HP in a matter of seconds. TP in from Mundo behind them, and suddenly you have a few kills, you can get your Baron. Oh, now it's Jagan, yeah. BB's here too. BB is there, Cola though, and Corn both backing them up there, and Insect trying to get that one started. That's the second time in less than a minute that Jay's been caught somewhat a little bit far up there, and Insect has looked to try and get in and do the damage to him. And again, Insect just sat forward, ready to leap over the wall. There are three men there this time though, and that is a bit of a dangerous scenario. He will actually leap away from it, but four-man push here in the mid lane. Mundo down bottom, he's got TP available, there's no teleport on Cola, so Ryze can't get involved in a fight if that were to kick off. You can tell TP are starting to get frustrated without a clear avenue for them to end out this game not quite sure what to do. They're just going to run up against these inhibitor turrets. It's really hard to actually breach the inhibitor turrets because those are the ones with the walls that funnel you in to a shockwave, to a flash from Rise to start something out. If you press all the way up against the inhibitor turret, then that is the you know small opening there that Royal Club could use to force something. And now they actually do have some very deep wards, which means now they can start really dancing around this Baron here. Oh, oh, he's going to get the kill He's gonna go down, there is wins to follow up. Archie does teleport finally into that fight, but they don't get it in for it. There's a flash into the jump, the slow lands onto Morning, but he instantly flashed as well. That support for AD, Royal Club now have control. Let's see what the move they're gonna to go to try and at least gain vision around Baron. It would be dangerous to start this one off, but they're going to rush in. But how dangerous, the behind, they've waited so long for this one. They take away the vision and they're gonna sit here with a trap ready and waiting. Will the Ooh. Taipei Assassins fall from this one? There's a pink ward there at the back. Royal Club know that they're there. There's the wall coming over Pardon. the top. Taipei Assassins spot them. Very, very smart play here. So just before, even though there's all the wards, actually never mind. Baron is started by Royal Club now. Starting it off, Wins is going to come over the top. Pink ward in position. Archie will join Whoa. into the fight. Baron going very, very low. Who's going to be able to get this one? He goes over it's to Royal good. Club. Wins going to go low. Picked up in the end with the Uzi kill. Meanwhile, Cola going for morning. Gets that one. Ace in the hole will be blocked by Archie. Exhaust onto Cola as well. Can't quite get the room prison down. That's going to be a two for nothing. And Royal Club get in the Baron. TPA have control of the Baron pit for over 20 minutes. No Barons committed to. Royal Club have an opening of 20 seconds, and they immediately commit to the Baron. They don't care if it's a smite fight. <laughs> Insect is able to win the smite fight, and then they wrap around for the kills. Huge pickup for Royal Club. Simply just TPA didn't manage to push to victory, to be honest. I mean, it's not over yet, by no means. Let's see it again here. So. Four members from Royal Club. Remember, BB is dead. So it's zero. He's running from base here. So no AD carry from one side. No support from the other one. Nice smite by Insect here. Gets the Baron. And Jay's actually using a nice ulti to keep them in the Baron video. But Royal Club at this point, because BB is not here, he's the main damage dealer. It's just so much stronger in the fight. They can finish up here, get a few kills, get the Baron, and now they're in the driving seat. Could have been a lot more kills there at the end as well. That exhaust really stopping them pushing through. Jay and BB actually looking for a bit of a trap here onto Cola, who's pushing this bottom lane down. No vision in the river, so it's a risky push out. They've actually pinged that bottom tower, which means that Cola is going to oh. be alone in this bottom lane. But do they want to try and take him on? This is a pretty strong ride. Scrying Orb is going to go down, but Cola with Baron buff on as well <laughs> is just too beefy for them. They don't want it. And so also due to the mid lane here, if they went for the fight and it backfired, suddenly the mid tower would be gone. Maybe even the inhibitor here. So playing it safe, TBA, gonna go back to their own base, sit five members and try and wave it. Suddenly, Royal Club pushing up here. 
T-Bay has to wave clear. Now the thing to watch out for is the long range into Sun onto Uzi. Uzi does have a Quicksilver Sash, so it's going to have to be multiple CCs that they land on him to actually get that kill. But the first one is going to have to proc it. Insane matchup here. And Insect is trying to get around the side of them. Gets hit good slow off, gets hit with the cleaver at the same time. We see Uzi, I mean, he's Shieldville right now. He's not really scared of tanking up a couple of hits from that tower. His Quicksilver Sash as well would stop him oh, from getting in any trouble. Here is Wins coming around the back. Who are they going to go for? Oh! Yeah! They managed to get one kill. Archie going low. Zero is low as well. Insect though, going to be focused. He pops the ultimate. Will get the stealth. Jumps away as well. But Archie is chasing like a madman. But TPA, they're going straight up the mid lane. Royal Club need to react to this one. Who's he right now? It's due to Rave. Can be streak on now. It's way too late. Morning. And the Rave team pushing up. Oh my god. TPA moving through the base. Archie can tank this one all day long with that thumbnail in there. Ace in the hole will come through. Big. Fat Mundo tanks that one up, they get the stun onto Cola, the tower goes down, TPA here trying to turn it back around, what can they do? Intent off to the side, doesn't follow up. Again, they don't have that hard engage, they can't trap you and make and force a fight, even oh. though they have Baron buff, still another 15 or so seconds left on Corn. so it's going to be a pretty easy escape for well, they need to get a tower, they get a tower. They're recalling and Royal Club just pushing straight down this middle lane, we've already seen the Uzi not scared to tank up. Zero will take some damage here as the rest of the team comes around. Inner turret on the top lane goes down to minions. The inner turret in the middle lane is picked up by Royal oh, Club as well. That's done. Would have been another uh, clean pickup for TPA. Now they did lose a turret to minions in that time. So those two were just traded turrets right there. But the play we saw just before here, this is the reason so many teams ban Lee Sin against wins, because he's so good at flanking around and setting up the entire fight, to be honest. He walked in there, managed to kick Korn back, he didn't try and flash the kick, there was no hourglass either. Easy pick up for TPA, pushed it in, open inhibitor now here, beautiful play by wins, and really showing why his Lee Sin is so, so respected. This is it's a hard be a trap <laughs> for TPA. Can they lure Royal Club into it? For now, you'd have to say, no way. Royal Club staying away from that one. And look at this, TPA actually coming to try and close in onto Insect. They've got a lot of vision on the top side of the map. They see both Uzi and Zero in the base, thanks to the ward that they left behind earlier on. Well, Insect really trying to start these plays off, always flanking in from the side. Now he has the ball on him. We said it before, it's kind of obvious, even if you can't see him, when the entire team's running towards you, an insect isn't spotted, but they've at least forced TPA back for now. Really risky by BBA to not actually get a defensive item as his last item, because TPA is playing a setup here where it's all about morning and BB to do the damage, so you know who Royal Club is going to try and focus here. And if Insect comes in there, followed up by Corn of the Rune Prison, then BB will die instantly, because there's no defensive items. He's going towards the plate of the Rune King. He's got to rely on Janna and the kickback from Lee Sin. If he's not protected, then everything is lost anyway. They have to have him as a pure damage source here, because Mundo's not going to be doing the damage. Lee Sin's not going to be doing the damage late game. They really need to squeeze it out of somewhere. So so this is up to BB's late play. You know, this is the, what the team has relied on. Him in the late game with the big plays. And a wise man once said that offense is the best defense. We'll see if that actually <laughs> comes to be true here. As once again, Insect trying to get it right. Taking oh. half of Insect's health away. That was insane damage coming out of BB. And Insect realizing he can't keep doing that without the help of his team. And again, we see Royal Club. They're forced onto the side of the map. TPA going up middle towards the Indian. This is actually going to be near, but the rest of Royal Club, they're running towards the base here. They want to maybe try and fight. Oh, speedy. Cola up. has flash. They can oh, force that. Go in. There it is. They're going towards Morning. Tied away from the side. Morning going to go down. It's Kong that gets the kill. Can they get any more? Uzi trying to get in the damage up towards Archie. He's got his ultimate running. And we'll try and back away. It's a 60 second spawn timer here for Morning. And Royal Club have 30 seconds until the Baron comes up as well. They should be able to turn and get that. If not, an in him turret of their own. Are you guys still with me? Yes, we are, talk, we are here. Job. I know it's a great game, but we got two analysts on this one. You've got to help me out here. But Royal Club pushing forward. Turrets being hammered away on. 
It looks like that's it for now. Baron is coming up in five. That's what Royal Club are going for. They should. 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 Be able to get this one because, as you said, the discrepancy in uh, revive timers there is going to be way too much. So another Baron for Royal Club, but they are also oh, going wins. to have to worry about getting back to defend the inhibitor here. Wind Shouldn't for the problem. solo oh. steal? No, he's too late and he's going to die for it as well. And that could be real bad news. Korn is actually recalling here, so no push just yet for Royal Club. Right, didn't even have to care about the inhibitor or their possible chance of TBA pushing. I mean. We had BB doing red buff, and of course, Morning was still dead here, so it would have been a very risky play by TB if they actually pushed up the mid lane. So, another Baron here for Royal Club. And funny enough, got 20 minutes back, and suddenly, <laughs> oh, we were talking about how TBA, they were so far ahead here, just pushing up the lanes. Could they actually close out the game? The answer is no, they couldn't. And all of a sudden, Royal Club, heading gold, got a Baron buff. Thing is, Royal Club, they had to use that Rise Flash to get the catch onto Morning and it definitely paid off for them. They won't have the Flash for a long time, but now they have the Baron buff, and they need to make this Baron buff count. Let's see how well the Siege will go, because they do have to be careful about warding up behind them. They don't want Wins to pull off another one of those Lee Sin plays. That top in the turret has got a big wave pushing through. Royal Club gonna join into it. Teleport's available for Kohler as well, who's in the base right now, so he'll be able to join in. I think wisely here, the Taipei Assassins decide to leave it. Notice what Kohler is doing. He's just sitting and waiting. He has Home Guard already on his boot, so he wants to teleport in. That's going to be the engage. Not flashing in with Rice, just Home Guard, and you run straight in against T TPA, land the Rune Prison, and then you can start a fight. Now he's actually moving out because they got to push all the way down to the base. And he has oh. the teleport, no Home Guard this time. Teleport coming into it, and Kohler will simply just join the party from this one. What's the next option for them? Waves in the top lane and in the mid lane, Sue are going to be bearing down onto those inhibitor turrets, but Royal Club want to go on this top inhibitor turret. There's the Kali coming through! He's massive the damage onto Uzi! There is a tidal wave together, disengaging, and the Royal Club <laughs> once again being shocked by the amount of damage coming their way, have to back off. This is the point that's extremely exciting in the game, where everybody's getting to their max item builds. And I love the fact that not only has BB built full damage, but we have Uzi as well. So full damage, both AD carries, which means, yes, if one of them is out of position, then everybody oh, yeah. has to spend all uh -huh. of the defensive ultimates to make sure their AD carry does not go down. That is the key to these fights, protecting the AD carries. Look down this bottom lane here, massive waving build up by Rothlop pushing in. As long as they keep TPA here, they might be able to move down and push in and get some damage in the bottom lane with this big wave coming. They're moving down now, but so is the rest of TPA. Look I at that graph there as well. TPA had such a control on this game for such a long time. And finally, Royal Club swinging it now in their favor. They're even pushing up to the steps in the bottom lane. Mid lane's pushed way up. Finally, that top lane has gone back a little bit for the Taipei Assassins to give them a bit of a breather on that front. There's a stun onto Korn. No follow-up just yet. Kohler actually going in. Bit of damage towards Archie. Once again, the Cullen being thrown out defensively, trying to keep them off the tower. Keep your eyes on the ball here. It's going to be about the Shockwave and about the Syndra stun. Who's going to hit the highest priority target first? Oh, I oh, think he's going to be focused there a little bit. He's down to less than half HP. He might have to pop that ultimate here. Of course, has masses of regen even without that one. Insect hit with the Q, but Wind's not looking for the play just yet. The Baron buff is still on for Royal Club at this point. So they're feeling good, even if they take a bit of damage. Zero down to half. Gets hit with the stun at max range from Morning. But it's so hard for Royal Club to push in here when you're again Lucian and Syndra to do with the heal. Oh, Fight. they're going to maybe there's the Monsu coming out. There is it. Take down to half HP. Ulti comes through. It's not enough damage though. This could be the game right here. Jay is low. Cola trying to get in to finish them. God, Howling Gale will stop him chasing. But that is the inhibitor turret. Gonna be focused. They're all at half HP though. It's dangerous to stay. Corn gets hit by the stun. They do stay and they do get the tower. But their health is back with TPA. Are they going to go for this one? With BB being down, there's not a whole lot of threat here. Royal Club can easily get this inhibitor. You had to see, though, they waited so long. They had to wait for the full duration of the flash from Cola to come back up from last time they were able to make a move. But it does. He decides to take it, and they're immediately rewarded with an inhibitor going down. Finally, an inhibitor destroyed here. That is going to change the entire face of this game because they have pressure bottom. They can go up the top with K. 
Caitlin take down a quick turret. Cola goes right in. He sees that open line for BB and takes it. The key damage source taken out from TPA. And it's just such a perfect setup because he flashes him with the Rune Prison just as the ulti from Boost is actually fired. He gets the extra damage, kills him instantly, and it's all about BB in these late game team fights. If he's gone, there's no damage. And again, yeah. He needs to build the full damage, but it's just so risky and so hard for him in these fights. One mistake, and he goes down, the fight is lost by TPA. Less than two minutes until another Baron comes into play as Kohler just wipes out that big wave on the top side. If we look down the farm, there's some ridiculous numbers on the scoreboard. I mean, we're 53 minutes into this one. There's over 500 CS on both of the AD carries at this stage. Insane game. TPA once again. Oh, they're Ooh. setting up a trap. Royal Club don't know they're there. It's Insect Guardian Angel. There's a Howling Gale coming through, but everything missed. Everything missed there. Wins takes the ace in the hole. They're going to back off. Look at those shields on Uzi, too. Talk about defenses. He's got a support and a sort of support mid laner on his team, so he's feeling a bit safer. Bottom lane of pressure is being soaked up by Achi right now and he doesn't have that far to walk to join this fight. Let's see if BB can stay safe this time around on the tower defense. He's cleared one super minion wave down there, so Archie can come up for a brief second. It's up again, though, for Royal Club to force this. This time, though, no flash for Ryze. Shockwave will be more important. We just have to say it, I mean, Royal Club has been able to outscale TB in this game with the comp, and now, going in for the fight. Oh, he kicks it, but not right into the team, wins going low here. Cole are actually going to be the focus to get Archie. Monsoon goes down, I think Royal Club have done enough to get the tower, they do. Insect is in the middle of the team, they still have a shockwave, an ace in the hole he's used as well, and that is going to be inhibitor number two going down. Insect the focus, he will leap away, and I think they've done enough to escape this one. TPA not going to chase. And Baron is spawning in about 10 seconds here, you have two inhibitors down. Go back, heal up, take the Baron, and go towards the top lane. Get the last tower down, get the last inhibitor as well. Things are looking very, very good for Royal Club here. Looking very strong with the late game comp. And it's been all about TB not being able to close this game out. I mean, they had two options here. You fully bait the Baron early on. You put all your effort into denying vision in the jungle. In the top side of the jungle, you get a pick with the Syndra, which is perfect for it. Or you just keep pressuring every single lane like they did. BB was a lot stronger than Usien. They're committing to we this. Oh, more comes we in. They're going to move inside. Win's going to move in. Again. Oh, he doesn't get it. It's Royal Club. They get the Baron, but there is a Kuli going through. They're smashing them in the back of the Baron pit. But there's a shock wave. He gets J. Two for one on Pitzel now. But it's a double for Uzi. Inse gets another one. This is going to be an ace in the hole. Doesn't quite get them the ace, though, in the end. Archie's going to run away, and it leaves. Two versus one left on the map. Baron going over to Royal Club. Insect's not going to be able to get a kill there, but another insane fight. And with Uzi still up, that means they can still destroy some buildings here. This might even be the game it will. for Royal Club. They can press in. They've got super minions, top turrets under pressure. They're going to try and end it. Archie got to be the boss here with that big tanky Mundo. Oh, and he spot. hold them away from it. Super Minions coming in. Inhibiting the bottom lane is going to go down once again. His next teammate is arriving in 25 seconds time here. He will have two of them coming up pretty quick, but Royal Club are focusing in on towards those turrets. There is the first one going down. Second one will be shredded as well. Archie will actually fall in the end with all those Minions and the two men left alive. And Royal Club, after 56 and a half minutes, win their first game here. Here at Worlds. Such a great comeback here by Royal and it's funny how when we see Royal normally play in the LPL they're not really a team to come back once they do fall behind but this time around a bit of a different comp. Cola and Rise for the first time at least from the first time I remember and they just managed to keep defending. Baron never went in favor of TPA Every single time they tried to start it, Zero was there, awarded it, the rest of uh, rest of Royal Club was there to stop the potential Baron and just sat and farmed and farmed and farmed. Then we got to late game team fights, they had a stronger late game comp and it paid off. Yeah, TPA did a great job of getting their early and mid game control of the game, but they didn't do much with their control of the game and eventually they fell to the curse of the two damage source composition, only bringing AD carry and AP carry really for the late game damage fall out and they just couldn't hang.
going by the book, as we've really expected of them and as we've seen from them in GPL. I mean, they've had a fantastic season overall, oh, yes. only dropping two games actually, coming through the entire second half of the year. And they certainly push Royal Club here, just lacking that final touch to the game, which funnily enough is so important. There are a lot of teams out there that can gain a lead over a team like Royal Club. You look then, though, to the fact that you've got to actually finish out the game, which is what a lot of teams are going to have problems with. Yeah, again, TBA, they just needed to make a decision. Okay, do we want to keep split pushing every single lane and just take down towers and, and duel you in these 2v2 on one-on-ones? Or do we want to try and find a pick in the jungle and potentially a Baron? They seem to just go for kind of both. And it just didn't pay off because it just bought too much time for Royal Club. And also, once we got to these late game team fights, Royal Club were able to either find Morning or BB in the start of the fight and instantly kill one of the damage dealers. And we see this happen to a lot of teams in high pressure games where they become very, very risk averse. And sometimes they don't commit to a lot of decisions because they're so worried. Up on that big stage, this is Worlds and they're at their home crowd. They, they've got a lot of people here cheering for them. Well, I'll tell you one thing, if the games continue like that, guys, <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm going to make it through five My uh, boys weeks of too. world. Insane match up there. We're going to throw it over, though, to the analyst desk for some post-game perspective. Thank you very much, guys. I hope your voice does survive, Joe. Uh, there is so much to talk about with this game. I do want to highlight something that stood out for me. That was the first time we've seen Morning on Syndra. Uh, every time we've seen TPA play Syndra, it has been in the hands of Chowie when he's yeah. playing in his local region. So that's an interesting turn of events. His opposite number, Corn, giving up first blood. Definitely gave TPA some resources to play with. And the first 25 minutes of this game belongs to the Taipei Assassins. I don't think anyone can dispute that. Well, it was a gift, though. It was a nice cornmeal. <laughs> oh. oh, I thought you too. fit in so well here. I love it. Monty, talk to me about the early game, what TPA did right, and you know what we saw going wrong for Royal Club. Uh, yeah, that's right. So this is an interesting team composition, and out of all the teams we see coming in, Caitlyn really isn't used by pretty much anybody else. And late in the playoff run for Starhorn Royal Club, they started playing these fast push compositions with Caitlyn. And as Freak pointed out, this wasn't an all-in in terms of that fast push, because they did have that late game presence with Rise and Oriana. So it was more balanced than some of the uh, fast push comps we've had before. But with Korn just walking into the top side of his jungle with the Wraiths in the lane swap, incredibly questionable. That's the, the nicest <laughs> way I can put it. Yeah. Move. So you had the bot tower go down to the fast push, the top tower go down to the fast push, but it stalled out in the mid lane because Korn fell so far behind and they couldn't actually capitalize on it. At that point, TPA had the answers, they got the dragons, and then with the Baron control, I, I think you guys have a lot to say about that, but the Baron control was, was really, really bad. Yeah, I mean, there's game. just there's just a lot of mistakes to point out. I think Royal Cup could have went an alternative route at the start as well. They had, a, they, had they were able to freeze bottom lane level 1 and just send Nami top and then have Ryze and Nami farm together and just farm into late game and do it that way. They did like to fast push, so I, I understand why they did that. But then, I'm just really confused for Zero. So, throughout the game, he built... Okay, let's go first. He upgraded his spell thieves all the way to a Frostfang, then went for a Ruby Sidestone and only then started building him Kales. And if that wasn't enough, if you wonder what's wrong with that, you need to get Mikhail's ASAP on Nami. But then, so he just wasted so much gold on nothing. And then, it, but to top that all off, his team needed an Aegis. They didn't have an Aegis until maybe 55, 55 minutes into the game. Combined with the Magis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this game made me very, continues, continues. This game made me very, very, very angry. So instead of like buying his items properly, he went for a Magi Soul Steer that he finished at 52 minutes in the game. Instead, at the same time when he bought his Aegis, instead of upgrading his Aegis to a Locket, yep. he got a grand total of three stacks three. at the end of the game. I wonder what his stacks are going to do <laughs> at the end of the game where you get enough AP that is oh, worth it boy. instead of just buying an Aegis or a Locket for your team. I just I just can't comprehend. Let's roll this along. Starhorn Crab, they stalled out the game. Their late game comp was superior. Yeah. Taipei Assassins had absolutely no idea how to press their advantage when they had it. Crumbs, I know you've been wanting to chime in. Uh, care to expand, you know, wins did well for his team, but it just wasn't enough. Uh, Yeah, you know, honestly, the biggest point that stood out for TPA, they did really well in the early game. They had an 8k gold lead. It was all about the Baron Bay. And the big thing to point out for anybody that wants to understand what happened was that their ward coverage was not proper. They had a lot of wards around the actual river area and Baron, but they did not have enough wards in the red side jungle for Starhorn, which means that if they start Baron, they can't see Starhorn come in. They need to move their ward control and ward denial into the red jungle so they have a lot more preparation time to see 
if Starhorn decides to come in and contest the Baron. In addition to that, they just need to push out their mid lane first. If they actually were the opposite team, their wards would have been perfect. Freak, wrap us yeah. up yeah, before we go to stage um, for an interview. And yeah, it's unfortunate that the uh, Baron Mates didn't work very well because sieging was kind of not an option against this type of team. You've got 500 attack range Lucian, a Syndra who doesn't have any escape tools. Those are the only ranged champions on your team, and you're facing an Orianna, a static Shiv, right? Like, uh, and the wave clear coming out from the Kha'Zix as well, and then you've even got the, the, the tidal wave. So there's so many anti-push tools to make their life so hard. If only they could set up Baron, it would have been fine. But of course, that didn't work out. Yeah, it worked against them, unfortunately. Anyways, good attempt by TPA. It didn't work out. We are going to send things over to Shox, who's on stage with Uzi, to talk about that win. Thank you very much, guys. I'm here with Starhorn Royal Club's AD Carry Uzi. Uh, first off, congratulations. Fantastic victory here versus TPA. Um, it was a fantastic game, and TPA came out very strong. At what point in the game did you feel that you could pull it back in your favor, and who made the decision for that Baron? Okay, so TPA is actually in this game for a long time. So, what time did you feel that you were strong enough to 赢得这个会战，然后是谁决定去扣这个巴龙战的？嗯、呃，就因为我们的阵容就拿得非常的后期，然后一旦我们拖到三十分钟或者四十分钟以后的话，我们打团或者是埋伏他们，他们就是打团会打不过我们，因为我们的阵容比他们优势。Okay, so basically we have a very late game team composition. So at when passing the time point of 30 or 40 minutes, actually we have the advantage at team fight and we actually and ambushing. Yeah, yeah uh, we saw that in a fantastic victory. Now later up today, you're going up against uh, North America's TSM. Um, what do you think of their bottom lane, Wild Turtle and Lust Boy, that you'll be playing against? Okay, so one day you guys are going to play against TSM. Do you think that the AD of the Wild Turtles can support Lost Boy? Do you think that's what you think? 呃，我觉得这次参赛队伍的下路都非常强，而且我也有看过他们的比赛视频。嗯，然后我也会用很多的方法去赢得他们吧。嗯。Okay, so uh, basically, um, every team that's participating in this World Championship, they have really strong bot lane, no matter which team. And I've watched Wild Turtles and Lost Boy play before, um, while on stream or on tournaments. And I have my way to beat them. Aha, very interesting. Well, that'll be a great game. Well, if you manage to win that game, you're well on your way in this group. Obviously, last year you were in the finals of the World Championship. This time around, a lot of changes to the team. How far do you think you guys can go this time? Okay, so last year, Huang Zhu also won the World Championship. That this year, you changed the team. Do you think that in this new team, you can go how far? Can you win the World Championship? Uh, I. 我希望我们也能进到冠军赛，而且拿到冠军吧！加油 ！Okay, I hope that this team and this year we can still make it to the finals and actually get the championship. All right, well, we'll be seeing you in your next games. Congratulations! Thank you very much. All right, it's time again for a quick break. But when we return, AHQ will face off against Samsung White. We'll be right back.
welcome back to day one of the 2014 World Championship. We are coming up on game five of today's group stage. Here is a very quick look at where the teams stand after our first four matches. HQ and Samsung White at the top of the table in Group A. Team Solar Mid and Starhorn Royal Club at the top of the table in Group B. We will be checking back to see how that changes after our next match, which has, of course, Samsung White facing AHQ Esports Club. Earlier today, we saw Samsung White beat Edward Gaming relatively convincingly. Took a little bit longer, but they held the lead for most of it. And I feel in this matchup, they're just going to outclass AHQ from the laning phase. I want to highlight one point really quickly from that game. Mata's kill participation and wards placed. He had 85% kill contribution throughout the game. He placed 84 out of his team's 144 wards placed. That's a 58% ward participation on a team of five players. That is a ridiculous amount of vision. Crepo is a support player. Have you ever hit 84 wards in a game? Probably. I mean, I used to play on CLGEU. <laughs> <laughs> he once had a what, seven hour best of three. I mean, exactly. he got some wards down on that one. Talk to me about Matza and what you liked and what you, you were impressed by earlier today. And he did that with majority of blue side stone. He didn't even need a red one. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, I just, he one. just saw, not only does he place that many wards, he plays them smart. If you watch Mata play, sometimes he'll just base buy mobility boots, buy two extra green wards, skip the side stone, and he'll just run into the enemy jungle, place the wards really deep, and he doesn't even need to see the jungler near his lane because he, he knows what side of the map the jungler is on, his team will react accordingly, and he just, he's just such a smart player. Yeah, I mean, in general, also, like, that duo lane is just so darn strong as well. Imp and Mata together are one of the very best bot lane duos in the world, let alone at this tournament. And especially coming to a match like this, I think it's going to be kind of GG for Garnet, Devil, and Green Tea. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why when we look at Mata, we call him the best support player in the world, because it's not only his contribution to his team vision, both in sheer number of wards and, like Crepo, you're saying, the placement, but he's n nearly perfect mechanically as well. And on top of that, he is the definitive shot caller on Samsung White. So this guy is a total package player in a way that very few people on this planet are. I think a lot of people are looking forward to this match. Let's just cut to the bottom line. Who do you guys think is actually going to take the win here? Is it going to be Samsung White or AHQ Crumbs, start with you. What's your prediction? Samsung White. You know, you just can't... You saw how they played against EDG. They kind of toyed around with them. I, that's how I felt like. And maybe they're not playing at their full potential. Well, we'll see if it works out. Crepo? Yeah, it's going to be Samsung White as well. I just wonder what team comes going to come out for them. I, I, I doubt that they're going to play their their full I want to see a Janna or a Nami so we can see more Magis. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough Magis for now. <laughs> Monte Cristo. I want to see Mata's Thresh just because he can be such a playmaker on that champion. But for me, it's going to be Samsung White. I really don't think after seeing the early stages in this group that we can expect HQ to come out with it. I'm going to use my powers of psychic ability and say, Freak, you're going Samsung White as well? <laughs> yes, I am. Samsung yeah. White is the very obvious savior. Even though both these teams are 1-0 so far in the group stage, White is clearly the much stronger team. If HQ has a hope here, lane swap, don't fight Imp and Mata 2v2, and hope somehow Westor carries your team. I don't think it's likely, but that's the only chance these guys have. We will find out. Let's check how the fan vote has turned out and who you have predicted oh. to win over on lolesports.com. <laughs> 95% of you have voted that Samsung White will take that win. Yeah, I just want to point out that the average misclick rate is 5% on a... That's why they got the guys last game, by the way. They, it was right next to the blasting one. Alright uh, guys, we are nearly ready to head into this match, but first let's hear how AHQ came together as a team after the defeat at the hands of the Taipei Assassins in the GPL Summer Playoffs. Zhuai 可能就是比赛前的练习都会有扣七针值之类的
调，就是在调整关键赛我们不足的地方啊。从我们拿到世界赛资格前几个小时，团队内部大家才把固执放下来。内部的问题已经。获得了改善，打残以后直接闪现上去收掉，好凶！我这边黑牛，告诉你，我就是露西安。能够跟世界各国的强队较劲，也是非常的兴奋，一定是一个很棒的经历。绿茶在后面勾到以后，西门竞争结束，直接收掉了阿皮克。帮我打给大家看，我也有想说，有一天我能够在世界舞台上。我们恭喜 H Q 可以出国，希望能在世界舞台上讲出 Read My Name 这句话。And we heard that this is our showtime right now. And well, they've won their first game. Yeah. We have to say though, it was against Dark Passage, probably the weakest team on paper in the group. Now they're up <laughs> against Samsung White. It's a whole different beast. It's the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much the same. <laughs> well, guys, before we get into the game, we of course need to check out the starting lineups. On the blue side for this one, it's Samsung White from the champions with Looper in the top lane, Dandy in the jungle, Pawn in mid lane, Imp the AD carry, and Mata the support. And on the red side, it's GPL's AHQ Esports Club. Up top is Prides in the jungle, Naz, mid West Door, AD carry, Garnet Devil, and support Green T. So as we move towards Champion Select, where are the big picks here? Where is this game won and lost between these two teams? I gotta point out Thresh, of course, oh, because yes. Green T and Mata, anytime those guys are in the game, they're probably gonna be fighting over Thresh. And I actually wonder if Samson White is just gonna look towards West Door and just say, you know, you're not gonna play Z, you're not gonna play <laughs> Fist, you're not gonna play TF or Yasuo, or whatever he wants to play in the mid lane here, and just fully ban him out. And on the other side, you almost have to ban Zillion, because if you're star player is an assassin player, you don't want the enemy team to play Zillion and be annoying as possible. And the other thing is, if West Door is targeted with bans, you know, uh, White are no stranger to facing teams that have a mid laner as their hard carry. Oh, yes. And then, you know, banning him out and getting Pawn a counter pick. If you get Pawn a counter pick, then he does mean things. And we should also say that these teams, specifically the individual players, play against each other regularly in solo queue. Of course, the Taiwanese players often found over in Korea, I believe, 70 to 90 ping they have if they play over there. So we'll see how this one goes. Up until now, we see that Fizz is the first ban out, uh, ban out there for towards West Door. Lucian, though, so not completely focused on West Door. No, it's a two <laughs> bans for West Door. It's enough. Ban off. You get Zed, you get Fizz. That way here, and Lucian, of course, the Garnet Devil, played in the last game against Dark Passage, was okay, very, very strong, though. so uh, band the way here. Early Lee Simpic for Dandy. Yeah, played that five times so far this second half of the year with a 3-2 record. Not his most played champion or most successful champion, but obviously wanting to bring that one out. What do AHQ now take away? You rightly said, Maokai has snuck through these bands completely. Is Pride's gonna go for that? Maokai's through, Nidalee's through. There are a lot of options right here. They're, they're definitely having a, a while to think over these. They probably didn't expect this first pick, Lee Sin, even though it's Dandy, you know, one of the huge playmakers with that champion. So it could also be because AHQ right now is trying to think, okay, which kind of comp do we want to run? Whoa! If, if I was AHQ, I would run full snowball comp and just try and get a lead early on and win the game as fast as possible. And Twisted Fate is one of the best champions to do that on. Just snowball the game out of control. And Twisted Fate is Westor's champion. Yep. He is famed for his Twisted Fate play. Not had it this much or that much, to be honest, this year, to be honest. But you know, that's been banned away five times from him as well. So really making sure, at least the other teams, that he doesn't get that. But he's going to get the chance to play here against Samsung White. Problem is, Twisted Fate is very squishy and fragile <laughs> champion for the laning phase. That's why a lot of people don't early pick him. Uh, two of the assassins that are great against, uh, against Twisted Fate are banned out, but there are more available. As we saw, mouse over talent yes. already. Uh, they decide to pass it up, though, because they can save their mid lane pick for later on and sweep up that Maokai early. But still, this is just AHQ saying we want to, first of all, get comfort picks, especially for West Store in the mid lane here. So if the two bands give him TF, don't even care about potential counter pick. I mean, he can run exhaust. It's still going to be a terrible match for him in the mid lane. So prides with Nidalee in the last game worked brilliantly. For Garnet Devil, Jinx is his champion. He's played it 12 times this year. Pure and has a 12-0 record on it as well. Perfect year for Garnet Devil on that one. Again, we have to say, though, different beast is up against in the form of Imp, who's locked in Twitch. 
Right, and so Nidalee into Maokai, same deal as we saw Ooh. before here. If they get the oh. one-on-one -on -one matchup, we might see oh. Pride do well in the one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I love the HQ comp here. Give them a few kills early on. I'm not gonna say they run with the game, run with the game, but it's gonna be there. The idea behind this one, I mean, they want to snowball, they want to one four split push as well with the nearly in top lane, just have the rest of the members running around picking kills in mid lane. Yeah, right, it's usually Naz and Westor, the killers, trying to get some of those early uh, kills to get the gold and get the momentum going for the team. Two good champions for them to actually do that. Uh, really, the execution, though, is going to be a problem, because if you don't do that, Look at this massive team fight team from Samsung White. This will destroy you in any sort of team fight. And Green T, we talked about his thresh in that last game. He's got to land the grabs here on Blitzcrank. And, well, this is a chance really for AHQ to say, look at us guys, look who we are, look how good we are up against Samsung White. We've already said it's going to be a very, very difficult game. And of course, we want to know your guys' thoughts. So pop over to Twitter and let us know who you think will win this match. Tweet the hashtag SSWWIN or AHQWIN to at LOL Esports and we'll be checking in with those votes shortly. I'm guessing Samsung White are going to remain big favorites <laughs> here, but this is a very fun comp to watch, I think, as well from AHQ. They're going to win them some fans if they do it right. Yeah, you have to say, you like the, di the direction that they're going with this because they want to keep Samsung White uh, Samsung White spread out. They don't want to fight them in team fights. So, you know, Twisted Fate, they've got a split pushing Nidalee. They even have Blitzclank. Blitzcrank they can roam around on and force some hooks. I mean, even if the Thresh is taken away, Green Tea goes for another hooker champion. Well, Kobe is excited. We're all excited for this one. It's <laughs> Samsung White versus AHQ, a second game for both of these teams. And well, right now, they're the leading two teams in the yep. group. And look here, AHQ early on. All five members moving together. Blitzcrank, one of the best level one champions. We might see him just go into the jungle of Samsung White, try and find a lone Samsung White player and potentially pick up the first spot. All right, defensive ward down there, placed by Imp just in time to see the invade. So alas, HQ will not get the early jump and surprise in this one. They they know pretty much all the movements of HQ. Yeah, they saw every single person go through yep. that bush. So this is all up to Samsung White uh, decide to counter here. And Simos just all the walls placed by Samson right down the bottom side of the map here, even out the river to see if it's oh. out. Oh, we're gonna have a fight! Oh, Green Team's gonna face check straight into it. Where's the focus? Mana going low. Nav will actually flash away the exhaust. Where's the Guardian Devil? Green Team surely gonna fall here. No. If gets one, uh -oh. this is gonna be a clean up. Westo's flashed away. I right, finally over. get one back. Dandy up to Westo with over. the kill though. <laughs> now Guardian <laughs> Devil is in the middle of oh. No Man's Land. Oh, is oh, gonna God. go for the fight and this my friends is gonna be five to one an ace will be delayed for five seconds for samsung Y at the start it doesn't go any ah. more wrong in these early stages but they got one kill let's so, watch it again small, yeah okay <laughs> blitzcrank is great number one if you manage to get on the hook and not if you to face check the entire the team and i mean from here on and out it's just samsung white Cleaning up all the kills. I do believe we actually got the kill from HQ here. Oh, Pride got the kill. So the biggest part about level ones is the jump in level ones because a little bit of damage goes a long way in those fights. Samsung White with the defensive play, with the wards, saw HQ were able to get in position. And then a beautiful play. He's able to level up play and get a nice AoE play on them. It's just there's not really a lot of hope for them. Westor tried to do his best. A red yeah. card is the optimal card for that situation, trying to hit AOE on everybody. But man, coming back from a 5-1 start in a level one fight, talk about an uphill battle. They already were going to have a hard time this game. Now it's going to be very, very difficult. 2,000 gold here after almost as many minutes, to be honest, of this game. Westor facing a lot of pressure from Pawn in this mid lane. And that's only going to be getting worse for him. See the wind wall there blocking everything out. Meanwhile, Looper 
is up in the enemy jungle. In fact, Dandy had completely got confused by the oh, fact that right, Dandy is walking down the enemy <laughs> lane. There are four men from Samsung White on top of Pride right now. And that is another kill. This one goes over to him, who, by the way, after three minutes is 3-0-3. Sounds like my standard solo queue game, except for it's the enemy to carry every single time. But not even did HQ lose a lot of members at level one. They also managed to get in a 1v2 situation where the whole idea behind the Nidalee pick was to be one-on-one -on -one against Marco up there to win the lane and start uh -oh. split pushing. A return trip here, maybe? I mean, that's a ward on Dandy. Don't worry, the rest of HQ moving down. Oh. Dandy can get out, though. Uh, he does have a pink ward he could hop over the wall to. Looking for the counter here. Dandy going to lose a bit of health, but or a trinket there ward. is the ward that you were <laughs> talking about, and he just walks away. Let's see here. So top lane, Ganondorf has been able to just sit and farm, but uh, obviously the rest of his team has been dying, or at least Price has been dying down his bottom lane. Mid lane here, Westor, just trying to do what he can. I mean, he started both armor against the Yasuo, so smart choice, but every single lane is just so far behind after level one. The biggest thing, though, is not to give up after a level one like that. Oh, never. Everybody who's, you know, all these North American and European teams who come over, uh, always talk about the scrims how you know north american and eu teams will immediately forfeit scrims after something like that but all of the korean teams play them out and they learn how you know to come back from things like this yes it's not a high chance of coming back but you have to keep your head in the game because it's not over yet oh don't do that almost i say almost being hooked he just sidestepped away in green tea had to make the choice of where he was going sadly for him chose the wrong direction but AHQ trying to help out Westor a little bit in that mid lane. You know that he's probably their big playmaker here, especially on the likes of a Twisted Fate. And to be fair to him, despite being behind there in levels, in experience, in kills, in everything in that mid lane, he's managed to get a decent amount of CS on the board, pretty much thanks to those wild cards and farming yeah. from a distance. And we did see uh, at least Green Tier trying to roam around on Blitzcrank, which of course is one of the big things you can do on Blitzcrank in a lane swap. Going towards the mid lane here, sadly, Dandy managed to spot him. And nothing uh oh, up top though, two versus one. Oh, Jinx, not a good position to be in, and there is the kill coming down. It's actually Dandy that will pick that one up, goes onto the killing spree to put Samsung White 7 1 up. The first turret is also dropped in that bottom lane. They weren't able to keep the two men away, and Impermata between them. An incredible advantage there. We already see All the right. Cutlass picked up for Mata five minutes in. Yeah, once the turrets start going down, that might be it. I mean, once this Samsung team starts to get control of the map, like we said, they have the team fighting team, so they're going to be able to get all of the early dragons. They can force it very, very easily. And with the turrets going down, there won't be any room for HQ to work with to try and spread this team out. They really have no safety to fall back on whatsoever. It's going to have to be some miracle plays. So yes, that roaming Blitzcrank running around, maybe some three versus one, they can get something happening. Uh, but really, let's see. Let's see how efficiently Samsung White can clean this one out right. because that was something that we looked at in the first game. Yes, they got a very big lead and they pretty much handily had that game, but you do still look for the crisp ex execution to actually finish the games out. Right, and it's not like Samsung White has the best like siege comp here. I mean, Twitch is not the best AD carry, it's actually a pretty bad AD carry yeah. at sieging up towers here because it opens up for HQ to engage onto him and he's very mobile and obviously Yasuo being a melee champion here, so it's not like Samson White if they do group, can just instant take down your tower, but because they are so far ahead, because they do have a Maokai as well in the least, then they might just be able to dive onto HQ or if they should get in a situation where they're pushing up to the tower. Well, so far looking to control the top side oh. of the map here. They've got him cornered, but there are oh, reinforcements oh. in the area. He's gone. The other thing that, that could happen for HQ, you know, if the Samson White do go for those dives, you can turn around dives, and that's how you can, you know, try and get back into this game. Especially with a Twisted Fate here, if Samson White goes over aggressive, dives up, dives up in the top lane or down the bottom lane, Wistle might be able to uh -oh, join though. in and pick up a kill here. Neutral objectives, you don't want to fight over those. Oh, there's a flash in, they're going to go straight for Green T. He flashes though, over the back wall. Oh, the hook actually missing, but Nats may still be in trouble. There's a hook from Green T off to the side, but Dandy, He's on top of Nat. He will pick up his fourth kill. Green T, the next target who gets played. Looper will get himself a first kill. He's got eight assists out of the nine kills yet. so far. Prize actually coming in. There is Westor. The wild cards. Will it be enough to get the kill? 
They do get one, but they lose another man. By the way, that's four versus five on this top side of the map, too. This whole, oh, it's not over. Oh, Brides is surely going down. Dad, he survived it as well. That's a double kill for Pawn. And it leaves him at three. Zero four four zero seven for Dandy. Three kills on the AD carry. A one zero ten Maokai. Yeah. So the window of hope is turning around. Tower dies, but you cannot fight over neutral objectives here. Uh, not only because of the team comp, but because of that massive lead. And Samson White, even in the four versus five, they get the upper hand in kills. They've got full war coverage of the red side jungle, so that's now their territory. Plus Twitch down bottom. Had a bunch of free farm. He almost got to his blade. Not quite there yet, though. The AHQ just have to sit in the lane, like at the towers, and just try and pick up some farm. If you ever move into your own jungle, into the enemy jungle, into the river, there's a very, very high chance you will die. So it's just all about sitting back now in your lanes and try and farm. And hope Samson White gives you some time. But look at the way they've already been placing all their offensive wards in the jungle. I don't think Samson White is going to slow down. No, I yeah. definitely agree with that one. And he is prize going to be pushed by Dandy. The Q's connected. Can he finish him off? There's the slow coming in. Half HP, but he's got a tower behind him. Might be able to survive. Oh, oh he kicked him away from the Q. Could have been brilliant. Wasn't, though, in the end. 1-0 for Prides. All right, Dandy with a rare mistake there. Or was right. it? Or was it? Was he sending a message, Kopi? <laughs> you are a jungler. Do you do this sometimes? Uh, I do. I actually am notorious for uh, letting kills slip away. There's a YouTube We've all video seen that video. We've all seen it, Kobe. Miscalculations happen all the time. Is that why you're only playing Nuno now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, oh Dandy missing the Q once again there. Matter though is going to be coming up. It's a max range hook on towards Nav. Imp is there as well. The slow comes in. Dandy appears from over the wall and it's Imp that gets the kill. Dandy safeguarding away there. Chompers are down though. And Westor had come in to join them. But honestly, a three versus three, you don't want that fight against Samsung White, who have 12 kills to their name. Pride's now is underneath his own tower. In. He knows that he's got to run. The Q is basically walked into there by Pride, and Dandy oh, gets his so revenge good. for that miss earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> Imp didn't get any assist on there, too. He was sad. Oh, oh what a hero minion. Oh, he's got. No, he's not. Oh, he's uh, baiting Joe Miller. He's baiting me from this one. and. Well, why not? Nine assists for him, ten for Maokai, and, well, only those two kills, which have, granted, both been taken onto Mata at this point. Mata has now missed more hooks than he actually hit. Oh, Twisted Fate, where's he coming? Bottom, I nice think. bottom, yeah. And actually, Pawn here is going to be backed up now by Looper, who's just TP'd into it. Mana looking for the hook, and it lands onto Guardian Devil. Leads it. Oh! oh he no, goes no, 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 the time. Let's go. He goes down. The shutdown comes in for Guardian Devil, but Imp will clear up and gets himself the double buff back. Questor's dead. So, again, stay around your tower. You might be able to hook someone in and get a kill here every single time you move into what I'm now going to call Samson White's jungle. You simply end up being a bad, being in a bad situation. You end up dying. Stay in your lane, stay at your tower, and hope Green T can pull in some people you can kill. Let's see. Three members of HQ on this red side of the map here. Imp just recalling though. Does pull off the Twitch invisibility plus B, so he will not be interrupted. Here's that hook, and here's the miss Q. Oh, so <laughs> hero Danny jumps in, takes the hook, ends up dying, and Imp of course can finish it, but still one for one. I mean, it's every yeah, single kill counts now. That could have been Mata under that turret. Exactly. He would probably survive, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chronic Devil here. What's ping there? Oh, yeah, so we're going through the wall. Meanwhile, Imp having to go west or in that middle lane. Oh, he's flashed it, but has he got the range? Oh, the point yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the I can't left. Be in your Green lane. Team looking to be oh. the hero. The dodge on the horse. Two kills. Yes. yes. Two kills for HQ. And Green T gave the kill over to Westor as well. What a hero. So <laughs> that's another one. And again, they're staying in the lane and they get the kills. Oh, Great. Dandy missed the kill, but it doesn't matter. They get the knock up and Pawn comes in to become unstoppable. They got minions as well. And that means another turret going over to Samsung White. Meanwhile, Pride's been hammered on here by Looper, who's already got that Rod of Ages going. Doesn't quite have the damage maybe to finish off and track down that Nidalee though. 
AHQ have got control of their own jungle back now on the top side of the map. Ah, uh, fine. They have oh. a jungle back for now. Green tea, can he be the hero? We'll get the knock up on to Paul Westor. Needs to throw the stun card. He actually has to walk around because of the wall there. Q lands onto Westor. Dandy, oh, he oh, is oh, going to oh. follow through. Q, uh, card is pulled there. The wall oh, 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 to kill. The super mega right that's behind them. comes through. That's a hubris kill. Where are they going to go? They're already gone. Samsung White already out of there. Thanks to the lantern from Matter. Brings them to safety. But another kill coming in. Yeah, they do need to get back to this top lane, however, because Lupa is still pushing it in. Not that Maokai is the greatest play pusher in the world, and he will actually just back away from the tower. So AHQ just trying to get some kills now, I mean, trying to come back in the game. Gandevli on to Mata. Oh, this could be a little bit deep from Mata. A lot of damage coming his way. Westall going to join in. There's so two. On to Paul. That's two kills. There's two. Every kill counts here, and it looks like Dandy's come down with Lee Syndrome, so AHQ still you know have a long ways to go oh, but they've got Imp. their sights set on mid Imp stealth up where's he gonna go they are gonna go for guarding devil and surely get the kill dandy is in the fight as well come Pride on green t flash away green t is low what can no. he do he's gonna fall to dandy who picks up his seventh kill of the game and he's not done just yet the chase uh -oh. west though he's trying to dodge around from everything Gotta pull the stun card. I get a kill here. Pull it here. Looper is low. They managed to pick off Pride. They managed to pick off Westor. They did lose Looper though. So in the end, still a few kills for AHQ, but Samson White is not done yet. What can Mata do? Nothing. Not a lot. They still got him cornered though. He's on the oh. wrong side of the map here. Here comes the stealth up rat just chasing him off through the jungle. Play to the Rune King is used. And Nas knows huh. he's not really escaping from this one. Pawn gonna come around the side. One slap of the sword and he's dead. You know, this is actually the first dragon that White have actually gone to. So they've really been ignoring, even though they had control of the whole map this whole time. They've been kind of looking for kills, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You feel that way, do you? Well, let's see what they <laughs> want to do now here. So they've been uh, fighting quite a lot. Gave up a few kills. I mean, for AHQ, they do have four kills on West Thor, two kills on Garden Devil here. Which, by the way, he's undefeated on Jinx. I do have a feeling that's probably not going to stay the same after this game here. But AHQ been trying to get some kills. Yeah. Every single time Samson White works in it just a little bit, I mean, they were there to kill them. And Green Tea and Westor have been looking stylish in this game as well. Pulling in several kills under the turret. Let's see what they can do with the next TF ultimate about to come back up. Prepare for another dive, maybe. And that's the problem with this game, right? The, the, the star just went so horribly wrong for them. Yeah. We mentioned that it's not necessarily over at that point. But if you give an ace to yeah. Samsung White of all teams in the world at that stage of the game, they're not a team that's likely to mess it up. But, you know, AHQ, you have to give them the credit. Stick to trying. this one. Keep trying to pull things off as West is going to get caught out once again. Uh, was he was already landed. He goes in there. He kicks Green T out. Green T will fall as well. That's a double for the rat. Not going to get any more, but two is all right for them. That's Imp's eighth kill of the game. So two kills here. Rest of Samson White around this mid lane as well. Sneak around. They might just take the tower. They might even go for a dive. Oh, spotted there. They're going to go for the tower here. And I'm not sure that it will survive either. Looper able to tank things up at this point. Pawn actually coming in from the side didn't have an opportunity. But that will be turret number five for Samsung White. And only the top inner turret remains. Pride's going to spot Pawn there after putting down that trap. Pawn gets more free farm down the bottom lane. Yeah. 17 minutes into this one. Goes without saying, I think. 15,000 gold lead for Samsung White. Well, let's see. AHQ, they've got one outer turret left standing. I like how you're already laughing. And, well, I didn't want there to be another silence. We can't leave Joe hanging again. We gotta work out this triple, triple man cast here. Oh, Pride's is dead. Uh, is he now? Yeah, Pawn gets right. seven. We're gonna be seeing double figures for someone soon. Dandy's already up to nine, plus 13 assists as well. Not bad whatsoever. As him stealthing in, there's no one actually there for him to kill off, but get a nice juicy wave of minions. Got that Blade of the Ruin King, got his Ghost Blade, got a pickaxe there as well at this point. Not exactly like uh, Garnet Devil can go head to head with him. 
No, and honestly, it's just the... This is a matter of time now before we're gonna see AHQ stand five members somewhere on the map trying to set up a trap. Hopefully pick up a few kills. I might just go for a very desperate Baron, unless it dies right here to Samson White. Oh, Samson actually back away from me. But for AHQ, AHQ now, it's all about just like sit in the bush. They're actually doing it right now, thank you very much. Try and get a kill and then go Baron and not lose the fight. Oh, there's the hook from Green Team, but only brings Looper, who's got his ultimate running right into the middle of the rest of them. Stun card onto him. Looper is chasing Westor underneath his own Sorry, He's going to get stunned up once again. Can he actually twist and advance at the right time? Actually, Westor waits it out, but he gets hooked, throws the stun to Mana, and it's him that gets that one as well. Meanwhile, Pawn is inside of the base, throwing down his ulti onto Pride. Will he get oh, the kill? Got yes, him. he will. Just another kill. Oh, oh by Zap, he did tag him. Super Mega Death Rocket. Yeah, he fired available. it. He fired it, but actually didn't land there. I think uh, it might have win Walder. Green there. T's looking to be the hero once again, chasing down. They're losing their inventory in the top lane. Well, let's not look at that. Let's look down towards that fight and see if Green T can be a hero. He can't. He couldn't chase them down. And in the meantime, Samsung White and Push Through are going to get the Indian. Yeah, again, I mean. They don't really have a lot of options for no. defending, so looking for those kills. Just get some kills and you just have to rush Baron, try and pick it up and see for how long you can actually last it. Go out to Looper, might be able to get a kill. Mata's low as well. Yeah, Mata's low. I think they can pull this one off now. All right. It's going to happen. One more kill here in a second to get up to Mata, who flashes away with a slow of the void spikes will be enough. Green T's waiting for the last hit. Oh! oh! They, they win Swag off. boy. Meanwhile, they lost their other inventory. Doesn't matter. Oh. Dandy now, being surrounded by three men. Oh, he keeps rising! Oh, he almost got away! Flash over the top as well to get the kill. He's keeping going, that was his 10th kill. Oh, big green. one from Green, green team. team! And it is the shutdown for Garnet Devil. We are, held on to that mid we're lane. Seeing, we're seeing so many cool things though, and you know why they pick all these champions. It's for the plays like this, the flashy plays from Blitzcrank. They have the faith in Green T's accuracy with these skill shots. He's a, he was great against Dark Passage on Thresh, setting up a lot of kills. Same thing here on Blitzcrank. I mean, it's hard to say what would happen if we didn't have the level one fight. Uh -huh. Obviously, Samson White would probably have been a bit more careful in the way they were playing and not just running around looking for all these fights here. But still, Green Tea has really been able to set up a lot of kills for his team. Sadly enough, though, they couldn't actually go for a Baron. You could tell they're having fun, too. That's what AHQ oh, right Look now. Look at the player camps, they're laughing every Yeah, exactly. Time. They're all smiling. Yeah, I think the realization kind of sets in at level one when you get ace that this game's going to be a, a bit of an uphill struggle, I think, if we put it mildly. So now Samsung White going about their business and controlling that entire enemy jungle. Mata, in the meantime, will help things out. Blue Buff's going to go over towards Blooper. And this is the point now where Samsung White are going to start closing in. He's pushing up this bottom lane. Finally actually running a bit like a team here and not just constantly looking for these one-on-one -on -one 2v2 fights. So push up the lane, Stan is going to join in as well. They don't really care about Dragon, they don't exactly need more gold at this point. Get Inhibitor down, you have to top lane down as well, and then you can just focus on mid lane and close out the game. So, three moving in, fourth will be in. And this Inhibitor should be falling as well. If they can do anything about this one, doesn't look like it. If actually going to go charging forward, who's he going to oh. go for? He goes for now, a lot of damage. There is Paul diving in. Green T will fall. That's Dandy's 11th kill. Imp is on surprise. That will be the domination for him. Yasuo gets another one. Paul actually flashing away there to make sure that he doesn't actually fall. In him's going to go down. Samson White is going to look to close. That is definitely going to be the game here. Nexus turns going down. Oh. One more kill, there's the hook again from Mata in the back. Box is in position. Westor crawling his way towards the fountain, but can't actually get there. And Samsung White leaving just two men left alive. We'll focus in on the Nexus, and after less than 23 minutes here, we'll pick up the victory against AHQ. And there's not a, exactly a lot to say here. Level one went horribly wrong from AHQ. They had this kind of snowball comp, had the blitz crank, they grouped up early, walked into the jungle, and the one ward placed by Imp actually spotted the entire team and made Samson White just sit and wait. And once they face checked them, suddenly the blitz crank won't bring anything in the level one. And fight went completely in favor of Samson White, got the kills.
managed to snowball the game. And to be honest, we can maybe put it all down to that one ward right at the very start inside of the tribush that spotted the entire AHQ team coming around. See the handshakes there. And we saw from the player camps from AHQ, they knew if you get aced by Samsung White before a minute hits the clock, chances of coming back are pretty slim. They had a lot of fun with that game. Seems like at least. And we did see some good moves. I mean, green team yeah. as well. Like Westall picked up a few kills. Prides as well got a few kills on Italy. So they tried. They did what they basically could do in this situation. Just get a few kills. If Samson White would constantly overextend, maybe you could come back. And this is a very big maybe. But uh, in the end. And they knew it, too. This is, this is a very difficult group. Uh, of course. For, for both HQ and Dark Passage. So. so we have to be honest, it's not about beating Samson White in this group here, if you are AHQ, it's about Edward Gaming. Like, they are the yeah. team they want to beat if they want to secure the, the second place and move on to the quarterfinals here. So losing to White was probably expected from HQ. They accomplished their first step, which was beating Dark Passage. So Exactly. Yeah, and don't forget, everyone needs to play each other twice, so they're going to have revenge later on, possibly, at least a chance for it, when I'm sure AHQ are going to set up inside a brush and <laughs> hope that Samsung White come around and they can ace them after a minute as well. But obviously, we are going to be moving into our final game of the night here pretty soonish, and it's going to be a big one as well. Royal Club versus TSM. I'm sure a lot of you guys, I was going to say stay awake for that one, but I think maybe the case uh, will be waking up for that next game that's going to be coming in there. That is definitely a Big, big deciding match in their group. For now, though, of course, we are going to send it over to the analyst test for a deeper look at that game. Thank you very much, Joe. This is one of the games that was decided before the two-minute mark. First and foremost, Samsung White got every single champion that I think they are comfortable on, that they're borderline famous for. Yeah. And Joe mentioned it, the, the ward in the tribush reading AHQ like a book, setting themselves up to, to deal with that invade really well. Right, and that's part of the point here is that when we normally see a standard warding pattern at level one, it's the drops and the chokes at 55 seconds. But this time, the read was there. They got the much earlier ward up. They knew the Blitzcrank invade was coming, and that allowed them to get that beautiful counterplay and set up the ace at level one. Yeah, I actually think we have to look at it. Uh, let's pull that replay up on your screen, Crepo. Talk us through this a little bit because really, it absolutely defined this game. Yeah, I think I'm going to provide all the anal analysis needed by just rolling a clip and yeah, just okay. This is what happens. So yeah, kids don't face check rushes level 1, especially if you're in a jungle who only have no idea where they are because then this is going to happen. I mean, this is just painful. You know, AHQ, uh, they don't even really seem to have the focus. It looked like they, they got scared. You don't see all of Samsung White and they like ran away. If you run into a brush and suddenly there's five people there, it's incredibly hard um, to do anything. Uh, so actually, if you have to analyze something, Wester drew a red card, which is really smart to stack the AoE there. Yeah. But in the end, uh, it's a five for one and it didn't even matter. Oh, no. Actually, actually, it did because that was the player they killed. <laughs> yeah, that's, the joke. that's exactly the joke I'm making right now. Thank you for explaining yeah. it to the viewers. I mean, complete and utter whitewash. Five for one. You've given two kills to the jungler, one to mid lane, two to Eddie Carry. From there, Samsung White, let's be honest, they let the hair down. They had some yeah. fun with it. Well, and this is the thing, right, is Samsung White knows they're the giant favorites coming in. They picked basically comfort champions. And actually, uh, I believe Joe brought it up at the very beginning, or at the very end, or was it Deficio? But they said, this is not the match these guys were looking for, right? They went for champions that you're probably not going to see them play again in matches that you know, these guys from HQ care about. I don't think we're going to see another Blitzcrank support. The other champions they grabbed were like these standard things like Pride's played. Nidalee uh, last game, and Westor is already known for TF, and you know, Garner Devil's already known for Jinx, so nothing surprising came out that game. We went for the Risky Invade because, well, we have a 1% chance of winning anyway. Let's just throw dice at every possible situation. 5% five, five according to LLEsports.com. Okay, 5% and chance they win the game. I, I, I also just want to mirror what the, the guys are saying on the desk. Fact of the matter is, this team, AHQ, will be looking to Edward Gaming as, yeah. you know, trying to cause those upsets. Yeah, last piece of trivia, the goal did actually extended uh, the amount of minutes in the game. So once the goal difference actually gets bigger than the amount of minutes you have in a game, mm -hmm. in terms of thousands, then you have a problem. Yeah, I think there was a problem much before then. <laughs> anyway, guys, we do need to take a very short break win, but we are not done yet. When we come back, Starhorn, Royal Club and Team Solar Med will face off in our final match of the day. So stay with us, guys. Kill though. <laughs> now 
Johnny <laughs> Devil is in the middle of oh, no man's land. Oh, Pride is oh, going to go for the fight. And this, my friends, is going to be five to one in that middle lane. Oh, he's flashed it, but has he got the range? Oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the I can't go left. Beat your end. Team looking to oh. be the hero. The dodge on the horse. Too good. Gandevoli on to Mata. Oh, this could be a little bit deep from Mata. A lot of damage coming his way. Westall's going to join in. There's so two. Hold on to board. That's two kills. Being surrounded by three men. Oh, he tries it. Oh, he almost got away. Flash over the top as well to get the kill. He's keeping going. That was his 10th kill. Oh, big one from Green, Green team. team. And it is the shutdown. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is our final match of day one as Starhorn Royal Club will be facing off against Team Solo Mid. Earlier today, TSM took down SK in a fairly convincing fashion, clearly winning out their early game. Starhorn Royal Club on the other side of the coin. I feel they really, really struggled against TPA in the early game. They managed to dig deep, hold on to their inner turrets. And I'm wondering if uh, Royal Club can hold up against the early game pressure that TSM is going to be looking to apply. What's your take, Freak? So, I think the games we just saw are not indicative of the team's real strength. I do think TSM played very well. The roams, especially from Dyrus, were incredibly good, and that was awesome. But again, SK is not only known as a weak laning team, but also we're missing their jungler who holds that team together. So, TSM looked better than maybe they should. On the other side, though, uh, Starhorn Royal Club had some uncharacteristic individual misplays. I actually loved their plan coming into that game. You mentioned it briefly. We talked about it a lot off camera before we actually got to the analyst desk segment. What Starhorn Royal Club did was basically build this great late game team and then carry it early game by Caitlyn killing two turrets to bolster the gold for the team and then just go back to a laning phase. And, and a lot of cool things played out because of that, and it was really sweet. Now, one thing that I'd like to point out as to... Well, I'm not going to spoil it, but I think that in the TSM versus Starhorn matchup, Starhorn is not going to be prepared for the camp that Amazing is going to put on mid lane. I think that Bjergsen with Amazing and with Dyrus roaming and perhaps seeing Lustboy roam into the mid lane, we saw what happened to Starhorn where mid lane fell far behind. I think that's going to happen again. And if that happens, I think TSM will know how to close the game. Yeah, and that's the thing too is that you know we saw the the mid matchup kind of go sour, and to be frank, like Bjergsen's going to be a much better player than Morning, so like that's that could be a big factor here. Now I'm intrigued because Uzi said that he had like a secret in store to win the AD carry support matchup, so it's a little intriguing to me. Uh, I do be a lane swap. Vain. Ooh. Well, um, very, very vain. quick, just before I throw to freak here. I mean, yeah. do you think they need something special while Turtle and Lust Boy? Uh, maybe the least impressive parts of TSM versus SK. Freak, you want to carry on with what you were thinking? Yeah, so I definitely think the, the bottom lane for Starhorn Royal Club is going to kind of win on its own without any kind of special sauce. But uh, I do want to talk briefly about the mid lane matchup, though. And you talk about the, the amazing Bjergsen camp. Now, realize that one of Super... Uh, wow. Uh, one of Starhorn Royal Club's... We said it so much. One of Starhorn <laughs> Royal Club's uh, biggest competitors in China is OMG. And that team is like 95% cool. Uh, the mid laner of OMG, like cool is is a gigantic force for why OMG is good, and so the fact that Starhorn Royal Club can deal with a team that is so mid lane centric means I think they are well prepared to deal with TSM, which is the same. Earlier, you just praised Darius for his roams, for his movements. Yeah. Uh, yes, I agree, they are mostly, but Darius did work around the map. If Bjergsen, you know, isn't relevant, maybe Darius can get under Royal Club's feathers. I don't know. I think Cola is so darn good right now, though. He's been playing really well so far this tournament. Um, I didn't necessarily give him a lot of credit coming into this, but so far, he's really good. His rise was impressive. Yeah. Krepo, care to add something to this? Yeah, uh, just all the points have been made already. I'm just, I just think there's going to be really big disparity in mid lane already. Um, top lane, yeah, sure, he's been playing solid, but it's a kind of different part of the map. I'm, I'm just... I'm just worried for their mid lane. Even even when they played against Cool, I still remember a distinct LPL match where it was then into Fizz and uh, yeah, they sure they ended up winning that matchup. But uh, Cool was 50 CS up. It was 30 to 80 CS at that point. 
You can't fall that far behind. Not at Worlds. You'll get punished. So we've still got a little bit of time to kill before we move to the prediction game. Uh, we've talked about every single role on both of these squads with the exception of the junglers. I actually feel there's quite a lot of similarity in playstyle between Amazing and Insect. I think Amazing can be overly aggressive. He can win games and he can lose games. And if you go back to game one, he gave up double buffs to Candy Panda off a terribly overconfident dive. Yeah. Um, he has the ability to make poor decisions. Uh, care to chime in <laughs> on the junglers? Yeah, I, I think this is is a really interesting point that you're making right now. In fact, Crumbs right before the match said, maybe you take away Lee Sin from Amazing this game and maybe you play that Nunu or something that's like a little more reserved this time around. Uh, just maybe you minimize a few more mistakes, kind of play more with the vision game or the counter jungling game in that case so that you don't end up uh, kind of giving up double bust for free. Yeah, I mean, if you trust your mid lane to get the get ahead on his own completely, then a new new pick would be way better because you isolate the other jungler and then you basically make the game on mid lane 1v1 and Bjergsen would get ahead. To be fair, Amazing's play did get Bjergsen really far ahead. Sure, he screwed up that die, yeah. but that was just a mechanical misplay that can happen here and there. He got punished for it, so be it. But what he was doing was constantly playing on the aggressive and there was zero hesitation. I want to have a player just be not afraid to make any mistake and keep going in and keep getting those. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the whoa. player whoa. for you. <laughs> All right. Listen, we've, we've done there. a lot of talking. We need to move to predictions. We need to move to predictions. It is time to play the game for the last time today. Um, we've got a bit of mixed opinions. Freak, you seem very opinionated in this matter. Yep. Who is going to be victorious and come away with the win? Well, still my number one. Starhorn Royal Club. I'm going to say the name properly this time. <laughs> said it so much off air. Uh, but I think they are stronger. Just as an overall unit individually, and I think they can at the very least hold on for late game and just carry with their just great players. We'll see if that works out. Gonna bounce this side of the disc. Crepo, who's gonna win? Um, I think it's really close. Uh, probably like a 50-50, but because I have TSM first, like the only way they can get first is if they win this match, so I gotta stick to my prediction, TSM. All right, so TSM, let's go Monty next. Uh, I agree. This is a very, very close match, more than likely, as will the TPA games be in this group. But I'm saying Starhorn Royal Club as well. I just see them having a little bit of an edge. 3-1 to one or 2-2, two to two, where's your vote? Just as he said, it would be a close match of 50-50. I'm going to have to take TSM side and split the desk 50-50. Well, this is interesting. The three teams that we thought were going to be the favorites to get out of, yes, Starhorn Royal Club, TPA, and TSM. Mm -hmm. We'll see how this match changes that battle. Let's see how you guys at home have been voting and how it compares to our team here. It's TSM, so let's see how much they've won the vote by. And it is 66% of you saying they're going to pick up their second win of the day. Well, I think they're going to have a bit more of a difficult time in this game. With that, guys, it is nearly time to send it back over to the caster desk where the teams are heading into the lobby. So let's see what they have to say. Thank you very much, Quickshot. I'm going to get straight into it. Checking out first the starting lineups here in the blue corner. It's the Starhorn Royal Club from China's LPL with Cola in the top lane, Insec in the jungle, Corn in mid. Uzi, the AD carry, and Zero on support. Yeah, and in the red corner, it's Team Solo mid from the North American LCS. We have Dyrus in the top lane, Amazing in the jungle, Bjergsen in the mid lane, while Turtle is the AD carry, and of course, Lost Boy is his support. So the desk was split 50-50 coming into this game. What are your guys' thoughts? Well, it do really <laughs> depends on... Uh, I was going to say, do we get to wait till after Champions? Yeah, that would actually be nice. I really <laughs> want to see like how TSM wanted to approach the game here. Do they want to be insanely aggressive early on and try and counter Royal that way? Or do they want to play like disengage, focus on getting to late game, and then try and punish Royal Club if they do make any stupid mistakes? Yeah, so one of the things is, in TSM's first game, they got such a good Yasuo composition. Like, if you give them something like that again, uh, then I feel like a lot of people would put more votes uh, for TSM. I don't think that Royal Club would actually do that though, so really interested to see how these picks bans phase out because, you know, Uzi, on that Caitlyn, I would much rather have him on something like Lucian or something. So we'll see if TSM actually focus the bottom lane like uh, Royal Club actually do. Yeah, a massive factor of that SK win earlier on, I think for TSM was the fact that they completely dominate a champion select in terms of the picks that they got. I don't think that's going to be the same here though as we see Maokai banned away by Starhorn Royal Club first of all. Fizz taken out by TSM. Yeah, Fizz is probably going to be banned against Korn every single game here because he's such a great Fizz player and it's their second most banned champ against him in LPL. Yasuo is the most banned. But he has like 43% of all the bans against Royal Club is against Korn in the mid lane. It's always Yasuo and Fizz here. So taken away once again. Nidalee banned by Royal Club? I don't think Dyrus actually plays Nidalee. 
Yeah, Darius definitely does uh, play in Italy. Did he pick it up? Okay, great enough. I just uh, don't actually recall seeing him play it. But this is something that we have seen a lot. Ban out three top laners and then early pick Rise. Just kidding. <laughs> Zillion also a very, very high priority pick. There should be Zillion for solo, uh, Team Solo mid though. If Rise gets locked in here for Royal Club, Zillion is such a great pick against these aggressive uh, aggressive teams like Royal Club and like OMG can be, which we're obviously going to see next week. And therefore, I feel like Royal Club taking the Zillion, making sure TSM can do it against them. So for TSM then, what is the priority at this point? So have to say Yasuo managed to sneak through. Yeah, exactly. Yasuo um, is yep. up, but so is Rise. So it is kind of uh, dangerous for people picking Yasuo when Rise is up. A lot of people do not like that matchup. Definitely does make it a little bit harder for him. And they already got a Zillion locked in, who is a great pick against Yasuo, so making it even harder for Bjergsen if he does lock it in here. Obviously, there's a lot of mid lane. Options like Orianna is open, Syndra is open for him, Zed is actually open for Bjergsen and normally always banned. Once again, however, Zillion comes into the mix. If you play Zed into Zillion and you do go into a team fight, it becomes very, very hard to kill a target. You're pretty much forced to split push for the entire game, which of course is what you want to do on Zed, but it can make it a bit difficult. Ooh, so they grab both. Dyrus gets to go with another carry champion. We'll see how he does this time around with Rise and Bjergsen on that famous Zed. Very, very fun to see. What else is fun? All right, just kidding. They already locked that in, but we just can talk about Insect. He actually did play this one time in competitive in a competitive match, and they won a few times, I believe. Actually, he's been uh, playing the Shaco. Probably not against Team Solo mid here. You're playing to be number one in your group. You just had a very, very hard okay. game against. Uh, against TPA just before, but Ring up being locked in for Insect. This is the kind of champion I want to see him on, where he can set up plays. He is extremely aggressive, sometimes again a bit over aggressive like the analyst desk was talking about. But as long as Royal Club can follow him, and now when you do have a Zillion as well, you can speed up the Ringer, put a bomb on, on his head, and he can just assassinate people. And keep him alive if he does go. That works too. <laughs> and we did talk about, you know, the bands that are often focused at Korn in the mid lane. You know, Yasuo and Fizz are the most banned against them. The second most banned out guy is Insect for this team. And the targets are Lee Sin and Rengar. They had to use one of these bands on Lucian because they didn't want Uzi Eye on that. So the second one does get through. And like I said before, I do really like Insect on this champion because his ult does give him the option of changing his mind after he decides to go with something very deep and very aggressive he gets vision of surrounding opponents. So he can pull out if he knows there's extra danger there that could collapse on him that they wouldn't otherwise know because of the lack of wards. Right, and TSM right here. Because you already have the Zed, you know you're going to be split pushing here. With the Zed, you pick up the Korgi for the mid-game siege they can do. You have Nami as well, great at sieging towers here, and of course Rise from Darius. He's going to be in the other side lane, the opposite side lane of Bjergsen, but he will have teleport, so he can join in for a potential 4 versus 4 fight there. So the Corky pick, I like it for this mid-game siege they can do. As long as Bjergsen get a good start to this game and he can start one-on-one, -on -one, everyone on the map, then it's easy for Solo mate to set it up and pressure every single lane. And Lost Boy getting by far and away his most comfortable pick there with Nami. Other side is though, when we're, when we're talking about the comfort picks, Irelia is a champion that loved by Wicked and a lot of players in China. <laughs> and Cola's gonna get his hands on it. We also see Janna coming out for a second time today. Yeah, Cola's always been real big fan of like Jackson Aurelia. These are the classic things we're used to seeing him on. That rise was a little bit of a different shade for him. But this time, he's gonna be very, very comfortable on this champion. And it's a perfect champion to run into Rise because Aurelia with a reliable gap closer always has this kill pressure on Rise when you've got a Rengar jungle. So we're used to seeing Insect spend most of his time down bottom. There were rumors about coaching staff trying to change things up and have him spend more time in the other lanes. That top lane would be a great th uh, area for him to spend some more of his time in. Yeah, we're really going back to, this is like a standard Royal Club comp we're seeing right here. Mid lane, you have the utility. Mid lane, you have the AoE damage as well from Korn. You have, of course, Cola on the champion where he can split push as well, and he can set up ganks for Insect on Aurelia. It is such an annoying matchup for Ryze because you have the range advantage, so you want to hit Aurelia in the face, <laughs> yeah. but every time you do, you get a low on HP and suddenly she can jump and stun you and then Insect appears and you die and you're like, damn it, I should never have hit this guy. And it's such an annoying matchup here. TSM, it's going to be all about getting Bjergsen ahead. You're now locked in the lease as well for Amazing in the jungle. So you have the perfect mid-game siege comp 
with Corky, you have Nami, and you have the Elise pick. So it's all about Bjergsen getting a good start here, so he can start one on one and split pushing. Rise in the other lane, and you have the three members sitting in mid lane just taking down towers. And the key to that early start is going to be amazing. He's on Elise, who's a champion who can go early side zone, spend a lot of money on early vision. You keep Insect down. This Rengar pick, he's going to take a while to get to that level six. There's this small window that Amazing needs to go for, control the game for his team early. Well, two teams have picked their champions, so who do you guys think are going to win this one? Send your choice using the hashtag SHRWIN or TSMWIN to at LOL Esports, and we'll check your answers a little bit later on. You were talking about the Elise pick there for Amazing, and his stats are pretty formidable on it. 10-1 and one over the course of the season. Big pick for him. They're up against Royal Club, and this is probably the, I don't want to say deciding game, because we've already seen that TPA are a oh, real yeah. factor in this group, but certainly a, a game that's going to decide quite a lot, I think, specifically towards the top seed. Yeah, they, sorry, there's also a game that's going to show a lot, like, of okay, Royal Club, are they really a shaky team? Like, are they inconsistent, or was it just a bad game against TPA, and now they can show against TSM that they are the best team in the group? I mean, this game is going to tell us a lot. Well, let's find out, shall we? We're into game between Starhorn, Royal Club, and TSM, and we said it before in the uh, first match for TSM, that win over SK, that they seem to be somewhat of a home team here in Taipei. Got a lot of fans who hear the TSM chances. They seem to draw all over the entire world. Yeah, exactly. They're kind of like a worldwide home team here. We'll see what happens this time, though, because Amazing, he has already started spending early money on Vision, as is common with many Elise jungles. He started with the true ward here, already at level one. And he should actually also be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Insect here early on, at least before the level 6 mark, because Elise is very strong in these small skirmish. And then later on, once Insect hits his level 6 mark, it's going to be all about the deep wards, because if you ward just in the river, it's easy for Insect to pop his stealth before the ward can even spot him out, and he can still pull off his gang. So you need to get in the jungle of, of Royal Club, place some deep wards, put around the blue buff, put around the wraith camp, so you can see Insect before he pops his ulti, and then you can spot the gank. Yeah, if you wait too long on that, then he will get to you. It doesn't matter if the warning range has been increased on his ult because there's a zillion who can speed him up, or if he goes bottom lane, he's just going to get that passive speed from Janna. There are, it's very, very dangerous for him, for you to let him get into any of these lanes. That being said, deep wards only help so much. You can always go for lane ganks with Rengar. Once very he gets true. his yeah. ult, if he decides to go for Cola's lane with level 6, then he's going to go for Cola's lane with level 6. Dyrus needs to be aware of the timing of the uh, experience for the jungler. That's up to Amazing. We'll see how well he can track down instead. Oh, he's going to be starting on the red buff. Dyrus actually giving him a helping hand there right at the very start of this one. We will be seeing standard lanes coming out in this matchup. Insect there just leaping back and forth. So, Irelia rides in the top lane. Well, let's touch on the bottom lane here. Tristana Janna against Corki Nami. Yeah, so normally when we see Zero play Janna, it's when Rodlov wants to like fast push his tower here. Uzi early on already getting the early advantage, we could say, in experience here. We'll be able to get level 2 fairly soon, but Wild Turtle and Lost Boy should be able to play out the last minute here. But they will get the early level 2 from Rodlov and just constantly push it into the tower, like over and over, trying to take it down as fast as possible. Then they can swap Uzi to the top lane and do the same here. And both junglers started on the red side, which means or, which means they're actually pushing down towards, or sorry, of course, blue side from Insect, but that means they're pushing down towards this bottom lane early on. And as you can see, Amazing, with his true ward, got there first, was able to place it, so he knows where Insect spent his trinket ward. Getting there first is a huge part in the war on vision just because of that. Now Amazing can work around the wards he knows are there from Insect. And this bottom lane, the river gank to the bottom lane is protected. So all that Turtle and Lustboy have to worry about, since they're pushed into their own turret, is the lane ganks and hiding in that bush. Rengar, one of the best uh, at those lane ganks and one of the best type of ganks for him to pull off before he is level six. Trying to get into those side lane bushes. We see the stats there from Lost Boy, 0-0-9 in that game with Nami against SK Gaming earlier on in the day. See if he can pull out those kind of statistics here once again against Royal Club. But now they've been a fairly 
timid start and you can almost expect that to be the case here as well because it is the top of the table clash right. in the group. And also we have standard lanes this time around, no lanes of no instant pushing down these towers here from Royal Club. So standard lanes, early on here, Cola taking a lot of damage. He again, he wants Insect to be level 6 and then he can start going for Dyrus when Insect comes in and they can pick up some kills here. So early on, definitely in favor of uh, Dyrus in terms of poke. Right, because especially since he started with that mana crystal, he wants to make a, a take advantage of that window that we talked about before there is a level six Rengar that can just uh, come surprise him. And amazing, he's gonna spend some time up top here, try and capitalize on the early lead here from Dyrus. They already burnt the teleport. If they can get a kill, oh, Cola getting hooked up there. Are they gonna be able to finish him flashing off to the backside? Will they flash in? Dyrus out of mana. Will they dive it? Amazing, going half under the tower will repel away from the danger. Cola went low and whilst they've not killed him there, the TP was used earlier to get Cola back in the lane, so that's no longer there. Meanwhile, down at bottom, Uzi going heavy onto Lost Boy here, gets him low. Wild Turtle trying to put the damage back, but TSM gonna fall very low from this exchange. This lane is such a big problem here for TSM. Amazing, he couldn't go down to the bottom lane because there was the ward in the river here. He's not really able to lane gank this early on. It's very hard to set up without the tidal wave from Lost Boy, which means he was forced to go top lane. Yes, he got the flash. Cola, though, been able to regain a lot of HP there and still staying in lane. Yeah, this bottom lane is absolutely beastly for Royal Club right now. Turtle really has to get some help from Lost Boy to get these last hits under the turret. They don't want to fall too far behind. It's not too bad right now, but if it does continue to get worse, uh, then it's going to be have to, something that Amazing does ha end up having to deal with. Zero just playing it aggressive there as well, trying to keep control of that bush. Actually, we'll have just seen the ward timeout. This boy probably one straight back down to make sure that they keep vision of where Zero is, or maybe more importantly, that there's not a Rengar ready to jump out of that brush and cause you a few problems. Up until now, it is Royal Club that have a slight lead in this game. Amazing, just asserting some control over the death brush there on the top side of the map, getting his pink ward down. So as long as Cola can stay alive in his top lane here, Inzek can basically just focus on farming up to level 6, because he doesn't need to help the bottom lane. They have full control of it already. Mid lane, Korn is just farming against Bjergsen. Is falling slightly behind. Once Bjergsen picks up this CS here, but it's going to be all about the ulti from Korn. If Bjergsen ever joins the team fight, just look at Korn and wait for... He's going to wait to see which target Bjergsen goes for and be ready with the ult here. It's going to be a lot of protection for Uzi in these late game team fights. So it's going to be a lot about getting him ahead. He's getting off to a great start. Obviously, the mid game is going to be heavily in favor of Wild Turtle. Once he gets Trinity Force, get some Magic Pen boosters, boots as well, we can really start seeing TSM grouping up as a team, or at least with the four members, three members, and start teaching the Antares forcing fights. That's Korn back into lane. With the boots that tier already from before, starting to get stacked up. Insek, who's not been able to really push too much here, but he is now level six. That's the important thing to note from Insect's side of things. We'll see exactly where he's going to try and focus. And I'm really uh, looking forward to see which build Insect decides to go for, because last time I saw him play Rengar together with Azillion, he went for early Feral player into Moby Boots, into a Ghost Blade, and then a Blade of the Ruin King, like full assassin build here. And once he got to a target, he would kill them in a matter of seconds. And then he had the Zillion as well to help him in case he needed it. I wonder if he's going to do the same here, and then look to try and punish Bjergsen when he's trying to split boots on the Z here. If he's standing one-on-one -on -one against Cola, suddenly Insect joins in, a lot of damage, burst down, Bjergsen, and the split push ends. Yeah, I don't expect anything different from him. I mean, a tank cooldown reduction Rengar is not really Insect style. And we'll see what he does, because right now he is heading uh, with those Moby boots down bottom instead of top. Now, top lane is pushing towards Cola right now, but Insect... He's hopping towards that bottom lane. Maybe this is a counter gank opportunity he's looking for because this bottom lane's been shoved up the entire time. Yeah, but and the CS really showing that as well. 20 is the lead here, basically, for Uzi. So, doing a fantastic job of that. Actually, we see him turn around or stop at least by the golems here. So, not going directly into that bottom lane. But just the fact he picked up Moby Boots as his first item. Normally on Ringo, we see the cooldown reduction. So, you can, like, gank as often as possible. And the cooldown reduction is so good on Ringo. The fact he goes for early Moby Boots tells me he's want to try to do this uh, aggressive assassin build and then look to try and punish Bjergsen when he's in this uh, 
split pushing uh, situations. The other thing is he's going to build up his ferocity on the jungle camps before he goes for the gank. Right now he's getting that red buff for the extra damage and burn as well. With Amazing showing in lane, though, it means that he's got free opportunities on the solo lanes. He knows Amazing's down bottom, and he can take this opportunity to try and swing something uh, for either of those solo lanes. Going to be hard for him to gain the mid lane, however. Seeing as Bjergsen is very, very difficult to yes, uh, pull exactly. that off. Yes, exactly. Like, even also when you try to lock him down, you can pop his ult and actually dodge around your skill shots. So it should be the top lane if you want to go for one of the solo lane ganks. All right. We're already going to Dyrus. Oh, this is going to be a lot of damage room for him. It comes down. Cole going in. Oh, aggressive there. Almost was able to finish off Dyrus, who at least forced him to back away some, uh, somewhat. Although, Dyrus' ultimate coming back up here in just a second. So, should be feeling decently safe. And he's also got Lost Point and Amazing coming up. He is a juicy, juicy target for Insect right now. This, even, it's a bait. Even under turret. It's now a bait. It's up to Lust Boy, though. This push. Wow, too late. Flashes in there. This is going to be the kill. And it is first blood. Lost Boy and Amazing come around, but they were just a little bit too late. And Insect going absolutely crazy aggressive there you to get the kill. You can't bait with 300 HP there. I'm just saying it was a bait. <laughs> I'm not saying it was the greatest idea ever, but it was actually a bait. We had Amazing and Lost Boy sitting there ready to counter gank once Insect showed himself, but he flashed in, instant burst down Dyrus. Easy kill here for Royal Club. Getting the first ball onto Cola as well. Looking great for him so far. Uzi should be able to take down his bottom tower very, very soon. Constantly getting damage on it every single time. Oh, Wild Turtle. Oh, Lost Boy actually coming into that one. And the fact that Lost Boy went up top but didn't stop that kill from happening, leaving Wild Turtle alone down in this, in this bottom lane has made his time a little bit harder as well. And Uzi continues to wreak havoc in there. Got himself the Avarice Blade and a BF Sword. Now, zero down to half HP. Needs to be slightly careful, but if you look at the vision on the bottom side of the map, they see Amazing coming a mile off. Yeah, Zero's done a great job. Very, very deep vision in here. That's what you have to do when you're shoving up this entire time. Turret is right for the taking, taking for them. Insect has to back, though. So they don't have any jungle back in here. They don't want to overextend. Something else you can bait with are tower kills. So if TSM drew a lot of their forces down bottom, knowing that Royal Club want to finish off that bottom turret, they might be able to try and take advantage. Amazing trying to get some wards in the red side jungle here of Royal Club in response. Still though, I'm just trying to picture how TSM wants to play it. I mean, again, we know they want to do 1-3-1 one, one split push here, but it's going to be so hard because of Insect on this ring. He's going towards Brutalizer now. So it's going to be so scary to ever split push when a ringer can just pop out of nowhere and kill you. Like, there's going to be constant deep wards from TSM, even deep lane wards if they want to spot him in the late game here. And a three versus three down bottom. Both junglers have been able to sneak into these side pushes. This is going to be an explosive No fight. yet from Insect. Oh, Insect here getting ready. He's going to dive in there. They're going for Amazing, who's got no chance to get away. He will repel. Oh, he's flashed by Cola. TP instantly. Lost point out to less than half. Will be finished up. It's a double kill for Cola. There's no reply here from TSM. Dyrus did come down. Zero going to go low, but not enough to finish off. They're coming for a dive. Zillion's headed down bottom two. They got to get out of there now. Getting the tower at least here. Dyrus and Wildstone will stay alive. Oh, oh he's going. Insect going to dive on the top. He's going for Dyrus here. Bob going to explode. Beautiful. Oh, another kill. Perfect execution by Royal Club. So this play right here. It is so typical Royal Club. First of all, Insect, he loves to gank the bottom lane on Ringer. He loves to get Uzi ahead. And the second uh, second part is, Cola, instant teleport down. There's no hesitation. It's just, okay, we're fighting. I'm going to teleport. Dyrus joined in way too late. Easy kills for Royal Club. Chasing on for the next one. Getting the dragon as well. Rangar is so good at those side lane ganks. And you saw the counter gank right there. That was almost like dandy-esque. Coming from there, he almost 100%ed amazing as soon as he popped out there. So, as you said, Royal Club, once they know they've got this advantage, they don't let you leave. They press it as far as they possibly can. As soon as they smell blood in the water, they chase you all the way back to your secondary turret. Lost boy that been pretty aggressive when it comes to just walking blindly through the enemy jungle. Ward down at Golems, won by the raid camp as well. And you know, that may this time have just paid off for TSM because they get that deep vision. They need to see Insect coming early enough to stop him getting involved on the on those lanes. 
And we can see it looks like they're gonna try and make a play here with Bjergsen. Gonna come through the jungle, will spot Insect. Deathmark available, but Insect just walks away and Korn was coming around anyway. Yeah, and while Korn, uh, Korn has been losing the lane in terms of farm, it doesn't matter, because it's all about just not giving up any kills to Bjergsen. Just sit there. I mean, you're playing a utility mage anyway. Your job is basically to say, where's Insect? Okay, here's a bomb on your face. I'm going to speed you up. Go do whatever you need to do. And whenever you're about to die, I'm going to pop my ult on you. So it doesn't even matter the fact that Korn is falling behind here. Right, as he, long as you don't give up any kills. He's giving experience bonus to his bottom lane, so it helps out that duo. He's giving it as well to Cola, uh, of course, because it's global. Uh, try and help him out up top with Dyrus after that first kill. You know, Dyrus is still in a squishy stage right now on this Rise. He's in the mana building stage of Rise, and he's still a very vulnerable target. Especially against a 3 0 1 Irelia, who's going to be such a pain for him here. And we do see Feral Flare. More Insect coming up here shortly, and just problems all around for TSM. Yeah, and also just a top lane matchup, even though you have the uh, Wild Turtle on Corky where he's going, going to be strong in the mid game, you can really punish Tristana because Irelia, on the other hand, is going to be so much stronger than the Ryze in the mid game one. She completes a Trinity Force, huge power spike first. She can just dive onto Wild Turtle and pretty much solo kill him if Cola wants to. So it means for TSM they can poke and siege, but they can actually straight up team fight in this mid game, and Uzi should be able to just rush straight into late game on this Tristana here. Again, he has the Zillion, he has the Janna to protect him. So far, things are looking oh. great for Royal Club. And Insect once again, up in this top lane. That juicy, juicy rise right now. Dyrus oh, is pretty low. Oh, gonna go in for this one. Dyrus, of course, will spot him coming in, but the health bar disappears. Insect tanking up the turret. Not gonna be a problem for him, and that is another kill for Cola, who sat at 4-0-1. They got three minions to help them with this tower. That one is gonna be going down, if not now, then at least in that next wave. It leaves Royal Club 5 0 up in kills, 4,000 gold in the lead. TSM really need to make some sort of play with this Zed on a side lane here. Without Bjergsen turning this match around, uh-oh, they're going to look for a play on the mid lane, actually. This has got to be it, surely, for TSM. This is a chance that they need to take. That is a great Howling Gale. They don't actually get involved there with the Cocoon as Uzi just jumps away from it. And what looked like a good numbers advantage for TSM is simply walked away from by Royal Club. And we've really seen a big difference in terms of junglers in this game here. Because every single time Insect is there to pull off a gank, Amazing hasn't been in a position to either counter gank it or gank somewhere else on the map. And of course, it's also because Roy Club has been doing well in the side lanes where Cola would always have the kill pressure on Dyrus in the top lane. And Uzi and Zero down his bottom lane have been warding up a lot of deep wards early on and just pushing in the lane over and over simply meant Amazing couldn't find anywhere to gank. Like, his best option would probably have been mid lane just to try at Snowball Bjergsen. I mean, Crumbs on the analyst desk was talking about how this is going to be mid lane camp from TSM. It wasn't there. They didn't try and go in and force the ulti from Korn and then go in the second time and kill him. And great warding from, from World Club and great ganks from Insects simply means they are dominating this early game. Yeah, TSM just gave up that story as well. Cola actually going to go aggressive here on towards Bjergsen. Deathmark's going to be used, but I don't know if Bjergsen's going to come out on top of this one. Cola just simply Ooh. kills him with a one-on-one -on -one straight away after picking up that Trinity. And Dyrus looks to have a similar fate oh. here. Yeah, that is not good news. Four men on top of you, and Zillion pops the ultimate on himself. Three miles oh, to another. go at Wild Turtle. This is going to be damaged back, but Cola dodging through everything, flashes away from the rocket. Oh, flash from Wild Turtle as well. He's going to try for this one. Cola still dodging. Phosphorus bomb misses, but another rocket will get the shutdown. So finally, TSM can pick up a kill here. Trinity Force was completed for Wild Turtle as well this time around. Got their E from Lost Boy, so he could apply the slow and manage to chase down the kill. But once again, man, Royal Club, as soon as they have the lead, they will keep ganking, they will keep forcing you into terrible situations. And if you don't react instantly by pressuring someone else on the map or be ready for the potential counter gang or take the fight, then Royal Club will kill you and just extend the goal lead. Insect there popping his ultimate. He was looking for roamers. They don't have vision on this bottom side without wards. So he was sort of screening for Uzi there, popping the ultimate. Nobody headed up through that river, though, so they find no targets. And he's just going to have to settle for ward coverage and secure this dragon. TSM probably should not rush headlong into this dragon. 
Rogue Club prepping it with wards. Still on top of the TSM ward there though, so TSM know that oh. they are hanging around. Pink ward will support that ward coming down from TSM and will be instantly cleared away by that jumping Rengar. So there's no ulti for Insect right now. If a potential fight should break out, let's see what TSM can actually do. While Turtle is fairly strong at the moment, his boots are completed oh. as well. They are going for the fight. Dragon goes down though, Insect will actually jump I'm away. I'm a liar, they're not going away for the, over the wall. No, they're not. Going for the steal. Already gone. The second dragon goes over to Royal Club, and look at this, a max oh, range mid tidal again. wave. Push the mid lane. That it was a great tidal wave. All it was supposed to do is stop those backs, buy some time. Now Dyrus, though, he's playing with Muscle. fire here. He goes in, trying to stop more backs. And they're going to get that as well. Insect is, is actually really low. Flashing from Dyrus, going for the kill. Uzi 2-0! Oh! And Dyrus goes down. Insect's still alive. Uzi looking for more kills. Exhaust will stop that from happening. Oh, he knocks him away. No way! Two comes in. Exhaust is down, amazing will fall, and that was just simply amazing coming out from Royal Club. There's another one for Cola as well. In second, Uzi, no fear, using his rocket jump on the top of Les White for more damage. Hell yeah, who needs to escape? <laughs> and Zero comes in for the shield and heal. He knew he had his back. Oh, uh, Wild Till. Uh oh, oh that Valkyrie over the top here, but Korn's pretty quick. There's the bomb on your head. I think he's in a. Oh, he turns it around. Korn, though, does get the second bomb for the kill. So let's just praise at least TSM for what they did before here. So after the dragon, we saw the tide wave from Wolfsburg try to delay the back while the rest of TSM moved towards the mid lane. We're going to see it again here. Okay, it's so on to Insect. Remember, this is a full damage Rengar, so look at the burst onto Dyrus, and then Uzi. He's not gonna jump away once you get a reset, no, no, jump onto the last point, keep going for the kill, zero joints in, keeps Uzi alive. <laughs> Sadly, Insect will die in the very end here for Royal Club. And, and during all that, while they were sending reinforcements down bottom to help out Uzi and Insect, there was a teleport from base to that secondary turret by Cola, so they were able to get the main person back in defense of that turret. And TSM they did a great job trying to stop the back yeah. in order to earn that objective, but they weren't able to stop Cola's, so he was able to get back and defend it. And Bjergsen, we have to say as well, has not had the impact here that TSM have needed. We saw at the end of that replay, he was basically halfway up the river towards that top lane, not involved with the fight not really getting the push that he probably needs to do at this point. And Royal Club romping away with a lead at this stage. There's so Kogadin in deck. Oh. They're all oh, under the sorry. turret. Oh, Turtle! Go for Wild Turtle, Valkyrie's straight away out of it though. That's still quite a lot of damage just by jumping and using your E onto him. So let's see, so Royal Club, I mean, ulti is gone from Insect now, so they can't really set up any picks at least from Insect's side, and therefore can just Go back or go into the jungle. He's placed a few wards. See if TSM wants to move. Potentially overstep their boundaries just a little bit, and then maybe Rodlock might look for a pick. But they kind of need Insect to get his ulti back or TSM to face check them. Well, face check could be real. They've really got some deep, deep vision on this red side here, too, for Royal Club. Luckily for TSM, you know, they're not venturing over towards that Baron, and they're trying to huddle where they know they have vision, where they have protection, safe in the lane. Woo, now they still want to check the Baron. Now they're getting dangerous. Checking oh. every bush with oh, abilities. Look, look at Royal. Yeah, Royal Club are just going for that inner turret in the top lane. They've got all five men still there. Dyrus, yeah, he's on his own down bottom. He's got TP, he's rise, he's what not is, killing turrets What are TSM doing here, though? They're going in the wrong way. They can't defend from the back. I don't actually look to fight this one. This is going to be extremely risky by TSA Mill. Let's see what happens. Well, they might need to take a risky fight here. There is a bubble coming down onto Cola. The damage from Dyrus will come in as well. What are they going to be able to do? Can they finish him off? They can't. And in the end, they forced Royal Club away at least, but no kills. That was good poke, but they were handling, handling a very, very dangerous team here. A zillion sped up. Or, uh oh! Set going towards Wild Turtle this time around. He's like, nope, I'm getting out of there. Valkyrie wants to get to the tower. But every time ult is used <laughs> by Insect, it should buy just a little bit of time for TSM to try and get back in the game here. They did lose the tower because they thought Royal Club was actually on the Baron and they wanted to move the safe way around. If you have no wards around the Baron area, you never want to run like straight from your own mid tower and in 
to the Baron Pity or towards the Baron Pity into like a choke point. Oh, you don't want to face shake as well. You have to push this in the jungle because you have no control of it. It would have been certain death for TSM. So they had to walk down the mid lane and through the river to try and see if anything was going on. Turns out Roy Club just took the big wave up top and took a tower. Got now by a good 7,000 gold. 4-2 in towers. 11-2 in kills. Both of them pop six of those with Cola right now. He's now got a frozen heart added to his inventory. Of course, Ghost Blade, Feral Flare for Insect. So what we you talking mentioned about, those builds earlier, and you know, a lot of people building Rengar differently, but you never expect Insect to go the more tanky route. It's all about the aggression, getting things going, and well, basically being an assassin out of the jungle yeah. here. And it's a great idea against something like a Zed here because it makes it so, so hard for Bjergsen to split push. At this point, Insect might even be able to one-on-one -on -one the mid laner. Not sure if it will happen. I hope we're going to see well, it actually if Bjergsen get enough burst onto him. Yeah, he is down two levels. It's definitely a possibility, though. He'll try it. Especially least. if he got... He probably wants to try. If he does get a chance. Yep. Here we go. Here's his chance. They've got control of the mid. Oh, Insect actually going very low from this one, but he's got the Zillion ulti on. They finish him off, but he's coming right back to life. They back away, though. TSM losing a couple of men down to half HP. Cola maybe dashing forward from this one. He's going up towards Cyrus, who will just flash over the top of the wall. The Howling Gale did connect, but both teams losing a decent amount of HP. But it's TSM that forced Royal Club back. And we Can do see the power of Koki in the mid game. So much poke from Wild Turtle. Can that earn them the dragon, though? Will Royal Club have the confidence here? They don't have any vision of it. Okay, they make the call just to push up mid very quickly. I like that. They're trying to trade here. Can TSM? make the pay for this though. Will they be able to cut them off and defend a turret in time? Keep in mind, Insect has no ulti right here for a potential fight. They're in the mid lane. TSM flanking around. No one to tank the turret really there. It's Bjergsen getting involved. Good damage coming down. They turn it around. Uzi is actually at the back Ooh. all on his own there. Cola right in the middle of the team. He's got a bomb. He's got the Zillion ultimate. Lost point going low but didn't go down in the end here. Surely someone will get finished off. His corn that went first but Uzi's getting the reset and with Cola they're able to get another one. That will be a three for one for Royal. So after the ult, Darius not done. Oh, he's it's getting a kill. He got him. Intake is down here. Intake is down but rest of Roy Club pushing on to mid lane. Yeah, they're gonna get this tower. Bjergsen and Dyrus both recalling here. They might end up losing a good chunk of health from the inventory. So TSM in the last fight here, as soon as they saw the ulti on the Cola, they had to just burst him down and it actually opened up for Bjergsen to get a kill onto Korn because there's no ulti left. But this mid tower is gone. Can they actually defend him? They should be able to. Bjergsen is here, Dyrus is here and Lost Boy is coming. Chasing them off is pretty much all they can do though. Not much for a rebuttal here for TSM. So let's take a look at this team fight one more time. They did not expect that positioning from Uzi Eye. And having that Zillion on your team is great because they have the confidence on both Aurelia and Rengar to jump in. Because Cole is the one that gets taken down first, he's the one who gets it and it opens up a pathway for Uzi to do what he does best. Go aggressive, jump all the way in on Tristana. Cyrus though, finding the sneaky kill. And Zeke doing what he's doing best. <laughs> Sometimes they extending a little bit and end up dying for a oh. Whoa! Yeah. That's uh, a Tristana with Last Whisper, Shiv, Infinity Edge. You can basically count on those crit heads to get you finished off, and that will be Uzi's fifth kill. This is going to be his game. Well, surely. I mean, all, all five members. Five. Korn is running in. Okay, he had to come from base here, but should be able to join the team very, very soon and just push straight on to inhibitor here. Royal Club can now put their attention on the Baron. Fully ward off the jungle here. If anyone from TSM wants to face take around this Baron video, I'm sure Insect is gonna jump them and the rest of Royal Club will follow instantly. They've got some decent vision around this river for Baron here at TSM. So they don't have to rush, you know, headlong into this situation. They have also got a scrying orb they can rely on. Wild Turtle has the activation ready for it. Used already. Used it. Oh, Uzi spotted there from the back. Baron is set down to less than half HP. Amazing. Time to shine, amazing. The hero here. Can he get in there? The bubble comes in. Royal Club actually move away from Baron. They're going towards Dyrus. Insect dies in the back. Dyrus will go down. Wild Tail, the next focus. They manage to kill him up. And it's Uzi going mental at the back there. Going to get the reset. Bjergsen puts in the death mark onto him. But Bjergsen is going to fall. Uzi does finally get popped. But that is an ace for Royal Club for just the AD.
can carry. Don't think you can really give this team Zillion just because it frees up Insect, Cola, <laughs> it frees up everybody on their team to play as aggressively as they want and build full damage. Not only Zillion, Rengar for Insect was banned against, or TPA banned it against Royal Club here because they respected the Rengar pick. TSM on the other hand, they banned Lee Sin away from Insect here, so he picks up yeah. the Rengar. And we were actually talking in the start how okay they were thinking about going Rise for the first pick, locked in the Zillion. First of all, TSM could take it, and then as you just pointed out, Kobe, it opens up for this Rengar build. Let's just see the fight again. Royal Club. Going straight for it, multi pop from Insect, they're going in here, onto Dyrus, just take down the first target you can, you still have the Zillion roll onto Insect here, in case he goes down, and now Bjergsen tries to join in, just pay attention though to the way Bjergsen plays this fight here, the very last Q actually pops on Uzi, is the guy, is the Q that managed to take him down, notice here from Machado, bumps the Q onto Uzi, and what he actually ended up dying, that was a beautiful Q. Just really doesn't matter. It's just the consolation prize, that's all yes. they get, at least they killed Uzi. Still leaves them more than 10,000 gold behind in this game. And hard to see a way back in here from TSM. I think patience is going to be one thing, but we've already seen it time and time again. Setting up a trap. trap here. They're going to actually come up zero. He's got a zillion ultimate, though. Darren, Corn for this. on that one. Insect off to the side. They're going to try and focus him down. Can they kill him off? Korn coming in there. Death mark from Bjergsen going towards Korn. Not sure that's not the damage. Bjergsen walks away, but they lose Wild Tail. They lose Amazing. They're going to lose Lost Boy as well. This could and be the game. Three kills. They might finish up. Uzi goes in for another one. That's another ace here for Royal Club. And surely the game. Such a great performance by Royal Club. They get all the picks they want. The Cole and Aurelia in the top lane as well. Looking so, so strong. Dominating TSM. Royal Club going to pick up the victory here and solidify their position at the top of the group. 30 minute game, very aggressive, perfectly played in most cases there by the Chinese side. Amazing. And we did see, as you said, one of the reasons why people ban Rengar against this team so often. Insect was magnificent with that champion. The first couple ganks worked out for him. He even got some early ganks without having to use his ultimate. Whenever you get your first ultimate gank successful and you get a second one after that without having it back up, then he's going to have a very, very strong game. And the fact that TSM or Amazing was never able to respond to any of the ganks here. The one time Amazing was down the bottom lane, it was actually Insect doing the counter gank, getting an early kill onto him. Up in the top lane here, we talked about how Aurelia can always set up an easy stun onto Ryze, and then Insect joins in from the lane, easy kill as well. And bottom lane, because Zero and Uzi was dominating and so hard, just constantly pushing it in and keeping deep wards in the jungle of TSM, it meant Amazing had nowhere to go but the mid lane. I'm not sure why he just didn't try, like at least try and go mid lane here, see if you can get a kill for Bjergsen. It's not like Zillion in the mid lane is going to 1v2 you. He might stay alive and buy time for a potential counter gank, but that's about it. I mean, you had to try somewhere. You couldn't go for the bottom lane. Top lane was already in trouble. I mean, you pretty much just had to go mid. That bottom lane gave Rail Club so much control of this Oh, game. yes. They, they had this very, very secure foothold down on that entire bottom side of the map. And once again, you know, we always look towards Uzi and see what he can do. 10-1-10, I believe, was his scoreline by the end of it. And again, you give him a champion like Tristana that can just clear up in those fights and prove him once again that he is most definitely one of the best out there. And also just showing it was a talking point going into the game. Royal Club's bottom lane against Wild Turtle and Lost Boy clearly went in favor of Royal Club here. Like from the start, early level two, that zillion passive as well, got the level two, just kept pressuring all the time. Zero doing a great job on Gianna. And it simply meant top side of the map. Royal Club could do whatever they want to do. And once this team gets a lead, not like in the TPA game where they actually fell behind and had to sit and defend, but once they get the lead, they will keep forcing fights. They're never going to stop. They're never just going to sit back and say, let's farm for 10 more minutes. No, 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 no. Deep wards in and just go, go, go. And TSM was just never able to respond. There were so many solo kills left and right. Zed, or Bjergsen on Zed, I mean, never got a chance to do any kind of split pushing, never really got going as well. Everyone from TSM simply just fell too far behind. I feel it leaves the group wide open now with TPA watching this and saying, we pushed Royal Club a lot further there than TSM did, and that second spot might be the one that comes under grabs or under fire, and uh, they fight for that second place. But guys, we're going to throw it over to the analyst to wrap up day one of the League of Legends World Championship.
Thank you very much, guys. I actually completely agree with Joe. I do think this... Uh, add some questions. Who's going to make it through the group? Starhorn Real Club came out. They completely outplayed TSM. They were extremely aggressive, got in their faces. And I think TSM was doomed from the start. They had never seen a good Rengar before. True. North America tried. Free <laughs> uh, you know, Crumbs, Crumbs tried twice. Let me tell you, I pulled two, out my notebook. <laughs> 2, 9, and 13 on your Rengar stats. You were particularly <laughs> impressed by Insec. Uh, what was he doing right well, there? Well, I, I wrote it all down so that I can bring it back to NA. <laughs> maybe try to do it. But, uh, one of the biggest differences I noticed is that in NA, everybody's building CDR. Like, oh, let's just get more ultimates, more ultimates so that we can gank more. He did not do any of that. He was only thinking about, I'm just going to make my gank as effective as possible. Building more damage, building mobility boots really early. And another difference is that he did not care at all about the little exclamation mark that pops up when you're ulting on Rengar. <laughs> He's just like, well, I'm here. Yeah, deal with it. Like he, <laughs> he tower dive and dives. So we clearly see him enter tower range and then just go gank him. That's the biggest thing that I saw. And he carried. Yeah, I completely agree. Something that worries me though for Royal Club is, is the Nidalee ban. Yeah, a lot of pointed out by a lot of people on social media already. If you do your research against TSM, it's very likely that you don't need to. Maybe they were worried about like an off-season like training pick, and that was their kryptonite or something. But mm -hmm. it's uh, either shows a lack of research or just distinct lack of respect. Either way, it was yeah. odd. And the fun thing is, on the same side, TSM did their own research. It's not a champion that Cola plays. This is the first time in a long time TSM didn't ban Nidalee. Uh, and yeah, it's just very strange that it went over to the blue side. So. Uh, even though I praised SHRC's pre-game planning just in the last game because I thought their team comp was really clever in their first game, the group stage, this was a red flag that something was kind of amiss with these guys. In terms of mid-game, I do think if TSM was able to hang on a little more to get Bjergsen strong enough, decent in the lead, and then start split-pushing, they could have done something, but their bot lane just fell so far behind. Uh, I know other people want to point out little things about this, but I, I went, mm -hmm. had the liberty of watching just what went wrong early. Uh, first of all, I want to point out if you play with Zillion, bot lane actually does not level up to two sooner only level three is one creep earlier uh but they just lost they lost the first wave push set them behind led through a little poke if they were going okay but then at level three uh lost boy skilled two points into his heel they initiated a trade and i think insect immediately realized that that um was a rank two heal and he jumped in immediately had no fear of the bubble because there was no bubble to be used and they won a disgusting trade and from that point that lane was over and yeah. it was something Uzi. you called out once you talking about the matchup between wild turtle and uzi yeah this is when we were talking about the world preview show and we were talking about uh, kind of focusing on the ad carries in this group wild turtle's laning was a problem throughout the entire playoffs and we were looking at massive cs uh differences between uzi and turtle as well as that big pressure advantage and as soon as that first gank got off they really freed up rengar to be in the top side a lot, get that Aurelia rolling to the degree that when the Zed split push finally came, Aurelia just 1v1 Bjergsen. And at that point, yeah. there's not much you can do. And part of the reason that led, I mean, the right, you, right, you lined up a so, replay. So Cola got incredibly fed. Um, let's actually pull up the, the replay. It's of the bottom lane teleport triple kill. It's really actually a lot of it's incredible. So first of all, the thing to point out is that Cola is actually already setting up the teleport. He shoved the wave. He's in the top lane uh, brush near Dyrus. He's actually going to run down towards the, the, the brush in the middle to make sure Dyrus can't flash rune prison him. He's actually already doing this before the battle has started. The second thing to point out here is that Uzi is going to be the one who initiates the fight, saying, look, I know I can't die. We see Darius, we see Bjergsen. If we get ganked by Elise, then Inset can follow up, which makes it very, very clever, and they bait in the fight. So roll the clip out, and it's going to be the start of a good trade, and then Uzi's going to say, you know what, actually, we can go in and take this battle. Uh, we're pause briefly for a second, but he's going to basically rocket jump in after realizing he's a good trade. Essentially baits in amazing afterwards, and suddenly, surprise, by the way, Rengar's here. TP has already come in again, and that is uh, Cola, who's in Fog of War, cannot possibly be stopped. Dyrus only now starts, but he's already lost two people on his team, so there's no possible way that goes any better for TSM. Yeah, At this point, Cola's got a bunch of kills. He can always handle the split push. And that's actually something that uh, Krepa was talking about much earlier in the day, is just how quick the reaction speed is from the Asian squad's teleports to the top laners. Well, to be fair, at that point, I was pointing out the things I saw in the Korea matches, but this was, this was exactly what we mean here. Fight breaks was immediate, zero hesitation teleport. Sure, sometimes it might be wrong, but like it was the right call. You saw Dyrus, he was a full four seconds behind on his TP. Even if it's wrong, he can just TP to the Dragon Pit because he already 
pushed in the top wave, so they can just secure a dragon while Darius has to address the wave top. So no matter if there was no kill in that bot lane, that's a free dragon. Yep. Yeah, well, we are going to have to move on in just a second. And, you know, after an action pack day one, it is time to look at the standings, see where these teams are slotting in and who's currently got themselves in a position to make it to the playoffs. Samsung White, a clear 2-0 in Group A, AHQ behind 1-1. One and one. Over in Group B, Sohorn Royal Club, 2-0. Team Solo Mid sitting at 1-1, one and one. TPA 0-1. and one. Yeah, not much to be said there for Group A. Uh, obviously, the favorites uh, are doing well already, and it's very unlikely. Um, actually, no, Edward Gaten yeah. lost. Okay, so I'm but, wrong I here. mean, they've played white. They it, like, yeah, they played white. white. Yeah. Right, the standings lie what, a little watching bit. The, watching the day, we, we're clearly going to see Edward Gaming and Samsung White come out on top. Just because yeah. HQ is actually higher in the standings, it's not going to matter. Group B's a tough one. Is Crumbs making? Is uh, now, TSM making out Crumbs? I signed up for TSM making it out. And that game against Royal was very shaky. But I still think that they have a shot. Like, they need to really reassess their plan. I think they need to target Insect when they play against Starhorn. They need to really make sure that he doesn't start rolling in some of his best champions. They have not dealt with a Lee Sin that good. They have not dealt with a Rengar that good. Just accept it and get out of it. Get rid of it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. All right, guys, before we close out the day, we would like to have a little bit of fun with some ambush kills, some fails, in a segment that uh, is a favorite of some of our junglers. It is, of course, the very special Thank you very much. So we strung together a few clips. This is, of course, the first one. Onto Prides by Samsung White. Yeah, pretty much textbook uh, exploit dive. They're always so far ahead, but yeah, four man surround. If you're left alone in that tower, all you can do is pray because you're going to die. Next up is Insect Crumbs. This is how you do it, bro. You just flash in, get the bullet, no chance of him getting out of it. And here's Amazing coming in under the turret. Of course, Candy Panda on his way out. And Amazing gets the kickoff. But Candy Panda, they're going to turn this one around. Dilius is right there. No gank you. Oh, we're going to have to rename that one. No gank you indeed. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> All right, Thank of course. You very much. <laughs> tomorrow, we will be bringing you another full day of matches, beginning with the Taipei Assassins versus SK Gaming. And we'll end our six games with Edward Gaming taking on AHQ Esports Club. Those matches will begin on Friday. That's 11 a.m. Central European Summertime, 2 a.m. Pacific. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our special guest analysts, Crumbs, Crepo, and Monte Cristo, as well as Freak, of course, and for the entire World's Broadcast team. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you all tomorrow. have got a jam-packed day to kick off our World Championship. Deathlet just lands on towards him, the wave comes riding through along with the Aqua Prism on Navi. Taken very low, has to back away from this one. Mana bounces it, Mana gets it! Turtle gets hit up, will they be able to keep it going? Everybody's jumping in and going for broke this time. Gilius gets hit, hit up, and the surrender comes in from SK. This has been an amazing start to Worlds already, and there is so much more to go. Garnet Devil's gonna be hit up by Holy Whoa. Phoenix here, the last shot crits, and it hits. Green T's now the focus, DP is getting what they want inside the base. In that middle lane. Oh, he's flashed it, but has he got the range? Oh, oh my God! God. The oh, the I can't can't be your lane. Lane. looking to be oh. the hero. The dodge on the horse. Dude, man. He's getting so good. Yes. He's survived. In the end here, surely someone will get finished up. This corn that went first, but who's he's getting the reset? That's a wrap of day one for League of Legends. It's pretty special to be here at Worlds. Like you play the whole season just for this moment. TSM five man pylon at the bottom. I should 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 I should
Jordan Westall slipping and sliding through the entire dark passage front line. 압도적으로 이기고 싶어요 첫 경기. Could it be a triple? Yes, it will. This is what everybody has been waiting for. Welcome to day two of the 2014 League of Legends World Championship. We've got a full day of action as eight teams from around the world will continue to battle it out for a shot at the Summoners Cup. We we're looking live at the National Taiwan University Sports Center just as the Taipei Assassins are actually walking themselves into the venue, getting themselves set up for the first game of the day. This is Gilius as well as Candy Panda SK ready room getting themselves sorted for their match as well. My name is Trevor Quickshot Henry and joining me to lend their League of Legends knowledge to our special world's analyst desk is of course Evil Genius's Mitch Crepo Force Pulls. Kicking it down the line we welcome Complexity's Neil Prolly Hammond, formerly of the LCS, on game net caster Ooh. Christopher <laughs> Monte Cristo Michaels. Formerly of the LCS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. David Freak Turley from the North American LCS. I'm still in it. Welcome to the desk. Yes, guys. All right, just day from day one, we have a lot to discuss. We have seen six games under our belt. I want to ask everybody what your opinions are. I'm going to start with Prolly. You were watching from backstage. What was your takeaway from the games yesterday and the teams that you saw play? I thought kind of the biggest difference and most impressive thing was the non-Western teams' grouping phase. It was really nice that they were efficient with it. When you saw them at Dragon, they weren't just sitting there dancing for vision. Is They group for Dragon, and they took it. They group for mid, and they take mid. And I think that kind of decisive grouping was really important. Monte Cristo? I mean, for me, there weren't a whole lot of surprises. I came in expecting the Korean and Chinese teams to outclass everyone and make a deep tournament run. It's exactly what we saw. I'm still waiting for that upset, guys. I'm still waiting. Well, it might happen today. Well, yeah, I think it, it still has the chance of happening. What I really learned is that the teams were more mortal than I expected. I agree, Samsung White and the rest of the Korean teams likely are going to be heavy favorites throughout the rest of this tournament. But uh, to kind of look at that Samsung White versus EDG game, White was up 8,000 gold 25 minutes in, and then it took them 43 minutes to win the game. And for 18 minutes, they just sat there not knowing how to close a game out anymore, and that's something you can't keep doing in a tournament of this caliber. Really? You weren't impressed by Split Push Zillion? I was super impressed. Right? <laughs> That's a CLG <laughs> special. Yeah. You must have talked about hey, no, it. It's, it's, it's the Korea. back door. It's the back door, man. Oh, sorry. That's it's the so CLG special. Well, let's roll this one along, Crepo. What's your thoughts on day one? I learned that I was wrong. I pitched TSM to win, and sadly they didn't. But yeah, it was a, it was a very close game. I think TSM could have won that if, if they just managed to stall out and just not die until Bjergsen got big enough to split push. But it, it went wrong, you know. Top lane Dyrus got surprised by a really good gank uh, from Insect. And then at the same time, bottom lane, that trade was just beautifully exploited by Uzi. He just saw there was no bubble on them. He just immediately jumped in. Even his support was surprised. So it was ch chasing after him, trying to shield him. But he won that trade so hard. And, and then, yeah, like both side lanes were losing. Like Amazing was pretty much playing Evelyn instead of Jarvan because he was completely invisible. And... <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. 
Ooh, yeah. Harsh words. Right, but, we'll but see if they can... They can win the next time, and I'm, st- I'm still rooting for them. Well, we'll see if uh, Apple Pie shines through. All right, yesterday featured some very incredible plays, but there was one hashtag world's big play to rule them all, and this one came from TPA's very bloody battle against Starhorn Royal Club, and it actually features Wins Lee Sin breezing his way to a triple kill. Thank you very much from at GGC Manasier. It says, it's got to be Wins triple kill against Royal. Win or lose, he went huge for the home crowd. Here's your number one big play. Is Insight going to be able to get away? There's the knockup. A oh, shot from miss. the backside as Jay goes down as well. Corn now at less than half. Zero. Cola. Both the left and the kill left. Wins goes through. I just really liked how incredible everything was. He landed every single Q as well. I actually wish that play were 10 seconds longer as well, because right before that, BB flashes a tidal wave perfectly to like single-handedly kill Uzi. Like the whole thing was amazing. I mean, hashtag not world's big play was the Oriana ultimate, which we probably <laughs> felt very yeah. strong about. It's really hard to to avoid looking at that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. Remember to send us your favorite plays using the hashtag world's big plays and sending them to us at LOL Esports. We also want to pay a tribute to some of the high-level plays that did not result in kills. This is just a good old-fashioned player escaping with their life, and it's much easier said than done at the World Championship. So this is a segment that we're going to kick off called Dem Jukes. So our first one that we're going to be playing comes from Dark Passage versus AHQ. Features some fancy footwork by Westor's Fizz. And right here, watch how good his camera movement is because he actually sees Nami casting the tidal wave and backs off sort of very early on in the cast frame. Manages to sidestep that tidal wave. Yeah, well, this is just really this fist control. He just knows the damage is coming, so he's on and gets out. But really, the most imp- impressive part was indeed sidestepping that tidal wave because uh, if you don't know the lantern, if he clicked that lantern, he would have gotten cancelled there, and he would just wouldn't have been able to catch up. But yeah, he just knew exactly what he was doing, and he was on top of his fizz game. Yeah, we're still on fizz. I think uh, different one of his main champions. Yeah. All right, today the action gets underway with one of the home teams, uh, Taipei Assassins versus SK Gaming from the European LCS. Then the LPL's Edward Gaming takes on Dark Passage, followed by Starhorn Royal Club battling SK. I'm personally looking forward to the TSM versus Taipei Assassins match later in the day, because one of those two teams could be advancing to the quarterfinals. Remember to head over to lolesports.com for a complete schedule and to vote on all of today's matches. You can match your predictions against the guys on the desk. Simply choose the team that you're picking to win, click the thumbs up, and we'll be checking in throughout today's games. Then head over to Twitter. We're asking you one once again, to share your world experience with us. We want to know, how do you, worlds, send us pictures of your viewing parties, how you're showing your team spirit, or just what your desk setup looks like and how you're enjoying the games. Use that hashtag worlds and address them once again to at LOL Esports. We will be combing through some of the best snapshots and send them later in the broadcast. Try beat the guys from Slytherin yesterday. Coming up, we've got our first match of the day with the Taipei Assassins facing off against Europe's SK Gaming. But first, fans have been anxious Anxiously waiting to see the best teams from around the world compete, but they are not alone. Even the pros have players and teams that they're excited to watch and play against. I think that the A team is EDG and the team. Then the B team is TSM and we. I would actually watch uh, EDG just to see if they can pull something off with Simpson White, who come in as top favorites basically. 도적으로 이기고 싶어요 첫 경기부터 저희 팀이 좀 쪼여 들어가는 플레이를 많이 하기 때문에 숨이 숨이 막히게 좀 해주고 싶어요. 이러고我就是那个神送坏的，然后我前面讲过那个Dandy，嗯，Dandy嘛，我觉得他他是送，我觉得打了最好的，结果就送。I haven't seen Nami play too much, but everyone just says that he could potentially be the best AD carry in the world, and he's the best AD carry in China. So really looking forward to see how well he'll do. I think it's always hard to predict uh, which team is going to do well because everyone's always going to give even more at Worlds and you know how much it means to them so it's going to be on a different level.
Welcome back to the 2014 World Championship. We are kicking things off with GPL's Taipei Assassins versus SK Gaming from the European LCS. And the Taipei Assassins will be hungry for a win after their game yesterday that they lost to Starhorn Royal Club despite looking like it was theirs for the taking. Uh, Krepa, I want to start with you. Talk to me a little bit about what TPA did right, or in this case, what they did wrong in not closing out. Yeah, they had a really strong start, but they they just didn't have the ability to close out the game. But at the same time, SK didn't even have the ability to get a lead in that game. So TPA will still have an edge uh, uh, in this matchup, and it'll be really rough for SK to come out on top, unless they have to, like just refound new synergy with with Julius because that it was his first match. Maybe he flicked the switch. Maybe he got some feedback, but. It's going to look really grim for SK. It's going to be a difficult one. I know Wins in particular stepped up. He once again performed in the international stage. Monty, you're quite fond of him as a jungler. Uh, Wins versus Gilius? I, I think it's really hard not to be fond of him as a jungler, especially with his performances yesterday. I mean, we saw he was the big play yesterday, getting that really clean triple kill on Lee Sin. And I think you got to keep him off that champion moving forward. And especially in this matchup, too, if we look at SK's weakness right now, it's a sub jungler and we look at TPA strength it's wins I mean that is a huge disparity in terms of matchup that w in this game and I don't have a whole lot of hope would you even go as far as saying wins is there wind condition wind condition I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh yeah uh, but honestly yeah like Taipei assassins to me are basically the question I had was how good were they because their region is I underrepresented a little bit small there's only a couple of good teams or top teams for them to face and so what we saw was that all their individual skill is there. Wins is one of, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, one of the best junglers at this tournament. The more I think about this team, they feel like a mini Samsung White in that they have this like ludicrously good jungler and their laning phase is good and their late game shot calling was a little bit suspect, right? Because they, they haven't played a lot of top teams who normally will roll over and just die to these guys, right? They 3-0'd the regional, like this is, this is a, like, the GPL region is easy for TPA. And so, <clears throat> Late game is hard for them because they're not used to actually being up against the ropes or having being fought back against. And so throughout this tournament, we'll see that late game improve for them, but they're going to keep those early game strengths. Now let's roll this one over to SK. I know probably you felt quite strongly about Jesus in that mid lane and uh, the difficulty he faced yesterday. Yeah, um, so they got a comfort pick with him, Oriana, which was his most played for a long time. And the kind of problem they had against TSM was he's just not ready for that kind of camp. I don't think TPA will put that kind of camping on him. So as long as he's able to kind of pull the lane, avoid those ganks, and kind of farm up and be that team fight mage he's known for, I think they'll do a lot better today. And do you think the rest of the team is going to be able to sort of match TPA in terms of SK's player? You know, Freddy in the top lane, we've been touting him quite successfully, but he was target banned yesterday. Nidalee and Aatrox taken off the table. Yeah, I don't really think just bans are going to be able to stop Freddy, though. He is a really big playmaker, and a lot of teams are weak against top lane playmakers, so I think they'll be able to capitalize on that. This matchup is also going to be difficult for SK because later in the day they'll be playing Starhorn Royal Club. Confidence is going to be a, a difficulty for them. Um, I think we need to move this one along to the predictions. We've heard some opinions from you guys. So let's see who you actually think is going to walk away with the win. Freak, who's yeah. going to be TPA or SK Gaming? Uh, type A Assassins, I'm a big believer now. Even though they did lose to Royal Club and they're 0-1 in the groups, they look stronger than I expected, so I'm going Type A Assassins for sure. Crepo, you're next. Yeah, pretty much everything Freak said. TPA. Fair enough. <laughs> We're going to move this one along. Probably new guys. kid on the block. Who's going to pick right. up the win and why? Yeah, I will go with TPA purely because SK was really shaky yesterday and it might be really hard for them to pick it up today. But I'm going to do the safe pick and get TPA right now. Yeah, the home crowd playing into their advantage as well. Monte Cristo, is it going to be a TPA clean sweep? Is there anything SK can do to hold them back? Uh, I don't think so with their substitute situation. And the other thing to consider about TPA is when we talk about their poor Baron dancing, they, it wasn't because they lacked wards. In fact, their recall timings, they had all of the tools necessary to be successful. And these are very small tweaks that I think they're going to make over the course of this group stage. And I think we'll see them close stronger from this point forward. Yeah, ironically, they, if they were just were a different side team, their wards would have been perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So I... I I think this is a problem that will be solved. Well, we will find out if it has been solved because according to LLEsports.com, you are also calling this one for TPA. 77%, that is a fairly hefty number. Let's hand this one over to the casters to get our day on the rift started. Thank you very much, guys. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Miller, and with me for our first three matches today are Lee Demon Smith and Sam Kobe Hartman Kensler. And guys, yesterday was epic, but I think today's 
going to be just as amazing. I've got a feeling in my bones. i got a feeling as well, Joe, but I think that's because we're just big bone, mate. That's for sure. <laughs> Could be. Well, I'm right there with you, my big bone <laughs> brothers. Don't worry. So our first game coming into this one going to be... An absolutely massive clash. Absolutely huge clash and could be a decider between maybe trying to fight for that third place, maybe the second place up for grabs, who knows? There's a lot of games to play. We're going to get straight into the game with a look at the starting lineups over on the blue side. Starting out is the GPL champions. They are the Thai Pei Assassins. In the top lane is Achi, wins in the jungle, morning in the mid lane. BB is the AD carry, and Jay alongside him as support. And of course, on the red side, representing the European LCS, it's SK Gaming with Freddy122 in the top lane, Gullius in the jungle, Jezus in the mid lane, and the duo of Candy Panda and N-Rated. Excited to see this one, you know, get started because they talked a lot about bands and, you know, the bands going at Freddy. That Those will probably be expected once again. But there is an interesting story here with the mid laners. Even though you don't really think of star mid laners when you think of Morning and mm. Jez's, they have those overlapping champion pools of Orianna and Ziggs that could mm. be fought over. And one of the big things in SK's uh, defeat by TSM was camping mid. Uh, and Wins is also going to be able to do a strategy like that. Uh, we'll have to see if Gilius tries to switch something up to try and counter it. Yeah, and it, actually, if you saw yesterday, there was a tweet from Jess that said, you know, I was just so used to Svenska and knowing what I needed in the mid lane. Uh -huh. I wasn't putting the calls out for Gilius. So it, it kind of felt responsible that, you know, obviously Bjergsen and Amazing were basically sitting on that mid lane. And, he just wasn't calling for help. He was expecting it to just come to him. And obviously, when you're playing with a substitute, that is the problem. Yeah, just like Prolly alluded to, it's up to the laners to also call for help for the junglers. Mm. And that's the interesting thing here, because I was having a little sneaky peek in SK Gaming's <laughs> warm-up room today, just to see how the general mood was. They actually seem pretty happy with themselves. It's not like they're down in the dumps. They certainly have to pick things up here, though, as we start to move into this game. And the bands, as Nidalee will be banned away. We could have called that one a mile off. Freddy, of course, brilliant Nidalee player. Zillion taken away over the other side, and Zillion being ah. a very strong pick so far. Well, very much sitting on exactly what TSM did yesterday. Nidalee and Aatrox focused heavily on Freddy. Pull him off his game. He is the shot caller. You know, he pulled out Mundo yesterday. Not to great success. Another top lane ban. Maokai finally coming out. Alistair was also taken away. So really, the top lane is pretty sparse the right now. Top lane is definitely loaded up with bans here. We'll have to see. Because SK, they do like to have Freddy on something that can split push. Still are options open for them. And Rise has gone through. That's been the next tier in top lane picks here. After all of these have been banned out. So we see Kha'Zix, the first pick for the Taipei Assassins, will of course land in the hands of Wins, the, probably the man to look at in this Taipei Assassins lineup. He's played Kha'Zix three times so far this season, has a 100% record as well with that Kha'Zix. We'll see now what SK Gaming decides to go for in their first picks. And well, top lane, of course, is an interesting point for us at this stage because of the fact that there are so many bands. Will that mean that SK Gaming get try at least to get something early on the board? They very well could, or they could try and leave it for later, because they do have last pick here and try and counter. But really, I do want to go back to that first pick you're talking about with wins, because Kha'Zix is such a strong early jungler here. He's really risen to prominence with all of the nerfs to the other strong dueling junglers. And this is really going to be one of Wynn's most recent favorite champions that he's on, so he's very, very comfortable here. Once again, the Sona, though, very surprising. I saw your face, dude, man. Yeah, this is something, you know, we were discussing after the TSM game, of course, you know, how it really didn't work out for them in that bottom lane. You know, the Sona picked Wild Turtle. He was dominated against the Starhorn Royal Club, but against SK Gaming, they put the moves on that bottom lane pairing of Candy Panda and Rated with Sona. Yeah, a lot of the support mains are sort of calling Sona like Nami Light here. It's a little bit sort of a weaker version of Nami. And uh, Nami is currently up right now, so he's opted for this. this is definitely a N-rated special. He's put a lot of time in on this champion. This is for SK's team fighting. They want to make use of the crescendo. They just feel like the tidal wave is too slow. Got to be a big one for them here. If we look over to TPA, it looks like they'll be picking a mid laner here for Morning. Syndra once again for him, which kind of falls a little bit outside of his normal pool. You mentioned that earlier. Him and Jezus have a very much overlapping champion pool. They also took oh. <laughs> Lucian here for BB. Yeah, and it was also, we saw Ari finally locked in for Jezus. This is the champion I feel he should have been playing yesterday. It is probably arguably his best champion, honestly. Six and one on yeah. it throughout the uh, summer split. 
fantastic champion, but back to Morning, obviously playing Syndra yesterday. It was the first time we've seen him play it, because Chowie, of course, is the mm -hmm. substitute for TPA. He can play at this World Championships if they require him. Exactly. And something that TPA were really big on in, in their interviews is that they've changed up a lot of strategies, and they've brought multiple strategies for the different teams that they've been researching here. So Syndra, a big part of that. However, we did see he's a little uncomfortable on the champion. It's It takes a bit of practice to start aiming those stuns, because those are uh, two key clicks rather than just a single key click for your stun this time and the accuracy was a little bit off that could open up windows for Jez's to go for those kills because Ari can dance circles around you if you miss your stun on Syndra then you'll be a sitting duck and it shows the faith that TPA I think have in Morning in the fact that he's not played it Chowie is the Syndra player if the plan is to play Syndra you'd expect maybe that Chowie would be the one to lead the way but they played brilliantly yesterday Unfortunately, lost out in that game, but showed some real good signs. We did see Jarvan picked in here for Gilius, a champion that he's played multiple times in the Challenger series. Of course, he's now officially an LCS player with Unicorns of Love having uh, qualified from the promotion tournament. On the other side, Rise and Janna were the two final picks for TPA. So they have the double AP comp, but it's not like they're lacking uh, attack damage threats here because Wins especially has been very, very dangerous on Kha'Zix. And BB once again on the Lucian, very comfortable with this champion, played it yesterday. They're also bringing the Janna, so we'll have to see if they listen to any sort of the analysis yesterday and he goes for Mikhail's earlier rather than going with the Medjai's. But really the Mikhail's would have to be used to get somebody who gets caught by Ari to safety. Interesting team comps from both of these teams, honestly, because you've got a mix between a mid and a late game on both sides, honestly. I mean, obviously, clearly BBJ down the bottom lane, they're going to be pushing the towers, but Candy Panda, when he gets going later on with the Tristana, will be strong towards him. <laughs> of course, then you've also got the Rise in there, he's going to be massive against the Mundo, Mundo's going to be massive towards then. It's a definite mix between this one. I think we're looking towards a longer game than we're expecting here. Yeah, they are fairly balanced here. Uh, we've heard so much about the Mundo and Tristana combos. When teams pick both of these up, they just have ridiculous scaling on the front line and in the back line for their team. But you can never count out Rise. We've seen how ridiculous he does get later. And let's be honest here. I mean, we're talking about two teams who have traditionally gone very, very long in terms of their game. So can't count that one out. But now that the players have decided on their champions, who do you guys think is going to win? Let us know by tweeting hashtag TPA win or SK win to at LOL Esports. We'll find that one out as we get in game. Of course, it was a 77% vote for TPA. Obviously, massive favorites here in the stadium. They're on home soil, and we'll see if that advantage plays into their game. Yeah, I mean, the fact is SK are using a substitute. Whether they're going to continue throughout the groups, of course, Svenska will be out of play after today. This is the last two games. He's had a three-game ban, so we'll see whether he comes in, whether they stick with Gilius. You know, I said to Freddy, I saw him just before this match, and he was like, wish him good luck, and he said, we're sure as hell going to need it. <laughs> we'll see how it works out for them. Yeah, and I do like Kha'Zix in this matchup just because it's a bit easier for Wins to outplay Gilius if he is able to juke the knockup from Jarvan then it's 100% going to be uh, one skirmish, four wins. And that early game, if it does go again in favor of TPA, then really the things that we do have to worry about is looking at how they finish out the game. Because yesterday, they had such a great lead, but they kind of made that classic James Bond villain mistake where they've got him <laughs> tied up. They've won pretty much. They've got him tied up on the floor. They've got a gun to his head, but they don't finish him off. Instead, they stand walking around and they tell him just how good their planning was to get to this point. By that point, it's too late though. James escapes and everything goes down the drain. Don't get Look at this though, face check. Oh, face check going in there, Air Raid is going down in the exhaust. Use only the Ignite's going, BB, surely one more shot will do it. It's Jay that picks up first, the Candy Panda walks away to the tower, but that is a straight up face check. And that is another early, early lead here for TPA. The money, though, it went to Jay. So it's not as bad for SK as it could have been. A first blood over to BB would be a horrendous start. Let's see what Jay goes for this time. That may just fuel his Medjai's counter this time. And disastrous start for SK Gaming. And this is where they in theory should still be at their strongest teamwork wise is this bottom lane candy panda and rated been impressive together throughout the last couple of splits and just not what they would have wanted and certainly won't help their confidence out also i feel showed their hand in terms of level one very early on with jesus 
skilling up his orb rather than, you know, just waiting for a little while in case anything happened and maybe taking a charm. Spotted by Morning. We thought that was it for level one, but the face check giving first blood over to the Taipei Assassins. And Jess is going very aggressive there onto Morning. You can see both of them starting with that door and drink. So we'll see how this mid lane does develop in the end. But it's standard lanes, Kobe, here with the 2v2 down bottom and the rise versus Mundo up top. Look at this trading wow. right here. As soon as BB jumps in, Jay puts on the shield. Great harass. Gets the double shot with the extra AD there. Chases them off of the minion line. This is how the Lucian Tristana match is really supposed to go. He gets that boing down. The first blood actually translated into boots, so not that big of a deal for the combat effectiveness of the early trades in the bottom lane. Interesting to see how this one works out. This, it's interesting, more importantly for me to see Sona coming back here because there was a reason he fell away in the 2014 season was because the changes in the bottom lane made the supports a little bit squishy because everything got a little bit more aggressive down there. And we're already seeing them rating ticking a lot of harassment from BB&J. Well, I, I expect to see much more aggression from BB&J because of the assist money that BB got. He got three potions now, so he can continue to trade over and over again and sustain up. Using that extra attack damage from the Janna shield, uh, as well as the shield to soak up damage itself, he can sit there and sustain right along with Sona. Telegraph gank in the top lane. Gilius gets spotted. BB once again is going in. Candy Panic trading back with this one. The Howling Gale preventing any more damage done. SK are not backing down too heavily on this one. They want to trade. And I'm not sure that it's a bad decision for them as well with that Sona in there to keep the heals coming in for them. Obviously, BB, as you mentioned, got himself a few more pots, but has since worked through those. So. We'll see how that one uh, all develops for you. Currently, CS pretty level as BB oh. once again going to go in. Howling Gale will come through, but not connecting onto Candy Panda. And a very aggressive bottom lane so far. Yeah, and these Howling Gales, like you kind of want the Howling Gale to time when you're going in with your ADK rather than right after the trade is over. Yeah. Seems to be continually BB starting the exchange and then the Howling Gale sort of ending it there. Not quite perfectly on point. But really, again, let's take another look at the junglers, because once again, Gilius trying to make something happen earlier. You got a lot of criticism for not making enough action early, whereas Wins, he's been hard farming the jungle there with Kha'Zix. He's very calm, he's not trying to rush into anything, and he's a little bit ahead of Gilius now, just because Gilius has been trying more things and sitting in the bushes. And um, Jezus has been unable to really get in there so far and do much to Morning. He's sat all the way back there behind that midway point of the map, making sure that he doesn't get in trouble. Meanwhile, Freddy taking a bit of a beating in this top lane, but he is ahead by a good chunk of CS. Yeah, Gilius, just looking at him, trying to take a look around. He's he's desperate to try and create a gank. He's been running around the top, the bottom, the mid, looking for anywhere to create an opportunity. And as he said, Wins is just happy farming right now. Yeah, so this is one of the dangers when even if you you know you get some criticism for you know a slow performance last game, it's hard for a jungler to instantly change their style. If you instantly try and turn into an early attacking, early ganking jungler, uh, then a lot of the times you're gonna have to work on the timing for those ganks because you can see there he wasted a lot of time sort of sitting in the bushes uh, just because he felt like he had to get something happening and now wins he's already been back to purchase he's got wards already on the map down right now and the sustain of his sight stone completed yeah it's not like these junglers have some magic switch that they can just flip and you know reverse their entire year style wins is down on this bottom side of the map uh -oh. and Raiden actually moving in there with the ward he's gonna take a big amount of damage will in fact flash away there back towards his turret so wins coming down okay no kill but he's forced the supports flash yeah, to pull that one out it does mean wins is gonna back away so first aggression we see from wins already causes one summoner spell to go down in that mid lane there is a rather large gap starting to appear in terms of CS. 52 to 37 already. Both have just been back to buy. So Morning building a big advantage over Jezza's early on. And that is very worrisome because look at the wards that Wins decided to place. He placed them over by this blue buff for the second blue buff spawn. If your mid laner is already ahead, this opens up the opportunity for assassinating Jezza's when he goes to pick up that second blue buff handoff. This could be 
the makings of a well-laid trap here from TPA if Wins heads over there and tries to get in position. You can see Jez has sort of had the same thought, though. He just places a defensive ward over that wall into the river uh, to sort of watch that avenue. And, as you can see, it's just a defensive handoff of their own blue buff. It's a matter of time. We'll see whether TPA decided to swing straight down there. They did start, obviously, their own blue early on, which means the red will be spawning, which is, it seems to be where Wins is going at the moment, so they're not going for it just yet. A little bit of a roam from Jezza's, looking to go further down, getting a vision, He's taking a peek towards the race. He hasn't spotted anything yet. Meanwhile, down this bottom, despite all the heavy trading back and forth, the actual CS between the two, BB and Candy Panda, is pretty even. Oh, Freddy, you're going to do some decent damage. Can he finish off a kill, though? See, Archie got himself that tier oh. stacking you know, up. Wins is now moving in. So those wards earlier on. It's Gilius oh. coming down into the middle. Ultimate from Jezus as well. Can't quite get over. Gilius is going to go down. Morning does fall. And that gives the double buff over. Wins going to dive onto the top of Jezus. Oh. Has he got the damage to finish him off? Flash actually onto the other side. He needs one more Q, surely. Just oh. down from Jezus. I think that's oh. going to be it. Avoid spikes do land. But Ooh. not quite enough damage from Wins. Yeah, they were going for setting up that attack sort of in the blue buff corridor handoff, but Gilius had different plans. He was just going straight for the gank. They weren't trying to hand it off. As soon as Ari hit level six, they wanted to get that kill. Morning did a great job of getting the first blood before he went down, though. Does result in the blue buff steal here, because wins the last jungler oh, left low. standing. Oh, Shendo goes down. Candy Pana jumps in, but a quick ultimate from Jay blows them all away. And while all that play was begun by SK, it's TPA that come out on top. However, Wins took a lot of damage there. Their jungler extremely low. SK take the opportunity. They're going to push this dragon. Oh, this is dangerous. Candy Panda down at half HP. and rated not exactly much healthier. Jezus has come back in. Don't forget those double buffs there for him and available. No spike to win. The That's a three-man stun coming up. SK do manage to get Dragon. Zephyr goes towards Candy Panda. They're trying to get away. Gilly is going to be back on to win. Completely worth it for TPA there. Not only did they get the kills and the double buffs back, but they have complete control of mid so they can answer objectives as well. Big, big pickup from TPA here. SK trying to force a play. They're trying to create something, and TPA just have answers for them every step of the way. The entire play was begun by Gilius and Jezus in that mid lane. Everything has just ricocheted out of their way, out of their control. Candy Panda down the bottom. He's going to back off, but TPA just gained a whole chunk of gold and all of the assists across the board. Everybody benefited from everything now. All right, so we'll take another look. Make sure here <laughs> there is no smite for win. So this is not a smite fight. This is 100% for Gilius. However, he uses his flag and drag on the dragon. So he has no escape after this. Cooldown's not going to be there. He's a sitting duck. Yes, they secured the dragon, but that's going to be two kills and the double buffs going back over to morning. Yeah, and he's now going to become even more of a problem. He's 20 CS ahead as a start. Got those two kills. Athenes is done for him. Something that Jezus has not been able to achieve, uh, achieve as of yet. <laughs> Cheese? That's also possible. Feeling hungry, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Big bone and we all just, that. We <laughs> just Cheese started today, guys. Um, if you look at the AD carries and their items, Avarice played BF Sword was a start for Candy Panda. So mixing it up a little bit on that front. Other side, BB not messing around here. He's got pickaxe as well as the BF sword. Jezus has fell quite far behind morning as well. Double buff was picked up during that. That's going to be clear out in a moment. Gilius did just have a peek and wonder whether he could get near them, but 90 CS to 66, two kills to the one. It is all going morning's favor. And you know, we were questioning before this tournament began whether he could do it, whether he could turn this around because when we saw him at Katowice, he had that one big showing on Ziggs, but outside of that, he was not that impressive. It seems, though, Chawi has been taking him through some training school for Syndra. And, you know, the game plan for the next five minutes here from TPA should be very, very clear. Well, yeah, we do have Gilius sitting in this bush right now, and Achi may be in a little bit more trouble than he thinks. Let's see how well Freddy can actually bait this. He doesn't want to give it away. Oh, oh, what a flash, but there is a cataclysm. Leaves him trapped inside. He's turning the damage round on towards Gilius. He's just at less than half HP, but the damage is there. It's Freddy that picks up the kill on his Mondo. 
Yeah, not much he can do there. I mean, he flashes the knockup only to get hit by the Cataclysm, and that oh, means you're oh. going to be stuck in there forever. Let's see how well this dive works out, though. They're sitting on a ward, and because top one, teleports in. Wow, well, that crescendo was way too early from Enrated. The rest of the team reacting. Jesus goes in, he gets on towards wins. We can see Morning flash away. They will only get that one kill. Again, if that crescendo would have delayed a little bit longer, I think they may have got more from that one. It wasn't a bad reaction from SK Gaming, though. They saw them coming in. Instant TP from Freddy to get down there. Ended up getting themselves a kill. Yes, they burnt a decent amount to actually make that Whoa. happen. As BB going aggressive again in bottom lane. Candy Panda has to be careful here. They get rid of the minions. That'll keep them safe for now. Yeah, really, it was the 100% perfect reaction for them because they had two members up top, so they didn't need both of them to shove it into the turret. They left the jungler up there, and they instead teleport down with Freddy. They got the advantage because no way Achi can teleport to answer. He's dead. And they did the turret teleport as well. Oh, oh. double stun comes in. Candy Panda in trouble. Ultimate used by Morning is not quite enough to take him down. And SK do manage to get away. They will lose a turret, but their lives are safe for now. Double flash used there by the SK bottom lane, and it means that the tower is going to be falling here. TPA picked that one up, and a 1500 gold lead is now settled for them. Chez is not able to come around for this time, and again, Morning just moving around the map nicely to start off those plays on the tower. All right, so let's get back to that clear game plan for TPA. Because they have this early lead, their mid lane is much stronger, their bottom lane is much stronger, Wins himself is much stronger. So this jungle, he should completely take over the blue side jungle of SK. That should be TPA territory right now. They set up an outpost there, litter it with wards, and they could continue to control all the consecutive dragons that are about to come up. One minute on the next one, they hand off this blue, then head over down to bottom side. Could be a very uh, easy pickup. This is a tricky situation for Gilius. I don't think he realizes just how many members of TPA are nearby if he were to try go for something. Freddy instead wisely tells him to back away. And there's no gang opportunities. SK gathering a little around the mid lane here. Dragon is up in 50 seconds and they want to start trying to gain control of the Serpentine River. Let's see here because Achi still has his teleport as well. If they send Achi back up to deal with Freddy and sort of shove this, this top lane wave as hard as he can, then yeah, this dragon should be TPAs for the taking. Freddy's not going back right now, so pretty much no way he could join that fight. If you look at some CS numbers here, though, it's TPA that will definitely oh, leave going. How'd it go? Oh, no. Oh, little bit <laughs> off there. Slightly off. The ward was down, so he had vision and expecting, I think, SK to move a little further out. But if you look at TPA, just as you said earlier, Kobe, get that vision down in the blue side of SK's jungle and really start to dominate that side of the map. They've got the vision. But they're now backing away to leave it again. Yeah, that being said, Freddy did take that time to back. So he backed just in time here. Dragon is available, but he's heading towards the area. And Ryze does take towers very slowly because he's pretty much all mana at this point in the game. He's just got his rod completed. Uh, so if he stays up in that top lane, it will take him a while to earn the objective for TPA. However, free minions for Ryze in itself is a pretty big win for them. If TPA can sort of delay SK around this dragon, then that will slowly gain them advantage. Let's see how decisive SK are around this dragon, though. They decide to force something. Because slowly but surely, Achi up top gaining little leads. They may just choose the opportunity to swing around. They can see there's three members pinned across in the jungle and rated with the ward down does keep them separated they're miles it away is. from this one they're gonna start it off and there's a lot of damage done on that dragon already tpa too late for the party wins is gonna have to jump in no it's sk's taking it and that equals up the goal okay so they just decide to play it safe and keep rise up top he will get this turret eventually extremely low probably gonna need one more minion wave up there and he should be able to get it before freddy is actually able to defend See if Freddy chooses the TP. I don't think he will with that win, uh, minion wave, is what they call winning in. Winion wave, also. Uh, and they are going to take that tower. And there's the vote. 1% of you extra in that swing. 78 to 22%. Oh. All right, forget that. 8 to 2% then. So big swing here for the Taipei Assassins. And honestly, SK, yes, they're a little bit behind in this game, but they've done well to control the dragon so far. If they can keep doing that, 
and obviously start to scale things up with that Mundo and the Tristana. This is by no means a done deal. As SK here pushing that middle lane. Yeah. Morning and Archie are going to come in, but it might just be too late. The tower's going down. Ah, yeah. Just a one more little hit. It's all they required. Winds goes aggressive on this one. I think they should be safe. There is no tower, remember. And the charm being flung out by Jezus just as a warning shot. It does give them a little breather, though. TPA. This is the question, though. They were a little indecisive yesterday when they had that lead over Star on Royal Club. They have no lead right now. It is equal. Now Blue Buff just gets dragged across by Morning. That's going to get taken away. Another one stolen away from Jezzers, but it hasn't hampered him too much just yet. There is just now the completed static Shiv as well for Candy and Panda. So that's more good news for SK. They've got extra wave clear right now much needed. It will supplement Ari's wave clear and they can hold out. They can try and wait until Candy Panda actually completes his Infinity Edge. Right now he's got the biggest pieces of it. TPA though looking like they may try to get vision control over the top side of the map. Let's not forget that epic game against Royal Club where they did get great control over the map but were unable to finish off that game. We'll see what they actually do here. I said vision control, not really much of it did end up going down. One inside the Baron Pit, one by the Wraith Camp that took the Sims being cleared actually by Gilius. So that means not too much gain from that little push onto that side of things. Maybe actually going to go down bottom. Candy Panda has no turret behind him, but not sure they want to fight at this point. So something we've talked about, obviously we've covered SK for the entire season. They've always been very slow in the lane phase. They're coming out of the lane phase, equal on what? gold. What? Jesus, that's a deep dive. Morning gonna get caught out crescendo in there. They only need to hit the tower once, but it doesn't matter. They take down the mid laner. And what over to Freddy about to say? That's the tower gone down. They're gonna back yeah. away from this one. Freddy's coming around the side. They may still keep pushing this mid lane. Yeah, this is dangerous for TPA. We see here the BB being forced away by Candy Panda. Minion's been taken down slowly but surely there, which means that TPA will hold on this turret for now. Morning gonna be respawning back in, but that leaves Jezus now at 3-1-0. And we saw the CC train there really coming in. Jarvan diving on top into the crescendo, into an easy charm. You just don't escape from that. There's Jay actually going very aggressive. TP uh -oh, from Archie as well. Henry is not going out of that one. Yeah. What gives his life up there? The question is, will TPA turn this and run down the mid? Exactly. They've got one kill, but it was just on the support. How much can they really gain mid? There's Static Shiv, Tristana, plus Ari wave clearing. Uh, SK have a pretty decent chance of defending here. Okay, it's just a, just a stray charm on the support. Not explosive because he is gone with the Athene's route, not rushing for the death fire. So, just a couple of minions there, but they are being kept at bay. There's a good chunk of damage. Killius going very well. And just gets destroyed where he stands. Don't think he was on the same page as the rest of his team there. SK happy to just hold off the tower. Freddy having to use his ultimate to keep himself alive. Morning continuing to put pressure on them. Now they're going to keep pursuing here. Crescendo is still not up. And SK, they are just simply trying to clear some vision here. They're trying to clear the waves. But TPA, they're not giving up. Pushing straight through onto this one. A big stun could be all it takes. Oh, morning there. He gets three men. They blow up the AD carry. No, not the AD carry. The mid lane. It was Jesus that went down. Candy Panda oh. half HP. There is Monsoon News just to top TPA back up. Don't think they want to tank the turret right oh, now. They will. I'll be proven wrong on that one. They go straight in onto it with wins. And that will be the inner turret going to TPA along with the kill. Morning with a couple of good kills. And it does earn them the secondary turret here. SK with a couple of little slip ups there. Gilius uh, going a little aggressive. I do have to commend him though, he's going for uh, combat effectiveness with his build. He's got the extra giant spell there and he's got the Hex Drinker to try and protect him from the same thing happening again. The full burst there from Morning. Next time around he'll have that shield. I don't think he had that completed when he got hit the first time. So barring the crazy jump in from Gilius, back to my point, my trail of thought was when SK come out of lane, generally even, the late game is there. That's their area of expertise. That is where they tend to shine. But Gilius jumping in like that, not quite on the same page, and that is the differential of having a substitute on your team. But do not write SK off. It's only a 3,000 gold difference. I think they were a little caught off by the pure aggression that TPA showed in that mid lane push. Of course, Jezus completely caught out. Then big stuns from Morning are really on point this game. 
And it's going to have to be, you know, N rated and these crescendos answering. 12 seconds here left for Dragon. Freddy does have his teleport ready for this if SKA want to try and rush in there. But TPA have cleaned out the entire river for Vision. And rushing into Fog of War against Syndra is very dangerous. They're going to do it though. Gilius runs right up. This is a very brave move from SK Gaming. Dragon's going to go late. down. Are they going to try and close in? TPA are inside of the Dragon Pit. It's Freddy that goes in. Winds is actually going low and will fall down. Send Ray to the picks of that kill. And TPA wow. they're stuck in the back. There's a cataclysm. Jezus has caught off BB around the backside. He's going to get the kill. Oh, goes down. Meanwhile, in the pit, Gilius and Rayton. Candy Panda all low. Well, they get three kills. Make that four. Whoa. And now Archie's in He's trouble. He's tagged. It's going to be in there. Freddy's going to run in there. There's another. The one. He got slow just as he flashed them. Oh, and the oh, minions. The minions. <laughs> <laughs> well, ignore it. They shouldn't chase. They should just go straight for mid. It looks like they won't well, have a Baron looks like instead. they're it on this Baron instead. And it is just a rise, so that should be Baron for SK. Now, that fight, it looked like TPA just called every man for himself. And they tried to scramble out of the Dragon Pit. Wins just jumped headlong by himself to try and get out of there. And everybody's left scrambling inside the pit. This is definitely going to be the Baron here for SK. What a huge swing. So the big thing I want to check, we're hopefully going to get the replay in a moment. I'm pretty sure the majority of the flashes were down for TPA, so they were stuck in that pit. And check Freddy. Freddy just they zones panic, them yeah. out. Yeah, they just kind of all panic inside. Wins just, he jumps headlong for and raided, and everybody else is still just scrambling inside the pit. Freddy's the gatekeeper here, the bouncer at the front of the dragon pit. He's not letting anybody in. Nobody's got IDs on them. They're all stuck inside. BB almost gets a kill over the wall, but he doesn't get it, and it turns into the four kill plus Baron. What a huge, huge swing here for the Mundo Tristana team. Worth noting there, though, was Jezus' position. He went around the back of the Dragon Pit and said, OK, yeah. if you've got a flash, feel free to use it. <laughs> He's Come in here, and I'll kill Arms you. Arms open. Almost went down to BB, but almost doesn't count. He got the kill. He's now got a DFG in there as well. So he's got a lot of potential to be singling out these targets. And TPA, we saw it yesterday that the later the game went on, the more decidedly dodgy some of their calls became. And that one was just not on point for them. They've fallen behind now in gold. They're up against an SK gaming team who now have Baron on them. Some big items were completed in there, including the War Mogs for Freddy, that DFG they already mentioned. Infinity Head and Shift now there for Candy Panda. Yeah, and actually being behind this time as the game gets later for TPA is a really big problem because with their team, it's very hard for anybody to get back to a late game Tristana. As the range scales up further and further, Candy Panda becomes extremely safe and it really has to be a positional mistake from Candy Panda for him to get caught in this. As K though, and Raider gonna have to blow his flash. This is interesting play from TPA. They are being the aggressive one. SK have Baron, but TPA are the ones that are being aggressive. SK is silly realizing it, thinking, what are you doing, guys? We have the upper hand right now. We have the power. Now they finally grouped up. TPA do back out in time, but he did force the flash from N. Rainey. He had Crescendo available if they piled in, though. Forced the flash and bought some extra time, taking very, very crucial seconds off of that Baron buff timer for them. All morning. No. Not going to get chased down here. We do see Gilius that. coming across. Flag yeah. and drag was used. He gets the ward down. Spots Jay in morning though. And quickly chooses to back away. But so five members pushing down the bottom while BB pushes mid. And when you're facing a team like this that has the upper hand, you don't try and defend. You try and trade. Whenever your opponent is much stronger than you, you try and work around their power. TPA, they take this opportunity, try and shove up mid to try and answer back some advantage. They probably won't be able to get a lot of turret damage, but they did shove the wave all the way up and moved away from the dangerous zone of the map. And if we look at the story of SK Gaming, specifically in the summer split, they never had a particularly impressive laning phase. It was all about building the strength, trying not to fall too far behind, and relying on the late game and the calls. And I almost feel that Gilius fits the late game SK uh -huh. style better than Svenskeren does. Mm. Yeah, because Svenskeren was very much all about Stealing the kills for himself sometimes, honestly. He was uh, very much a, a selfish jungler. I think he is safe to call him that. We'll see how it works out because 
now that they're out of the lane phase, that's that's the time when a sub is the, the, the really the handicap for you. Now they're in together as a five, they're grouping as a five. You can't really do too much wrong as a sub, other than maybe making a positional error. He's with the team. He is the big tank in the front. Well, obviously, Mondo will be the big tank. But <laughs> for now, when he's split pushing, he's he will be the main man that blocks them out. So yeah, the, exactly. the handicap is gone from them right now. He's going to be the big cataclysm to group people up. He's the one who's trying to get people in the cataclysm for N-rated to ultimate. If they get that combo off, then it's very easy for Candy Panda to stay safe on the back line and just dish out damage the entire fight. Freddy is become yeah. enormous. We just saw the culling going on him, the tower's hitting him, and didn't even take a thousand hit points off him. That tower was taken down, full on tanked out. The Baron buff had worn off, but they just walked in and took it. This is why you know, a lot of people have been sort of getting tired of seeing Tristana over and over. The Tristana and Mundo, I always pointed out, the strongest scaling tank and AD carry. It's gonna get very, very difficult for any answers. Freddy just stands on the front line, takes all of the hits. The only thing that can get back to Kenny Panda Ooh. is a morning stun. Sinter stun will go right through him. If they can get that and capitalize, then maybe they'll be able to uh, swing this back in their favor. But that's very tricky because they're basically hoping that morning can land the stun and BB goes in. But with Candy Panda on Tristana, he can jump on his face. Jezus can spirit rush on towards him. So it's going to be very hard for BB to land the perfect position. And they're going to try it again here. This is going to be another stun try and start out by Morning. Oh, gets the knock up onto Freddy. They're going to try and do some damage to him. Any bit of damage that he can really get onto that health bar is a bonus for them at this stage. But SK deciding to move towards the Dragon. TPA here have cleared out the wave may decide to push up mid look at that they see nothing on that bottom side of the river sk had moved up to the brush decide though that they do want that dragon they will be able to take that down baron's coming up in one and a half minutes time which is pretty much the perfect amount of time here for sk to back spend everything that they've just gained with those pushes and be back in time for baron and relocate their own wards uh, tpa took that opportunity they know they were that they were going to give up this dragon so they at least went to try and put down some vision by Baron, but it's very sparse vision that they have down there. And uh, it will be very easy for SK to clear that out. That being said, they can, again, shove up the lane and then just gain control of that entire side of the jungle. Dragon was what turned things around last time. That led to a big massacre by SK of TPA and picks up that Baron afterwards. That will be up in just 40 seconds time. There is good vision in there for TPA, but I feel SK will no doubt come through and sweep out that. You can see a pink ward on end rated. Jezus gets himself his blue buff. He's going to be happy. And the next fight may well be a bit of a dance around the Baron. I feel that is most likely going to happen here. It's been somewhat of the European style. I think TPA, I mean, they showed it yes against Royal Club that they're not scared of doing that Baron dance either. So seems like a likely option to actually happen in this one. For now, Freddy just pushing that top wave out to have it going in their favor. TPA have already got a good bit of coverage down on their side of that Baron pit. SK now finally starting to move in with a few pink wards once oh. again though. TPA is saying on the track, Gilius, is he gonna oh. face check? Freddy came in and that scared TPA off. That was nerves, that was nerves. They, they could have gone for that and they were just like, is this the <laughs> right play? I not sure and they rightly backed away because Freddy came around that corner at just the right time tricky tricky moments here for both teams yeah setting up traps with only four of your members oh, oh. Jay oh Cataclysm comes down yeah, one soon one more shot. There it is. Back. Candy Panda gets the kill the calling wasn't enough to really return much there onto SK Gaming and that gives them a big advantage yes you can argue it's just the support down and rated here oh to play the bait that's a good stun from morning his three of them gets in rated right though Jez is gonna go in towards Archie and actually using his ultimate there so they may want to try and move forward from this one Gilly is trying to get in another good stun comes out from morning but SK have push them back and can just go back to Baron. Yeah, perfectly played there by SK. They get the vision and then they go for the picks. Gilius especially, great job jumping on that Janna. They get the important cooldowns out and the extra kill. Then Jezus goes for a pick. He does a oh, nice side finish it. Crescendo comes out, but maybe gets the smite out there. That's gonna be Gilius that picks it up, but SK is taking very low in the pin here. Candy Panda jumps back in, but it's TPA coming out on top. Have they got the damage? They damn well have. 
Jesus gets picked up. Beasy goes huge. Freddy, the last man standing. And it's going to be an ace for TPA in the home ground. What a turnaround once again. They quickly need to shove up mid and try and get that inhibitor down. The wave is halfway there, so they'll probably at least be able to get the turret. Let's see here, 20 seconds. They don't have BB. Crucial kill there at the very end for Freddy to be able to take down BB. We'll make this push much slower. And they've not got much help either from that one. You see Jay and Wins trying to dodge off there on the damage that they're going to take. Minion Wave comes in to make it easier. They're going to take the turret, they're leaving. They don't want to stick around and risk that ace that they've just got being turned around onto them. TPA going to back away and this game back and forth. Let's have a look at that Baron fight again. All right, so the oh, fall oh. Geno and BB with the beautiful sidestep right there. A great stun. Let's see here. They corner them inside. Wins jumps right into. Jez is on the outside. Can't lend enough help. And then the beautiful cleanup here from Wins. BB, this is the point. Freddy flashes in to finish him off. And that right there saved them the actual in-hip kill. Yeah, wow. So, we got a game on our hands, ladies and gentlemen. We are back in it, and it is just a 2,000 gold differential. Baron completely wiped off the board. Nobody keeping that one for SK Gaming. And it is all square once again. Five towers to four, TPA taking that one Man. inhibitor to it down. The question is, how will SK react? They had the upper hand. They still technically do in terms of gold, but that's definitely going to put a scare amongst them. Yeah, I mean... Basically, they didn't get any use out of the crescendo because everyone was on Baron and uh, BB, in fact, even dodged it. So next time they have a team fight, SK probably still have the upper hand here as long as they are together and they're able to actually make use of all their crowd control. The fact that they were all focused on dealing damage with Baron was really the only reason that TPA were able to clean that one up. And they still have the gold lead here. So this is why they're continuing to pressure mid. If they just play it sort of solidly here, they should be able to take down. Well, they siege down this turret. We'll see whether they do manage to stick to it. Morning, trying to follow through. I want you to get your stats head on you. Channel the inner freak right now, because I want to see how does it compare? The fact that Candy Banner did have to go for that third defensive item. He's only got the IE and the static shift compared to BB, of course, who went towards that last Whisper. So it is going to hurt them a bit because they've got uh, the Mundo and Jarvan with, you know, Jarvan adds a little bit of damage, semi-damage, but really it's going to be about the solid plan from this team anyway. This team's not about uh, having to rush things. So Candy Pennant just playing defensively, not worrying about uh, the actual long uh, DPS over time in this team fight because their composition is so safe. This is sort of like the... Uh, Greek Phalanx here for SK. <laughs> Can you find pushing out that bottom lane is a dragon that will be a freebie. But I say freebie, we look at TPA and they're actually pushing up the mid lane right now. They've got Freddy to try and hold them away. The inhibitor, of course, is open. And SK tried to move in from the side. Spotted by a good pink ward there by TPA. And TPA are going to keep watching from this one. Freddy actually going to use his ultimate to get that region in. Kuli comes out from the side. Are they going to go for this one? Morning isolated on the top side. And actually, yeah, oh. Gullius went for him. But the rest of the team went down middle. Bit of coordination problems there. But they get the kill in the end. Candy Panda picks that one off. That's a lot of damage gone from TPA. That's a big, big pickup by Gillias there. The sub coming out huge and singling out that mid laner. Very well worked for them. There was no flash available for Enraged either, so he couldn't get that flash crescendo because four of them were stacked so tightly that it would have worked perfectly. Instead, though, SK taking advantage and pushing down that inner turret. That's gone. There's no way that they can have that one. The question is whether they can actually defend here on the inhibitor turret. 20 seconds still until morning will come back up. Freddy was not pretty low in that last fight. If we can even really call it a fight, it was more <laughs> of a positional face-off, which ended up in Gilius catching out morning on the top side. But SK recalling and TPA are just going to push back up mid. Oh. Yeah, the uh, sort of safety first mentality of SK kind of paying off here. The more I do look at it, though, I mean, Candy Panda has so many safety nets that he can fall back on. A third damage item would speed this game up for them a bit. But with that Banshee's Veil, it just means that even if Morning does land a Miracle Stun through Mundo, through the front line, onto him, 
he's going to have that blocked. So it makes their composition just that much more safe. That third damage item is now in. And Candy Panda is not going to have too many problems with Achi anymore either. He's got the damage. TPA are waiting off the side. They want to try and set up a, a gank push, but they're against SK Gaming. They've played Fnatic all season. They know what this is all about. Are they going to fall for it? Freddy's the man Ari's that gets singled out, but here. he's got four and a half thousand hit points and a whole stack of armor. He does not care too much what Baby does to him. Yeah, last whisper, all well and good, but quite frankly, he's got he's got enough to just say I don't really care. Even if you're hammering away on me a minute until the Baron comes up. Freddy, of course, was. I mean, Oof. despite the fact that they got Ace, you could probably argue the hero of that one flashing in to kill uh, BB and stop them from taking the inhibitor, which has given them the respite. We do see, though, that TPA sat in the death brush here trying to bait SK in. Yeah, On award, though. They really, need, <laughs> they really need to get some sort of surprise because if your enemy is stronger than you in the straight up five on five, you don't fight a fair fight. You try and get the element of surprise on your side to pick somebody off because if they stack up 5v5, look at this. Who is wins ever going to get a reset off? Talked about the safe sort of style from this team. Everybody here is hard for them to take down. Even N rated there. He's got the extra shield for everybody and he's working on extra health items for himself. Very hard for TPA to actually <laughs> ever get resets for wins. I gotta give it to TPA. They're persistent. They were staying in that bush for a long time and this game was just like. We know you're there. We're not falling for it. This has happened too many times to us throughout the year to just stroll on into that death bush. And now SK have got themselves advantage. They've moved in. They're getting the wards down. The Baron has spawned, but TPA, they're always giving that little edge of threat. There is no tower in that mid lane, remember. They can wall straight onto the in here, but it's a risky, risky play if they go for it. And SK now feeling very confident if they once again control vision around this Baron and then wait for the picks. They have the Ari, they have the Jarvan with both Flash and Cataclysm available. So picks are very, very easy for them to pull off. Vision is controlled. Uh, now they play the slow game. Not that slow, actually. Whoa! Oh, Freddy going down to less than half HP. There's they call it. They managed to lock him up, but can they finish him oh. off? They can't at this stage. And SK actually starting off the Baron, doing about half of the health bar. Haven't finished that one off. And TPA have not only done the damage to the big tank, the they've Russian. managed to actually stop them doing the Baron. They're going straight up mid. So this is a completely different phrase for TPA. A decisive move. When their backs are against the wall, Baron's going down with this level 18 Tristana. They force it. They engage on the move to pull them off of Baron. And now they've run SK all over the map, shoving mid and switching over to Baron. Teleport on their traps. This is really risky. They've got to take that Baron down very fast there. And they are doing the damage to it. The TPA are going to get it. They've taken the Baron. And SK are just too slow to the body. What decisive calls will do for you? Engage on the Mundo to draw them off of Baron, then shove mid to make them all recall to try and defend the inhibitor. What good objective selection from TPA. One, two, three, they got the Baron, burned it down, even with the teleport from Freddy, able to pull it off in time. It's just so hard to call this game because we've seen it swing back and forth already. We saw TPA in the lead, they end up losing out and must have had this deja vu, a horrible deja vu feeling from yesterday, but they get that Baron. There's still 5k gold behind, but we're 40 minutes into this matchup now, getting to the point where the gold is going to be less and less impactful. But what are TPA going to do with the Baron? This is where, yes, we've just seen that decide to play for the Baron, now they've got to be even more decisive and show us what they can do with that big Baron advantage. Well, the really, really big thing for them is that the middle inhibitor turret is already down from the last time they were able to rush it. Even though BB went down after that and they weren't able to finish off the inhibitor, they've got that open door. Can see just TPA. They've got the Baron. They want to make this play. Jez is hanging off the side. I'm not sure that's the right move. And he's having the same thought himself as he comes around. This is going to be very hard for them to push into SK's face, though. Keep your eyes on Kenny Panda. The Banshees is popped. Morning was able to land the stun there, but as we said, defensive item there for Candy Panda, able to block one. We'll see if the cooldown comes back up and they get a second. Freddy standing at the door. 
That big bouncer that we've talked about already, trying to keep Back them out up, and away from that inhibitor. But you see TPA stepping forward, trying to get those stuns off. BB needs to be very careful how close he goes in because Jezus, if he gets the pick, will go in there, but they do manage to force SK back. The inhibitor goes over to the Taipei Assassins. Now they're going to have the super minions coming in, but if you look at top and bottom, it's already on SK's favor, so they need to just spread out Whoa. those time lanes. They're trying to set up a trap, but they were on a ward. Yeah, that's not going to work out for them. They're trying. There is a giant minion wave down bottom for SK, so that at least they have pressure down there. But TPA turning their sights towards the top tower. They want to make use of the Baron while they still have it. Trying to trap in the jungle. This time around, not going to work out. There is a big wave, as you said. That's going to be the top tower, the inner going down. The bottom may well get dealt with by those minions. SK do have that advantage, as you mentioned, but this wave Will it get cleared out quick enough? It's going to be taken. TPA get himself oh, no. another tower. The stun on Jezus isn't enough. The Kulin doing the damage. He gets caught with the Rune Prison. And TB down by TB. Straight on towards him. Crescendo still not used. And Raiden holding on to that one. But SK are down to four members. This is dangerous for SK Gaming. Jezus has got a one minute spawn time. And TPA knocking on the door on this top lane. Are they going to be able to work their way in? There is the next minion wave coming in. Watch for Morning because he's been brilliant with his stun so far. They managed to lock up Freddy for a while. There is a crescendo. Morning after using the Zonyas. Not two from Jay. SK trying to push this one back. There's the damage to Candy Panda. Not enough though. They kill off Morning. Gilius will fall. Archie is actually pretty low. Wins the spawn to go back away. Double for Freddy before he goes down. That's three dead for SK, two dead for the Taipei Assassins. This time they've got the AD carry up with them, they're gonna try and win the game. The Super Minions coming in the mid lane, Wind's taking a hell of a lot of beating now, but BB goes aggressive, and Rainy taking low, he gets dropped down! Candy Panda, the last man standing! Jez is up in nine seconds time, they're gonna try and push on towards the Nexus turrets, one goes down, can the second one, BB goes in, annihilates him! And that's gonna be the game for the Taipei Assassins! What a match! And listen to that crowd roar there. Taipei Assassins did so well yesterday against Royal Club. You should argue that they probably should have won that game. This one was far from easy for them once again. They had that traditional TPA great early start. They also had then the traditional TPA ropey later stages, but they managed to hold on, making that decisive call which led to the Baron. And this time, they make no mistake the later they went. And man, do I like watching BB on Lucian. He doesn't hesitate to dash in to finish off AD carries. He sees the high priority target low, and he uses the skill as its name, Relentless Pursuit. He's always following up on the damage, and that's what counted. He got the kill, and they were able to snowball that all the way into the base. I'm sure that Freak is going to have some words about that defensive item. <laughs> Third for Candy Panda as well. We'll see, because BB did not go for one of those earlies, just making the McHales so that he could continue to go aggressive. What a back and forth match that really was. You know, TPA leading in the beginning, SK clawing the way back into it after a great ace down at the Dragon. Actually, it wasn't quite the ace, was it? That he only got the Quadra there in towards it. Gets the Baron straight off the back of it. Gets a second Baron as well, but TPA they answered so well, catching them in that Baron pit and then picking up a tactical, tactical, masterful Baron. They really, they just forced them up the mid, led them on a merry dance and ran straight up and picked that Baron. And that really was where it all turned for them. They just pushed in towards the middle inhibitor, taking along the top turrets and completely running SK in a merry dance. That flash room prison though, on towards Jez's was incredible because he'd already flashed, but the room prison went down as it was going through. And that is what left them in a 4v5. Yeah, it was great follow-up. They get Sindra stun into flash rise rune prison, and then BB dashes in to finish him off. Everybody on the same page there. Completely different face from uh, TPA than we saw yesterday. Maybe it was jitters for their first mm -hmm. Worlds game, and now everybody's in sync, but they look much more cohesive. Maybe it isn't having their back pushed against the wall is all that they needed. The speculation coming into the tournament was SK Gaming 
TSM, TPA, who's going to be the second spot coming through? I think general consensus was that Royal Club were the strongest team in this group. And now, later on today, we're going to see a 1-1 TSM going up against a 1-1 Taipei Assassins. And that could be a big deciding match. That's going to be brilliant. And let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is only day two. This That's is a round well. robbing <laughs> group stage. These guys all have to play each other again. So there's still lots of matches to go on. But my god, we're getting some fantastic games in these early group stage games. Yeah, these are very, very exciting. This one goes super late too. Everybody likes to see the late game uh, that actually are decisive because yeah. there was nonstop action in this one. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth. Are we going Baron? No, we're not going Baron. Let's go to Baron. <laughs> Let's not go Baron. We're to Europe. Europe. Team. <laughs> we're used to seeing that. So for us, it's not all that bad. But, you know, TPA, he, we were, I, I was hoping for them that they wouldn't make any kind of mistake the later that things went. They've already shown that they've got that trait, which they'll probably not uh, really like having that trait themselves. It cost them dearly yesterday against Royal Club. They've got to work on that one. And as you mentioned, there's, there's still a few games to go in the yeah. group stage. They've still got to play each other twice. And we're getting such great games the first time around. The second time these teams come to play, they'll already have a match to kind of look through what went wrong for them. And the evolution over a group stage itself can be really interesting to watch. Yeah, one of the biggest things coming into these group stages was so many teams had all this time to prepare. They all came here in boot camp, and we didn't get to see what everyone was working on for several weeks. So now that they've had that first day and they've got that first glimpse, uh, the second day is exciting to see how they'll adapt to what they've seen. Absolutely fantastic match and a win for the Taipei Assassins. For more on that one, we're going to send it over to Shox, who's standing by with TPA's wins. Thank you very much, Joe. First off, congratulations, wins. Fantastic victory here for the Taipei Assassins versus SK Gaming. Yesterday, you guys almost won versus Starhorn Royal Club. How did you guys manage to win this one? They went back and they were calm and they went to the drawing board and think of their strategy to face the team today and that paid off. Well, that's one win already for you today. Later up, you're going uh, up against TSM, the North American team. How do you think that matchup will play out? We think uh, our, our uh, strength are almost the same, and uh, TSM has a really good mid. But we all, if we all perform right, I think we'll have a really good game. Well, we'll see um, how that game plays out. Now, Wins, you were on the world stage last year with the Gamma Bears. How well do you think you can do here now that you got the Taipei Assassins with you? So it's unfortunate they, they faced the SKT, the eventual champion last year. But this year, um, he put a lot of work into it, and hopefully he'll do better this year. Well, this was a great start already. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, now we're going to kick it back over to the guys at the desk to analyze TPA's win. Thank you very much, Sharks, and what a game to kick yeah. off day two. Yesterday, we had a killer match to start day one of Worlds. Today, similar case, SK come out swinging. Definitely a marked improvement. Let's talk picks and bans, team compositions. Monty, you were not particularly sold by TPA and what they put together. No. I mean, they won this game, but uh, and obviously team compositions aren't anything. They outplayed and kind of out-rotated their opponent in the mid lane when uh, that whole Baron skirmish happened, and then they forced them back and kind of took the inhibitor uh, as a result. But when we're actually looking at the picks and bans here. The issue is, is that... They're riding a very small power spike with their Siege, with Lucian and Syndra, and Janna really does nothing. 
uh, they only have one form of engage, which is a Syndra stun, which was why it took them so long to close. They couldn't really get a team fight. They got a nice fight when, uh, when SK was in the Baron pit. But other than that, there's not a good way for them to actually win the game. And so with very little engage, uh, there wasn't a backline threat because SK could just stand there and if Rise walks up, you just charm the Rise, you kill the Rise first, and then you can collapse on the backline once the front line is dead, and the kiting will come in from SK at that point. So there's just, there's no point to the Janna. You're not going to have a good disengage, and you don't have engage either. You don't have really good siege. It's just wishy-washy, and against better teams, you have to be able to draft better than that. So. Yeah. I, I want to cut you off because I, I'm exactly opposite to your opinion here, which is that I actually love the Janna a lot because um, we don't see her much, but my read on her is this. Number one, I think she is the best support in the game at 20 minutes because that is when she gets level 9 and she has a 50 attack damage shield to put on a one item AD carry. And when you've got a Lucian who does so much physical spell damage, he is far and away the strongest champion in the map with a Janna shield on him. And we saw that that timing window, the 22 minutes they come in, Cinder can one-shot somebody, the Kha'Zix has power spike with the Brutalizer. They've got so much darn damage there that things just blow up. And Syndra is enough engage against champions that squishy, where no one's really come online yet. And that team turns into, by the way, you've got a late game Rise, by the way, late game Kha'Zix. And then even Lucian was actually building a Blade of the Rune King so we could deal with Mundo late game as well. So it, this kind of team turns on at 20 minutes and then grows. And it was, I thought it was a wonderful team comp that eventually just builds it, into an unstoppable team. It helped that SK walked into a number of Syndra stands as sure. well. Crippo, let's yeah, add here, we'll we keep a, this conversation I rolling. I know we had a couple of replays coming, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, I would have still preferred a Thresh uh, for multiple reasons, just for like extra engage or just Thresh in there looking for picks. But uh, what worries me is, that is, or what's interesting is the Sona pick early. It opens you up to get countered really hard, and I yeah. feel like TPA dropped the ball on that. I watched the entire bot lane again, and... BB and J just weren't, weren't in synergy. They kept going for trades one by one, separated. There was no tornado follow up. There was no Lucian Q poke in lane, and they just basically allowed Sona to stand to tie farm Lucian Janna, which should never happen, even after first blood. And that's a really big mistake. Secondly, one thing on SK side, I would have loved and rated to pick up an earlier Chalice and maybe even an earlier Mikhail's. Uh, because he didn't even build that after finishing his locket. I really think he needed there's, the There's a theme on the analyst desk, Crepo disliking support build orders. <laughs> Probably, yeah. we haven't heard anything from you. I want you to take me through our first replay. Let's pull this up. First of all, Gilius deserves a high five. His early game presence was a marked improvement from yesterday's games, and uh, SK put a lot of focus on dragons. Let's roll this clip out and probably talk us through it. So I really like this fight specifically for Jez's position. You can see him coming around the back right now, and right now he just disappears. TP has no idea where he goes. And this kind of gives them a lot of indecision and they don't know what to do. At this point, Wins jumps in right when they see Ari, and you see the rest of them in the pit, they're just too scared to move out with Ari behind them. And now it's Freddy and Jezzy's just closing in on these threes without, you know, much escape. And it's just kind of TPA not really making that decisive decision early, and now it's up to SK kind of to pick and choose who they kill first. Yeah, you were talking about the fact that you felt uh, TPA was maybe afraid of Freddy and just trying to get away from him. Do you still feel the same after rewatching the replay? Yeah, rewatching it, it, it really did seem they're more scared of Ari. And then once they saw Ari, they are like, this Mundo's in front of us and we don't want to touch him. Yeah, he managed to run a wreck. Now, before we move on to the next replay, what's your take on the game? I see you wanted to chime in while the disagreements were happening. TPA, <laughs> they sort of fell behind early but they strategically outplayed SK and got control back. I think uh, the biggest turning point was definitely that Baron, and that was what TPA really needed. They didn't have good engage, and SK doing Baron basically gave TPA an engage. It forced SK to sit in that pit and do that objective, and TPA just walked in and fought. And if they had just left that Baron, what was TPA going to do? They can't really run them down. It was yeah. a good dodge on the crescendo as well. Yeah, we actually yeah. have a replay of the Baron fight, if we can pull that one up. This is the one that TPA uh, comes in and cleans people up. So the thing that's going on here, by the way, is the call for SK is to finish Baron. Candy Panda flash crescendo to try to stop TPA from coming in to stop the smite. Problem is, he misses win. So let's roll the clip out, and you're going to watch him go for the flash crescendo here. And it's just, just barely away from Kha'Zix, so it doesn't quite tag him. He actually walks forward into it, and he actually gets into range to smite. You're going to see Wins actually puts a smite down here. 
Uh, it's just a little bit too early is all. But at this point, it's a big misplay. Uh, so Sona's out of mana, no Chalice. Candy Panda also flashes the wall he's so afraid. He realizes, oh wait, I'm not dead. Rocket jumps back in, but by now it's already too late. As Jess has flashed out himself and can't get back in. And so it's a really, really badly coordinated fight by SK. It's of course easy then for TPA to clean up the rest. I just want to add in very quickly, Morning, this is his second professional game on Syndra. For TPA, when they have played Syndra in the GPL, it is Chawi that has been playing it. He play, uh, pulled out Syndra yesterday for the first time. That was a great stun. And yes, positioning gets made easier, but he hit those stuns multiple times throughout the game. Yeah, Justice also didn't even have his ult. He had already burned it before that fight started, so that was another problem. Yeah, adding on to that, that the Crescendo was in down four to fight. I, I completely understand what went through in Raider's head there. Like, a lot of times people call Burn Baron, okay, support goes Stalin, but... What are you going to do once you get the Baron? If you're two ulties down against that team coming in at you, that does that desperately, like probably said, needs an engage, and basically you become their engage, mm -hmm. then it's going to get really hard. Final thoughts, Monty, before we move on? Yeah, and that's the thing. You know they don't have engage, so you don't flash to engage. You, you wait, wait. You wait for them to walk into you. You use the Crescendo as a counter engage, tie up their front line. That way the Janna never does anything because she's too busy protecting the back line that doesn't need protecting. You burn down Rise, then you just follow up and clean up. Well, definitely a game that got the analyst desk talking. Very exciting. All right, LPL's Edward Gaming and the international wildcard team at Dark Passage are preparing for our second game of the day. And I think we're actually going to take a look in at the venue in a moment. We can actually see Name, the rest of the team in their practice room, getting themselves ready. Dark Passage will also be taking to the Rift. They're squeezing in some time on the games. We'll be back in a second, guys. Jesus has caught BB around the back side. He's going to get Whoa! the goes down. That's going to be Gillian that picks it up, but that's going to take a very low in the pin here. Candy Panda jumps back in, but it's TPA coming out on top. Have they got the damage? They damn well have. There is a crescendo. Morning after using the Zonyas. Not soon from Jay. SK trying to push this one back. There's the damage to Candy Panda. <laughs> Welcome back to the first group stage of the 2014 World Championship here in Taipei. I'm reporting Riftside with Insect from Starhorn Royal Club. Um, always a pleasure to talk to him. And starting off, Insect, yesterday you guys got to play TPA and TSM. What are your impressions of your group after day one? Insect 선수 우선 안녕하다고 말하시고요. 어제 1일차 때 TSM이랑 TPA 상대로 이제 1승을 거두셨는데요. 어제 TPA랑 TSM의 경기에 대해서 어떻게 생각하셨는지? 간단히 설명해 주세요. 어, TPA 이전은 어, T, 아, TPA가 초중반에 잘해서 저희가 많이 말렸고 하지만 저희 조합을 보고 후반에 가면 이길 거라고 생각해서 잘 버텨서 이긴 것 같고 TSM은 이제 저희가 원하는 거의 모든 챔프를 가져갔기 때문에 네, 충분히 쉽게 이긴 것 같아요. So our game against TPA we had a really hard time during the um, early and mid game. They were really good. They really harassed us in the early mid game, but we thought that our composition was good in late game, so I think we were able to pull it off. And against TSM, I, we had all the champions we wanted during the pick and bans, so I think it was relatively more easy. Uh, let me revisit that game versus TPA again, because uh, Wins here in front of his home crowd has been doing very well. What do you think of his style? The TPA team of Wins 선수가 어제 되게 매우 인상적인 활약을 펼치고 있는데요. Wins 선수에 대해서 좀더 얘기를 해주세요. 좀 간단하게 표현하면 초중반에 정말 잘하셨는데 이제 후반 갈수록 약간 힘이 빠져서 네 그래서 아 후반 갈수록 그냥 힘이 빠지신 것 같아요. Um, I think um, his listen was really good, especially his early game. Like he was really threatening to our team. But listen in general, um, he kind of fades out in the late game, and I think he made some mistakes. So yeah, we are pretty good. All right. Um, then after that game, I talked to Uzi, who said how far you guys wanted to go as a team. What is your relationship like with Uzi now? 어제 경기 승리 후에 우지 선수 인터뷰 때 이제 그 우지 선수가 이번 시즌에 이번 롤드컵 때 우승하고 싶다고 말씀했었는데 어떻게 우지 선수와의 관계는 괜찮은가요? 어 이제 애초에 저랑 큰 트러블은 없었고 지금은 다 해결돼서 전부 남은 토너먼트에 어, 집중할 수 있도록 전부 잘 준비하고 있습니다. Um, so Uzi and I, we don't have any problems with each other. Um, we're working really hard as a team. 
and we really want to focus throughout the rest of the tournament. All right, very good to hear. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to throw it over to the guys at the desk for a look at this next match. Thank you very much, Sharks. Uh, we are setting up for our next Rumble on the Rift. It will be between Edward Gaming and the international wildcard team, Dark Passage. Let's start with Edward Gaming. They are by far the favorite for this matchup. It is China's number one seed. However, they did have a rough start to their world's trip yesterday as they were taken out by Samsung White relatively handily. It just felt like Samsung White had the better strategic play. What do you think, Monty? Well, I think that what Freak brought up earlier is true, that they were a little bit shaky in the late game. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Edward Gaming struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, a little bit shaky, but it's, you know, I still think that, uh, you know, Samsung White here is obviously going to be the favorite, and I think their play is just going to get cleaner as the as the group moves on. So for Edward Gaming against Dark Passage, it is definitely a, a David and Goliath side to this freak. You particularly like Nani. Yeah, David. Yep. I'm, I'm, Despite I'm with Monte Cristo. Samsung White is the favorite here. Um, no, Edward Gaming definitely are incredibly strong. Um, yeah. They just. They're, they're just going to outmatch these guys, ultimately. They are incredibly strong. Name especially is incredible. Uh, again, in the previous game they played against Samsung, what you had the highest damage dealt in the game, the champions, despite such a rough start. And it's just an all-star powerhouse. What can you say? Yeah, I completely agree. Now, the other side of the rift, it is Dark Passage. Um, they struggled yesterday against AHQ. They were fairly outclassed uh, on an individual level, but they did dig deep. They did hold off against the Southeast Asian squad. What are they going to need to do here against the Chinese squad, Krepo? Um, get really lucky, I think. They got outclassed or, like they got outclassed by HQ, and if you just compare HQ and EDG, then the comparison, like the, the gap, just even gets bigger. So this is probably going to be a really one-sided match. So I just wonder: is uh, is Dark Passage going to play their signature champions? Are they going to go for some cheese or just unconventional stuff? What are they? If you're in Dark Passage seats, like, what is your strategy? How do you go into the game, like? I'm going to ask Prolly that exact question. What would you do if you were in Dark Passages yeah, up against the number one not being uh, the number one favorite for I'm, I'm playing matches? I'm very averse so. in being the underdog, so yeah. this is basically you know, <laughs> easy for me. Uh, for them, I would say the best idea, picks and bands-wise, is go for a very early game team-oriented kind of pick thing and go for an early dragon. Do a risky early dragon and bait them into fighting it. If EDG gives it up and is smart about it, I don't think Dark Passage will have a chance, but I think they can bait EDG, since they are a very aggressive team, into something early and you know, punish them for it. Well, we'll see if that does work. We're going to skip down to the bottom line. I think I know where these predictions will go, but let's see anyway. Who is going to come out with the win? Is it Edward Gaming or Dark Passage? Probably you spoke last. You can predict first. Who are you going for? I'm going to go with Edward Gaming. Yeah. I'm doing safe, safe picks for a while until I get a good ratio, and then I'll start you know, wavering from yeah. there. <laughs> Crepo. Uh, yeah, Edward Gaming. We've stated all the reasons. It's probably going to be this way. David versus Goliath. Before we get to David, Monty, your prediction. Well, even with uh, Prowley's expert advice on how to uh, blue turtle shell, I'm still going to take EDG here. Yeah, I still don't actually know what blue turtle shell is. You'll have to explain to me in-game. <laughs> Freak up next. Blue turtle shells only hit the first place team, so Edward Gaming <laughs> going to probably take second in the group, and nice. they're going to win this one. All right, well, down the line. Let's compare that to the fans' predictions over on lolesports.com. Right now, you're calling this matchup for Edward Gaming to the tune of 68%, still ahead of the curve. Let's throw this one over to D-Man, Joe, and Kobe to get us into the game. Thanks a lot, Quick Shot. And let's get right to it with a look at the team starting lineups. On the blue side from China's LPL is Edward Gaming with Koro in the top lane, Clear Love in the jungle, Yu in the mid lane, Name the AD carry, and FZZF on support. And in a mammoth task on the red side, it is Dark Passage from Turkey. Fab fabulous in the top lane, Crystal in the jungle, Nauru in the mid lane. AD carry is Holy Phoenix and Touch alongside him as support. All right, so yeah, as they already prepped for us, this is really going to be one of those underdog stories, the David and Goliath. We'll have to see Dark Passage. They're kind of in a similar situation uh, the HQ were in yesterday when they were going up against Samsung White, this team that everyone's talking up and is obviously extremely strong. So we expect probably early game, uh, early game focus there from Dark Passage to try and get maybe a level one invade, try and snowball some sort of uh, early gold into some sort of momentum. Well, you say that, but that is exactly <laughs> how AHQ lost the game against Samsung White yesterday with a five-man face check at it's, level one and got ace. It's a big risk. It's called a high risk for a reason. <laughs> it's like, if it works out, suddenly you get yourself a little bit of an advantage and maybe, just maybe, you buy yourself some time. Mm. 
But if it backfires, like yesterday, Samsung White were ready and waiting for it, then it can look a little bit harsh on yourself. It is a thing that they need to do, though. I mean, you look at the champions. If you look at Dark Passage, you say, mm -hmm. Holy Phoenix is the guy that has to carry him. He's up against Nami, who is considered one of the best AD carries in the world. It's a tricky, tricky task, that's for sure, for Dark Passage. We'll see how the bounce work. And I think that's a really good point to bring up, too, because Nami's not this really good AD carry that even has a big potential to go sort of crazy and throw games. He's not like he's going to give you even that small opening where he jumps into a team fight. He's very cautious with his play, and he's very, very smart and patient with his play. So if they do get ahead, then he doesn't leave a lot of openings for a team to jump on. So let's have a look down the bands here. We see Edward Gaming binding out Nidalee, most played champion from Fab Fabulous in that top lane. Alistair, another just all around very strong pick at this point. On the other side, they actually ban out Twitch, first of all, third most played champion statistically for Nami, with a, uh, a decent record as well. We'll see how that one goes. Zillion also banned away, and it's hard to ban someone like you out because he just plays pretty much everything. Well, the, that Twitch ban is exactly what they did as their first ban yesterday. I wonder if it's just something that Dark Passage as a team do not like dealing with, maybe. And well, that may be very, very scary on yeah, Twitch. Yeah, of course. And it, I'm kind of sad that they're actually banning out the Twitch and Zillion because EDG do run a very cool uh, Twitch variations on Twitch zillion compositions in which they speed up and you do get to see Name's patience and uh, his really skillful positioning. Won't see it this time around though. He's definitely versatile. He can always go with that Lucian as well. Maokai goes through though with EDG spending two top lane bans and the Rise coming in for the final ban. It's a pretty easy pickup for them. Many Chinese teams love to have that team fighting. Maokai, one of the premier team fighting top laners. It's going to be a very big pickup for Koro. Well, Dark Passage first picked Lee Sin yesterday. We'll see whether they stick with this Kha'Zix that Crystal is currently hovering over. We do see Lucian getting locked in for Holy Phoenix, so we'll see. Of course, has had a pretty successful uh, win rate so far in the World Championships, Lucian. Yeah, and they do take it away from Nami. Yeah. So, uh, sort of two takeaways from him, and we'll get to see what his third string sort of is here. The Kha'Zix, as we said last time, I really just like this jungler all around right now. He does pretty much everything well, except tank. We'll see here though, Rhaegar locked in on the other side. Yes, we get to see the hunt. If this game goes long, then maybe we do get to see that epic hunt between Kha'Zix and, uh, and Rhaegar. It's got to be two level 16s. There's a bunch hey, of, there's it a could bunch go of conditions that long. in there. There's, it could go that long, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> could well do. FCZF though, getting in that Janna once again, expecting to see the Mechie Soul Stealer again from him. Not too many people running Janna, really just JFCZF, and of course we're going to see it uh, probably later on from Najim Wajja when we reach Singapore. Yeah, I think the thing with uh, Janna is that it was really a recent trend that emerged right before everyone went into boot camp before Worlds. So there's no telling how many of these teams yeah. took that boot camp time to actually pick up Janna. She's not that hard to pick up for a team, no. and we've seen so many It's an old champion yeah. that's been around for yeah. a very long time throughout the years. And as you mentioned, on the hunt, but more importantly, Clear Love, this is a Rengar, this is his second most played champion, you could argue, yeah. obviously, alongside Kha'Zix as well. Jarvan being his main one, interesting that he didn't go towards that when he's played it 15 times throughout the season. Yeah, they've also, though, had a lot of Rengar bans aimed at them, eight in total across the season, so a lot of teams saying we don't want Clear Love oh. to get in on towards this one. We see Nunu actually being picked up here for Dark Passage. Ooh alongside the Kha'Zix, so, and Thresh is in there, so I was going to say, Nunu support, then I look down the <laughs> list, and then you've got Thresh there. Fab Fabulous going to bring out a top lane Nunu, how, how are they going to go with it? All right, Joe, I'll give you a 3% chance that it's a top lane Nunu, because that is a viable option, uh, but it would definitely mean they will be lacking in damage. This uh, probably going to be a solo lane Kha'Zix and a jungle Nunu, that's where yes. I'm going to put my Fab money. Cool. Fabulous. Fab Fabulous, it's a pentakill, that's what he got yeah. it on back in, well, season three, so it's a long time ago. <laughs> but of course, it is a champion. He has played very well. Catching us all off guard there, honestly. Ariana in the mid lane, and Cogmore 
picked up for Name. We'll see how that one works out for him. Ooh. Strong, strong champion for him. It's his second most played. He's 9-1 yeah. on it from the summer of the LPL. Another favorite from Name. And he does have the Janna and the Orianna. So shields on shields for him. Plus they have the reset if they need it. And Maokai, one of the best healing tanks in the game. So good at protecting Kogma. He doesn't have to use Twisted Advance to engage. He can use it if Kha'Zix ever jumps in. He's so good at locking down Kha'Zix. If you take away that mobility of any of these melee assassins like Kha'Zix, then it really, really stymies their uh, team fighting here. And this EDG team just looks like it's going to be very hard for Dark Passage to really break into. So final pick for Dark Passage was in fact Zereth. We did see Naru playing Zereth once during International Wildcard. Funnily enough, out of the seven games he played, he played seven different champions. So already shown that he's got depth in his champion pool. He's up against you this time around, who may not be the most formidable mid laner in China, but he's going to have a hard time. We're going to see how this one works out. Definitely an interesting team comp. Edward Game, and honestly, it is a strong composition from them. Dark Passage. We'll see whether this works out. Are they going to try and fast push those towers? Is it going to be work out against them? Because that's not really a team comp they can do it against. Right. I mean, we do see oftentimes solo lane mm -hmm. Kha'Zix, they'll pick up the team at into the Hydra. So then they can sort of split push. But EDG, not only do they have massive team fighting, but they've got a Rengar on their team. And if ClearGov gets any sort of foothold in this game, Rengar's great at taking out split pushers. I don't know. It just seems like EDG have so many answers for this this game here. Yeah, and if we think back to the last round, got Insec on it yesterday, going full damage. And with that Maokai in there, there's a possibility that he'll go the same way. We'll find out. Don't forget, guys, you can keep sharing your predictions for this game over on Twitter. Send the hashtag EDGWin or DPWin to at LOL Esports, and we'll see, be checking back a little bit later on to see if the voting shifts once we're actually in game. We've said it before, this is a mammoth task for Dark Passage. Going to be a hard, hard game for them. But honestly, you also have to feel that at this stage, the team has nothing to lose. Yeah, and I want to see what they do with sort of the beginning of this game. Because Clear Love on Rengar, he'll probably be hard farming his jungle here. Clear Love sort of likes to do that anyway. And so on Rengar, it's a pretty clear path for him. This is going to be up to Crystal and the rest of Dark Passage to try and uh, do some counter jungling, take away as many of the large jungle monsters as they can to delay the Feral Flare stacks and the experience gain. Oh, I just saw him. I think, Naru, I think they were trying to set up a cheeky uh, go push down. gank there, but we saw in the previous matchup it can't work. But this time, the uh, Name, sorry, spotted it out. Now, uh, a delayed invade over a ward. This is not a good situation. And this is only a three-man invade here, so you should probably not go through with this. Uh, I'm just getting flashbacks to some of the yesterday. We'll see, though. Oh, Rock looking Massey for the lane. Putting a ward down there, and we can actually see that Maokai and Rengar are on the top side of the map, so kind of switching position here. EDG looking for that invade. As you mentioned, the ward went down between the turrets to spot those early movements towards uh, the lane. Yes. Exactly the same done by EDG. That ward was spotted on the top side, though. Looking for that lane swap. Let's see. Well, you know, Kogma, he gets a huge boost in lane power when he does get that level 6. In which case, then they'd want to swap it back. Let's see here. Dark Passage. They haven't... I don't think that ward saw them yet, so they don't know the Kogma's down bottom. But they're already sort of initiating lane swap. I think Nauru saw him earlier on, remember. Ah. There's the ward that spots them, though. No, mate. And, and they head back down. Spotted out. So will be a 2v2. Yeah, they're going to choose straight to head back down there. There goes Holy Phoenix in touch. And they are going to get to lane a little bit later than EDG. Yeah, so they were sort of preparing for the situation where EDG would uh, lane swap top. But since they did not do it, it actually gives the early shove and lane control over to Name and FCZF. See here, the Kogma plus Janna early. They don't shove it. Don't want to get uh, overextended at all. Pretty much though, we'll see how he does get to, how he does work his way towards that level six. Interested to see how Holy Phoenix does. Obviously, his first real major tournament couldn't compete in International Wildcard last year because, well, quite frankly, he was too young. You might not believe it, but 
having a look at him, the guy looks, uh, well, certainly older than his actual age at this point, but this is his chance to really shine and show what Whoa. he's made of the hook, right? Aim from touch, just didn't quite have the range there to land on Tanami. And Name doesn't even flinch. He's got the extra boost speed from Janna, just keeps walking the straight line, barely out of range of that hook. This is a matchup and not seen in a while, that's for sure. Maokai versus Akazix. We'll see how Koro deals with this one. Fab fabulous. The champion he's well versed on. And the fact that he didn't go towards it yesterday, I was interested to see how he would choose this one. Got to keep our eye on exactly how he builds this Kazix. Of course, a lane Kazix is something we've not seen, certainly in Europe and North America, for quite a while. Yeah, not since the days of uh, mid lane Kazix and the bursty build that he was. After he got changed, a lot of people pretty much gave up mid lane Kazix altogether. But Fab Fabulous, this is an old favorite for him. It's something he's very comfortable on. He's taken that extra crystalline flask just because. He is melee and up at melee range with Maokai. Maokai doing all that AoE damage. Straight magic. He doesn't want to get shoved out of lane. And Touch here. Just exerting a bit of dominance down on this bottom side. We'll see if they can set anything up there. We're expecting Clearlove to be a little less active, I think, on these lanes. Uh, just due to the fact that he is one of those junglers. And with Rengar, will want to hit level 6 as fast as possible. And of course, as I say uh -oh. that, yep. he starts <laughs> headed towards the top side. So the other thing about Maokai is that he's also great at setting up ganks. And oh, Clear dear. Love is the perfect position to get that jump from Bush. Oh, no! He got away! I think Good he plan. has. He's reached the tower just in time. Clear Love could not get close enough. Good play from Fab Fabulous. The leap of flash required. Very good flash there from Fab Fabulous. And he did have a ward in the side bush too, because the way you lane Kha'Zix um, is that you harass with your Qs, which do not draw minion aggro, and then you go into the side bush to get your passive up, then is the only time that you would want to trade with an auto attack. Do that every once in a while, and then you have to reset your passive by going back into that bush. Well, of waiting again towards middle. We saw Naru basically using his entire mana pool earlier on just to burst Whoa, down Crystal a little bit of damage. Though. Crystal coming up around the backside of Koro here. That's going to be a lot of damage. First of all, we'll twist and advance away, but they've got double slows here. Not exactly easy to run off, but Koro manages it with the help of the flash, though. Gank for gank, flash for flash. So far, so good for Dark Passions. Up 200 gold. And Nunu, of course, has rushed uh, with the Quill Coat here, so he dropped an extra ward in that river. Very safe uh, setup here for Fab Fabulous in the top side. Not a lot of good pre-6 ganks, gank paths here for Clearlo. So I expect him to stay back in the jungle, uh, hard farming from now on, especially with their bottom lane, the Kogma and Janna, as we said, trying to get to that level 6 point before they really go too aggressive. Just going to hold off and keep the farm going, doing a fairly decent job of it. Holy Phoenix is doing what's required on Lucian, just to bully him as much as possible. His death sentence is not quite landing yet from touch. Yeah, and you just uh -oh. heard there. Uh -oh. Ooh, four men roaming down bottom. Level 6. Uh, level 6. They're going to actually spawn from this ward here, which means that instant move back oh, from oh, just oh, oh, they saw him, they saw this him. could be really bad there's a lantern actually going down you will put the ball on towards touch and that ward basically saving them there holy just though oh. my god it was close crystal now caught out clear love putting some good damage down on towards him only the support of naru is what forces clear love away if you would have been a bit closer they could have got the first blood efficient pathing so far here from clear love you can see he's got the slight level advantage i mean crystal's almost to that five so it's not too big uh, but really, that sort of half gank down bottom was only a few steps for him. He was clearing out double golems, and it only cost him a tiny bit of time to head over there. This mid lane going well for Naru so far. 55 to 50 CS, both of them with the Chalice and Doran's ring. Naru has now hit level 6 as well, and now he's also a champion where if he decides to go down and touch can land a hook in, he can obviously high range do a good bit of damage with that ultimate. Meanwhile, Koro and Fab Fabulous again on this top side. It's going to be exchanging a little bit of damage. Koro going for that Rod of Ages start. We'll be getting the Catalyst in there soon. Meanwhile, Fab Fabulous, since he's against the AP laner, going for early Hex Shrinker. Double AP team, it will serve him well 
Even Kogma with a decent amount of mixed damage there. Let's see how King Clearlove builds this Rengar as well. We've seen a number of different ways of building a Rengar, building into what you're against, whether it'll go aggressive, whether it'll go full on defensive. Expect a little bit of aggression, especially since they are considered the massive favorites coming into this match, but EDG, fairly risk averse. They don't want to, you know, go too aggressive this early on. It is, after all, only their second game of the group. And remember, the team that they brought into this game, their composition, this they are they're very well equipped for team fights much later on, and they're waiting. Here's the point. Clear Love, actually level six with red buff with four stacks of ferocity. We'll see how many he ends. Oh, he's getting five off the double golems. Force, not enough. This is 100% very well prepped gank. Everything from Clear Love. Let's see if they're able to position in time. Crystal oh. is coming in just in the nick of time for a counter gank here. Let's see how this one works out. Rengar will only be getting involved here in a second. FCZF that will get hooked up. Crystal is going to come in with the lance and Absolute Zero comes in. Oh, so With the TP, can they get any more? Koro has been hooked in, touches on top of him as well. Koro does get a kill on Crystal. They're so low there underneath the tower, but DP come out. Here comes With Oriana the kills too. Two for one. Oriana's going to be too late, I think, to come to that one. What you looking to get in on the action, Naru? Even moving down, he might, you know, go for it here with his ultimate. Take He's going to go to the back of the bear dragon pit. Oh, oh slightly too late. Too early. Oh, if only Fab Fabulous had evolved his wings, he'd have got the reset and he couldn't <laughs> clean up there. But instead, he went for the Void Spikes. Wasn't to be, but what a great clap from Dark Passage. Beautiful timing here, Crystal. He got in position. This actually, they set up this gang. What a hook from touch there. Fakes them out. You think he's going for the AD carry. Actually hits SCZF. So SCZF out of the fight instantly. And they also got the exhaust down to, onto Clear Love as soon as he jumped in. So he wasn't able to return a lot of damage. Nunu, that was basically the best position for him to be in. You get the Lantern into the fight and pop off your ultimate. There's no way that EDG can get away from that. Oh. The Dragon fight, though, starting out during the replay. Dragon low. There is Crystal off to the side. He's got Smite available. He's going to come in for it. He nope. goes over to EDG, though. Clear look, trying to get involved. Crystal is going to fall. But can they get any more? They're focusing towards touch. That's two kills for EDG, plus the Dragon. And just like that, they gave themselves a thousand gold lead. They answer back very quickly. They use that team fighting that they brought. Maokai plus a good shockwave, followed up by Clear Love. Dragon and some several kills here for EDG. They don't really let that bottom lane shenanigans sit for long before they answer back. But Fabulous fancies this one. Koro taking a lot of damage. He's got that ultimate. Got uh, sorry, the passive worked out here. He has got a red buff, but Koro, he's safe. He's on towards the tower. And Fab Fabulous, though. Not afraid to brawl, caught actually on the tower. Gotta... Fabulous, oh, not quite the damage. One more Q. Oh. No, it takes a tower hit, has to back away. So, so close. In comes Clear Love, stealthy and towards oh. him. Slowed down by the Void Spikes. How's he going to get close enough? No. Fab Fabulous is safe. Evolved Void Spikes, the man. There you yeah, go. That is why. <laughs> he may have not got the reset, but man, did it save him there. Beautiful shot. Fortunate. Fortunate shot. Yeah, I mean, he was stealth up running in there, worked out for him perfectly. Now look at this crystal. Success on his first move to the bottom lane. He's in that brush without being spotted once again. Absolute zero oh. is up and available, but can they bait them through? There is the hook going to go wide, and that might give EDG a that bit of a comfort so in this bottom lane now to move forward. They did ping in that bush as well. That was a blue ping from EDG in this bush. Yes, there is a pink ward, but maybe he was a little bit sloppy getting in, and a minion saw him. Or there, they just, or they just have good game sets. <laughs> there he is. One way of spotting it. So now a burning him towards that triforce, while Holy Phoenix he's a long way towards that infinity edge. He's coming out quite well here with that kill and assist that he got down in the first brawl of the game. Touch taking a bit of damage, but. They're giving as good as they're getting down this bottom lane. They're doing well against FCZF and Nami. Well, he's got the, the <laughs> Lucian Thresh and some babysitting as well yes. from Nunu. 
Really, though, the top lane. I mean, this is where Fat Fabulous should start to take over. Oh, what? Oh, and he's going for it again. Poro taking a good chunk of damage here from Fabulous. Actually, Whoa. it pops his ultimate. He's going to go for this one. Ulti for Koro as well. Is Fat Fabulous going to go for no, this one no, the whole no. way? The void spikes come in. Koro once again going to go incredibly low. His TP just came off cooldown, though, so he can get straight back up to that lane. It's working so well for him in that top lane. Just not quite enough damage, though. The Brutalizer will be picked up soon. He's got to be careful he doesn't stick around here. Koro is baiting him in. Clearlove's going to try and sneak around the side, but it is a ward. Ultimate is not quite back up for Clearlove, and that's definitely going to be a back. Pretty dangerous to bait that one, but Clearlove does get to soak up some extra experience. Let's see here. He's got 21 stacks on his Flare of Flare. Still a ways to go. This bottom lane, really nicely done so far. I mean, they're gonna have this advantage. They can also say collapsed nicely for those kills earlier. Crystal actually went back in tower range, which was the death of him. So not perfect execution on that one, but Dark Passage giving as good as they've got here, as you mentioned earlier, Demon. 20 CS lead though in this middle lane has appeared for you, and there's a flash through, trying to get his one. Oh, oh he's got the stun under the tower Ulti. though. That big damage, Ulti comes down. Whoa. Kill. Wow, 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 wow. I tell you what, Dark Passage have turned up to play today. Right now, Fab Fabulous, he's returning back towards that top lane. Rod of Age is still not completed by Koro. They're making the move actually down towards the bottom half. And Nerus actually could well be the focus here. I don't think he can brawl with Fab Fabulous at the moment. Yeah, exactly. As we said, the top lane now, Fab Fabulous has a very good hold on that lane. Uh, Maokai's not a very strong laner, and with the Brutalizer on top of his Hex Drinker, he not only has a substantial amount of uh, attack damage, but he's got the defense and the armor penetration. So all he has to do is spam his Qs, and then get those passive powered auto attacks, as we said, weaving in and out of the bush to gain control. Really, though, we have to go over another one of Clear Love's ultimates ganks foiled here. He has not had the success that we've seen earlier from Rengar. See if he can fix that here, though. Level 9, his ultimate will be coming up here in just a little while. We do actually have Crystal headed towards the top lane. There's no ward in there either. He will just scan out to take a peek at that Koro. Will be forced onto his turret, though, as we do see that minion wave pushing through. Crystal decided completely against that one. In fact, he's going to come down to this <laughs> river, try and clear out the wall. Spots you coming through, though, and decides, ah, I'm not going to stick around. I don't want to fight against that Orianna. Clear Love headed bottom, but his timing may be a bit off. The recall's already started. Oh. <laughs> Quick slam onto Fab Fabulous as he tries to uh, catch onto Koro. That's one way to keep him under control, that's for sure. Just knock him back every time he jumps on you. Wings not quite evolved, about to hit level 11. We'll see whether he goes for them. Ooh, Name just completed his Trinity Force, so now is a pretty big boost in power for him, as well as a rushed Medjai's here. Not even upgrading Boots of Mobility or Gold Generation item. Just straight up Sightstone and then rushing that Medjai's for FCZF. The confidence here. Dragon is spawning. EDG in position once again. Clear left goes for it, the stun! Blind Ward. stun from Nero. Pink Ward there, yeah, spots him. Quickly blocks that out, and again, it's another ultimate use. And he's got those Moby Boots, because uh, he wanted to have more effective ganks rather than throwing out more ganks and going with the cooldown reduction. So every one of those that does not pay off is going to be a fairly long wait for him. Does mean that they do gain vision control almost all the way around the bottom side river, though. Third path is still with their single ward. Teleports available for both top laners as well. Yeah, one big advantage between them is, of course, that Koro can interrupt Fab Fabulous, whereas Fab Fabulous cannot do the same. So if he was to go back there, there's the wings evolution from Fab Fabulous. We'll get the resets if they get the kills. Thing is, yeah, with those two top laners, yeah, Koro could interrupt the teleport from Fab Fabulous, but really, the two top laners, them coming in on teleports, it's good for... Oh, oh. oh. oh this is he's bad dead. news. He's dead, yeah. Solo. Caught out completely there. 
did actually use that's his ghost, didn't have a flash available, and, well, Dragon's just come up, yeah, and EDG say thank you very much. Perfect timing right there. You know, even though that ward is there, it would be a very dangerous move to Whoa. steal the Dragon. Good flash. Good flash, counter flash. Holy Phoenix trading with him. Hasn't got enough, I'm not sure. The culling going through, but no. Nami takes him down, and now Touch is in trouble. EDG just closed the net, pick up the Dragon, and just like that, they get themselves a huge lead over Dark Passage. Yeah, that one's really gonna hurt. Not only are they, did they already have to give up the Dragon, but trying to sneak that kill while everybody from EDG was doing Dragon does cost them two more. What I was gonna say about those top lanes teleporting in, though, is uh, you generally want your tanks to be there at the beginning of team fights, so and you generally want Kazakhs to be there, you know, halfway through, so he can clean up. So the teleport timings uh, would work out for Fab Fabulous. But now it looks like the teams of those two top laners will be disproportionate in the amount of power. Let's see here, they do go for it. They know everybody's on Dragon, so they're trying to get a quick summoners and then get out. Teleport though means they can't leave. Koro gets down there. Fab Fabulous said he said there's nothing he can do about it. And they lock up two kills. So, where does that leave us then? 4,000 gold the difference for Edward Gaming. 6 2 up in kills. One a piece on the towers. If we look down Clear Love again, we want to keep an eye on his build. Feral Flare is now finished. Got himself a Vamp Scepter as well. So, going full on damage for this one. Wants to get that aggressive play style out onto the map and really utilize the power that this Rengar has. Meanwhile, Holy Phoenix trying to clear out the bottom side and, well, <laughs> I feel like I've been baited into this one somewhat. 78% of you think that Dark Passage are going to win. Good morning, Turkey, I believe, yeah. is uh, the, what we can use there. Here we go, clear off stealth coming in once again. This time they will find that target. Holy Phoenix locked up, he goes down, and now touch. Flash comes out, clear off lands the bottom. Will get locked up again with the Howling Gale. He's not going to be able to escape this one, or is he? No, clear off says no. I love how Crystal came in there as well. He was like, huh? <laughs> no, I'm leaving from this one. Like, Fabulous is actually going for Koro here using his ulti, but you see that Rod of Ages, that the power mana? that it gives towards Koro. No mana left for Fab Fabulous, and Koro will be able to just get back into farming. Yeah, you don't want to get too close to those bushes. Crystal really wanted to try and lend some support to their support there, but if you get too close, then you're going to get caught as well. That's sort of trickling in one by one. Never want that to happen. They have to back off. Really though, this entire bottom lane side has been taken over. Nami, after he got his Trinity Force, really put it on some fancy moves here. And they've got plenty of ward coverage down around the blue side. FCZF getting in there to establish their ward line, which will definitely prep them for the next blue that comes up. So big advantage slowly growing for EDG. And this, this fits their style, you know, always a little bit slow to get going, but when they get going, holy hell, do they cause pain and Dark Passage. I got a feeling within the next 10 minutes, some serious pain is coming their way. And yeah, I am going to keep my eye on that blue because, oh, never mind, Nara's already wearing it. Those were just taken. You know, is he going to be trying to collapse in on this bottom side? Credit to Dark Passage here in there defensive warden inside of River and around that blue buff. Might not help oh. them though because Clearlove coming two. in. Look, listen, there's three men in there. They do get spotted out. Clearlove dives to the front. It's one versus three as the rest of the team do finally join in. Holy Phoenix goes down. There's a TP from Fab Fabulous. Here comes you though. Where is the shockwave? There it is. It pulls both of them back in. You get the one kill for the Rampage. Touch is going to fall. That's a double now for you. And Naru tried to help out there but was sent packing instead. And that is three kills for EDG. Possibly a tower with this next minion wave. Yep, shoving up two lanes right now. They they didn't even need Koro for that team fight. Doing his best to get that mid lane into the turret as well. Gonna be a secondary here for EDG. Yeah, and the Rue. Oh, Clearlove coming around the backside of him. He's got the stun ready and waiting. Oh, flashed it out of it. Nicely done. That will save him for now, but it will not keep the tower safe. Mid lane, meanwhile. You do see Koro, he's rotating around. He's going to join the rest of his team. They now have five members down the bottom here. They could keep the pressure on. See a recall here from a couple of members of EDG, but all of a sudden that gold lead moving up towards 9,000. It's a big, big lead that they've built up. Just trying to catch those guys that were recalling 
FCZF just escapes in front of Crystal's eyes. Nothing that Crystal could do to stop that one, but DP actually trying to get some deep awards in here. Let's have another look at that one, and again, it's clear of stealth, though. Yeah, look at that pause. He pauses right here, too, because his ultimate reveals, oh, there's more people in this bush than we thought, but after taking stock of the situation, yes, we will take this three on three, immediately targeting Lucian, and he goes down so quickly. Teleport is canceled because he knows they're outnumbered and the AD carry has already gone down. So a good cancel there by Fat Fabulous. Able to at least uh, make sure that he doesn't die as well. Interesting to see how the stacks are building actually on FZZF. They must be starting to clock in there. He got that a while ago and he's definitely picked up a, a chunk of skill. There you go, it's already at six. So that is not quite money <laughs> worth. It's when he gets the eight, I believe it is, the actual count on that one, I'm sure people in the world of Reddit and Twitter will correct me if I'm wrong. So, EDG, big advantage expected, honestly, but Dark Passage, they started off well. This is a, a good early showing, but no surprises. Crystal caught out. Oh, gets away by the Lantern. Nice. Yeah, he was trying to stand on top of it there to prevent him going back, but not quite working out for him. And again, it's clear love that tries to make those plays with that Rengar ultimate. This Dragon not going to be challenged by Dark Passage, and that will bring the close, uh, the gold, almost to 10,000 here for EDG. So look down the scoreboard, you having a great game at 501 Death Cap. Athene's Void Staff now added in as well. We've got that Blade of the Ruin King on now, mate. Yeah. Other side, there's a Ghost Blade Infinity here for Holy Phoenix, but I'm not sure that he can just trade with him at this point. No, I mean. Trinity Force and Blade turn your AD carry into a much more substantial fighter. Kogma here, he's he's got so many different speed boosts to rely on at this point, and so many sources of sort of burst damage there with the active as well uh, from Blade that it's it's even going to be sort of scary for Fab Fabulous to jump in on him now. Let's see whether the split push can work out for DP because that's the. Really, their only saving light right now. But the problem is, they need to be five members to prevent this EDG powerhouse pushing through. Fab Fabulous, we haven't really seen him other than that opening aggression. You can see him down the bottom. Yes, he's probably going to get this inner turret, uh, outer turret, but going to lose an inner for it. Yeah, I mean, he's gone with that um, Hydra that we talked about. He can split push very quickly. Uh, he does have the evolved Reich's uh, spike rack, but as you said, a bottom outer turret, not quite uh, worth the barren control that EDG are setting up right now. Notice how deep oh. the wards EDG are placing right now. The full red side jungle lit up for them. They've got lane pressure as well. Even Nami and uh, FCZF keeping the rest of Dark Passage busy right now. This is an easy Baron. Well controlled, two man Baron. They're gonna get a little bit of support from Koro towards the end, but Clear Love has done all of the hard work. Baron is secured for EDG. So, big advantages. Every objective, Dragon and Baron taken by them. Four towers to two. And Dark Passage are slowly but surely being suffocated back into their base. Gonna be a very hard comeback for Dark Passage. This is, you know, the scenario that they really needed to avoid falling too far behind. And I think this is what happens a lot that, you know, if, if the underdog team actually will just forget this because EDG are going to go in for this one. They've actually got yeah. towards touch and just gets blown to pieces. Crystal actually going for the absolute zero. The Cully coming back, but it hardly dents Koro, especially with Command Protect on him. And that's another turret going down. Second in a turret for Edward Gaming. Fab Fabulous doesn't want to stick around there. It will jump on you if you're not careful but my point was that this I think happens often when you have a, a big favorite in a game that a lane phase can be close but you really see the the skill gap difference between the two teams as the game progresses and things just snowball out of control. Yeah EDG completely playing by the books here they've cleaned up the map right now now they can easily siege up here they do have the Kogma so it's easy for him to get a shield Activate his W, a couple of long range hits, and you cannot really engage on this EDG team. There's so many options for them to peel for Name. It's ridiculous to try and get to the back lines. That's why you can see Fat Fabulous is not even thinking about jumping in. They're just trying to pelt them. Xerathon and Kha'Zix trying to do as much poke as they can. Lucian's culling coming back up soon, so they may be able to culling one more wave, but 
That's about it. Now may just stood waiting. He's like, yeah, you're not gonna hit me. I, I'm not moving, just gonna relax, just chill here. Pushes forward, takes himself another turret for his team. And you talked about it, obviously, the, the difference in this one. I think it was really all about that bottom fight. You know, Dark Passage came out on top, but the instant reaction from EDG to come straight in, take the dragon, yeah. pick up two kills, and that is really the difference, the, the instant reaction, the instant decisiveness of the teams between them. And EDG, obviously, far more experienced, despite Dark Passage being the big Turkish champions. You know, they've won heavily in their region. The fact is, the Chinese region is a much stronger region. EDG have dominated since their creation in, back in the uh, spring. One thing that I have noticed about uh, watching both EDG and Royal Club, it's very hard for their opponents to find times to return to base for healing or purchasing. Uh, you know, anytime they get an item breakpoint, it's very hard for them to work in the small window of time to actually go back to base. Just basing against these teams is an objective in itself. And EDG, they finish that dragon before the replays even up. And then they clean up some extra kills because you're trying to get there in time to answer what they've already started. Keep continuing to use this Baron just a minute left on it. And they're going to see if they can take maybe an inhibitor turret. They've got the top lane being pushed in by Koro. And this 2 1, 4 1 split, sorry is going to work well in their favor. Can they catch anyone off? You can see Clearlove stood on a ward. We'll spot that one, sweeps it out. Ultimate being used by Nuru just to keep them at bay and throw everything they can at Nami. But he's quite confident that he's going to survive through that one. The shielding from FZZF keeping him safe. And now they're just seeing if they can draw anyone into the jungle. I don't think Dark Passage are foolish enough to fall for it, though. Well, they'll probably die if they do. There, touch warding over the top of the wall, and Koro just walking between middle and top lane here, pushing that wave out once again. And they're just going to go straight in the box. Used so early there from touch, they do manage to hook in clear up. Can they burst him down? Less than half HP remaining, but he's Ooh. able to walk away. Oh. That Tori going low. Now they will get the kill on towards Nunu, and that is the inventory going down. They do hook in clear up once again. There's the shockwave onto Fun Fabulous. You right at the front here, and that will force them off in him going to EDG. Pretty easy cleanup for them. I mean, they don't they don't have to even dive. You know, just clear love popping his ultimate there. Name easily can hit the turret from range and they can play it safe, but they're just so far ahead that they can just bully their way right into the base. One inhibitor down means that the second push will be that much easier. They've got plenty of money to spend here. Go up and fill their fill up their pockets with the extra drag soul. So the suffocation the name of the game, and you can see it up to the 10 minute mark. Could start by Dark Passage, but EDG patiently played it out and then just slowly turned the screws as the game developed and used every little bit of their advantage they've had. Successful ganks along the way. Still really yet to see. This Kazix, of course, you know, picked in that split pushing, but it's just nothing to do for him right now. He's trying to keep them at bay, but they have such a good team comp, such a strong, solid team comp. Yep. You know, the big tanky frontliner, the brawler coming in from Clearlove, double shielding for Name to keep basically the superstar of the team completely safe. And that's why uh, it'll be a pretty easy siege for them for the secondary inhibitor. Um, they don't actually have to wait for Baron. They've got complete control of the area and they could set up wards and go for another pick but they could just as easily go up and siege another inhibitor turret right now. Looks like they are making that call. Top will be the target. Name gonna come up mid. Maybe he'll clean up one more minion wave and swing over to the rest of the team. Dark Passage, this is their chance. While Name is mid, maybe they can make some sneak attack work for them. Oh, last roll of the dice and Fabulous nope. shows himself. Well, they've got a pink ward here, so they're just uh, gonna try and wait it out. They don't have too many options. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Everybody run! Yeah, they kind of caught on up to the fight. Clear love here, all on his own. He's just going in for this one. But Fabulous will try and join in. The box comes down. And Dark Passage just scared of Clear love as he dives right on top of them. And that really opens things up now. EDG moving towards his top lane. I really like the fact that Banshees and Randwins was picked up there by Clearlove with the fact that Naru can just blow up these waves. They realize that actually 
Khalil and the rest of the team kind of have to dive to get in there to start these off. And there Whoa. we see once again the shockwave comes in. Naru going to be blown to pieces. Crystal will also get picked off. That two men down for Dark Passage. Holy Fiend is going to get focused. Fat Fabi just trying to lead them away. And now, mate, has by far the damage to deal with him. That is a triple kill picked up by you. Four members of Dark Passage down. And EGG will close out the game here. FCCF just bursting that monsoon down to top everyone off so they can walk in and tank down the turret. Dominant performance from EDG as they progress from the lane phase. 17 kills to two. I don't think this is any surprise to anyone in this matchup, but Dark Passage, it's a good start from women lane that can take something from this one. They played against the number one team in China. They did, man. They held their own in the very early game as well. Man, actually, both of the Kha'Zix and Rengar ended up level 16. They almost, <laughs> I think the hunt might have just started off there. Did Clear Love win the hunt as soon as it started? Split seconds, I have to go and back click that replay. Well, it's another win here coming in for EDG. I say another win. That's only their second game. And they <laughs> lost the first game against All right. Samsung White. They've won games in the past, Joe, so they technically have, you're that, not wrong. Exactly. I'll that. give it to you. They've won another game in history. Another <laughs> game. For sure. It's been two incredibly action-packed days as well, so forgive me for that one. For Dark Passage, of course, not exactly the ideal start to things, but, you know, this is also a big experience for them. They're from a, a new region, we can definitely say, with Turkey. They've dominated that region as well, and this was kind of the next step for them, come out on the international stage after winning Wildcard very impressively. And to be honest, yes, they've just lost to EDG, but we're talking about EDG here. This is no easy team by any means. And all the teams that did come to Korea to boot camp for Worlds for this group stage got so much extra time to practi practice against all of these very high caliber teams. Uh, Dark Passage didn't actually come over for those boot camps like everybody else did. So, you know, practicing against the other teams that were left in Europe not quite the same amount of training. So these actual games here of the group stages, this is basically the highest quality training that they can get against these very, very tough opponents where they can learn a lot from these different map movements from EDG. And one thing we should take away from this, obviously, for Edward Gaming is, yes, they do look very good. They are a solid team. This is what we expected. They are the number one seed from China, of course. And we had already heard rumblings before this tournament even began that they were giving Korean teams a very good run for their money. So, honestly, they they are up there in the favorites. I'd love to see what you know if there was odds going on with them, how high they would be because they've beaten the Samsung Whites of the world in scrims, but they can't quite do it on paper just yet. But they took them very close. And let's be honest, it was only the one single game. The second time that they meet which will, funnily enough, be the final game of the group. Yes. It's going to be a very, very interesting one to watch. And now there's a break in the action. Make sure you guys head over to Twitter. Uh, to Twitter. That's where it is. <laughs> and share your favorite moments from today's games by tweeting hashtag WorldBigPlays to at LOL Esports. But now let's check in with our analyst desk to get their thoughts on that win. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I think... The result that everybody was anticipating or expecting. We'll talk about the positives first. Dark Passage, they did come out. They they did pick up first blood and aggressive bottom lane. And for the first 10 minutes, held even. But that's EDG. EDG are always slow out of the gate. Before we talk about gameplay, picks and bans. What was Dark Passage thinking about the team comp in your mind, Crepo? I mean, they were just going for comfort picks and they just... Say like, okay, I like playing this into this and this into this, and yeah, the Kha'Zix top maybe, maybe that's the cheese aspect. Lucian Thresh is a really aggressive bot lane. Uh, you can still surprise even the best players if you flash flay into hook into exhaust and hopefully kill them over and over again. And that was that was their only hope to win. And uh, I know probably has a thing or two to say about Xeraf and Nunu combo. So yeah, so I did like their picks and bans in a way because I think that was their best chance of winning. They picked favorable matchups, and especially the mid lane, it sounds really goofy, but Orianna has no escape. So if Nunu walks up and snowballs you, Xerath gets all his free poking, and that can kind of snowball a lane and snowball a lot of pressure for your team. Unfortunately, that, it didn't happen. At yeah. the other side, though, I really like EDG's comp. I think it's really... Um, a little bit too much late game focus and against better teams you can get punished early. But look at it, it's Maokai, Rengar, Orianna, Kog'Maw, Janna. It has double engage from Maokai and, and Rengar. It has triple peel from Maokai, Orianna and Janna. And in the in, in the back line, who you're peeling for? The best hyper like carry hyperscaling carry Kog'Maw. So I really like the composition as is, but 
I think it can get abused in lane a little bit too much, but I I think it was a solid comp. I think it's it's very much EDG style. You know, Dark Passage, they started strong, as you said. They did pick up that first blood mechanically. They made some mistakes yeah, as, as the kills. game went on. They could have got more. But it wouldn't have mattered. I feel the same. Uh, what did, was EDG doing right that actually helped them pick up the win? I know in the mid lane, uh, you, you managed to 1v1 Naru. Uh, what else about the team you know, sort of stood out in your mind, Prolly? I thought the most important thing was once they took the mid turret, the Janna and the Rengar pushed up all the vision. And at that point, Xerath can't farm. And then their bot lane can't farm. So it almost snowballed all the gold lead to a point where now the enemies can't farm and you get to farm whatever you want. So it kind of kept Dark Passage from ever getting a foothold in that game. So Edward Gaming will be playing off against AHQ in the last game of the day. Is there anything from this matchup that AHQ can learn uh, to maybe take away, look for ways to take down the number one Chinese seed? If they if they open themselves up for uh, for too much of a late game composition and are this week early, then maybe they can lose the early game. But I mean, they're solid. They've played these these type of compositions before. They know exactly what they have to give up in order to just not lose the game straight up. But that that would probably be AHQ's like only hope. I do think AHQ is going to be able to see a lot from uh, them banning Syndra on blue side. I thought that was really interesting. They didn't want to pick it. For themselves, they wanted to ban it out, and I think AHQ is going to be able to pick something aggressive mid lane and kind of, you know, be able to catch them off guard. Well, we'll see if they decide to take that route. We are going to switch gears for a minute to see how all the fans are enjoying the action out of Taipei. To remind you, earlier in the show, we asked the Twitter sphere, "How do you guys worlds?" And our first response comes from at it's on 2D over in Sweden, who shows us how he worlds with his buddies at Umayu Umayu University in Sweden. Somewhere um, in Sweden. I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. yeah, I can't do that. Anyway, our next one comes from at Peachy, who shows us how she and her future League of Legends. Protégé, watch the games. And finally, at Gardner B02 shows us how they world in the United States Navy, where it's not just a job, it's an adventure. Great. Thanks for those photos, guys. And thanks again for sending them in. Remember, you can share how you world by tweeting your photos to us at LOL Esports. We've got more action coming your way. Next up, it is China's Starhorn Royal Club taking on the SK Gaming from the European LCS in Game 3 here of Day 2. We're going to check in on the teams very quickly. Starhorn Royal Club watching all the matches from the sidelines. They are waiting for their team, uh, their turn to take the stage. TSM, TSM they're in the building. We'll see what they can do. Is that their right substitute? Oh. And now they might go oh. down as well. Solo burst from the room. Oh, from Bobby Lillard bring him down. Good flash, counter flash. Holy Phoenix trading with him. Has he got enough? I'm not sure. The cutting going through, but no. Takes it down and now touches in trouble. Where is the shockwave? There it is. It pulls both of them back in. You get the one kill for the rampage. Touch is going to fall. That's a double now for you. Welcome back to day two of the 2014 League of Legends World Championship. I'm Ify Shok Zaportra here with Samsung White's AD carry Imp. Um, Imp, the first thing I want to ask you is that in the video leading up to this in Road to Worlds, you talked about how it was a failure last year. Try and express how bad you want the title this time around. 그 작년 월드컵 때 이제 삼성 오존 팀으로서 좀 살짝 실패를 겪었었는데 이번 월드컵에 이만한 각오 좀 들려주세요. 어 저번 시즌에 저희가 되게 자만을 많이 하고 어, 무너지게 됐는데 이번 시즌에는 팀원들이 어, 그때 탈락한 이후로 한 마음이 되어 지금까지 연습을 열심히 했기 때문에 저번 시즌과 같은 일은 늘어나지 않을 거라 생각해요. Uh, for last year Worlds, I think we are a bit too overconfident. But after we lost last year, um, as a team, we really worked hard and we really want to win this tournament. Well, you, you mentioned it yourself about being on, overconfident. You had a great first day yesterday. How do you keep yourself from maybe going down that path again? I talked about the 네, 그래, 해왔기 때문에 일어나지 않을 거라 생각해요. 아예 꾸준히 열심히 해오면 네. 뭐라고요? 네, 음, 
we practice really hard, and I think with that um, practice amount, I think we can stay confident and to remain and to win this tournament. Yeah. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about the 80 carries in the scene. Last year it was Piglet that got all the fame as Korean ADC as maybe the best and they brought home that world championship. How much do you want that people call you that? 작년 롤드컵 때는 이제 피글렛 선수가 SKT1 K팀이 우승하면서 최고의 원딜러로서 꼽혔는데 어떻게 이, 이번 대회 때는 그 자리가 탐나나요? 어, 작년 롤드컵 때까지는 피글렛 선수가 세계 최고의 원거리 딜러 선수 딜러였다고 생각해요. 피글렛 선수는 어, 작년 롤드컵 때 자기가 더 돋보일 수 있음에도 불구하고 막 팀의 승리를 위해 더 열심히 그렇기 때 열심히 그런 플레이를 했기 때문에 SK가 작년에 우승을 차지할 수 있었던 것 같다고 생각하고 저도 이번 시즌에 피글렛 선수처럼 제가 돋보이기보다는 팀의 승리를 위해서 네, 공헌하고 싶습니다. So I think up to last year Worlds, Piglet was the best ADC. Uh, it's because during the games he put his team in front of him and he sacrificed for his team's victory. And also for this year Worlds, I want to do the same thing. I want to focus more on winning rather than my own fame. So does that mean when some people and casters maybe put Name ahead of you and as AD carry or best AD carry in the tournament, that doesn't bother you at all? 그럼 그렇게 치자면 이번 월드컵 들어가기 전에 앞서서 많은 사람들이 남해가 최고의 원딜러라고 꼽았는데 그게 좀 신경 쓰이지 않으세요? 어 저는 그렇게 생각하지 않아요. 남해 선수가 최고의 원거리 딜러라고. 어저 같은 경우에는 일단 어제 경기에서 저를 이기지 못했고 저 같은 경우에는 제가 생각하기에 한국에서 라인전이 되게 약한 원거리 딜러라고 생각하는데 그런 저에게도 좋고 만약 남희 선수가 최고의 원거리 딜러라는 이름을 가지고 싶으면 일단 저를 꺾고 8강에서 데포트를 만나 꺾어야 네 그때 최고의 딜러라고 말해야 늦지 않, 그때 최고의 원거리 딜러라고 말해도 늦지 않을 것 같다 생각합니다. So um, I don't agree that Nami is the best ADC. Um... Last year, uh, last uh, yesterday, when we played against them, he lost to me, and I think I'm not that much. I'm not that much of a lame bully in th among the Korean ADCs. So in order for Nam Namae to become the best ADC, I think he has to beat me and Deft, and then maybe he can re reclaim that title. <laughs> well, we will see if he can pull that off. Thank you very much. All right, now to preview our next match, let's send it over to the guys at the desk. Thank you very much, Shark. Some strong words there from Imp, as usual, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, it is time for our third match of the day. It's a battle between the Starhorn Royal Club from the LPL and Europe's SK Gaming. So for Starhorn Royal Club, they got off to a strong 2-0 start. They remain the front runners of Group B, but it was not an easy start yesterday. They really had to bounce back against TPA, who pushed them around in the early game. What do you think, Polly? Um, I think... Starhorn really just doesn't care about the early game. They're really ready to make their team comps work. They do the support mids and then strong carries top. They're not just doing Maokai, you know, tanky tops. So this actually really accentuates boom team comps, you know? You think about it, normally when you have a tank top, you see the two threats as being the mid lane and the bot lane. Starhorn's coming at it with three threats, with the top, mid, and bot coming at them. And you can't ignore the jungle threat either. Yeah, I mean, their jungle's really good as well, but what's interesting to me as well, you talk about the team comps and whatnot, is, uh, and the early game especially, is you've got this really interesting cycle in this group where uh, TSM beat SK early game, SK beat TPA early game, TPA beat Royal Club early game, and Royal Club beat TSM early game. And you've got this circle where they're all doing different things to each other in the beginning of the game, and so you can't call like the beginning for any given team here, which is very confounding. Because you normally have like a really good idea of how those teams are supposed to stack up in the laning phase. Uh, but ultimately, yes, like I think Royal Club come in here with really amazing mid game, as you come to expect from them. And that's been killer. And Insect was killer. He single-handedly destroyed TSM yesterday with his Rengar. We yeah. switched over Gears a little bit, talking about junglers in this matchup, because Gilius earlier today, he stepped up. In contrast yeah. from yesterday to today, he's definitely impressed. So between Insect, who's playing for Royal Club, and looking at Gilius and what he did earlier and, and helping SK's early game, right. how are we going to see that jungle matchup play out? Let's start with Prolly. I think the biggest thing is... I always come back to it. I think the mid lane. I think Gilius and uh, Jezzes are starting to get it together a bit. And I think that's where the jungle pressure is going to be. It's going to be mid lane. And for Starhorn side, I feel like it's going to be more of waiting for the dragons and for the grouping phase for the jungler really to shine. Yeah. yeah. I I can't really agree with you enough about the mid lane focus for SK Gaming because when I think back to their prior game today, they had actually sacrificed their pick and ban phase to get a good mid lane out there. They picked their Tristana and Sona first round to see what the enemy mid laner was, saw it was Syndra and said, okay, great, 
Ari and Jarvan, great gank synergy, great follow up on a low mobility mid laner to make sure they can get the kills. And you saw Gillies repeatedly have strong ganks there. I think that's going to continue to be the focus for SK. Let's see if it's going to be enough because it's time for our experts to play Oracle, predict who they think will win the match, starting with Stone Rule Club or SK Gaming. I want to know, Freak. Who is walking away with a victory here? Uh, I think it's Starhorn Royal Club. They're still my number one for the group. I think they're going to come out undefeated, and they've got to beat SK to do that, so it's going to happen. And Prolly? I'm going to say SK will win the early game, and then Starhorn will take the game overall. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's see if it works out. You guys at home have been sharing your picks over on lolesports.com, and the majority of you are also siding with the Starhorn Royal Club and seeing that they will come out on top. Let's see if it actually happens. Teams are ready for the rift, so as we send it over to our casters, Starhorn Royal Club's team has been undergoing an evolution with the addition of its two Korean players, and while they're still adjusting to communication issues, they believe it is change that will set them up for long-term success. Hello, 로얄 클럽에 가게 됐는데 그 후에 저까지 포함해서 제가 테스트를 볼수 있게 계기를 만들어 주셨어요. 经过了一段时间我们联系了韩国那边的俱乐部然后引用两名韩国选手跟一个韩国教练玩这个阵容对我来说我是比较满意的我们说中文他们听不懂他们是韩国人听不懂本方国哈纳罗都中国哈纳
for SK Gaming, I think uh, more than I mean, every game is important here. Let me. I don't. You want don't want to be zero three that though. That's you don't want to be zero yeah. three, and then looking at your last three games, thinking we have to win every single one of those. I want to start off with saying that that last game from SK Gaming was a marked improvement on the two previous ones. Yeah, definitely a marked improvement on the, especially that early game. So we'll see what they do this time around with Gilius because facing uh, Starhorn Royal Club, obviously Incense Re Insects Rengar is a big, big target here. So that's probably going to be a ban. Uh, don't think Gilius would be confident bringing that one into into the playing field here. Everybody coming against SK yep. Gaming has one thing clearly in their mind. Freddy, we're banning you out. Nidalee and Aatrox once again. Will we see another Maokai ban maybe against them? Because Freddy has just been forced onto this Mundo every game. Yeah, I mean, well, it's worked for everybody else. So every consecutive team that plays them is just going to keep using it until they actually see a different result here. And Freddy, you know, he's come such a long way. If you think back to spring last year with against Law Authority, but it wasn't that impressive at all, but he's really made his mark in SK Gaming. And again, three bans targeted at Freddy, which means that, you know, the likelihood of a possible Mundo coming out for him again is real. We see Zed banned away Ooh. there as the final ban. Interesting choice here for Royal Club because they have very high priority on both Rise and Zillion for their team. Zillion, just because of the way they like to play with their top lane threat, as they mentioned on the Analyst X, plus their jungle and their bottom lane and their mid. It kind of enables everybody Ooh. to go very aggressive. But the other one is Rise for that top lane. And there we go, he already switches over to it. It's not gonna be uh, the Jax or Aurelia that he also likes, but Rise definitely a very big flex pick for these guys. It still could go mid, and they have the option of pulling out that Aurelia still. Well, SK Gaming baited into that one. They instantly lock in that Zillion and say, no, we're having it. Yes, yeah. I don't think it is a bait because, I mean, the mousing over it, Royal Club definitely do have a high priority on that champion, but they're happy giving that up this time for Rise. Well, you say that, but Jezza's has not played Zillion this season. Nor is then rated if you're yeah. you know, looking at No, it's a takeaway. I mean, it's a high priority yeah. for Royal Club. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's taken away, but who's going to play it? <laughs> is it going to be unrated? Is it going to be Jezza's? The Kha'Zix, of course, was locked in. It's something we saw Gilius on Previously with Unicorns of Love as well. Ooh. Nah, he just he, he, he did this, did this he yesterday. He did it yesterday as well. Yeah. He's just playing. Sadly for us. <laughs> as we are, we're going to see that Janna coming out. What is Insect going to go for? Lee Sin yeah. is the obvious choice here, and it will be locked in. Janna also been picked up by zero for that bottom lane. Obviously, the roar goes up from the crowd. Everybody loves to see Insect on Lee Sin. However, he's already pl he's playing this into a zillion. And if you try and pull one of his classic moves in that late game, you kick somebody in, that guy's going to have a zillion ult on. They're going to get that zillion ult down. The problem is, can you extract that guy when he gets back up? Well, we'll see how it works out. Of course, the Janna. Once again, for zero this time around, starting to become very popular at Worlds here. You can see, 75% win rate. Four games already picked out. Yep. What will SK go with? Is it going to be the Twitch? It's all about positioning. Has Candy Panda got it in him to play so well against such an aggressive Starhorn Royal Club team? That answers a few questions, though. Zillion is support. And it will be Syndra in the middle for Jezus. So SK may actually be looking for a lane swap, even though they're working with a substitute jungler. Lane swap's really hard to pull off with substitutes on your team. Everybody does have to be coordinated and down with the times. Everybody has to be on that same page. But, you know, with them going up against Uzi as their opponents in the lane and with them having Twitch, lane swap's looking like a real possibility here for SK early on. Yeah, I, I don't know about Syndra for Jezus. He's played it uh -oh. once all season. Trouble. Could be dangerous. We are going to be seeing Yasuo locked in here. How did we get through the ban phase without talking about the most bans against them? Always focused against Korn with his Fizz and his Yasuo. 24 bans against the Yasuo and 20 on Fizz. Both of them get through. He gets his pick of the litter, saves it till the end. And we do get to see Horn on the famous Yasuo. This is actually possible. This could be the first showing of Nar, but looking by the cheeky grin on Chris's face, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, you say that, 
Nar is that. Oh, uh, Nar is actually a, a champion you can use to split push effectively. Freddy does love that style of play, and Nar also does bring a lot of uh, team fight crowd control. He can lock you down uh, when he gets the ultimate. Uh, okay, never mind. We'll stop talking. About it. <laughs> Being the lip, yes. lip reading master that I am, Freddy was saying, "I can't play it. I can't uh, play it. I can't play it." Uh, which is obviously an issue uh, when it comes to, you know, the Nobody. World Championship and just taking picks that you can't play. Nobody yeah. could really play it. Right I mean, now, let's face it. There's a whole list of people. I was talking to a whole bunch of top laners uh, back in North America that are saying, yeah, they really thought it was going to make an appearance here at World. Somebody was going to bring it out as a surprise. But as you said, you know, in the boot camps, people were trying to refine strategies. They yeah. weren't trying to learn new champions that they could bring out. And NAR is definitely something that takes a long time to actually learn how to play well and learn to play with your team because of the unstable nature of the champion. All right, well, we can get off that now though because they're not gonna use it. So let's look at the team comps. What do we got going for us here? Because the Yasuo has snuck through. Surprise, I mean, it, as you mentioned, 24 bands against Star Hall and Royal Club throughout the summer and the playoffs. And how did he not get focused so, by SK? In the research that all teams are going to do against Royal Club, the two things pop out to you in ban phase mm. are Corn and Insect. So you, you ban out the Rengar, oftentimes the Lee Sin, and the two for Corn are the Fizz and the Yasuo. That's four bans, so everybody always has to sort of pick and choose between those. But because they opted for, you know, the Alstar they didn't want to give away, and then the Zed coming out here for SK, uh, they had to give them all up. And it's going to be very scary for them because these are comfort picks for Starhorn Royal Club. And them on comfortable champions when you're the ones with a, sub a substitute on your team makes for a pretty awkward situation. Well, we are going to be getting into game then for this one. It is, of course, Starhorn Royal Club versus SK Gaming. And as ever, you can also tweet to us at LOL Esports with SHR win or SK win using those hashtags. We'll figure out how that vote goes a little bit later on, but for now, into an important game specifically for SK. Already zero for two, and they've got a formidable opponent here with, honestly, some pretty formidable comfort picks as well. Yeah, I mean, Insect known for the champion, and as we already went over, Corn very big for Anya, so maybe it signals a little bit of lack of preparation. Uh, from SK, or maybe they have uh, perfect things to deal with it. Now, the lane swap definitely even looked like more of a possibility here. N rated gone with a Doran's ring for his zillion to start it out. And if they're looking for lane swap, they might want to do an early invade to get some wards down. Oh, flash in the cleaver misses. Uzi's gonna come around the side. Oh, you don't know want to go there. Blocking out. Rocket that was really nice from Uzi. Blocking yep. the cleaver, knowing that he's got his jump available to get away. The thing is, that does hinder their lane. Last time we saw uh, this from Uzi, they, of course, like to get the early shove with the Tristana lane, leveling explosive shot. Now he's got his rocket jump. It will be a bit harder to shove. Uh, that all being said, though, if the lane swap does play out, doesn't even matter. Well, so, oh, Uzi. ring around the rosy. Where are you going, Gideus? Now he's clear. Who's he's like, eh, <laughs> I don't fancy it. But level one rocket jump. That's uh, forced him into that one. But while that's all happening, Calder and Insect are just like, that. Nah, we got it. We're going to take you red. Yeah, they're pretty much expecting the, the move here from uh, SK. The SK got some very deep wards in the jungle there. Uh, to try and see where they'll shake out. Sneaky sneaky red steel, though. It does go unnoticed. SK didn't have defensive wards on this side, so Insect does get to start out at his opponent's red uh, without giving away any intel. When Cola gets there, though, they'll see he's coming from that red side and at a delayed time. So Gilius can infer starting location. Yeah, so keep our eye see where he goes. Straight to red. Oh, but Insect. No, nope. it's gonna go blue. It's gonna be a standard start. Boom. Yeah, bit of a swap over there. Gilius moving in. Will be spotted Spot though by that ward, so they know that Gilius is in there. Oh, oh yeah, there it is. Going for it. Yeah, they could shove out their lanes too. Let's see if they how early they call this collapse. There's the ping. They're saying go now. Gilius will spot him. Sonic wave catches. Only on the red buff. That's gonna delay him. Now Corn's gonna be the focus target. Gilius uh, fancies that one. Didn't get the help from Jezzes that he required. And that does mean he's going to be starting a buff down as Insect will be starting with three buffs. 
It costs their mid laner a little bit of experience, though. Uh, and a decent chunk of life as well. Let's see what Gilius does. Now that he's got no extra buff to go after, maybe he goes for a an earlier gank. He does have a blue buff, though, and that's the most important buff for him early so that he can uh, clear easily through the jungle. What he goes for in this one certainly was more impressive in that Ooh. last game. Then Rage is going to take Go a lot of damage. Uzi dives in for that one. The ignite down from zero, but they're not able to pick Whoa. up. Meanwhile, Candy Panda putting a lot of damage back. He oh. flashed in for it, but wasn't able to get those last hits down. Does draw the heal from Uzi, but that is going to be a summonerless support Janna. A little bit more vulnerable. Let's check into that one. Room Prison coming down. I don't think the damage is there, but Freddy might be in trouble and will be forced to recall with that one. It's a very aggressive style from both sides. Zero low on hit points. And rated low on hit points, but does have Ignite still. Of course, did start out with that Thorns Ring, so those bombs going to be doing more than your average support start, that's for sure. Teleport used by Freddy. He returns back to the top lane. Serious trading going on between the two junglers at the moment. You can see, of course, both taking the rates. We'll see whether they collapse on that mid lane bomb again on Uzi. Very low. Look at this gank here from Gilius, though. He's got perfect moves, perfect positioning here on Uzi's lane. And they are summonerless. Remember, they burned Zero's flash in the level one. Oh, this is bad, bad news. He's going to try and get in there. Howling Gale will knock him off. He's going for zero, gets the kill. Kohler has TP down, but he's not got the damage. He can't finish off. Meanwhile, oh, Gilead's no. going for Uzi. He's going to go too deep. There is the jump from Insect in, and Korn joins in. It was actually Uzi that got the kill. Overextension there from Gilius. Well, it was completely worth it. Gilius gets first blood money, plus he draws away all the solo laners. SK solo laners have two free lanes now. Plus, the teleport is going to be down for Cola to get back to that lane. Re Gilius just relieved a lot of pressure there. But, I would argue, after getting that first blood, he could have escaped. He could have just <laughs> ran straight <laughs> to his turret. Well, he would have still drawn everyone towards him. Rise was in his way. Fight. Rise teleport in between him and his own turret. But one person, is he going to stop him? He's only going to use that room prism for a couple of seconds, and then he can get away. Uh, not sure on that one. Well, one thing that we are at least sure on is that Uzi has now a pickaxe coming back into this lane. We'll see how that all works out for him. We can see that Enrated actually picking up that Mana Chrysalis Insect is going to come down bottom. Enrated needs to be very, very careful here. He's on his own. He does not have good ward coverage either. He's or a flash. They're yeah. completely blind. Well, they're waiting this one out, so Candy Panda is actually going to get back in there. That wave going to be naturally pushing thanks to the yep. explosive shot. But they're going to come out from this one. Howling Gale. Oh, nice speed up there from Enrated. Gets Candy Panda away from that tornado coming flying in behind him. And look at this choice from Candy Panda as well. He's gone for a very early uh, lifesteal here, going Vamp Scepter to sustain through these constant trades. Zero and Uzi always trading in this lane. So he's going for the early sustain to try and sit through this one because still Ionizer support won't be able to help you. You know, all of this trading back and forth, all this movement from Star Wars Royal Club has actually bought Jezz some time in that mid lane. And if you think about, obviously, when he played Bjergsen on Yasuo, it did not go well for him. So he's got himself a little bit of a reprieve so far. They both hit level six, and we'll see whether he manages to hang on a little longer against Korn, because this is a matchup that has not gone well for him in the past either. At the moment, though, kept up in farm. See if he can keep going on that front. Actually going for the chalice first of all. Insects got the timer for this red, yeah. remember. Gilles is actually pretty low here. Well, Insect having the timer, but I think realizing that he was probably there, decides not to push through. And there's a, okay, another trade down bottom, but there's another small little thing. Uh, Insect placed his pink ward in the back of that red bush before he actually walked into it. So he didn't know there was an SK pink ward there. And since that was already available before he placed that ward, SK now know where Insect already placed his pink ward. So it's not gonna provide a whole lot of value for him. They can work around that information. 
So, whoa, can he pound it going down? He's got it! Uzi straight up taking him down and then ready now in trouble. One more hit should do it. Uzi gonna go down in the process. No, the shield! Oh, he saves him. And that's a double for Uzi. Uh, questionable aggression there from Candy Panda going uh, pretty deep onto Uzi. Maybe he got heel baited there, thought it was still down. Yeah. Completely, completely mistimed it. Uh, three kills on Uzi now, on a Tristana. <laughs> yeah. Big problems for SK Gaming. This is getting out of yeah. hand quick. That is not only a BS Sword, that's BS Sword plus pickaxe here for Uzi very early on. Bad news for his bottom lane. And, you know, I said it in that last game where they face check, gave up first blood, struggled in the lane as well after that. But this should be the, the rock for SK Gaming in this scenario where they've got that substitute coming in. Insect! Well, okay. <laughs> he got the kick, he dashed to the ward. Sadly for him, he kicked Jezus away. Not quite the insect kick maneuver that we're used to, that's for sure. So, Korn. That's version 2, dear man. <laughs> Next level. This is. Oh. oh, this is tricky. This is tricky. SK going for this one. They know that. Insect's kick is down. Korn's ultimate is, of course, available. They've got three members collapsing in on this blue buff. They got their own secured a moment ago. This might have to be a smite fight, and you can see Gilius takes it. Blue buff steals are a pretty high percentage when you do have Syndra on your team, too. They did a good job timing that one with the base of Cola. So they take a small window, and they get the objective just in time. Good shot calling there from SK. Bottom lane again, fresh at 72 to 60. CS here, favor of Uzi. It's those three kills that are the real problem for SK Gaming. You can see the damage that comes out of Uzi with that BF sword and pickaxe combo that he's got in there. They look in other areas though. Freddy doing an exceptional job in terms of farm. 87 to 61 CS for Cola. You know, only going to be getting stronger tier and catalyst in there at the moment. Meanwhile, Insect. He's having a move down. He's at Golems right now. Could end up coming in towards his bottom lane if they want to push out this turret. We'll have to have a seat. Yeah, there's an important ward here in that side lane bush from the SK bottom lane. Uh, that will see a uh, lane gank here if SK goes, but it does have two hits off of it. So Pro Club know there's a ward here, and they will alert Insect to try and work around it. Ooh, recall. Ready timing it right, or is he? That's the question. Turn it around. Uh -oh. Getting jumped on. That wind wall doing itself a favor and stopping him was crucial. That could have been the mid lane going down for Starhorn Royal Club. They're trying to take advantage of this. They're going for Dragon. Gilius is going to find zero here. The rest of Starhorn do claps on towards him. Gilius sidesteps there from the Sonic Wave, but he gets kicked oh. in. And there's the ultimate from Korn. He held his nerve, and that will be Dragon for Royal Club. There's the classic Lee Sin Yasuo oh. combo. And you got to see there how it's such a big advantage when your bottom lane is constantly pushing up. They instantly collapse on the fight mid uh -oh. and roam up there. Candy Bad is caught. Ooh, pink ward. Oh. <laughs> he flashed before the pink ward went down there even. And we saw the mastery of Yasuo from Korn as well. The dash behind the wind wall to stop that extra little bit of damage right at the end that possibly could have finished him off in that mid lane. Either way, it's Royal Club here taking the first dragon of the match and sitting at a two and a half thousand gold lead. His top lane, Freddy, as I said before, got a solid CS lead. We saw the uh, trade back and forth, which for Freddy, it's not really that big of a problem because, as you can see, he's ultimately generating right back up. Yeah, Freddy's doing, once again, a magnificent job on this Mundo, farming extremely well. But we can't talk enough about the bottom lane of Royal Club. Whoa, Gilius! Jumping over the wall for this one. It looked kind of cool, but just a couple <laughs> of slows, not enough. Well, he did evolve his wings at level 6. There you go. That's one thing, you know, if we'd have seen maybe that from the uh, last matchup, it could have been so much different, but no. Still 4-1 in favor of Star on Royal Club. Big advantage in this bottom lane for Uzi. Right, this is the second. Oh, gank towards mid. Can he get the knockup? Oh, Easy. Yes, he can. Yeah. Jez is going down here. Sonic Wave lands. Thank you very much. I'm going to steal that one for you. Kill secure. Oh, bottom lane as well. Uzi trying to get a bomb on his head, but may have done enough. And re rates super low. Uzi actually had Flash and Eel. Zero had a Flash as well as an Ignite there. So possibly could have finished off. 
Maybe Insect will come around in time for this one. There is a ward yeah. in that tribush. There he's going to show himself. Candy Panda instantly hits the stealth. Candy Panda Ooh, Candy Panda almost walked into that one. Juked himself. <laughs> almost, almost. That could be the turret. Star on Road Club will take their first one of the game here. Jungle Invade continues though. Oh, and he finds Gilius there. And this is going to be a close, close trade. Gilius thankful that he evolved his wings so he can leap away to safety. And that is going to be the blue steel, or is it? Because Gilius and Rated and Candy Panda coming back around. Insect not quite close enough to get the steel. He will land the Sonic Wave and gets the steel secure. Insect doing the right thing, playing off the bottom side of the map where they're strong. Second game in a row, we say this, we see this bottom lane. Woo! Oh, okay. Oh. They found Enraged in there for that one. Insect yeah. lands his Q. His ultimate is on himself there, Enraged. So won't actually go down from that one. Insect almost being bombed to death in the end. SK trying to use the position in there to get this middle turret, and they will get it. That's the first one of the game for them. That's a First of many, they're the first to take the tower down. And Star Wars Club could have taken the objective earlier on. Candy Panda taking low. The Ignite is running. The slowdown on Uzi puts a couple more hits in him. Freddy now tower diving on here. He's going to get baited oh! out. Oh, he's in trouble. He gets caught up, and it's the return kill. And that was double flash between them. Not sure it was worth it. It does, of course, wipe away the way from Cola. So overall, bonus for him. Yeah, definitely a good move there. Uh, he's able to kill, whenever you're able to kill him under turret, they do lose uh, on way more experience. Freddy, though, he's really the shining light for SK. He is the one who's got the lead for them. That's where uh, they should try and take control of this game. Uh, maybe some more jungle attention they can get down that turret, get some extra global gold. Here we go. Let's see. It's just going to be briefcase after brief briefcase, and then the ring around the rosy. Good flash on that one, but Freddy's right back on top of you. I'm not sure when uh, SK Gaming were coming into this tournament whether Freddy envisioned playing Munda for the first three matches back <laughs> to back, but uh, he's still doing a good job in terms of farm in that top lane. Has himself an advantage building. We saw how much of a monster he can be against the Taipei Assassins on that champion. We'll see whether the rest of his team can keep up. So far, it is Starhorn Road Club with the advantage in kills, but still it's a tower to SK. Gilius actually on the bottom side of the map once again here. I'm trying to stop out this corn ring. Oh, that's a level 12 as the 9. Yeah, no follow up from that, but could have done some good damage. Yes, it was fairly close. Here we see Insect oh. coming in once again up to the wall. TP's coming down as well. The Q from Insect hitting the minion there, and Gilius and thank his lucky stars because of that teleport from Cola. There was a lot of people around there with a good amount of damage. They might try and put the down the damage onto the tower. Good wave clear from Jezus though. That means they yeah. force them off. That was a bit forced there. I mean, that was probably an instance where they pinged and say go, and it doesn't work out. They lose a whole bunch of minions up top. Teleport's going to be down. There's nothing they can shove. The dragon's not up. They can't even prep for this one. So definitely a little bit of a misstep there. Royal Club trying to force something mid. Uh, Insect was standing on that ward, so the whole plan sort of turned around on them. Yeah, and all they did is they took Jez's flash. Maybe we'll see whether it gets turned into a big advantage, but SK Gamer will be happy to keep that pressure on in the top lane because Kona Stein's a struggle in this one, but this bottom lane, this is becoming a serious, serious problem right now. Infinity Edge already picked up by Uzi, and they're continuing to push it. Almost 50 CS is a lead that Uzi's got there. And, you know, you look at Royal Club and you say that Uzi won oh, wow. the biggest, he's not the biggest playmaker on the team, and Rayton is going to get his ultimate box here. They need to jump away. Candy Panda starts to move in. Gilius is there as well. They get the slow up oh. to zero. And not sure they've Teleport. got the damage here. He's going to come Gilliam. off. TP is going to be coming into that one. Freddy is behind them. Zero surely will go down from this one. Although he's got it low, Gilius does get the kill, but will fall himself as well. But it's not over yet because Freddy's around the side here and he splits off. There's three members of Royal Club coming around him. Insect chases him down, puts down the briefcase. Is he going to be able to walk past him? No, knocks into the ultimate. Has he got the heal regen to try and get out of this one? The rest of his team coming around the side. Caught, locked up, and taken down by Jezus. SK Gaming come out on top once again. Just in time for Dragon. Perfect timing for SK. Royal Club over commit, committing everything onto Freddy. The juicy, juicy tank. The Fed member on the team. The one with all of the power for SK. Freddy takes the hits. He gets them the objective. 
So where does that leave us then? Just, well, it's less than 2,000 gold at this point. We know SK Gaming stronger as the game goes on as a team generally. And the fact is here that Royal Club, we heard it in that last video, as we see that fight once again, that their problem lies in communication. And uh, look at it, it was a messy turn of events from Royal Club. Well, as we watch this unfold, this is like a, this is everybody starting to collapse here through the jungle, but they don't leave wards behind them. Uh, Royal Club doesn't leave any blue wards here through the jungle. So this is why they spend everything on Freddy. They think they've got him out there. They're like, okay, this is great. Three versus one. We can surround this guy. We can burn everything. But all of the members of SK are still coming down. And when they finally get there, it's a beautiful stun from Jez's. And they can easily pick up the kill on the corn. Uh-oh, he's dead. Yep. Whoa. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Yeah, not much to talk about from that one. <laughs> Three on one, you land everything, he's gonna go down. Jezus caught out of position. Look at this, oh, Uzi and Cola Freddy. coming in. Freddy this time will get knocked up. Has he got enough health? Has he got enough regen to survive? There's, there's five of them over there. It, and it's taking a hell of a long time to kill them off, and Freddy survives it against five from Royal Club. But look at the choice here. Candy Panda's shoving mid this whole time. SK just trying to delay, Whoa. trying to delay this whole team of Royal Club here. If they can keep them up here long enough, they're gaining mid-secondary turret. They're taking a hell of a lot of damage here. The whole of Royal Club trying to back off, and SK not letting them. They're going to keep on pushing along the top lane. The bomb gone to zero, forces him back. And this is buying all of the time for Candy Panda to try and put all of the damage on the inner. Doesn't have the minion wave to finish it off, but great play from SK and Freddy pulling the entire team to him once again. Yeah, he's got some sort of magnetic field here. All of uh, Royal Club, again, dumping a lot of abilities into Freddy, only to chase him under the turret and have to turn around because SK collapsed. They gain a little bit more back into this game. That being said, Royal Club still very much in the lead here. And Uzi has hit a very strong curve. He's gotten out of the trough. Oh, he's done. He got him. Oh, <laughs> Flash. He does get the flash, so that's still... A uh, win for Uzi. Oh, Dark the road. To Cola here. This could be real dangerous for them. Ultimate is actually on Gilius, so he's not actually going to die. Insect in the meantime going to be flashed onto by Candy Panda. They kill him. They're going to kill Cola as well. SK turning up the heat. They spend everything bottom. That's going to be the kills plus tower going down. Uzi can answer up top, though. Royal Club will be able to get that top side. Will SK actually decide to sh keep shoving here because it's two shoving lanes for Royal Club to only one for SK? I think they should. They're going to keep going. Defending. They're going to take down that turret. Remember, the inner's on next to nothing. Uzi will take that turret down. He's going to keep on going in the top lane. Freddy's held out, but they're collapsing in from the jungle. Are they going to get close enough? There's only two members here. This is tricky. Teleport is available for Cola if he can go for it. There he is. Teleport into the side push. SK Gaming are going for this one. Zero of the focus. He goes down. Cola in the next run, but they're going to get on towards him. Gilius goes down, Candy Panda drops, and just like that, it's a double kill for Korn. He wants more. And Raids has got a flat oh, out brilliantly stop. there from that one. Meanwhile, Uzi has taken down that top inner tower as well. Freddy not able to get there to defend that one, so a lot going on all over the map here. Nice closure by Royal Club down on the bottom side, able to get them the two kills as well. Yeah, costly decision by SK to keep shoving down in the bottom lane. Uzi takes down turns so quickly with his static ship for shoving the wave, and then the, the Infinity Edge attack damage for taking down those two turrets. Gets both Whoa. of them in time, and he still has enough life to take the hits from Jez's. That's also, by the way, he's got his max rating of uh, rapid fire fully maxed out now, level five. So helping him take down those turrets that much quicker. Freddy, oh. TP. Going in, Freddy comes around the side. They've got to follow Jez is coming in as well. Can they lock on towards it? Corn's the man they want, but it may well be Insects. They're going to take a secondary prize. He uses the kick, <laughs> catches out Jez. He's pulling everyone towards it. Meanwhile, the mid lane, they're going to focus in there. Candy Panda on towards him, locking up as much as they can. Candy Panda focused in. Zero and Cola on towards him on the tower. They're going to dive on this one. Have they got him? They have, and they turn it around. Zero uses the monsoon, saves Cola's hit points, and they get themselves a Another kill. And that's a great trade for Royal Club because they gain control of mid lane, getting down that mid. Oh, Gilius, you dead. Well, that's 
an uh, interesting maneuver. Don't know what he was thinking. That Look at that. He doesn't know himself what he's thinking. Hands on head. We saw it in the bottom right. And they lose it. Oh. This one of Cola. Cola's going down. They kill off Jezus. Freddy here looking to be a hero. Who's he going to go for? Who's he there? Corn now joining in as well. They're going to try and kill off Freddy. But he's wow. coming oh. off. Who's he chasing? And Rayton to the top time. Here is Freddy back into it. Can he hold off on this one? He can. Oh, they're all so low. They're all so low. And Candy Banner's back alive. Uzi's going to run away from this one. Freddy's going to continue chasing. Oh, he's got three members. He's tried to bait them in. But is it too much? I'm not too sure. Freddy oh. does manage to get away. And just this, again, this game is wild. This game is chaos, Steve. <laughs> Constant skirmishes all over the map. Constant teleports trying to cut off different people on multiple sides. It's everybody not afraid to fight. I at least. We're enjoying the mid game here. Finally, some focus on the dragon, though. Vision for both teams, so we may see even Insect more fights. Stealing. Ooh, oh, that was really Quick close. Quick attack, well. real close. Real, second, real close. Second of three dragons going to SK. Freddy, just incredible performance from him overall. I have to say, I'm very impressed with SK keeping up in such a chaotic game. This is kind of where Royal Club thrive, and SK are almost there toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. They're answering back in many of the instances. A lot of times it is because so many of Royal Club's cooldowns are being dumped into Freddy. He's doing a good job soaking things up. Got to point out at this stage, though, Gilius there, we saw him just completely, well, I'm Lapping not sure what he was thinking. Maybe. Yeah. And we saw that in the last game as well, remember, in a turret with Jarvan as he dove into the team and ended up dying and they lose the turret. Those are the kind of mistakes that can end up costing you games and a team like Royal Club aren't scared to really capitalize when there's a five on four in front of them. All right, so it has come down a little bit here, but let's take a look at a couple of these items I do like from SK. Candy Panda's got both of his blades right now. So you do have to worry about that roaming twitch if you're Royal Club and set up a little bit more uh, ward coverage. Plus, they've got Jezz with a really early Sonya's Hourglass uh, for that Syndra in the mid before he goes with Death Cap or before he goes with a Void Staff because this, there's been so many skirmishes across the map. If he's able to get off his active for the Zanyas, then that can be the difference between life and death. Just buying a few more seconds for the rest of your team to collapse. That, that ward's too also it's out of range of the pink ward there, so they didn't actually see that. Also, it allows him to deal with the Yasuo combo here. If he can spam it in between knockups. The problem is that Uzi is 6-0. He's flew past that mid-game low. Oh, yeah. He's got himself the static shift. Last whiz by an Infinity Edge. Nearly a hundred CS advantage over Candy Panda. Gigantic. A full item between them, yeah. And this is this is the problem because they're so far ahead they can take this Baron down. Gilius is nowhere to be found. There's no smite to answer this. Yeah, and that with vision, SK's ward at the back was out of range of the Royal Club pink. So Royal Club didn't know that ward was there, but SK Gilius had gone back. No smite available. It was actually on cooldown anyway, so he was obviously off. Uh, doing something in, in the jungle before that one got started. Well, that's a big pickup here for Royal Club. Yeah, that right there, that could be the nail in the coffin. Uh, this this Tristana right now is getting out of control. Uzi's even picked up a defensive item. He's got the Negatron Neg Cloak, which he may turn into Quicksilver Sash for a quick answer to a long-range stun from Jezus. Uh, but yeah, he has the three main damage items already. That's a massive question really lack of judgment. I'm not too sure what was going on Gilius there. There was zero pressure on them. You know, they were just farming out, clearing out the waves. And for some reason, he decided, I've got to go back to buy this item right now, when Freddy clearly already pointed out uh -huh. that they're in the pit. They're trying to bait this one out. Something is going to go down now. Guys, we need to be on point. He was in the base. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, less, we're talking about the World Championships here. And, and a player who's drafted in at the last well, second. tricky. Yeah, you don't want to say that fight. No. Defender. You know, brought in at the last second with no real experience. He's qualified for the LCS now, of course, but no experience that can prepare him for anything like what he's experiencing here at Worlds. All right, so as everybody starts to group up and we see this uh, siege from Royal Club. Whoa. Whoa. Oh! Well, 
The Zillion ultimate's on him, but he leap away. You were talking about it earlier on. He can't do it. Uzi gets the reset, goes for Candy Panda. There is Freddy once again. They can tell on it. the backside trying to do this. Insect is he's tanking on the turret there. May go down. Jezus though is low. There is Freddy killing off one. Jezus will in fact fall. But Cola may go down as well as Freddy comes back in. There's oh, the monster. No. The heels coming out. And they kill off Freddy. They get him. And oh, Cola did die there in the end. I think it was the tower hit that yep. got him. Tower hit finished him off, and that's the ace. That's the aggression that Star Wars have been looking for. And it was all once again the insect kick. It finally worked. Yep, didn't even get time to set it up. There it was the insect kick, and you get the zillion ult on top of it. But yes, can't extract your member from deep inside of the Royal Club. Here he goes. This time pulls off the flash to ensure the kick. Instant reaction from the entire team, and his legs are not strong enough to hop out of there. Uzi, though, he's going to jump right back in and follow up. Wow, that burst onto Candy Panda almost eliminated him from the fight. What it did do was leave Uzi vulnerable for Freddy here in the back line. This was the the only thing that SK were getting out of this was Freddy. He picks up one here, then he almost gets Cola, and the turret will finish him off in the end. The whole team comes to try and save Cola, but he just <laughs> takes that one step down into turret range. So we're back in the game. Let's see how that has turned things around. Of course, that was a barrened up Royal Club moving in. That is now timed out. And SK Gaming are looking to try and get something here. Freddy once again drawing all of the aggro. SK coming around the side. The stun on Cola. Not going to happen. Freddy locked up, taking a hell of a lot of bad damage this time around. He may even need the ultimate coming out of N rated. He's just getting burst down so quickly. No matter how tanky he is. You can't fight this team, they are so far ahead right now. They're jumping in again. Freddy gonna go low from this one. What are they gonna do? There is a kickback from Insect. They do get it finished, but again, the ultimate out of it. Rated, he comes up with no more tail left. Oh. They get it, they do get it. Stun coming out from Jezus. He's losing against himself. He's eighth kill of the game. And they're gonna be knocking right on the base. Zero, uh -oh. gonna heal them all up. Yep, round two, oh, he's dead. Jezus caught out the Zonius, is it enough? No, he just about gets taken down. Insect, Gilius leaps in, Insect he's burning. burning. Oh, no, he survives. Hey. Gilius wants it, he oh. gets it. He takes down Insect, but at what cost? That is the question. Candy Panda and Rated, they've had to go back to Fountain. They're rushing back to this tower to try and save it. Three members of Starhorn Royal Club pushing in, they will take down the turret and SK will lose their first inhibitor the game. They're going to look to make a play here though, Gilius has stuck around these backside, he's still waiting for them, he jumps over the top, what? he jumps too deep, he went too far back and he ends up going down, Uzi picks up kill number nine. A bit of a comedy of errors there at the end. <laughs> a valiant effort, I guess. He was looking for the reset just to snag a quick kill and get out. Uh, but man, I'm glad we've got two play by plays for this one. <laughs> Dragon gonna be picked up on the, on the exit path here for Royal Club as they lick their wounds. 9-1-4 for Uzi. And honestly, it's all about getting those kills early on for him. He got rolling so early in this game. Let's not discredit the 17 assists for Zero. Where's the Soul Steal away? Do you need it, man? Oh. He's absolutely rocking it right now. He got so much feedback to go for the Chalice. The kill, the game with all the kills he doesn't actually go for. All right, so they do burn everything here onto Freddy. They're not afraid of using the knockups, combos with the Yasuo ultimate to burn down the tank. Not only do they kill this Fundo a single time, but yes, he gets back up and goes down for round two. SK doesn't deal a lot of damage while Freddy is soaking up everything from Royal Club. There's just not a lot of extra threat here being put out by the rest of the members. What a shot there. And the last seconds on this will not be enough. Oh, Freddy caught out here in the mid lane and he's gonna go down again though. And Rated gets him back up to half HP as the revive comes in, but he's not gonna escape it. That's two kills coming down and Rated going. Oh. Insect gonna go. Max Rage follows the jump of Gilius, and that's another one. It's a double for Uzi to put him onto 11, and surely the game here now for Royal Club. They can keep on pushing through. Candy Panda just recalled. Jezus is the only other man standing on side. There's the stun. That's on a gigantic cooldown now. Jezus locked up. The ultimate coming out of Candy Panda, but he's just forced back onto the mountain and taken down by Uzi. He is just that strong. He gets the reset, gets the tower, and gets the game for the Star Horn Royal Club.
He got the Mikhail's active as well. First play bought it, gets the first one just in time before the victory screen. What a game for Royal Club, though. You knew it was going to be the Uzi show when he got those early kills down bottom lane, and he did not disappoint. 13-1-5. But for SK Gaming, they've not looked that bad today. That was the final game with their sub. They've got three games, they're down 0-3. But honestly, when Svenskeren comes back, I think they could take a victory off one of these guys. Yeah, and they should almost treat this as kind of a scouting round of games, you know? They've gone 0-3, looks a lot better today. They're gonna bring Svenskeren in, who this entire time has been with the team backstage, been making sure that he watches these games. Obviously, you know, it gives an extra pair of eyes to help you break down what's gone right for you, what's gone wrong for you, what needs to improve going forward in this because one thing's for sure, SK have to now win all remaining games. And they need somebody to do them a favor as well, if I recall, you know, if you just go through the group stats, 3-3 three, three is going to be tricky to get through. You yeah. can hope that somebody else in your group takes a game off one of these top guys. They do not have a lot of breathing room, so they, their SK fans better be hoping that bringing Svenskeren in is going to be a whole new face for this team. And uh, after that game, you he definitely, there are definitely uh, easy places for them to improve. So Royal Club themselves, while they're picking up victories here, they're not safe wins. They're having oh. a few problems. Well, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> yesterday's TSM was a pretty safe win, okay, that's, that's for sure. But I was thinking more of Speaking on the other side, TSM could take a game off them. So you look at the whole group. We you know before Group B even started, we were saying this is actually a really tricky group. You know, everybody could take games off everyone. That may may just go into SK fans' favor, but it's a big ask. Star on Roll Club, though, a little bit wild, honestly, to say tell the truth. And if they were up against a stronger team, they would have made punish them. I, you got to give credit to SK for being able to match that aggression yeah. from uh -huh. Roll Club, though. And yeah. that's not something that I was particularly expecting out of SK, knowing how chaotic Royal Club can be. Yeah, it was definitely a fun game to watch. And, you know, talking about Royal Club, yes, a lot of the games have been, you know, really exciting, really kind of messy. They're 3-0 in yes. this group right now. So you talk about the situation that SK and it's completely flipped for Royal Club. They're sitting pretty right now. Perfect record for Royal Club. And for an in-depth look at that win, let's check in with the guys at the desk. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I think it's uh, a good point that they're raising. You know, talking about Starhorn World Club, they are three and zero, yeah. and the rest of the pe the analysts on the desk were talking how it's going to be TPA or TSM that could be the second team to make it out of the group. We'll get to that later. Let's talk a little bit about this particular matchup because I think for a long period of time, both of these guys were super even. SK held. Uh, strong in the laning phase despite losing 2v2, Candy Pan and Rated just looked outclassed. Yeah, and the thing is, I want to go back to picks and bans that a little bit because on you basically have a champion like Zillion who is this very non-committal sort of poke champion in that he's going to toss a bomb on you and then has very little follow-up since he's got exactly one damage ability. Right? No shields, no defensive ability, still six. And when you have a champion like Janna, she can match the bomb damage with a shield and then actually have some follow-up. And so it's an automatically losing lane. Plus, you're adding Twitch to the matchup, which is also a very weak laner, probably the actual weakest laner of AD carries. So you've got a horrible 2v2, and it played out exactly as you expect. Uzi gets to win in CS as a Tristana, and they get the, the heads-up double kill as well. Like... That's such a bad way to start the game out. And and they, they opt into the lanes and they opt into the matchups as well. Yeah, and really with the Zillion pick, it seems like you want to get your carries strong and fed. Mm -hmm. And with Twitch and Syndra and even Kha'Zix, they were fighting too much. They never really got farm. So Zillion is not going to matter if you're not getting these big ticket items. And they kind of were fighting and then rezzing someone who had like double Doran's pickaxe. It's like it's not going to be a big deal when you... Uh, Rez someone like that. Yeah, the one person that was farming that did a fantastic job was, of course, Freddy and that Dr. Mundo. Yeah. This game, in my eyes, felt like Freddy and Friends versus <laughs> Starhorn Real yeah. because he really carried hard. I feel like his involvement in the top lane and teleports was strong. I know, probably, you were talking about how uh, he was involved in a lot of the uh, big objective plays in the mid game for SK. Yeah, the play bottom that happened actually was Starhorn Real Club pressing a big advantage. And Freddy noticed that, hey, these guys are way too far out, and right now I'm hitting a big tanky power spike. So he did a big TP bot and just let top, you know, rise free farm. And what happened was is something that went bad for SK turned into something good because Freddy saw an opportunity and took advantage of it. Yeah, it worked in their favor. The other side, of course, it is Royal Club that came away with a win. Sure. Uzi, uh, once again, 
a stellar performance. I would say probably more aggressive than we've seen out of all three games. He's got over a 15 KDA throughout Worlds. What wow. did you take away from this Royal Club matchup and maybe Uzi in particular? Uh, I mean, Uzi, I think the game went kind of you expected. Gilius fed him a free kill early game. He uh, tower dove him kind of for no reason and gave him the first kill. Again, the double kill bot lane where the Zillion lane all lins pre-6. It's like, you're going to get six first. Wait till spray and pray. Wait till the zillion chrono shift. Then all in, not a wave early, and give up two kills to that one. Like SK had these tools here that they just used improperly. And at that point, you've got a team with very little threat against Tristana. He outranges um, the Syndra. He's going to outrange the Doctor Mundo. Tris is one of the best champions at killing Mundo as well. And so the game is just set up for Uzi to win, kind of like handed on a silver platter by SK. So of course it's going to play out that way. This particular matchup, I think, more than the previous two games from Royal Club. Uh, reminded me more of how they played in the LPL regional qualifiers. Mm. Um, it was very chaotic. It was very all-in. Royal Club didn't necessarily, in my eyes, have that same level of control that they demonstrated against Team Solo mid yesterday. Do you think there is still possibilities for this team to suffer losses? They've beaten all three of their opponents. Yeah. They have to redo that over the coming days. How do people bounce back against the number one team in Group E? Um, I think you can take advantage of the fact that Uzi's going to play a little bit aggressively uh, about the fact that this team still is uncoordinated, right? They don't all speak the same language fluently, which means you're going to have these missteps. And any aggressive team is going to have this sort of 80-20 split of it's going to be right a lot of the time, but sometimes it's completely the wrong play. And you got to hope the 20 comes up. Yeah, I think, honestly, it's almost a double-edged sword. The way they play really aggressively is borderline reckless. And it really just takes one team to know what they're doing like very well and have very big decisions and it's going to crumble really quickly for them and i'm not sure if they're going to be able to take control of a game that's you know falling out of their favor well they did it sort of against tpa but that's more tpa's yeah. mistake than sure. them yeah, getting control well. right so we talked about this let's talk about the standings rather and see how these teams are stacking up we're halfway through day 1 and of course we're going to kick things off with a group a. Samsung White, clear favorites 2-0 in that group. We will be seeing them playing next up, actually, against Dark Passage. Over in Group B, I think this is the interesting one. Team Solo mid 1-1, one and one, TPA 1-1, one and, one, and despite SK 0-3, if SK's opponents, Team Solo mid and TPA, suffer losses, SK can go 1-3, and three, their opponents are 1-2, right. and two, they're looking closer. So basically, as long as TSM and TPA beat each other once, like assuming Royal Club 6-0 is what I think is going to happen, if TSM and TPA go 1-1 one one against each other throughout the group stage, SK comes back with Sven Skarin and beats TSM and TPA back, all the teams are three and, or all the teams are 2-4, and four. they can all just have a big, nice three-way tiebreaker with all 1-1 one one against each other, and I think it's actually very possible. Typical. European team in the group, and there's the possibilities of tiebreakers. We'll see how that pans out. I have to refresh my memory on, on how those rules work, actually. Mm. Anyways, guys, we are going to take a brief break while Dark Passage and Samsung White load onto the stage for our next match. We will be right back with more coverage from Taiwan. This guy is insect, so flash before he can insect you. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he kicks you in the um, uh, other di direction. <laughs> okay, boys, sure. we just got taught how to counter an insect. Really a side steps there from the Sonic Wave, but he gets kicked oh. in. And there's the ultimate from Korn. Insect in the meantime, going to be passed on to a Candy Panda. They kill him, they're going to kill Kohler as well. SK gave it a go for this one. Zero the focus. He goes down. Kohler in the next drop, but they're going to get on towards him. Gilius goes down. Kohler may go down as well as Freddy comes back in. There's the oh, no. The heels coming out, and they kill off Freddy. Jez is locked up. The ultimate coming out of Candy Panda, but he's just forced back onto the mountain and taken down by Uzi. He is just that strong. Continuing coverage from Taipei, and I want to welcome Team Solomon Senior Most member, their man in the top lane, Dyrus. Um, Dyrus, first off, while well, you get a fantastic applause.
Wow. Well, well, you know what? Just talk to them for a minute first because the fan support for you guys is amazing here. I love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> and they love you. Now, um, first off, can you make sense of the madness that is your group right now? Because you guys absolutely crushed SK. Then they're doing pretty good versus Royal Club. And you guys did not do good at all versus Royal Club. TPA is looking pretty good. Make sense of the madness. All right, so to start things off, at SK, they don't have their jungler, but of course their sub-jungler is also pretty good too. Um, we had a plan, we executed it when we played against Royal, we had a plan, and you know, things kind of went not our way. Um, personally, I don't think that game really represents our skill level at our very, very best, obviously, and we're going to try our best, do better, and not come in cocky. Well, talking about skill level in that matchup, uh, you seem to be struggling a lot with that Aurelia Rise matchup. Is that something that you're not comfortable with? Um, it wasn't really about the champions. It was how we played with the champions. And personally, one-on-one, -on -one, there's a lot I could have done that I didn't do. And I'm going to look to fix that next time. Well. Um, when you look at that defeat, I heard you talking in the preview show how at PAX you were very emotional and you thought that actually wasn't a good mindset to be in as a team. So how do you kind of keep from doing that when you got a game like yesterday? Well, for the first game, we had it in control because we'd be getting too excited, like, oh, we're winning, it's so easy. And then when we're losing, it's like, oh, we're losing, what do we do? You know, <laughs> There's two different mindsets and it's a lot easier when you're winning than you're losing, obviously, for every single team. Um, what, what lessons have you drawn from the matches you've played so far, and actually specifically the matchup versus Starhorn Royal Club? How big do you think the gap is between you guys, that team, maybe Chinese teams overall, and then one step further, maybe the Korean teams? Well, when I'm talking about, you know, the gaps and stuff, like, what, no matter what I say, it's like, Darius, you're full of it, you know? <laughs> but personally, like, I don't want to say anything until we've proved it on stage, because actions speak wilder and words. And last year, you know, I said certain things also, and, you know, I didn't back it up myself. So before any of that, we're just going to show you on stage. Well, um, you've got a fantastic chance to prove that later on. You will be fighting the team that is a home crowd favorite here, TPA. What an important match in this group. Tell me your thoughts on the matchup. Um, TPA is definitely top three in our group, and... I'm not too sure how it'll play out because when we watch them play compared to playing, it's a lot different. And we'll just show it on stage once again. <laughs> well, we will see indeed. Uh, finally, Dyrus, you were telling me kind of about your experiences here and the things and the fans you've been able to meet. Tell that story for the guys out here because they do love you. The story of the fans? Yeah, that you told me before oh. how we <laughs> were meeting all of them out um, here. There's so many fans here that support us as TSM, as you can all see. <laughs> and everyone here is so humble, happy, and you know, there's fans everywhere we go, but we, never, we don't know how many and how much they like us. Like, there's different levels of fans, like some will come up and hug me, some will tell me to sign on, inside their shirt, <laughs> some will give me gifts, like, here, it's been very humbling. Good save. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good luck in your later matchup. Thank you. All right, now let's send it over to our guys at the desk to set the stage for our next match. Thank you very much, guys. We are gearing up for game four as Dark Passage will be taking on Samsung White. And Dark Passage are going to have an incredibly difficult time against Samsung White because even though Samsung, uh, even though early in the, the day they sort of held off the first 10 minutes against Edward Gaming, Samsung White are much stronger much earlier in the game. And I'm very nervous for the Turkish champions, you know. How are they going to withstand this Korean powerhouse? Yeah, I honestly am not sure their best strategy. I would say right now it's kind of, what's the word, like damage control. Like, make sure it doesn't crush you guys because they still have a chance to do stuff in this group. So I would say take this game with a grain of salt, kind of do as well as you can, and then, you know, learn something from it and apply it to the next set. 
Uh, Monty, what's your take? I mean, this this there's, there's very little chance. Uh, we've seen HQ pull a risky strategy yesterday, and it didn't work out in their favor. Uh, yeah, and HQ is of course arguably the better team than Dark Passage as well. So I don't know. It seems like the cheese was read really well yesterday. White responded beautifully to that, and it gave them an even bigger advantage. So at this point, I think you just kind of have to choose how fast you want to lose. Well, let's let's highlight one person on Samsung Y2. I was quite impressed by Looper. Uh, his first professional game was last year at Worlds. And in his first game here at Worlds, he pulled out the Rumble, uh, surprised many of us, played incredibly well with it, is still performing as expected, really. He's one of the best top laners in the game. Uh, what's your take on Looper and the rest of the team here? The first professional Rumble game from Looper was actually quite a surprise for me because that's really not a Looper-style champion. I mean, when we think of this guy last year when he made his professional debut, it was a lot of, uh, particularly his singed play was very notable. And then from there, he's moved into, he's always been a big Mundo player as well, but typically he plays these top lane tanks. For, so for him to play kind of a mid-game carry was really interesting to me. And so I'm curious if he's going to start transitioning into a more aggressive style, uh, or if we're just going to see him, as we run deeper into this tournament, go back to his old comfort picks. Final thoughts probably before we move on? I think something it could be reading too much into it, but since you're saying he has a typical playstyle of certain champions, maybe the Rumble pick is something to terrify his opponents later on. Yeah. They're going to go, oh wait, this guy plays Rumble now? What do we do against this? We thought he played this, this, and this. So it could be a strategic thing or just, eh, we really wanted to play Rumble. And if Samsung White are feeling very confident in this matchup, they could also pull out some more surprise picks. This game, <laughs> it is time to lock in your predictions, gentlemen. Who do you guys think is going to win? I'm going to start with the conductor himself. Do we even need to ask? No. White. So Monte Start Cristo is going to pick Samson White. He's very confident in their individual play as well as their strategic ability. I am going to ask Prolly. Do you know who's going to win? Yeah, I gotta go with my boy Pawn. I've loved him for a long time. He beats Faker, and I don't hold it against him. So I'm gonna go with Samson White. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fair enough. We'll see how well Pawn can perform. All right. The fans are in agreement with both of you guys, and according to LLEsports.com, they are also saying Samsung White. Preview show called this group David and Goliath. We'll see if David can throw any of those slings. Teams loading on a champ select. Let's send it over to the casters to get us back into the action. Thank you very much, Quick Shot, and hello everyone. We've switched out the desk. I'm Riving Division the third, along with Joshua Jat Leesman and Martin DeFisciolunga. This is gonna be some amazing matches, and it's already started the day off crazy. Yeah, man, this is gonna be really good. This is our first time actually casting as a trio, so yep. I can't wait. We got some world class <laughs> games about coming up. This one, definitely David and Goliath, though, so we'll yeah. see what ends up happening. It's been so amazing. We're going to dive right into our next battle with a look at the starting lineups. On the blue side, it is Dark Passage. That means in the top lane, it is Fab Fabulous. In the jungle, it's going to be Crystal. Mid lane is Naru. At AD carry is Holy Phoenix. And supporting him is Touch. And on the red side, of course, it's Samsung White. The Giants right here. Looper in the top lane, Dandy in the jungle, Pawn in mid lane, and of course, Imp and Mata in the bottom lane. Really, absolutely the Giants, and it's going to be tough for Dark Passage this game. We'll say that right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, we just have to say it. They don't have any pressure on them to perform here. True. Go in there, play the laning phase, see what you can get from it. Maybe you can learn a few tricks playing against such a great team as Samsung White and see what you can learn. We saw their game earlier today. They actually had a pretty decent start in the laning phase against EDG. I think this game will really be about small victories for Dark Passage. When they were coming into Worlds, they didn't really say they were going to go win the World Championship. Right. Really, after Gamescom, they just said they wanted to play against yeah. Korean teams. They wanted to see how they stack up. And they're going to be able to see that, specifically in the laning phase. The individual accomplishments, if they can pull something off, is all they're going into this game hoping for. They are still strong individual players. When you see the team fights come together is when the coordination starts to fizzle for them. And you can see world-class teams really start to come out on top. They are able to make some moves, but it's gonna have to be early because that's when Samsung White will take a hold of the game. Make some bans. Now the question is here, will Dark Passage try and go for a bit of an AHQ kind of comp against White where you can try and make some early moves, see if you can get a lead and try and snowball the game? It obviously didn't work for AHQ. The level one was a big deal back then or in yeah. yesterday's game here, but we could see Dark Passage try and do the same. I feel like you only get one Pre minion spawn ace per world championship. Well, but we could be wrong. We'll we will see. see. Uh, pretty heavy top lane focus bans here from Samsung White. They know Fab Fabulous is pretty devastating when he gets going. I like the Kazakhs top lane actually in their last game. It did show some effectiveness. You can tell White 
isn't taking them lightly just because they're a huge underdog. No, and it's actually also a thing they were talking about. Like, in tier we had with him saying, we want to take every game serious. We want to show that, yes, our last year was a mistake. I mean, we don't want to underestimate any teams here. So I actually expect pretty serious picks from White and also a good uh, serious performance. Plus, they got to boost up their stats a little bit more. I mean, oh, they had 34 Jeez. kills in that 22-minute game against AHQ after that level 1 ace. It'll be tough to top that one. Surprising they actually did let them get Alistair, though. So let's see what Fab Fabulous can do on it. I mean, normally, again, he is the Kha'Zix type. He loves to play in Italy as well. If he builds, like, 24 static shift on an Alistar, he might be able to do some split pushing. But of course, you just see him try and roam around. And I'm just going to say it here. Alistar is great for level 1. A bit like Blitzcrank. As long as you mm -hmm. get the first move, you can knock up a target here, kill the first target. We might see some level 1 stuff. In a really great pickup, even with Rengar still on the board, Dandy takes away Crystal's favorite, that Lee Sin, who was actually making some plays on it previously. Yeah, it's a little bit too bad we don't get to see Crystal play Lee Sin, but guess what? We get to see Dandy play Lee Sin. He <laughs> was super devastating in that game against AHQ. At one point, I think he was 9, 2, and 11, like 14 minutes in. Yeah. Uh, definitely a playmaker. I actually expect White to pick plenty of playmaking champions here because if the game does get out of hand, they're going to know how to have a little bit of fun. Well, that's also you have the rise already locked in for the late game. So if we're going to see all case. these, just in case, this is a backup plan in case it goes wrong in the early game, you can then wait for late game. You do have the rise here. On the other side, though, for Dark Passage, we did see Touch play Thresh in the last game. He tried to make some big yep. plays. It just really didn't pay off. You can't have a Dark Passage team not take the Dark Passage champion. Yeah, that's they very would true. instantly lose. And we've been seeing a little bit more love coming out for Janna as well throughout Worlds here. Consecutive plays from these last few games. We actually often see also picked into Thresh here. And mm. if you build a Mikhail's, you can pretty much stop the entire engage potential for Touch on Dark Passage side. So we have to see what Mata wants to build. A Soul Stealer, of course, could work too if you want to get some early kills. Yeah, seeing a Twitch from him would be pretty exciting. Ooh, and it would be even more exciting. Deficio and I were actually talking about this just before the game. We are thinking if Samsung White wants to just kind of have a fun game or really prove themselves, we are yeah. thinking, which champions are they going to play? And we actually happened across a vain Janelaine because it will give him the shield and potency yeah. to go in hard. And one year ago, Imp was <laughs> probably considered the best vein player in the world. This is going to be a pleasure. And now he's going to show it again. Hopefully going to show it again. Holy Phoenix looking to bring out the Jinx within this game. We'll see if he can do it. The Oriana goes down for a bit of safety around it. But like we said, this is really going to be Dark Passage trying to get small victories out of the game as they are about to face the powerhouse Ooh. Samsung White Talon locked in for Pawn in the mid lane. And we have seen him play it before where he killed a certain Faker in the mid lane. Obviously that was against a Cassidy and not an Oriana, which is a bit safer, but still somewhat the same deal. I do actually like the comp here from Dark Passage. It's very, very strong in team fights. So if they do manage to survive the lane phase and group as a team, they do have a lot of CC. There's some good damage here. Get a target low, you get Holy Phoenix going. He loves to play Jinx because he loves to get the resets. Yeah, it's a really good point there, Deficio. If Samsung White takes them lightly in the laning phase in the early game, there's a lot that could end up getting away from them. Alistair could get to a point where he's tanky. The Jinx yeah. has to come in and they can yeah. make something happen. However, it's probably not going to happen. This is Samsung White, and they of also have a ridiculously powerful team composition. The amount of damage they have coming out of those rolls is rather massive. And the amount of pick potential they have as well. I mean, you have a Talon in the mid lane, you have a Vayne, of course. Everyone here can just kill Dark Passage if they're out of position, which they might end up being in this game. All right, so before we get any shots fired here, we're going to head over to Twitter. Tell us which team you think will prevail here. Tweet hashtag DPWin or SSWin to at LOLE Sports, and we'll be tracking how you guys are voting throughout the game. It's pretty fun to root for the underdog, too. Even with that good lane oh, yeah. phase against EDG, I Why saw not? they had like an 80% vote at some point oh, yeah. in the game. Keep it up, because eventually they'll be able to hear that support, especially coming into this. You need to have a pretty thick skin as Dark Passage to come in against teams that are so much more experienced than you. It's not like Dark Passage has a chance to play three years of competitive League of Legends right. coming up to this. This is kind of like their season one or two where everyone else is playing on 2014. I would love to see Dark Passage kind of go hard in this early game. Get Samsung White where they are known to be the best and really give them something else to think about here. It's obviously going to be a great back and forth throughout the entire matchup. We're going to see how much fun we can get throughout this game. And just for... Looking at the summoner spells, 
too exhausted from Dark Passage because again, you are against Vayne, you are against mm. the Talon, even a Rise you can use exhaust well, against here. So the they are really setting up for a great team fight. And once again, it's going to be all about this early laning phase here, if they can survive it, and of course, if they can avoid dying to Dandy on this Lee Sin. How about a great level one coming in right now? It'll be real interesting to see what ends up happening off this one. Slow but sure. DP is playing very, very smart right now. Not getting too antsy. And these are the plays that they need. Fat Fabulous able to make his way in the brush, keeping Holy Phoenix safe on this one as well. And I love the fact they're not scared. I mean, they saw what happened yesterday when you tried to invade on Samson White at level 1, but they're ready to do it again. You do have the Thresh here, land the hook, and then you have Alistar CC. You might be able to get a kill. Samson White are ready, though. They're pretty patient right here. They're just hoping that Samsung White is trying some type of delayed invade, in which case they would be able to get the jump on them, but they just didn't luck out in this sense. White had scouted everywhere else. They're not really willing to check the one spot they haven't scouted. Minions have spawned. Slow play, interestingly enough, coming in from Samsung White. We'll see if Imp and Mata can control the lane as they like to throughout the start here. Holy Phoenix and Touch known to put down a little bit of pressure as well. Holy Phoenix likes to get himself into some trouble in the early games. Has some trouble dodging the skill shot, so he should be all right if he can just dodge the Howling Gales for now. I just want to highlight the ward Samsung White will always place in the middle lane at level one. Often it is simply to spot, first of all, if people are running like from the top side of the map down to the bottom side. But it's also to see what the mid laner is doing, because often the mid laner will actually move a little bit to the side where you're starting with your buff, just to be there to kind of check if anyone is late invading. So they're going to see Nauru move a little bit towards the bottom side, and therefore they suddenly yeah. know red buff. It's the free way of scouting for them. They don't need to get the dangerous ward. Instead, they'll place a safer ward, which can still give them the same intelligence. It's only something that happens after a lot of good coaching and strategy. Small advantages to be grabbed in the early game. Allow the jungler to make those first hits really count. We'll see if Dandy does anything crazy, as he usually does towards the early part of the game, as things are pretty even across the board. Level 2 is about to be hit here in the bottom lane. We'll see who gets the upper hand on that advantage. Oh, it's going to be Samsung White. They hit it fast, but actually, oh, nice. a great oh. hook coming in from Touch. The play goes out, and that exhaust comes up very big. Silver Bolts have been taken second by Imp, and that's going to be putting out a lot of damage. Can the reset come in? If it is, Holy Phoenix may be able to close the gap. It's all up to Touch. Can the flay damage come out? Nice no, they turn around once again. Mata Flash is trying Earth to give himself life. the damage, and everybody's going to be alive on this one. It's not over yet here. Look at the minimap. Dandy's coming down towards this bottom lane. He might try and go for a kill. There's not very many wards. Holy Phoenix needs to get out of there. He knows it too. He's not going to stick around for the greed. He is definitely recalling, and but now, for now he's safe. That's a pretty tricky to execute dive, but we'll see if they go for it. Samsung White's a pretty good team. Seven of eight summoners burned in that bottom lane. Touch still have his flag. Oh, Great nice teleport was canceled out. Stopped out by Fat Fabulous. He decides not to come down. Looper wasn't close to stop that. So teleport burned right there. Something that was very wise there was to not end up teleporting him because they'd already disengaged. Even though it was a great hook, it was on the wrong target because he didn't have turret aggro. Right. At the end of the day, it is an advantage for Samson White because they forced the recall and the teleport. See where they decide to go from here. A lot of pressure towards that bottom lane. They know the flashes are going to be down, and I feel like Dandy's going to make a repeat trip there quite soon after he clears the top. Fat Fabulous keeping this push for Looper. And now we're in this mid lane here. He should be able to keep the lane under control, at least in the first few levels, before we see the talent level 6, and then you can really start mm -hmm. jumping onto targets. Yeah, the talent is not actually a very potent laner against Soriana. It's this dangerous matchup for Pond to kind of be picking into. It is because he's so versatile and it's because he has so much confidence. But Naru, in his own right, is a fantastic mid laner. Yeah, and I mean, he's shown, first of all, his champion pool is huge. But also, the mechanics he's shown on certain champions like Zed in the wildcard tournament really impressed me. But again, talent in the mid lane. You also need items because you are a bit of an all-in type and if you don't have the damage to kill targets when you go for the all-in, you take a lot of damage in return. And also the biggest thing that Naru didn't face against in the International Walker tour Tournament, as great as you can play against an enemy mid laner, he's also playing against Dandy. So right. the potential right. gang presence and his ability to maneuver around wards when they're down on the map, which by the way is very poor ward coverage in the mid lane right now by Dark Passage, is something you can't really prepare or practice for. Well, in their 20 games, including playoffs, Pawn only took that talent once, but he did get a victory on it, 8-2-6, and six, so he knows what he's doing. And so far, keeping Naru at bay, but Naru's farming up nicely. No kills to come out of that mid lane just yet, or any lane 
for that matter. And that's going to help DP at least in the early part of the game. They've been able to stave off Samsung White's very early aggression. Yeah, and been a lot of action down this bottom lane. We also saw Crystal move down mm. in case Dandy showed up. Is they ready for counter gank? Would be very hard for him to actually go for the gank himself because the lane was pushed so far up here. But uh, for now, both teams still fairly even. No close Whoa. yet. So nope. as soon as the death sentence was down, if decided to go in aggressively, the flame choppers are the only thing keeping them alive there. But the damage is done. Touch can't sustain that back up. The warding down here, making Dark Passage feel pretty confident about. Getting some hooks in, but Samsung White knowing when they can trade back efficiently. Clockwork wind up a few times onto Pawn as they keep going back and forth in that mid lane, and he has evened out the CS quite nicely. See a little bit of action towards the top lane as Dandy looking to make sure he can draw any bit of movement. This is actually when the teleport earlier from Fab Fabulous hurts because he would have gone back and sustained up, bought some items, now he's going to miss out on substantial amount of experience in minions because if he stuck around, he would have been too vulnerable for ganks. Yeah, exactly. And the only way Dark Passage could kinder win on this situation was if they actually got a gank in the bottom lane. Now to teleport from Lubus on cooldown and then they could use the Alistar. But that's such a risky play and of course not the ideal situation. And you can see the lane pressure is accumulating fairly well here. Han actually used his ultimate very low cooldown ultimate on Talon just to force Naru back to base. It's continuing to keep the pressure up. They're not having to back on their on timers, right? They're mm, forcing right, right. Dark Passage to back when Dark Passage doesn't want to, and White is controlling that pace. Giving themselves the windows to make things work here. Pawn's gonna make it back to lane, and really he's gonna be able to pick up the CS to keep it even still. Great brush control here coming in from Samsung White. Touch, gonna fizzle that out a little bit with a beautiful word. Once again, down this bottom lane here, Crystal waiting. There's a pink ward from Dark Passage, so they know he's not spotted just yet. But it's still going to be very hard to pull this gang off here. I mean, Imp is very mobile on this vein. You have to join as well. And we're seven minutes into this game with a level four Kha'Zix sitting in a pink ward. His red buff is up. Yeah, he should be he farming. Needs to clear that. He should just take that red buff before he goes down because he is not effective at this juncture. Even if he had the gank to go on, I don't think you're killing the Jana. No, I mean, overall, Crystal has just been wasting too much time. He was up in the top lane as well, and he just stayed there for like 10 seconds, and then he moved away once again, and not really been able to apply any pressure on the lanes. And in this mid lane, Naru suddenly in trouble. I love this play by Pawn. He's just using his ultimate pretty much on cooldown for the harass harassment. It's creating so much pressure. Now he has to ultimately respect Dandy, no matter what, because the follow could still kill from Talon. Well, you're getting that talent ultimate every one minute, but you're also getting Crystal here hugging the bottom lane. It's pushed up a little bit too much, so he's not going to get too much out of this. After grabbing the red, he repeats his same path. And Fab Fabulous, we talked about before how their teleport or the lack of teleport could hurt him. Mm -hmm. He actually walked all the way back to top lane, and you see once again Crystal is down this bottom lane. Dark Passage, they want to get a kill in the bottom lane and then use the teleport advantage to get a dragon. And that teleport advantage, even though Fab Fabulous has it up now, before he went back to base, the lane was actually kind of close, but it was right. frozen as he went back to base. Looper picked up all that farm, and now it may be insurmountable. It's simply just Dark Passage hoping to get this one kill and then take the dragon. Like, yeah. they invested so much into the potential dragon, even lost the blue buff now for Crystal. Here's the worst part, though. If they want to go and get war control over the dragon area, they would need some type of presence in the mid lane, but Narhu has been trapped in his turret by Pawn, so no one can safely go elsewhere. He just continues to pressure him down. Drew out the exhaust as well. Everything working in Samsung's White's favor. I feel like the first dragon is just going to open this game wide and it's just going to be a run through for Samsung White. DP holding out strong here. 10 minutes on the clock, coming up. And the early armor here for Naru actually saved his life. Yep. Brutalizer instantly from, from Talon, our opponent in the mid lane, and just going aggressive. Every single time he has the chance, jump onto Naru here and force him That's back. Dragon. That's exactly what it is. Cool yeah. down, cool down, cool down. Every time his ultimate is up, clear it out. Dandy easy dragon because Kazakh is nowhere to be found. Strong methodical play, as usual, coming in from Samsung White. Looper staying in the top lane pretty much unscathed, and giving him a safe lane is not what you want to have. This has actually been a pretty interesting opener to the game. Obviously, Samsung White is winning, which is what is expected. But what's a little bit surprising is the manner in which they are winning. Ten minutes into the game, they still haven't drawn first blood, yet they're still in complete control of the game. I expect them to have a little bit more fun in that sense, but they're just pulling out a nice, decisive victory. I think they feel you a little bit there, Chad, as they go in quite hard from brush control here in the bottom lane, pushing it out once again. And if they're not getting the kills, 
they're just pushing the lane out completely, and they're still getting the victory on it. Well, that was a nice little setup by Samson White. I mean, Ulti was popped by Imp, and he then in stealth tumbled actually behind Holy Phoenix here, and then forced him to flash away. So once again, Samson White, again, they're controlling the lane yeah. in the mid lane as well. Every single time there's a cool and red before he jumps on, and there's no kills. But it doesn't really matter because slowly Samson White is going to get more and more farm. They already picked up the dragon, and it's just a matter of time before they pick up the one kill they need to open the game. This is all happening as well. 2,000 gold on Imp as they control the game in that bottom lane, so he's going to go back and be even more powerful. Holy Phoenix putting that BF sword in. He has not been able to get any resets on his side. The most surprising thing to me, actually, was the fact that Mata had saved up 1,300 gold uh, he did end up picking up the early Sightstone normally when I watch Samsung White. They'll actually complete the Boots of Mobility before the Sightstone, but knowing that Vision is actually not as big a priority in this game as usual since there's not much roaming going around from Dark Passage and White is controlling them so well in the lanes, he just decided not for the Mobility Boots. It's kind of weird to see more DP wards on the map right now than you would Samsung White's. This is where Mata really just excels in the game. Right now his pink wards are to come out. That's his other forte. So he's going to be working those now and just denying Dark Passage Vision in the bottom. And I like how Dandy's just been living in the top side of the jungle. He went in for the blue buff, he's been taking the big red every single time he's as well. He's been pretty quiet. Yeah, I mean, he's just been sitting and farming to be honest. He went back, he got mobility boots before yeah. he dealt the lizard, so we should see him start roaming around. But he's basically just been farming because every lane is doing fine. And the first team fight we actually see in this game could either give Dark Passage a chance or completely win the game for Samsung White because they're developing such an advantage from the laning phase alone. One hook, Mata gets hit up. Oh, trying to get the passage over to Crystal, but he missed it on the first touch, and it was a little lackluster on the gank. Almost managed to set it up and did actually force a flash here. Top lane, Fafebra is taking a lot of damage. I mean, this is one of the things that happens. You fall behind in lane as Alistair, so you try and build the Sheen, but the Catalyst may have been needed for the sustain. He's in pretty big trouble here. Trying to work his ultimate oh, to break the rule. Oh, no, 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 and that's one last... Oh, wait oh, no. a minute! It's going to be so close! He nope. cannot try to get back in for the fight, though. Wow. That was a little dicey there by Fab Fabulous. He ended up almost getting a kill, but at the end of the day, even Drake. Right, on to the bottom lane. Dandy making his first appearance here for the big gank, but they flash out a well-placed box to disengage the entire lane push there. Dark Passage stays alive once again. We talked about small victories for Dark Passage, honestly. Even though they're down 2.3k gold, if they won a team fight, they could actually be even with White 30 minutes into the game. If anything, it's a victory to not die to Samsung White 30 minutes into the game and count it. Had that 38 kill game, 20 minutes, was it? Yeah, I'd say it's a victory yeah. right now. Still pushing past the turret. Touch. This is where it gets a little hairy. The flashes oh. have been blown. The kick comes back. Oh! oh again! The play is from Touch on the Dark Beautiful. Path. Beautiful. The entire team is now here. Naru's actually out of mana, so I don't know how much they can really chase this. It looks like it's just going to be flexing the muscles, getting Samsung White to push out. So Samsung White here, they keep the aggression going here. They want to chase for this first spot, but every single time, oh, man. Dark Passage managed to disengage. That was a really nice lantern placement there by Touch to just save the day. However, the damage is still kind of done. They're losing of control that yeah. lane. They're down 40 CS to a vein. That is not good. The question is just, for how long can they avoid dying? It's I'm going to say 17 minutes and 50 seconds. Holding it to them, holding you. Looper with the Rod of Ages coming in the top lane. He is now happy to just charge up still. Waiting to make some teleport plays. He's going to go ahead and actually whoa, teleport whoa, whoa. right towards the blue buff. Does he catch yes, Naru? Don't worry. Naru is going to be forced to flash as well. Looper looking to make plays by himself here with the rest of the team to work their way in. It's subjective bullying right now is all they're really trying to do. They're just trying to force Dark Passage into fighting them. They don't necessarily have fantastic engage on the Samsung White team outside of a Rude Prison, so they kind of need the fights to come to them or get a pick in the open where Pawn can use the open battlefield to chase his prey. Look at the top lane. Oh, Pawn going for Crystal. Oh, great flash over the wall. Still alive, still alive. All these defensive flashes, I mean, at this point, you'd think the next point of contention would be the Dragon, but because all the flashes have been burned defensively by Dark Passage, they may not even think it wise to contest at that point. But what we do see from Samsung White, even though they're constantly chasing this potential first blood, they don't over-chase. They're not over-aggressive here. They're just playing it fairly safe. 
and making sure they don't give Dark Passage any kills or any chance actually to potentially win a later team fight. This is what Samsung White was talking about in their interview footage earlier, is that suffocation game. It doesn't have to come with kills. It doesn't have to be a bloody suffocation game. They know, even though they can't see the goal, they know that they're pulling ahead fairly substantially. They have the turrets, they've been bullying neutral monster objectives consistently. They can press tab and see that Imp is 30 CS ahead of Holy Phoenix. They know everything is going well according to plan. It's just not as stompy as they may have hoped. Well, Imp now doing his thing, free farming in the top as Samsung usually leaves him too after the laning phase is crushed. But they, or DP rather, is now going to put a little bit more focus on the top lane. Crystal trying to prep this one for a return gank if they can hopefully take down Imp. He's getting pretty big right now, 145 to 112 in that CS and already finished. Let's play to the ranking. And I do love all the early cooldown reduction on Atala. I mean, your, your ulti is already rather low cooldown. And the more you can get off here, the more picks you can go for. Mm -hmm. You can even engage the fights because you have a Janus. So put the shield on the pawn, let him jump in, and then be ready with Mata from the disengage side. And as long as pawn stays alive, it's a good engage. Another uncontestable dragon here. I don't know if Thresh oh, is in range of dark passage for this guy. Ooh, Holy Phoenix, hoping to get out of the ashes Where on this one. Yeah. But I don't think he's going to no. come back up. First blood going over to Dandy on that one. An inch away, and now we can see it's already 5,000 gold. The 600 gold there from the first blood across Ooh. the team is a lot, and the map control is suffocating. Absolutely. They continue to put themselves in the jungle of Dark Passage. Fab Fabulous cannot join the team yet with the ultimate being the tank. Everybody is just getting taken out too fast in these fights. Samsung White continuing now to take Dragon, pushing to the bot lane and utterly controlling the map. You can see how fast their wards moved into the side of Dark Passage. We also see how uh, the warding on the map often is determined by where Dandy is actually running around because he was in the top side for like the first 10 minutes but now he's been putting all his attention on the bottom side and look at all the wards on the minimap here from both him and Master together to make sure okay I can roam in the jungle of Dark Passage I can always walk behind them when they're trying to farm the lanes like we just saw Holy Phoenix try to do here and it means at least Crystal could potentially get a blue buff or give it to his mid laner. Yeah, well, with the second Sight Stone being completed on Samsung White, they're going to try and get greater control of the map. Even though Dandy was just on the bottom side, it's up to Mata and Imp there to control this side. A couple good defensive pink wards there for Dark Passage, but they can pink ward to know where Samsung White is. With this gold disadvantage, even if they know, they may not be able to do anything about it. Yeah, that's always going to be the problem once you do fall this far behind here and Samsung White. They know it, of course, just constantly walking in the jungle. Mm -hmm. Plays a few more wards yeah, and out the pinks. Make sure, make sure Imp, sorry, on Vayne can just sit and farm in, in the side lane. He is going to be very, very scary. You can actually see Fab Fabulous cannot do much but watch him push down these waves. I feel like Imp's going to be getting antsy. Like, he wants to kill somebody <laughs> at this point. He's been farming 177 minions on Vayne. He had that scrap at level 1 that was really close, but he wants to do more. I can feel it. We've seen feel that happen. He, 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 he will. It, I think he'll get himself caught a few times before this game is over. We'll see, though. Imp's got, always got that big grin on his face every time he gets a kill. He needs to get that kill here. Well, they did kill a tower, so... That's true. I mean... Small victories. Very, very small. Sated the thirst for some time. He will be looking for those kills, though. That's all in Dandy's hands at the moment, making plays around the map. It looks like Looper gets himself pretty deep here. This is not really the matchup you want for your AD carry. Down his bottom lane in a one-on-one -on -one against a Talon who's already level 13 and can just jump and one-shot him pretty much. So Holy Fiend's just been forced to actually give up the tower because he couldn't hold it. And even on the tower, he would have died instantly. Fight over blue buff. Come on, take Dandy. It. Come on, Dandy. Oh, oh he missed. Ah, yeah, that's, that's cheating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who says? My rules. Oh, okay. There we go. He's going to try it one more time. Going for the red. It's going to be a 2v1. He does decide to give up on this one a little bit, knowing that Naru left lane. And the rest of the team is kind of doing their own thing. Looper's on, like, solo mission now. Dandy finally joins him. Or, rather, Looper finally joins oh, Dandy. Oh, no. He didn't even have a smite that time. He stole no. with the resonating strike. Sonic Wave, actually. Mind games. Mind games. That one was right fair, no. That was fair. Yeah, that was a fair steal. He played by the rules this time. You can rarely see now how even though Dark Passage was kind of holding their own in lane, they got bullied off of so many objectives without being able to retaliate. It's now out of hand, even though yeah. they've only died once. It's one of the risks of kind of giving up all these superior things to a superior team in hopes that they'll dive you and make a mistake. 
if the team's smart enough to just not dive you and make that mistake. They'll take every small advantage and turn it into a victory. Oh, this is so unfortunate, too. Holy Phoenix being on some of his favorite champions, but yeah. not being able to get resets because he's getting taken down solo on the other side of the map. Dandy's going to continue a 2v1 by himself. Looper says, you're mine. And he may there even get another go. one. The bolt comes flying through in the double kill for Imp as they start to just choke down on that suffocation play. And suddenly Samson White says, now we're going to get some kills yeah. here. We see the fighter blue buff, four kills up there. Oh, sorry, three kills up there. And of course, down his bottom lane. Again, we just talked about Talon against Jinx. Not really a fair matchup. And we saw with the way Dark Past was giving away objectives, if they could have found a team fight that they came out on top of, it would have been able to kind of make up for them giving up the objectives and create a somewhat even game. But as soon as you lose that team fight or give up a couple of kills, the game becomes nearly unwinnable. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. 11,000 gold, almost 10,000 gold at 21 minutes. Yeah, but again, you just have to try. Because if yep. you keep playing this game, you're going to fall further and further behind. It's honestly not a terrible strategy by Dark Passage, the way they entered into this game. No, I agree. I think the games they watched yesterday with Samsung White, Samsung White was playing pretty crazy. We saw Imp doing some really silly things. A little intense, Chris. yeah. You know, we saw the fact that they had that absolutely ridiculous game against HQ, but now Samsung White has the lead. They're going to go where they want. And a touch too much. Looper can be able to take him down right quick. Teleports in once again keeping that fame teleport teleport on lockdown. He gets himself right in the fight. 4v1 for himself right now as the team comes in from the backside. Health bars are being completely demolished right now. The double for Looper as Dandy picks up another one on the side. Yeah, again, we just see how far Dark Passage is actually behind because every time they try and do something, they make they, they do oh. no damage. Oh. Just wanted that right around the, the goal. The longest shot I've Whoop. seen from Vayne in quite some time. And yeah, you're right there, Deficio. It goes from 10,000 to 13,000 just like that. All right, now Samsung White close the game out, or do they continue to chase around here? <laughs> well, they did again. wait 15, 16 and a half minutes, was it, for their first kill? Yeah. To see how many they can get before the end of the game at this point. This fight was just Samsung White being so far ahead. I mean, that Fabulous doesn't get to zone because he'd already used his cooldown, so Luper gets to walk straight up. Imp gets the move speed from his Vayne ultimate, and they can just chase everyone down from Dark Passage. It doesn't matter if you land a Shockwave at this point if you don't have items. Can't believe Mata stayed alive there. That was a very nice flash on the outside of the play. Another Dragon going over to Samsung White, that 15,000 gold lead, and at 10 to zero in kills. Five zero in turrets, uh, shutout, possibly to come into this game. And item spikes far and ahead as the Spooky Ghost gets pulled out for Mata. Deficio, you are the support player. But we'll talk about the Spooky Ghost after this. Nip shot, oh. another one. Max Rain, geez. Oh, oh it's not done yet. man, they are still going for this fight. A little bit of brush control is going to be good for this one. Double kill coming in for Imp. He keeps the shot Panda? coming. The triple kill for Imp. Looking for the oh, yeah, they want to give him And they are going to get it. Yeah. The Penta yeah. kill to right. come in for right, Imp. Penta kill. Does it count when the Alistair just stops running away? <laughs> I think that's like maybe one third of a pension if you're not actually earning the last guy as soon as he stops. But it's still pretty well earned. 15-0 now and the surrender. The surrender indeed. 23-27 on the clock. A complete shutout coming in for Samsung White. And again, we talked about it through, through the game, to be honest. I mean, every single blue buff picked up by Samsung White. They got every single dragon. They controlled every single lane. Dark Passage had their had a tactic say give them the objectives we don't want to fight too early did pale it was a game we expected obviously yeah, dark passage course. had some type of strategy to just hope that samsung White would get over aggressive before they had an advantage but of course they did they bided their time they got the advantage in the lane and when they turned it on they turned it on and let's be honest if they did get over aggressive they probably would have been able to handle it quite well yeah. playing superbly in that one a great strike at 17 minutes and they didn't let go after that for first blood but still, as we talked about before the game actually started, this is a learning experience for right, Dark Passage. Absolutely. And again, as a player, when you face such a good team, just like one-on-one -on -one in the laning phase, you will notice some small tricks and you might be able to pick them up yourself. I mean, you're going to see the way they move in the lane. You're going to see when do they actually go for the engages. Like down the bottom lane, you pointed out how Touch missed his hook and instantly you saw him go forward, be aggressive here. And those small things, you can notice them, you can watch a replay and use it actually to improve your own, own play. And even the bigger picture stuff, experiencing what it's like to never have saved, you're not being able to farm on your laner, never being able to push up, are things that you can kind of figure out how it happened to you. It just takes a while to implement it. You can't exactly just no. learn it overnight, or even in a boot camp for that matter. 
So the David and Goliath matches are coming to be played out as many thought. We do see Samsung White kind of toppling the group so far, but a lot can still come out of EDG. A lot can still come out of the rest of these teams. We'll have to see what AHQ can do as well. Yeah. While we have a moment, though, I do want to talk about the Pentacle. Okay. Was that a legitimate Pentacle, in your opinion? I think it's a little bit... So because he stopped first running. of all, first of all, there was no flash for Fat Fat. Are you going to get away yeah. at that so point? So he was never going to get. He away. wouldn't be able to escape. Exactly. Right. I mean, we even had the twin shadows. We barely talked. We didn't actually even talk about it. But yeah. twin shadows from Mata. He could have used it as it well. Would have caught him. It would have been yeah. perfect item. Plus, there's the extended, we'll there's the extended timer on the pentakill. You know, upon oh, yeah. further oh, yeah. examination. Yes. That I mean, they would have killed him no matter no, what. That was an earned pentakill. I stand corrected. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 100%. You were also saying that they're going to have to force a fight. So it was a forced fight. They just took it as they could. And that was a pentakill. Yeah. So, yeah. Locked it down. Great job by M coming in. The first pentakill coming in for Worlds, which makes me hope that we'll see quite a bit more. It probably won't be coming from a vein. They were able to do a few of the picks that they were able to kind of show off with within this game. And it definitely was that pentakill to show it off. Let's send it over to our guys at the Think Tank Analyst Desk for more on Samsung White's win. Thank you very much, Rev. Guys, here on the Think Tank, uh, it's not much to break down here. Samsung White executing a perfect game. Zero deaths, zero dragons given up, zero towers giving up. Uh, absolutely demolishing Dark Passage. They got themselves the pentakill. I want to talk about the dual lane. Vayne Janna, best lane in the world? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, within the context of their composition, it was fine. But when you pick that, when you don't even know what the enemy is going to pick. And, you know, Thresh Jinx is a lane where, yes, if you can get a shield onto Vayne and you can get that tumble, it can hurt. But you run into a real risk if you are tumbling like that to getting flayed into traps. I mean, there's so much hard CC that you're probably going to lose, and you also can get poked out as well. It's, so It's just mechanics practice, come on. Yeah. So it managed to work out for them. I want to ask uh, probably the Talon versus Oriana. We saw Pawn constantly throwing his ultimate over and over and over. Talk to me about the matchup and how he played that out. So I guess it's kind of counterintuitive, because you think about it and you go, all right, Talon without ult, he's not going to kill him. But in that matchup, it's actually really hard to ever get a free kill on Oriana. So using your ultimate on cooldown the way he did with the Brutalizer first buy was perfect because after he uses ult and Oriana went low, he's now able to just auto attack to get all the CS because Ori can't harass that back. She's too low from what just happened. And then it's a ticking time bomb. Talon gets ult in 30 seconds. So it's going to happen again. So it's almost like Oriana has to buy five health pots every back and then has to trade really well. So it's kind of like... It's just terrifying to play that lane. Yeah, it really worked out in Samsung's favor. They mechanically outshone their opponents. One thing that stood out for me was their buff control. Um, we were looking at the gold lead despite having next to no kills by the 20-minute mark. Seven blue buffs and six red buffs over the course of the game. In contrast to Dark Passage, they had one blue and two reds. I mean... When you can't even control your own jungle, there's literally no way you're actually going to be able to be relevant and stay in this game. No, and not only that, but they were ba basically Samsung White was running from red buff to blue buff on the enemy side over and over again while the mid turret was still up. <clears throat> there's not really a way to get out rotated harder than that. It's I mean, fast that's. Feet. Because basically, when you still have that mid-outer up, you should always be able to reach your other buff faster. And Dandy also, it must be said, I mean, we were just taking a look at some of the, the information from this game. Dandy was three levels up very early in this game by about 15 minutes. And they did that just through objective control and buff stealing and dragons, mostly. So it was pretty impressive jungling from Dandy on the whole. And then, uh, you know... I want to talk about the Vayne pick a little bit because this is something we're likely to see a, a bit more in this tournament with big-time Vayne players like Imp and Uzi. First Vayne of the tournament and secures a pentakill. Yeah, and it won't be the last because when you leave the Alistair up and you are on red side, uh, then if they take it and they put it up in the top lane, Vayne is one of those champions through the, the percent damage, the, the true damage that will be able to deal with this. Because when Alistair comes in, especially if you have some sort, like if you have Vayne there and you have a zoning tool to keep the rest of the team out, you can quickly burst down a hyper tank. It's good against Maokai as well. Very quickly before we get to the replay. Okay, uh, just one thing. So sending Vayne top against that, I think better teams 
are going to be able to realize that kind of fault with a top lane and not allow that to happen. When Vayne went top, it was very predictable. They should have been able to see that coming after the bot turret fell. And if they were just able to lane swap, they could have avoided that. But it was kind of like Dark Passage wasn't really aware they're going to do this. And after Alistar was stuck top against Vayne, it was just, now they're going to bleed turrets. And that's exactly what happened. We talked about the pentakill. Let's pull this one up onto your screens. It is the first pentakill here, day two of the World Championships between Prolly and Monty. Let's talk through this clip as we roll it out. Because as Monty said, impin ain't easy. Impin ain't easy. Well, I mean, coming in here, <laughs> I mean, Naro just dies to the burn right there. And it looked a little risky for him. He gets hit by the traps and the Alistair knockup, but gets saved right there by Mata. And then Dandy's there for a little bit more protection. And Looper from the side makes sure Touch can't get out either. And then, uh, you know, good guy Fab Fabulous. To zoom in. Gives up the last one. That's some classy camera work. Prolly, Jat asked it on the, on the set. Was that a legit paint to kill? You're going to be the final say. I would say, yeah, because that cow was not going to get away. No, there was he, no way. He I just he accepted his fate, and he's like, I'm going to think about what to buy now. And just open up his shop. <laughs> <laughs> became, became a big piece of steak. Anyways, guys. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing about the takeaway of this, because the AHQ game was a little bit more scrappy, and we saw some more cocky plays from Samsung White. But this game was a very different story. You know, zero kills until pretty pretty early into the mid-game. Very methodical control of objectives. You can see how intelligent White is here, as well as uh, good at skirmishing and maybe overplaying their hand a little. Very impressive I'm, to get a perfect game. I'm actually happy you mentioned that, because in the matchup of Samsung White versus Edward Gaming, they also had missed positions, especially in Imp in particular, that cost them some of those team fights. Anyways, uh, we do want to check out how you guys are watching the World Championships all around the world at Simon Monk Niels and some friends in class are working on their R's. Reading, <laughs> writing, and Renekton, if <laughs> you say so. And from Crumbs, he writes, this is how I worlds. You may have the best view, uh, but of course he's looking at us. So yeah, that well played, creep. dude. Uh, and then at Jack Doonan, he proves that even though... Uh, that even down under, they're, they're chanting TSM. All right, we've got another one coming to us from at Shiny Shedinja. Uh, proves that cosplay isn't just for cons and writes, This is how I world 4 a.m. Renekton outfit, because who needs sleep anyway? Is that really a Renekton outfit? I couldn't actually see. <laughs> we, we need a full body Renekton photo from our last photo. Anyways, send them to us how you're watching the action out of Taipei by tweeting at LOL Esports. Use the hashtag Worlds. In our next match, North America's Team Solo Mid will square off against the Taipei Assassins for what could be the second team to make it to quarterfinals. We're going to take some shots of a second. TSM in a huddle. Uh, hey, the General's there. We'll see if any strategies he can provide will do better than the ones that worked against World Club. TPA, is that them? Yes, chatting a little bit. Those are serious faces. They definitely don't want to disappoint their home crowd. Don't go anywhere, wait. we'll be right back. Dandy is going to continue a 2v1 by himself. Looper says, you're mine. And he may there have we another go. one. 4v1 for himself right now as the team comes in from the backside. Health bars are being completely demolished right now. A little bit of brush control is going to be good for this one. Double kill coming in for Imp. He keeps the shot it? coming. The triple kill for Imp. Looking for the oh, yeah, they want to give him the And they are going to get it. Yeah. The pentakill to come in for Imp. Pentakill!